historic trial of a former president. All of it coming together in really just the last 90 minutes, setting up opening statements maybe as soon as Monday in the former president's case. Coming up, our breakdown of how the prosecution may try to frame that opening, what happens from here with the alternates, and who exactly are these everyday people picked to decide Donald Trump's fate? That's live from downtown Manhattan. Also tonight, new answers on how 911 went down for millions of Americans and the mystery still out there in one state, sending officials scrambling. Plus, why a bunch of Kennedys are not backing one of their own in the race for the White House. Instead, late today, coming out and endorsing President Biden. So how much does their famous family name really resonate with voters right now? Then the potential foreign aid fiasco on Capitol Hill, the House Speaker fighting to save his job and get billions for Ukraine and Israel. We'll tell you how even TikTok's playing into it. Plus the new fight over religion in public schools, why Florida's governor is now going toe to toe with Satanists. You heard that right, that's later on in the show. Hey, I'm Hallie, and it is the first of what may be many milestone moments tonight in an unprecedented trial. The jury, 12 people now seated in the criminal trial of Donald Trump, along with one alternate. They've got to pick five more alternates. The judge says he's hopeful they'll finish up tomorrow. Seven new members now added to this jury, including a male investment banker and a male security engineer. They were added because two people were taken off. One, uh, an oncology nurse who said so much personal info got leaked, her friends figured out it was her on the jury. She's no longer on it. The other, this male IT consultant who was out for allegedly lying to the judge. Remember, it's not over yet. The magic number is 18, so you still have a few more to go. But all of it sets up the openings maybe as soon as Monday. This day overall, highlighting the challenges of a trial at this moment, an election year, for this person, Donald Trump, in this city, New York, with one dismissed juror. Talking more about that with our Yasmin Vesugian. Everybody has biases and, you know, you know, stereotypes in their mind so you have to be a really you know deep and uh you know fair person which is very hard to do right so what about former president trump this is him walking out of court just within the last hour you watched it live last hour right here on nbc news now accusing prosecutors in his view of being out of control slamming the judge even complaining about the temperature in the room very cold now a lot of people said it was basically freezing in that room here's what donald trump did not say anything about the makeup of the jury the seven men and five women who will decide his fate vaughn hilliard is outside the courthouse in manhattan that may be because that partial gag order has been put on the former president we'll talk more about that next week when the judge is set to make a decision on any penalties for potential violations but let's talk about what's happening now this big milestone now a jury picked and seated and it sounds like monday is when everybody thinks openings will begin Right. The starting lineup is set. They've just got to fill out the bench right now, the six alternatives that they've got left. And that's what the order of business is going to be tomorrow, Howley. This is a uh, it was an afternoon that went from having just five jurors to suddenly having 13, and one of those being the alternate, five left to go here. And this is significant. These are going to be the 12 individuals that ultimately determine Donald Trump's legal fate here in New York City. It is going to be on them, despite all of the pressures that exist around them here, to ultimately make the determination on the evidence and testimony they hear over the next six to eight weeks on what Donald Trump's uh, fate is. So, Vaughn, talk to us a little bit about what you heard from some of these prospective jurors. I mean, we're looking at this graphic here, and obviously, you know, I should note here, there was an admonition from the judge to members of the media, to members of the press who are watching this go down, to use common sense and not reveal too much information that could be revealing about these jurors. He seemed concerned about that. Um, but it has been a process. It really isn't over yet, right? Right, and this is what makes Donald Trump such a unique criminal defendant is that all of these potential jurors were asked the question, do you have strong opinions about Donald Trump? And every single one of the individuals who have been seated, the 12 plus one, all said no. There was one woman who had actually been seated on Tuesday to be a juror, but showed up this morning at court and said that she didn't actually think any longer she could be. So she was dismissed and excused. I want to let you hear from one other dismissed juror that I talked to about the experience of walking in there and about being asked the question whether he could be fair and impartial. Take a listen. Were I to be seated on the trial, A, it would be dishonest for me to withhold that information. But there's be no way that 
Blanche, who's not going to rely on the kindness of strangers, would permit me to uh, be on the jury. Mark, that man, an honest man who came in and said he could not be fair and impartial, but they were waiting through. You know, some of the folks said that they could be. And when the defense team for Donald Trump went through the social media accounts of some of these folks, they found posts uh, that were not too kind to yeah. the former president. And several of those individuals, they were dismissed and excused because of those past social media posts. Is it raining out there? I can't tell. Is it, it looks like it's wet behind you. It's been a bleak day, Hallie. It's been a bleak well, day out here. And so, inside the courtroom, Donald out? Trump was complaining about it being cold. <gasps> well, that's what I mean. There are but, like, people, are people out and about. It's that's not what I'm asking. Chaotic... Because, like, here's one person who we know is out there. Why did George Santos, right. you know, show up to the, to, the, to the court today? I mean, all of it gets to something that we've talked about this week. And you're seeing a picture of George Santos walking in now, I guess, to the courthouse. Um, we, we've been getting to this. This is a spectacle. I mean, it is, a, it is an unprecedented trial. It is a trial that is making history. And it is right. also kind of in a weird way become a bit of a tourist attraction. Is that fair? Right. It's kind of a chaotic scene. I, I, George Santos is sort of this odd character in our American politics the last two years. And of course, I guess naturally he'd find himself outside of this courthouse. But definitely there's been folks that we have met that have come by just to go and see it here. I wouldn't call it a chaotic scene here, but, you know, it, it's not lost on anybody, especially in lower Manhattan, that uh, the former president of the United States and the potential of the future one, at least Republican presumptive nominee, is going to be here for several more weeks inside of that courtroom, Hallie. Vaughn Hilliard live for us there in downtown Manhattan. Among it all uh, on this, as you say, Thanks, bleak day, Vaughn. Thank you, friend. Appreciate it. So listen, let's take a step back. Remember what this case is about. Okay, Donald Trump facing these 34 felony counts accused of falsifying business records, basically lying on business documents, allegedly to cover up payments he made to former adult film star Stormy Daniels during the 2016 campaign. Now, in plain English, as you see this web here of all of Donald Trump's legal issues, there's a lot of people, including us, who have shorthanded this particular one as like the quote unquote hush money trial. That's what you'll sometimes hear. Oh, this is the hush money trial. Some legal experts have suggested it is the weakest case because they say, okay, if he lied, if he lied on these internal records, what is the harm to the public? But the Manhattan district attorney says it goes way beyond that. Here's the breakdown. In the orbit of Donald Trump's trials, the one in New York has headlines that seem tailor-made for the tabloids. A possible sex scandal involving Mr. Trump, an ex-porn star Stormy Daniels, and $130,000 in so-called hush money payments paid to her by his former fixer, Michael Cohen. Mr. Trump denies having a sexual relationship with Daniels, but the alleged crime recorded in checks signed by Mr. Trump to reimburse Cohen. And Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg suggests there's more to it than so-called hush money. So it's an election interference case. Not interference in 2020, but the first time around, the 2016 election. Bragg says those checks, allegedly to try and silence Stormy Daniels, were part of a scheme by Mr. Trump to keep the alleged affair from voters in 2016. That payment was to hide damaging information from the voting public. Bragg never actually even called it hush money when he announced the charges. He argues then-candidate Trump did this to cover up other crimes, like the campaign finance laws Michael Cohen pleaded guilty to in 2018 and served three years in a federal prison for. The DA repeatedly making the case publicly, this goes beyond a sex scandal. The, the case is, is, is not, you know, you know, the core of it's not you know, money for sex. We would say it's, it's about conspiring to corrupt a, a presidential election and then you know, lying in, in, in New York business records to cover it up. That framing echoed in part by the judge, Juan Mershon, who in a court filing wrote he'd tell a jury that these allegations have to do with falsified business records to conceal an agreement with others to unlawfully influence the 2016 presidential election. All of it, a potential preview of how the prosecutor's opening statements may go. Yes, yeah, so that's the prosecutor's case. What about the Trump team, right? What might the defense say? Well, according to legal filings, they may say something like, look, Donald Trump just didn't want to be embarrassed. It has nothing to do with influencing voters. And more importantly, they say that means it is not illegal. We will see how this begins to be framed starting maybe as early as Monday. We'll have coverage of that historic trial right here on NBC News Now. To some other headlines tonight, and there are plenty of them. Let's start with that 911 system outage on Oahu in Hawaii, not even 24 hours after a separate outage, left millions of people across four other states without a way to get in touch with first responders overnight via landlines.
We don't know if these two outages are related at all, but it comes as we're getting some answers about what may have happened overnight. It looks like the issue was related, at least partly, to a communications and telecom company called Lumen Technologies. In a statement to NBC News, a spokesperson apologized to customers in these three states, Nevada, South Dakota, and Nebraska. They said the outage happened when a third-party company was installing a pole causing what some officials say was an unprecedented situation. To our knowledge, we have never experienced an outage of this magnitude or duration. Here's what else we know tonight. Law enforcement officials tell us there's nothing to indicate that this was part of a cyber attack or something somebody did on purpose. The FCC is looking into this, but here's what we don't know. What the root of the issue may have been down in Texas, which was one of the states affected by this outage, because Lumen Technology says it doesn't provide 911 services there. Brian Chung is joining us now. And what's interesting, this wasn't like same, same in all of these states, right? For some places, 911 services were only down if you tried to call on cell phone for other places. I mean, it was just a, it was kind of a patchwork here. Yeah, and that's why it's important to parse out that we don't know what happened in Texas. We don't know what happened for that 20-minute outage in Hawaii. But what we do know is that in the three states that were affected in Nebraska, South Dakota, and also Nevada, that those were tied to Lumen Technologies, which is a telecom communicator, uh, having gone down because of a wire that was cut because of a third party, not Lumen, trying to do repair on a light pole. It's as simple as something like that uh, that could take down these emergency services, which had overnight, in some cases, many states... Uh, experiencing difficulty in reaching 911 emergency services. Now, uh, it's interesting because this is really highlighted that there are instances and might be instances where you can't reach 911, in which case emergency uh, providers like, for example, the fire departments and also uh, police departments have said, first off, jot down the local number for your police and your fire department. It's 10, 10 number digit, and that's not 911. And they also advise trying a landline or other types of ways of reaching out, like text messaging, for example, in which case you actually can text 911 depending on whether or not your locality offers that. And one last point here that's so important, Hallie, there were instances during this outage where people were trying to dial 911 to test if emergency services were being active. Do not do that. We saw the yeah. same thing play out when AT&T had issues two months ago. Only dial 911 if you're actually in an emergency. That's such a good point. You mentioned that AT&T AT &T outage a couple of months ago. Is there a broader question mark here about the vulnerability of some of these systems? Yeah, and again, I want to emphasize that what happened today does not appear to be a hack. It simply, right. simply seemed to be that, uh, that, that repair air pole cutting a line, but uh, there have been instances where the Department of Homeland Security has said, look, there's an upgrade that's trying to be done to 911 services nationwide. Could that be subject to a hack some point down the line? That's very much a concern, but again, not related to what we saw happen today, Hallie. Brian Chung, thank you very much. To Maryland now, where a high school student is in police custody, charged with threatening mass violence in connection with an alleged school shooting plan. This is in Montgomery County, right outside D.C., According to court documents obtained by NBC News, here are some of the documents here alleging that 18-year-old Andrea Yee, who goes by Alex, wrote a 129-page document that includes a strategy on how to carry out the attack, even contemplating targeting an elementary school, allegedly wanting to be famous. We expect some more details, possibly as soon as tomorrow in a news conference. But Yamiche Alcindor has made her way to Montgomery County. Tell us more about this investigation, how it unfolded, and where this goes from here. Well, this, Hallie, is really a striking and disturbing situation here. And to understand how this all is unfolding, we have to go all the way back to March 3rd. So we should put up a timeline for folks. That's when a witness contacted Baltimore County Police and said that Alex Yee was writing a manifesto um, that was disturbing to them and that, was, that made them feel like a school shooting was imminent. Then on March 5th, police obtained a search warrant for Yee's Gmail account that was tied to that document. On March 5th, he messaged on Discord, which was a, an internet site that he, that he actually ended up being pushed off of and, and blocked from because he was posting about violence. And he wrote in that, on that internet site, my friend reported me to the police for a book I'm writing. March 6th, he is hospitalized. March 21st, there's a search of Yee's home. And then on Tuesday, he is arrested. And police are saying that this manifesto, this 129-page document that Yee says was a work of fiction, that really is, it contains such disturbing language that they are worried that this was something that was actually going to be a blueprint for a school shooting. I also want to put up that Montgomery County Public Schools, they're weighing in here. I want to read a bit of their statement. They say the charges are extremely serious, involving alleged threats to harm others. The student who has not physically attended a Montgomery County Public School since the fall of 2022 has been actively participating in lessons through a virtual program called Online Pathways to Graduation. So there you have the high school and the school district there saying while the student was not physically in school, they were still part of the school community. So 
definitely going to continue to watch this. He, as we understand it, is in custody and is now awaiting a bond hearing. Hallie? You may shall send our live for us there in Maryland. Thank you. A big deal moment tonight for a big deal family in American politics with the Kennedys coming out today against one of their own and endorsing President Biden's reelection instead. Watch. President Biden has been a champion for all the rights and freedoms that my father and uncle stood for. That's why nearly every single grandchild of Joe and Rose Kennedy supports Joe Biden. 15 Kennedys there. You see them all, including Carrie. You just heard from her. She's the sister of RFK Jr., who is, of course, running that third-party race. Carrie Kennedy saying that President Biden, who you see on stage, represents a vote to, in her words, save our democracy. This endorsement's coming at an interesting time in an interesting race, as some Democrats worry that RFK Jr.'s candidacy could hurt former President Trump. RFK Jr. himself responding on X, saying, I am pleased my family is politically active. He says, it's a family tradition. We are divided in our opinions, but united in our love for each other. Mike Memley is joining us now, and it is so interesting for multiple reasons, right? Number one, um, because of the family involved here, because it is the Kennedys. Number two, because for any candidate, having siblings come out, right, and, and protest your candidacy, in essence, or at least endorse your opponent is significant, particularly when that candidate has leaned on his family history. Yeah, Hallie, just think about if Valerie, Frank, and Jimmy Biden came out this week and endorsed Donald Trump, <laughs> what, what a, a bombshell that would be. And for the Biden campaign, you can understand why this moment is so significant. You just need to look at the polls, right? There's a Quinnipiac poll this week that shows if it's a head-to-head, -head, Joe Biden versus Donald Trump, Biden has a three-point lead. But when you insert Robert F. Kennedy Jr. into the mix, you see both candidates drop down into the 30s and Kennedy with a significant share of the vote. The same finding in a Reuters poll that had Kennedy up at 16 percent. So you, you see what is at stake in terms of uh, the Biden campaign with Kennedy as a political spoiler. I think what's so fascinating is the way the Kennedy family is viewing this. They see this as a potential legacy spoiler for the family. This was an event that was weeks in the making. You can remember that uh, image we saw of, of generations of Kennedys with President Biden in the Rose Garden. This was in the works even well before that. The Biden campaign saying they're taking their cues from the Kennedy family as much as they want to be involved, they will be involved going forward. It, what's also interesting is the place where this is happening. In Philadelphia today, after two other days, so this is the third straight day that he has campaigned, specifically in Pennsylvania, all while former President Trump is sitting in a criminal trial in New York, right? Talk about um, the, the potential benefits of the campaign and how they see it. Well, it's, the Biden campaign really sees this, call it what you want, the counter-programming, the split-screen strategy, the message they want to convey this week, knowing that Trump is going to dominate most of the national headlines, is one to get a lot of local headlines in the most important battleground state to Joe Biden, which is Pennsylvania. But you can really break down the political geography that Biden covered this week to look at some of the issues and how they see this race. Scranton, of course, President Biden's hometown, he sees that as sort of uh, the, the home base for his economic messaging. He talked about the fact that Trump views the economy through Mar-a-Lago or Park Avenue. He sees it through the lens of the people he grew up uh, with in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Then you see Pittsburgh. That's been a political home base for President Biden. He was with union workers. He sees himself as the most pro-labor president. Yeah. An important stop there to talk about China. And then there was, of course, today, Philadelphia. That's kind of the stakes of this election, the democracy stakes. The Kennedys helped him to make that message today. You also saw him playing both sides of a very heated political debate in Pennsylvania. <laughs> the president stopped today at a Wawa. He got a hoagie and a shake. This was just the day after he stopped at a Sheets in Pittsburgh. Which side are you on, Mr. President? I, I think this is a, a real question. <laughs> that, Please that, tell that, me somebody <laughs> asked him. Well, we haven't heard that yet. You know, this will be something maybe he's going to get the next time he goes to Pennsylvania. I think I know where you uh, fall on this, this Just so issue. people, Western PA, home to Sheets, the pale imitation of Eastern Pennsylvania's Wawa, uh, a Wawa, of course, that has infiltrated, you know, from New Jersey all the way down here to D.C. Did you, did you, oh, you're in D.C., you didn't place an order, but I'm going to send you like an Italian hoagie over from Wawa to the White House, ma'am. Well, Hallie, as somebody who spent a lot of my youth, uh, the summers in a, on the Jersey Shore, I was a Wawa guy for a long time, but covering the 2008 campaign especially, I spent Don't a lot of time it. in Don't rural Pennsylvania. Nope. nope. And Sheets was kind of that beacon uh, at, no, at night when you really needed a good meal. And nope. so I, I don't know.
Okay. Uh, I guess this is my last appearance it's, on Hallie It's Jackson been a lovely now. final appearance for you on this program. Mike Memoli, uh, Sh Sh Sheets Betrayer, thank you so much. Wawa forever here on this show. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. All right, listen, we got to take you out, Wes, because there's some breaking news that's happening now. We're just getting this into us here, so I want to grab some information on this because we're seeing some protests now at universities in some of the country's biggest cities, not just New York, but L.A. as well. Let me start with New York. Look at Columbia University. So this is police coming in. We've told you about this over the last 24 hours, these huge crowds of students that kind of camped out on the big lawn in front of the university. The school says students refused to disperse, so now more than 100 have been arrested. But go to the West Coast now. That's where it's happening as we speak. USC students, look at this, out protesting the university's decision to not allow a speech from this year's pro Palestinian valedictorian, a valedictorian who has expressed views that are pro-Palestinian. Now, the school says the decision has nothing to do with freedom of speech. They say the main issues are campus safety and security. I want to bring in now KNBC correspondent Christian Casares, who is joining us from the USC campus. Christian, you're right in the thick of it. Tell us what it's like. I can tell you this group, as you can hear them, they are chanting, let her speak. And that has been uh, the mood here for about an hour now. I can tell you this group came together fairly quickly, about an hour. And they came together here right in the middle of USC's campus, right by uh, Tommy Trojan. About 20 minutes ago, this group that you see here, they mobilized. They went around the campus here. They did a short walk. Uh, and it was a silent march. But I can tell you that students here, they say they received messages. Uh, from fellow students to cancel their school attendance this afternoon to participate and support the request to reinstate the valedictorian's speech. Now, participants were asked to wear hoodies and a mask, which is the reason why many of them uh, have that uh, on right now. But again, this is a silent march. Uh, I was telling you that they were walking around the campus about 20 minutes ago, and they really didn't chant. They didn't really say much. They were all quiet. I talked to a couple of students along the way, and they said that they really uh, did like the fact that this was silent. It really does speak to the fact of why they are out here. Now, at the center of this is uh, Asna Tabasan. This is USC's 2024 valedictorian. She is a fourth-year student from Chino Hills with a major in biomedical engineering and a, major, and a minor in resistance to a genocide. Now, the university canceled her speech after they say concerns sparked over a link that was that was that she shared but did not author on her social media that they say contains anti-Semitic language. Well, recently, the first generation South Asian American Muslim told NBC4, our affiliate here in Los Angeles, in a statement that she was disappointed in USC's decision to cancel her graduation speech uh, during the ceremony. She says that this is basically a campaign of hate meant to silence her voice. I did get a chance to speak uh, to a spokesperson from USC just moments ago, and they said that they still are standing on that uh, move on, on on that stance to not allow her to participate in the ceremony, which is coming up on May 10th. But again, this is a silent march that is just getting underway. It's been about an hour now. I can tell you, it's roughly about maybe uh, 200 students. There's also, I understand, some faculty uh, that are here. But again, they're very passionate about this, and this is something that has been going on for about a week now. So of course, this is just something that both on social media and of course here on campus, students have been voicing their thoughts about this uh, this fellow student that they are, are fighting for her to go and have her speech uh, said during the, uh, the ceremony, which is again coming up on May 10th. Christian Casares, we're glad to have you out there reporting on all of it live for us tonight from Los Angeles, again from our affiliate KNBC. Thank you, Christian. Appreciate it. Let's bring you back here to Washington because right now this really big fight over money is picking up more steam on Capitol Hill. And there's a big question tonight, right? Can the House Speaker get these $95 billion foreign aid packages for Israel and Ukraine? Can he get those packages done without losing his job? That is totally a potential. Right, that is a live ball at the moment with some members of Johnson's own party, Mike Johnson's own party, threatening to kick him out. Speaker Johnson himself late today shutting down talk about changing the rules to make it harder to kick him out of his position, a position, by the way, he's only held for like six months. And in the hallways, Johnson's telling our team that his whole speakership thing, this whole threat to his job, that is not even his biggest worry right now. Sir, have you decided on proceeding with changes to the motion to vacate rules? Speaker Johnson. No, we're, we're focused on the supplemental right now. 
All right, so he says he's focused on the legislation. So let's talk about what those bills would do. Israel's getting ready to retaliate against Iran. Ukraine says without this money, they will lose the war with Russia if they do not have U.S. support. There's also a TikTok component making the whole thing even more complicated because the House is trying to package up those foreign aid bills with a potential ban on TikTok, a ban that would go into effect unless TikTok's Chinese owner decides to sell the app first. Obviously, TikTok's not thrilled in a new statement. They say this is a cover that'll devastate millions. Sahil Kapoor is joining us now. Um, let's talk about these two things, right, in two sort of different ways of thinking about it. The personnel drama with Speaker Johnson and then the policy drama with all of these foreign aid bills and the TikTok thing. What is going on with Mike Johnson, right? In other words, if these bills pass on Saturday night, uh, does it mean he could be out of a job come Monday? It's a tale as old as this Congress itself, Hallie. <laughs> Speaker Johnson has a wafer-thin majority of Republicans in the House of Representatives. He's dealing with a Democratic Senate and a Democratic president and a very rebellious right flank that does not want him to compromise with Democrats, specifically on the issue of Ukraine aid. Now, this is all very plausible that this bill gets through. He's come up with a creative process that would trigger four separate votes on four bills, Israel, Ukraine, assistance for the Indo-Pacific, and finally, this hodgepodge of national security priorities, which includes a potential TikTok ban. Let's uh, show a graphic of what exactly that provision in that bill would do. It would require uh, TikTok's owners to sell TikTok so it's no longer uh, controlled by ByteDance, the Beijing-owned uh, Chinese company, within nine months. That's a shift from the earlier bill, which required it to be sold within six months. The president would also have authority to extend uh, that nine-month window to a year. And if the sale does not go through, then TikTok would be banned in the United States. That's paired with some other national security measures um, in, that, in that final bill that Johnson's put out, including new sanctions on Iran, providing some uh, of Ukraine's assistance in the form of, of a forgivable loan, and the Repo Act, which would empower the White House to seize Russian assets in the states uh, and help pay for Ukraine reconstruction, the Ukraine assistance. All of this has a good chance of getting passed, but first, Johnson's got to get this through the Rules Committee uh, and get this through the floor, the process on the floor so it can trigger the votes. He's going to need Democrats for that, and he's got to do this delicately because Democrats, usually the minority party, usually does not uh, get involved in the processes of these things, and his right-wing members certainly do not want him to work with Democrats on it. So then timeline-wise, what are we thinking? His goal is to get this done by, Friday, uh, by, by Saturday evening. Okay. That was about 72 hours since the bills came out. He likes to give them time to read it. And beyond that, as soon as the, the Rules Committee can trigger the process, they will uh, move to the House floor, begin. The, he says there are going to be votes on some amendments. But by Saturday, we, uh, if his plan uh, works out, by Saturday evening, these bills should be passed and headed over to the Senate, where they will have escape velocity because there's a lot of determination to pass aid to Ukraine and Israel. Hallie? Sahil Kapoor, live for us on Capitol Hill. Lots to cover for you, friend. Thank you. Lots more here on the show as well, including cutting the cord, the bizarre reason that travelers are facing some big delays out west. Plus, college athletes cashing in, the new law that may have student sports stars rolling in it. But there's a catch.
hours after the eye roared ashore. There is some late breaking news. All right, it just is. We're talking possibly a trillion galaxies. Yes. That is a number that is just so hard to compute. Whether it's the moon, whether it's Mars, it feels like we're on the cusp of something big. A potential fight now brewing between Florida Governor Ron DeSantis and the Satanic Temple. That is not a misspeak. That is actually what the deal is down south. It has to do with this bill you're seeing DeSantis just signed into law that would let Florida public schools bring in volunteer chaplains as a resource for students. It's controversial for a bunch of reasons. Like critics say kids could end up getting religious advice they don't want or feel uncomfortable if the chaplains have a different religious background than they do. Case in point, the Satanic Temple tells our team they're planning on training and placing their own chaplains in Florida schools. The governor is talking about that today. He says that is not going to happen. Watch. We're not playing those games in Florida. Uh, that is not a religion. That is not qualifying to be able to participate uh, in this. So we're going to be using common sense uh, when it comes to this. So you don't have to worry about that. Marissa Parra is joining us now. It's, it's one of these, like, sort of wow moments here for, for a lot of reasons here. The governor, of course, Republican governor of Florida there, says the Satanic Temple is not qualified to be a part of this procedure. Is there a legal mechanism to, um, to stop them from being involved as volunteer chaplains? Great question, Hallie. And yeah, I do have to acknowledge it wouldn't be a day of covering Florida politics if we weren't talking about a headline like a showdown between the state's governor and the Satanic Temple. Um, so let's get right to it. DeSantis seems confident that there won't be a showdown. That won't happen. In fact, look at his tweet that he put out not that long ago. Uh, he said that Satanism isn't a religion. He's very confident that they will not even qualify because it's not a religion. And in his tweet, you'll see an image. He has a circle and a strike through around the world Satanists. Again, he is very confident. But it's important to point out the bill's own sponsor, a Republican senator in Fort Pierce, said she was concerned about what the Satanic Temple might be able to do because of First Amendment religious freedoms. Um, so that could potentially be the next chapter of this, Hallie. A court battle over what exactly defines religion. The Satanic Temple has already said that they would take this to court and fight against this under the guise of, of discrimination. But the Satanic Temple has also said that they are very confident that the Constitution is on their side here. Um, uh, calling DeSantis's words today, some of them you just heard now, quote, empty grandstanding. And they also put this uh, statement out in part saying they will move forward with training their satanic chaplains to place them in Florida public schools. But Hallie, also really important to remember that it is ultimately up to the individual schools on mm. how they choose to move forward, who they choose to allow into their schools to meet with the kids. Setting aside the potential of, of, of having, you know, Satanists volunteering as chaplains in schools. There are some other concerns, and we touched on them briefly at the top of this discussion, mm -hmm. more broadly, when it comes to the role overall of religion in public schools, right? Right. And so this is something that we've seen open letters. We've seen open letters signed by, uh, of course, not just faith groups. We've even seen chaplains sign in on that. Um, but civil rights organizations, particularly the ACLU, they have been very, very vocal about this. Uh, here's some of what they wrote in March, in part, expressing frustrations and concerns about how this would infringe on religious freedoms among students. They said that this also opens the doors for students to be evangelized, especially in states like this one that have conservative Christian leadership. And as you can see on your screen there, their concern is about the lack of credentials and training required by these volunteer chaplains, Hallie. And I'll just end by saying that Texas passed a law just like this one last year. 14 states have introduced legislation just like this one just in the last hmm. year. So Hallie, Florida, just the latest one to sign this bill into law, potentially not the last just this year alone. Super Hallie? interesting. Marissa Parr, live for us there in Florida. Thank you. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Dickie Betts, of course, a guitarist and co-founder of the Allman Brothers Band. He has died at the age of 80. His manager tells Rolling Stone he died from cancer and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Betts wrote that hit song Ramblin' Man for the Allman Brothers Band, and he really helped define Southern rock back in the 60s and 70s. 
Number two, police are investigating whether Ye, the rapper formerly known as Kanye West, was involved in an alleged battery. L.A. police were called to a scene early yesterday morning, but say that Ye was gone when police got there. His chief of staff tells NBC News this incident happened after Ye's wife was allegedly, in their words, physically assaulted. Number three, the Sacramento airport. Seeing some huge delays after some AT&T wires were cut, apparently on purpose, according to officials. This happened at a utility pole two miles away from the airport. Police haven't figured out who's responsible yet, but they say it looks like somebody who knew what they were doing. Uh, service has been restored, obviously. Flights are getting back in order now. Number four, college athletes in Virginia may soon be able to get paid directly by their schools because of those NIL deals, name, image, likeness. They're not going to get paid for playing, but they can be paid for showing up in marketing campaigns. It's supposed to start in July, but probably won't take effect because current NCAA rules still stop athletes from signing NIL agreements with their own players. Leaders in Virginia say the law will give them a leg up if and when those NCAA rules change. Number five, Starbucks is gearing up to roll out new disposable cups in a push to try to cut down on the amount of plastic we all throw out. The company says the cups will be made of up to 20% less plastic than what they use now. Comes as the company's um, sales of cold drinks. Obviously, that's what they're serving those plastic things for. They've boomed. More people drinking those iced lattes. Summertime, man. Coming up, why laws in some states have women facing off with their pharmacists. That's next. Plus, evacuating an eruption. We're bringing you to Indonesia as thousands scramble to get to safety. message that you're trying to get out to young people. Know what is in the drug supply. We've got important news this hour about your money. Mental health. Big picture. Why is it so tough right now? News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. Tonight's original now with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been watching. And tonight we take you to Idaho, a state that now bans abortions in nearly all cases after the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade a couple years ago. Some women who need medicine for things like miscarriages or inducing labor say they're struggling to get their hands on them because they can also be used in medical abortions. Here's Erica Edwards. You give me a high five. Children were part of Kristen and Lauren Colson's plan from the beginning. We always knew that we would have a family. But it hasn't been easy. In January, the Boise, Idaho couple miscarried for a fifth time. We were hoping to see a heartbeat, and on ultrasound, we saw that um, I had a non-viable pregnancy. Kristen's doctor wrote her a prescription for misoprostol, a drug that causes the uterus to contract helpful during a miscarriage, which is the spontaneous loss of a pregnancy and can take weeks for the body to complete on its own. Everybody processes grief differently, but for me, I, um, I like to have a plan. Choosing to use the medication, I can time when 
this happens. Misoprostol can also be used during a medication abortion, a deliberate termination of a pregnancy. That's why Kristen believes her Walgreens pharmacist refused to give her the drug. I was in shock, confused, um, dealing with this miscarriage. They told me that they didn't feel comfortable filling the misoprostol prescription at that dosage. Idaho's Defense of Life Act went into effect in 2022 after the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. The state's law says that every person who performs or attempts to perform an abortion could be committing a felony punishable by a sentence of imprisonment up to five years. The law isn't clear whether a pharmacist is committing a felony for dispensing the medication. The threat of jail time is a real worry for pharmacists like Matt Murray. Once you see a prescription for misoprostol, you now a little alert goes off in the back of your head that says, well, maybe we need to make sure what this is used for. Is this frustrating to you? It's frustrating and it, it takes time away from other things that, that we need to do. But ultimately the fear is that people aren't getting the medical care that they're needing. Pharmacists are understandably scared by these incredibly strict abortion laws that have been enacted, and they are afraid that they might be charged with a felony simply for doing their job. Allison Tanner, senior legal counsel at the National Women's Law Center, says since the Supreme Court decision, they've heard from a number of women who say they were denied access to legally prescribed medications, including misoprostol. Pharmacists were afraid about the new lay of the land under the law. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has investigated complaints against some pharmacies, including Walgreens, which HHS says have been resolved. In a statement, Walgreens says it'll accommodate team members whose beliefs conflict with selling certain products and make sure another pharmacist can fill the prescription. Kristen's doctor was able to transfer her prescription to another Walgreens that filled it. In Boise, I have other options and access to other pharmacies, and that may not be the case for, for a lot of people that went through what we went through across the state. Erica Edwards is joining us now. So, Erica, we've laid out what happens in Idaho and the policy there, but what about other states? What are they doing? Hey, Hallie. Yeah, you know, this is happening nationwide. Women across the country are telling us that they have been denied legal prescriptions. Now, the HHS has given guidance uh, to pharmacies basically saying that refusing to prescribe certain medications um, to women can have negative health impacts and may violate civil uh, civil rights laws. But it's not so clear to pharmacists like who we talked to in that piece, uh, Matt Murray and Boise, who say, you know, navigating this legal landscape is especially difficult for independent pharmacies who don't have the legal means to guide them through this process. We're left, Hallie, with pharmacists who'd rather play it safe and not give out these medications that could land them in trouble. Hallie. Erica Edwards, thank you so much for bringing us that reporting right here on NBC News Now. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day, and because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here's a look at what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of Indonesia, a local airport shut down, canceling flights in the region, all because of that volcano eruption we told you about 24 hours ago here on this show. I want to show you here more stunning video. Look at that lightning, right? Bill Karens talked about this yesterday, that eruption is sending lava, ash, especially way up in the air. We don't know how many passengers are left stranded at this airport, but officials have ordered more than 11,000 people to leave because of a potential tsunami risk if part of the volcano collapses. Out of the UK, Scotland's only clinic for treating transgender kids has announced it's pausing new prescriptions for puberty blockers. We told you last week how the UK's push to restrict gender affirming care for minors is kicking in. Health officials say they want to provide the best care while also reviewing medical evidence that supports this treatment. They clarified patients already getting treatment will not be affected. And also out of the UK, Prince William stepping out again publicly for the first time since his wife's Kate wife Kate's cancer diagnosis. Remember, Princess Kate announced she had cancer. You see him or is diagnosed with cancer. You see him at a food distribution center there representing the rest of the family. A lot of the royals have been absent from the British public because of their health problems, specifically King Charles, who's seeking treatment for cancer. We still don't know what kind. He also, a lot of folks watching him. When we come back, Caitlin Clark's money moves. The company is reportedly fighting over a partnership with one of basketball's biggest stars and what it means for the rest of the league.
back and forth because they Oh yeah, this is it. We're talking possibly a trillion galaxies. Yes. That is a number that is just so hard to compute. Whether it's the moon, whether it's Mars, it feels like we're on the cusp of something big. Now that basketball superstar Caitlin Clark is a pro wnba -er, more big money is expected to keep rolling in for her, with The Athletic now reporting Clark's about to sign an eight-figure sneaker deal with Nike that could be the biggest ever for a female basketball player. The Athletic also reports the bidding apparently got so intense for a partnership with Clark that NBA star Steph Curry showed up to a meeting to try to get her to sign with Under Armour. This was like, you know, hot competition here. Clark's bringing in tons of interest to the league to the point that Monday's draft night shattered viewership records. It was four times higher than last year's draft. Juan Vanegas is covering this. It is the Clark effect. We have seen it again and again. We saw it in the college championships and those playoffs. We're seeing it in the draft. Now we're seeing it in like the sneaker wars, right? Talk us through how this sort of big money and this attention rolling in for stars like Clark could help start to change the overall perception of women's basketball and maybe even help the WNBA pull in more money. Hallie, she hasn't even played a minute in the WNBA, right? And she's already made a difference. You mentioned with the NCAA tournament. I mean, I think this year there was more attention for the women's final than the men's final. And a large part, it was because of her and what she's done during her whole college career. And now we've got the news of Nike with this deal. You can expect other sponsors to come in and also try to establish some type of relationship with her because we know that she brings in those ratings. She was also on Saturday, Saturday Night Live. So... She's becoming an icon of the sport. Um, and you can also look at what she's achieved, right? So it's not just the money, but also the records that she has as a college player. She is already the all-time scorer in the NCAA. She was a four-time All-American. She was twice a player of the year. So these are records that people are going to talk about for a very long time because she has established them as a successful uh, basketball player. And now with all of this, this will equal to more ratings and possibly more money being made by the WNBA and the sponsors, which is good for the future of the league. She is, in, in so many ways, kind of the biggest story in basketball right now. But there is this example of something that perhaps one could argue she has to deal with that, that men, a lot of men just wouldn't have to. Like this moment that some folks are calling out that's getting a lot of attention. Let me play it. Hi, Hi. Caitlin. Uh, Greg Doyle, Indy Star. Real quick, I'll let me do this. You like you like that? I like that you're here. I like yeah, that you're here. I do that at my family after every game, so. Okay, well, let's cool. start doing it to me, and we'll be able to get along just fine. We couldn't see it there, but he held up, like, the hard hands here. Walk us through the backlash to this moment and the apology now. Uh, Hallie, it was just such an awkward moment. Uh, we should start by saying he has apologized since. Yep. Uh, he shared on social media a, a message saying, my comment afterwards was clumsy and awkward. I sincerely apologize. Please know that my heart literally and figuratively was well-intentioned. I will do better. But the question here, Hallie, uh, by colleagues, by people that watch that news conference and others on social media, is what would happen if someone asked that question, made that comment and that gesture during a press conference for an NBA player? What hmm. would the the league, the team, or the employer do to that person for asking that question. But overall, it was just a very awkward moment. Now, that columnist did say that he's had other awkward conversations, but we're still seeing a lot of backlash. And you can see her reaction when all she has to say is, uh, yes, I do that to my family sometimes. So overall, just a very awkward moment, Hallie. Quad Venegas, uh, thank you very much for breaking that down for us. Appreciate it. A lot more to come here on the show, including the news. It, it may truly be the biggest news you care about today. It's her. It's her album. It's all kind of almost midnight and seven hours from now. All the Easter eggs she's dropping with the reporter who exclusively covers her coming up.
unless you live under a rock or perhaps in a cave somewhere, you probably know that later on tonight, Taylor Swift will drop her 11th studio album. Like, I know. The whole world knows. Everybody knows. It is, um, like, already a huge deal, and it's not even out yet. Spotify is announcing that the Tortured Poets Department is officially the most pre-saved album countdown page ever. And whether you're a Swifty or not, you've probably seen one of these so-called Easter eggs hyping up this album. They're literally on buildings. Murals of these QR codes, again, around the world. This is a global drop, and they all have different clues on them, with businesses jumping in on this kind of unprecedented moment. Apple Music launched a Swift scavenger hunt. You need a subscription to play, right? Spotify is launching a whole pop-up in LA. But one thing that probably wasn't planned, leaks of some of these songs. It got so bad that even X blocked searches. What makes this tricky, people don't even know if these quote unquote leaked songs are real or fake. With AI, it's a whole new story. So here to break it down for us is US Today, Taylor Swift reporter. That's right, Brian West. Brian, we're so glad to have you on, a former NBC alum. Thank you for being on with us tonight. Thank you so much, Holly. We are about six hours and counting. And everybody is counting. I mean, truly. And so that's what I want to get into, right? I want to get into your job in a second, but let's start with like the business impact that Taylor Swift is having. We have seen big album releases, even just this year, Beyonce with Cowboy Carter, but she's about the only one, right? The two of them are in a league of their own, a universe of their own when it comes to the attention on the music that they're producing. Talk us through that piece of it. And what we've seen with Taylor especially is that she has a snack for Easter eggs for bringing in a lot of her corporate sponsors or corporate partners to help kind of uncover or unleash this new project. And so we saw Spotify, as you announced, had a pop-up installation at the Grove in Los Angeles. Hidden in that pop-up display are book spines with the titles of the 20 tracks on this album. There is a globe there that has a pushpin in Miami, which is the next location for her U.S. domestic leg of the the Eras tour. She had a typewriter that had messages. She has song lyrics that are included in the cases. And so you see that across all these different platforms on Apple Music for six days, fans would have to search all the playlists to find which one was lowercase with specific capital letters. And that would spell mm. out a phrase we now know that is, we hereby conduct this post mortem, which tells us that there's something to do with two. A lot of clocks, including the animation that Taylor Swift has release have told us two o'clock or postmortem is two hours after. So a lot of fans are again speculating. They are excited. They're thinking maybe something is going to happen. You're looking at the animation right now. This is the intern area. And that's where she says what's going to happen. The calendar that we are going to see the first single Fortnite with Post Malone. It's going to have a music video that comes out tomorrow night. So it really just makes it fun for the fans to follow along, but also must be so exhausting for the singer and her team team just to keep track of everything. Do you think quickly here, Brian, that this album is different from her others in terms of its release, its hype, et cetera? What we know is that there's two collaborators, so Post Malone and Florence Welch from Florence and the Machine, but two co-writers, co-producers, Jack Antonoff and Aaron Dessner, have worked closely with the writer. We saw Aaron come in during the folklore era, and so he has really helped to kind of propel advance the writing. And same with Jack, he's been one of her producers sound yeah. since 1989. I have to ask about you because you have what is maybe the most coveted job in all of Swifty world, right? Um, after you got it, the vice president of local news for USA Today talked about how you personally, Brian, have this balance between somebody with serious news chops and someone who understands everything about Taylor's world and the universe that you're stepping into. Talk to us about how this role has been and honestly, what you do next once her Eras tour is over. That's a good question. So it is constant. I would say every day is completely different. I just woke up about an hour ago to get ready for this full marathon <laughs> all nighter of the release. And then tomorrow morning, it's been such a whirlwind to be able to travel uh, with the Eras tour alongside it in Tokyo, Japan, in Melbourne, Australia, and Sydney. I'm going to be heading to Europe in May to see also if there are any changes. But it really is the dream, uh, the, the job of my wildest dreams. Uh, Brian, we're so glad to have you on. Thank you. Um, so, like, what do you have, 16 Red Bulls to get ready for tonight? Is that the deal? Just all coffee? Oh, we're constantly? already starting. Starting now. A fortnight of Red Bulls. Okay, very good. Brian, thank you so much for being on. That does it for us for this hour. We've got a lot more coverage picking up right now.
Breaking tonight, the U.S. vetoing a U.N. resolution that would have paved the way for Palestinian statehood. The move coming under sharp condemnation as the U.S. faces mounting pressure over the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Plus, officers in riot gear arresting dozens of pro-Palestinian protesters at Columbia University. The breaking details just coming in. Also tonight, an NBC News exclusive, Hezbollah's second in command. What he says will happen if Israel fires back at Iran. The leader blaming President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for dragging out the war in Gaza. Also breaking right now, 12 jurors plus an alternate selected in President Trump's historic criminal hush money trial. The announcement capping off a day of jury shuffling and drama in the courtroom where the selection process stands. And I sit down with one of the reporters who first broke the story on the hush money payment, how his work led to the first ever criminal trial of a former president. Family turns on RFK Jr. More than a dozen members of the Kennedy family throwing their support behind President Biden. RFK Jr.'s response to his family, giving him the cold shoulder. How the Democratic Party is working to fend off the independent, concerned over his appeal to younger voters. Koberger's new alibi, the suspect at the center of the brutal murders of four Idaho college students, disputing his location on the night of the killings. New court documents claiming he was out driving, something he did often to see the moon and the stars. Plus, office bully? Imagine coming to work and finding your desk put on the roof of your office. But does it go much further than just a practical joke? The employees questioning that boss's relationship with a top official, saying he will never face the consequences of his actions. And fully electronic humanoid, Boston Dynamics revealing its most human-like robot yet, the brand new state-of-the-art machine moving like nothing we've ever seen. Top story starts right now. And good evening. Coming on the air with breaking news tonight, the U.S. vetoed a Palestinian bid for full U.N. membership, ultimately blocking Palestinian statehood. This was the moment United States Ambassador Robert Wood struck down the widely backed measure. The U.S. was the only one of the 15 U.N. member states there, the Security Council, to veto the measure. Two countries abstained and 12 others voted in favor. The move coming under sharp criticism from several countries, including Russia and Egypt. The U.S. arguing the two-state solution should be a result of negotiations between Israel and Palestinians, not the United Nations. And it comes as tensions mount across the country, right? Over the Israel-Hamas war at Columbia University, police in riot gear arresting more than 100 demonstrators during a pro-Palestinian protest. And concerns over a wider war in the Middle East, cross-border fighting between Israel and Hezbollah in southern Lebanon intensifying over recent days. In just a moment, you'll hear from Hezbollah's second-in-command in an exclusive NBC sit-down. The Iranian-backed militant group vowing to strike Israel if they provoke an attack. We'll get to all of that in a moment. But first, I want to get to that breaking news on the U.N. Security Council's vote. NBC's Ellison Barber joins us now. Ellison, take us into the U.N. and what happened today. Yeah, I mean, look, this wasn't a surprise. The U.S. had been very clear from the State Department briefings earlier today saying we intend to veto this. We saw the U.S. try to delay this resolution, having a vote, uh, presumably hoping that they wouldn't have to take this very public position against it. But the way that this works with the U.N. Security Council is that you have... Uh, all of these members that are on the Security Council, and in order for a resolution to pass the UN Security Council, you need nine votes in favor, and you cannot have any no votes or vetoes from any of the five permanent members. The United States, one of those five permanent members. So when we're looking at this 15-member council, the U.S. voting no, that minute was going to be dead on arrival. It won't go to the full UN, 193 members, to vote on this. For Palestinians, that means their hope of statehood, of an independent state, is even further from reach. This would not have meant that they were going to have a statehood and be an independent state, but it would have given a lot of validity to that push that they've been trying to get to for decades. For Israel, this is a moment where despite public disagreements between Netanyahu and Biden, Israel can look at this and say, we still have our top ally in our corner. So many countries voted to approve the statehood. We obviously voted not to. Has the White House reacted to this yet? Yeah, they have. So we heard on Air Force One from the National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby. He told reporters this, quote, we believe in a two 
two-state solution and a state for the Palestinian people. We believe the best and the most sustainable way to do that is through direct negotiations between the parties. That's echoing what we heard from the spokesperson of the State Department earlier today, where he said that direct negotiations need to happen between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. But the question moving forward is, when and how does that happen? Yeah. Because the Palestinian Authority, they control the West Bank, but they don't have full support of the Palestinian people. Hamas controls Gaza, and Netanyahu has been very clear that he does not support a two-state solution, saying after the terror attacks on October 7th that that is just essentially a non-starter for them. Right. They believe that it would be a win for Hamas and that it would further threaten Israel's security. And this may be a little bit of a problem or maybe a big problem for President Biden as he heads into the election because he's already felt the pressure from progressives in his party yeah. and from Arab Americans as well in places like Michigan and Pennsylvania. Yeah, I mean, when you look at that graphic that you had up, up earlier of who voted in favor of it, the countries that said yes, and then the countries that abstained, you have key U.S. allies like France, Japan, voting in favor of this resolution. Then you have another key ally like the U.K. abstaining from voting. Domestically, you have to look at that and you think President Biden is really on a global island of yeah. sorts in some ways. And the most pressure he's faced in terms of his position on the Israel-Gaza war is from within his own party. That is something that will probably be an issue for him politically moving forward because you have other key Western allies who made a very different decision than the United States did here. Ellis and Barbara on that breaking news from the UN. Ellis and we appreciate that. And as we mentioned, a stunning scene at Columbia University in New York City today as this vote came down. Police in riot gear at the request of the university president moving to clear an encampment of student demonstrators protesting the war in Gaza. Antonia Hilton is there as demonstrations continue tonight. Confrontation at Columbia today. Police removing protesters from campus. Citing extraordinary circumstances, Columbia University President Manu Shafiq called in the NYPD to clear an encampment of pro-Palestinian student demonstrators. The encampment set up Wednesday morning, the same day Shafiq testified on Capitol Hill about anti-Semitism on campus. We must uphold freedom of speech because it's essential to our academic mission, but we cannot and shouldn't tolerate abuse of this privilege to harass and, disc and, and discriminate. In a letter to the university community, Shafiq noted, protests have a storied history at Columbia, where anti-Vietnam demonstrators took over buildings on campus in 1968. But in asking for help from the police, she said, the encampment and related disruptions pose a clear and present danger to the substantial functioning of the university. We are risking like our academic standing just to like show the administrators that we are not okay with their decisions. Several demonstrators today stomping on an Israeli flag. Some students saying they feel unsafe on campus. I feel as though um, people are kind of weaponizing um, anti-Semitism. Demonstrators telling us they plan to keep their protests going despite the police presence. Do you feel like this administration has clamped down on students and faculty members' free speech? 100% yes, I do believe that. New York City's mayor tonight saying police made more than 100 arrests on a campus severely divided. Antonia Hilton, NBC News, New York. And fears continue to mount that the war between Israel and Hamas will explode into a wider regional conflict. The world waiting to see how Israel will respond to that large-scale aerial assault by Iran over the weekend. Tonight, in an exclusive interview with NBC News, a top leader of the Iran-backed militia, Hezbollah, says it is not seeking to get involved in the war, but if Israel strikes, it will strike back. Here's Matt Bradley with that interview. Tonight, as the world waits for Israel's response to Iran's massive aerial assault, the entire Middle East teeters on the brink of a region-wide war. The Iranian-backed militia Hezbollah vowing to match any escalation from Israel. Israelis have indicated that their response, which we're still waiting for, will likely not be against Iran itself. It could very well come against Iranian-backed groups like Hezbollah. In that case, are you prepared to respond? Are you prepared to escalate? If Israel attacks us and aggresses us, then we will definitely respond. If they escalate, we will escalate. In a rare and exclusive interview, Hezbollah's second in command, Naim Qasim, said the group is determined not to ramp up fighting unless Israel does first, faulting Israel and the U.S. for escalating the war. Israel's two-front war against Hamas and Hezbollah, both backed by Iran, is now in its seventh month. The war began with Hamas's attack on Israel on October 7th. 
Hezbollah stepped in the next day, attacking a disputed border region between Israel and Lebanon in what it described as solidarity with Hamas. We didn't expect that the war would last that long because we didn't think that Netanyahu was that foolish. Same for Biden and the other countries. Hezbollah claimed responsibility Wednesday for an attack that injured 14 soldiers in northern Israel. A response, they say, to Israeli strikes that killed two of the group's top commanders. Hundreds have been killed on both sides of the Lebanese border since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. Qasem defending Iran's decision to attack on Saturday night, which Iran says was in retaliation for an Israeli strike on Iranian military leaders at the country's consulate in Syria. Tehran speaks publicly and clearly. They do not want war and they have responded to the attack on their embassy and that's it for them. I think Iran is honest. This is what they told us and this is what they keep reiterating to the media. Like their patron state, Iran, Qasem said that Hezbollah is determined to avoid a broader war and will only ratchet up their attacks on Israel if the Jewish state escalates first. But American officials believe Israel may respond to Iran's aerial attack by striking militant groups like Hezbollah. What are you expecting Israel's attack to be? The Israelis are confused. They do not know whether to respond or not. And you want me to know what Israel will do? Do you think Israel doesn't have a plan right now? They do not have a plan, nor the courage, nor do they know what they will do. If they commit a mistake, then they're going to pay a high price for that. Do you think they're scared? They are 100 percent scared. They did not expect Iran to respond, and it did. But there are good reasons for fear. A single spark from this conflict could ignite the entire Middle East. In such a blaze, it would be hard for the United States to avoid getting burnt. All right, Matt Bradley joins us fresh off his interview from Beirut tonight. So, Matt, you asked what Hezbollah would do if Israel strikes. How concerned are they that they could be the target of Israel's retaliation against Iran? Yeah, well, Qasem told me that, you know, he doesn't think the Israelis actually know whether or not they're going to be attacking Hezbollah or whether they're going to be attacking anyone. He said that the Israelis are confused and scared. And Tom, I don't know if concerned is the right word. He said that, you know, when it comes to the path of jihad, when it comes to fighting against Israel, martyrdom is one of the only options and that there is no way to surrender. Tom? Matt Bradley for us tonight here on Top Story. Matt, we thank you. We want to turn now to the latest in the Trump hush money trial. Twelve jurors now seated to hear the case, plus one alternate. The accelerated selection came after the process appeared to suffer a serious setback when two previously selected jurors were dismissed from the case today. NBC's Laura Jarrett has the latest. Tonight, a full jury of 12 now sworn in in former President Donald Trump's hush money criminal trial after the day began with drama surrounding two jurors dismissed. The full jury now including an investment banker, security engineer, retired private wealth manager, speech therapist, physical therapist, someone in e-commerce, and a product development manager. I'm supposed to be in a lot of different places campaigning, but I've been here all day on a trial that really is a very unfair trial. The whole world is watching this New York scam. Mr. Trump arriving this morning with seven jurors sworn in, only to see that number quickly go down to five after an oncology nurse who had said during questioning that no one was above the law. I'm here to just hear the facts. Tell the judge today she had concerns she could not be impartial about Mr. Trump and worries about her identity becoming public after loved ones figured out she'd been impaneled. The other juror, an older IT consultant who had called the presumptive GOP nominee fascinating and mysterious in court Tuesday, excused today after prosecutors said he was arrested for tearing down conservative political ads decades ago and did not reveal it on his juror questionnaire. But late today, those additional jurors selected to serve, among them an investment banker who said he follows Mr. Trump's Truth Social posts and has seen quotes from his book, The Art of the Deal, but has not read it. The retired private wealth manager who said he does yoga every morning and that speech therapist saying of Mr. Trump, I tend not to agree with a lot of his politics and his decisions as a president, but said she can be impartial. At one point, a prospective juror even apologizing to the former president for her past criticisms of him on social media. She was dismissed.
Today's events underscoring the challenges of seating a jury in deep blue Manhattan, where 85% of people voted for President Biden. When the pool of 96 prospective jurors was asked this morning if they could be impartial in judging the likely Republican nominee, nearly 50 hands went up saying they could not and were dismissed. Kat was among them. I couldn't be impartial. It's a historical case and, you know, this is going to define so many things. Um, but at the same time, our job as a juror, right, is to be impartial. Mr. Trump sounding off about the jury selection process, writing he was given the second worst venue in the country. He's accused of doctoring his internal business records to hide a reimbursement payment to Michael Cohen, who allegedly paid off Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 election so she couldn't go public about an affair. Mr. Trump denies any sexual relationship with Daniels and has pled not guilty. And with that, Laura joins us tonight from Lower Manhattan. So, Laura, I know you have some new reporting about the witness list. Yeah, Tom, at the very end of the day, Todd Blanche, Mr. Trump's lead lawyer, asked the prosecution to provide the names of the first three witnesses that are expected to start to testify after opening statements. It's a typical courtesy you see in court a lot of times, but the prosecution here, Tom, said no. They said they're not going to do it because they're so worried about Mr. Trump posting about these people on social media. And Tom, get this, the judge agreed. He said, I can't blame them and I'm not going to order the people to turn those over. So they're going to go into court on the first day with the first witnesses not knowing who they are, Tom. Yeah, it speaks to the sensitivity of this case, but also how a lot of the people all around the country and the world are watching this. Um, Laura, walk our viewers through the sort of the timeline. What can we expect? The calendar, if you will. We know they're still looking for alternate jurors. They still have to do that. Do we know when uh, opening statements could start? That's right. So we have one alternate now sworn in and ready to go, but we still need about five more. The judge has said he wants six in total. You can understand why, given that two of the people who had been impaneled had to get dismissed today. So we will take up with more questioning of potential alternates in court tomorrow morning. And then opening statements in this case could begin as soon as Monday, Tom. Laura Jarrett reporting from Lower Manhattan tonight for us. Laura, we thank you for that. Next tonight in Top Stories Spotlight, before there was an indictment or a trial, there was a breaking news story. The investigation that led to the first criminal trial of a former president was prompted by a Wall Street Journal exclusive. The article, you see it right here, Trump lawyer arranged $130,000 payment for adult film star silence, broke in 2018 and detailed the arrangement of a $130,000 payment between Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels in exchange for her silence about an alleged affair with Donald Trump. And we are joined tonight by one of the reporters of that byline who won a Pulitzer Prize for his work, Michael Rothfeld. Michael is now an investigative reporter with The New York Times. And Michael, welcome to Top Story. Thanks. So I, I want to get your first thoughts, right? It's been six years since you broke the story, nearly a decade since the alleged affair happened. And now we're about to start the criminal trial. What are your thoughts? I mean, it's pretty mind blowing. Uh, as a reporter, you always sort of uh, are amazed when your stories have some consequences in the world. And, and this one, you know, uh, the consequences having been the first indictment of a former president, the first criminal trial of Donald Trump, maybe the only criminal trial before, you know, the election in uh, November. And, you know, you don't hope for any particular outcome. Right. But um, just to see that reporting play out over so many years since we first reported the hush money payment in 2018 is, is really amazing. And I think that's the operative phrase there, right? Over so many years. And I want to ask you, you know, the Justice Department had looked into this case, right? And we're going to get into that in a bit. The Manhattan DA's office before uh, Alvin Bragg had also looked into this, but they never pursued it, right? Yeah. And now we're about to start the criminal trial. Right. I mean, did you ever think that was going to happen? Uh, no, actually. I mean, I knew that Cy Vance, who preceded Alvin Bragg, was looking into this. And, and of course, we knew that the federal prosecutors were also looking into it, but they couldn't charge Trump uh, when he was president because of a Justice Department policy. And then afterwards, they really didn't want to use Michael Cohen as a witness because he had been convicted of crimes. He had lied. They had criticized him themselves in court papers, so they weren't going to do it. And then Cy Vance thought this case was either not serious enough or, you know, that was one of the main right. things. So you brought up Michael Cohen, and you bring up a question I have a lot for when we interview lawyers here and former district attorneys. How do you think a jury is going to perceive Michael Cohen with his history, sort of the, the, the way he carries himself, and what he told reporters, what he told authorities that turned out to be lies? 
Yeah, I think that is largely going to depend on how he performs on the witness stand. And he's very practiced. He's been on television a lot. He testified before Congress. And he's a, he's a smart guy. So he will be prepared to be attacked. Um, how he does will make the difference. But there, there's witnesses, uh, cooperating witnesses all the time in criminal trials yeah. who have criminal convictions, drug dealers, really bad people. And, you know, mob, mob hitmen, you know, yeah. become, uh, and, you know, so this is not unprecedented. Right. I want to, I want to go back in time if we can, and, and I was reading again your initial report. I'm going to put a piece of it up on the screen since we're talking about Michael Cohen here. In it, you guys write, this is a statement from uh, Michael Cohen. Um, he told you guys, this is now the second time that you are raising outlandish allegations against my client. You have attempted to perpetuate this false narrative for over a year, a narrative that has been consistently denied by all parties since at least 2011. Talk to me about the process in nailing down this story, because that was a tough cast of characters you had to deal with, and you guys I spent over a year working this? Right. Well, we first broke the story at the Wall Street Journal of Karen McDougal's hush money payment, or it was a non-disclosure agreement with the uh, National Enquirer. Actually, they bought the rights to her life story, and then it was a catch and kill. And then we knew Stormy Daniels at the time had been represented by the same lawyer as represented Karen McDougal, but we did not know, uh, you know, who had paid her off, if anyone had paid her off. So throughout 2017, we kept asking this cast of characters around Donald Trump, you know, Playboy models, porn stars, paparazzi, and towards the end of 2017, uh, we had a source meeting, and that, that source said, you know, think taxis. And, you know, Michael Cohen owned a lot of taxis. So we knew uh, that, you know, that meant that he had paid her off and that he had used uh, uh, an LLC, a shell company, to right. do it. And so then we had to search for the shell company and we poured through corporate records until we found one that had his name on it. And, Incredible. Uh, yeah. Incredible reporting. You know, after your reporting, after this all came out, Michael Cohen's office was raided. Um, this was part of the, the Mueller investigation. Federal agents raided his office. And, and I ask you this because do you think there's evidence that lawyers have, that, that the prosecutors have, that maybe the public doesn't know about yet, that, that we may be surprised in this case? I, I would like to know that. I mean, we, uh, you know, uh, Joe and I, who broke the Stormy story, wrote a book about this. We have extensively interviewed everyone. Yeah. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm really curious what, what more could come out. I bet there will be some new details. I doubt there will be many new details, but I'm sure we're going to hear from David Pecker. He was the publisher of the National Enquirer yeah. and associate of Trump's. He's never spoken publicly, so I'd love to hear what comes out of his mouth. Michael, having covered this case for so long, what's the one thing you're looking for in this trial? Um, I, well, I really want to see if Donald Trump testifies and how he's going to talk about these events, on how he's going to perform on the witness stand. And I really want to see how prosecutors are going to lay all this out. And just to see this all play out in a courtroom, um, this whole story that I've been covering all this time and whether it will result in the first conviction of a, of a former president or whether Trump can take this um, back to the campaign trail and say, hey, look, it's in, in, I was being persecuted here. All right, Michael, we thank you for your time and for all your reporting. Time now for Power of Politics and the family feud playing out in the 2024 campaign trail. More than a dozen members of the Kennedy family endorsing President Biden at a Philadelphia rally, even though their own relative, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., is running against him as an independent. Gabe Gutierrez is at the White House tonight with the latest. Today, with his opponents stuck in court, President Biden on the attack in battleground Pennsylvania. The 2024 election is about two fundamentally different visions of, for America. Donald Trump's vision is one of anger, hate, revenge, and retribution. The campaign touting the endorsement of 15 Kennedy family members, even though one of their own, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., is running against him as an independent. The best way forward for America is to reelect. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to four more years. Responding to his family's endorsement of his opponent today, RFK Jr. posted on social media, we are divided in our opinions, but united in our love for each other. The environmental lawyer and anti-vaccine activist first ran as a Democrat. Now, Kennedy's independent campaign is polling above 10% in a few key swing states, where Biden is also trailing Trump. Democrats are aggressively attacking third-party candidates like Kennedy, whom they view as a threat to President Biden's re-election, people involved tell NBC News. Though it's not clear which candidate, President Biden or former President Trump, would lose more votes to RFK Jr. 
Kennedy told NBC's Von Hillier this in February. I hope to draw equal numbers from both of them. I think at this point I'm probably drawing more from President Trump. All right, Gabe Gutierrez joins us tonight from the White House. And Gabe, I understand you have some new reporting on how this endorsement came about. Uh, yeah, Tom, a source familiar with the Biden campaign's planning says that the Kennedy family endorsement was months in the making and that it was the Kennedy family that came up with the idea and brought it to the campaign. And Tom. Gabe, I know NBC News has a bit of other reporting on the Kennedy Shanahan ticket with a bit of other news out there. Uh, not a great day for their campaign, but they received a financial boost in a very unique way. Yeah, that's right, Tom, and we're just learning about it through an FEC filing, but it turns out the day after she was announced as vice, uh, as a vice presidential candidate, Shanahan donated $2 million uh, to that campaign, and she had donated previously, but now that she is a candidate on the ticket, she can spend unlimited amounts of her own money. Tom? Okay, Gabe Gutierrez at the White House tonight. We want to switch gears now to a close call at Washington, D.C.'s Reagan National Airport. The FAA now investigating how two jetliners nearly collided on the tarmac this morning. Air traffic controllers scrambling to halt JetBlue and Southwest planes cleared onto the same runway. NBC's Emily Aketa has the story. A hair-raising moment today on one of America's busiest runways. Stop, stop, we're 2937, stop. An air traffic controller frantically telling a Southwest plane to stop. We stopped. We were cleared to cross runway four. After it was cleared to taxi across a runway at Reagan National in Washington, D.C. When calm, runway four, clear for takeoff. A JetBlue plane was about to take off, according to the FAA, but then also suddenly told to abort. And we're stopping at JetBlue 1554. A source says the planes came less than 1,000 feet of each other. Something went amiss causing uh, one controller to clear the airplane to take off and another ground controller clearing the Southwest Airlines to cross that same active runway. So to me, it looks like it's what the FAA calls an operational error uh, involving an air traffic control issue. After a string of near misses, an independent safety review found last year over time is at a historically high level for air traffic controllers and challenges, including staffing shortages, have caused an erosion of safety margins that must be urgently addressed. Tonight, the FAA reports serious runway incursions are trending down. Stop, stop, we're 2937, stop. Regarding the latest scare, both airlines say they're working closely with federal investigators to determine what went wrong. And Tom, you know, I mentioned how the FAA is ramping up its hiring process, but it says to improve safety, it is also taking a number of other measures, including introducing modernized simulators to help make the training process for all of those new hires more efficient. They're also exploring more advanced technology for the runway to help improve controllers' situational awareness, all in an effort to bring the number of serious close calls down to zero. Tom? Yeah, we hope so. Okay, Emily, thank you for that. Still ahead tonight, Brian Koberger's new alibi. The man accused of killing four University of Idaho students, claiming he could not have committed the murders in November of 2022. What his lawyers say he went on to a drive to do at the time of the slayings. Plus, the LAPD confirming Kanye West is a suspect in a criminal investigation, the charges he could be facing. And terrifying moments at a Taco Bell drive through an 11-week-old in the back of his mother's car, suddenly unable to breathe. You're going to hear from the employee who jumped into action and saved that baby's life. Stay with us.
have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Developing right now on Morning News Now. Growing frustrations over the migrant crisis. Reports of new drone attacks by Houthi militants. And the storm is creating dangerous conditions all across the region. Now let's get to some financial headlines. New rules are coming to cap credit card late fees. Talking tuition as a new class of freshmen gets ready to go to college. This is a big decision for families. Do you think this could impact how people vote? 100%. Morning News Now, streaming weekdays at 7. All right, we're back now with the latest on the Idaho College murders. Defense attorneys for suspect Brian Koberger filing an updated alibi in August. His lawyer said he had been out for a drive at the time of the murders, but couldn't give a specific time or place. Prosecutors arguing that was too vague, and a judge agreed. Dana Griffin has the latest claims from his legal team and the reaction from the family of one of his alleged victims. An alleged alibi revealed in the deadly stabbing of four University of Idaho students, Madison Mogan, Kaylee Gonzalez, Zana Carnodal, and Ethan Chapin. Brian Koberger's defense writing, Mr. Koberger was out driving in the early morning hours of November 13th, 2022, as he often did to hike and run and or see the moon and stars. The Gonzalez family telling NBC News in a statement in part, we are not sure why it has taken over a year for this to come out as these don't seem to be complicated activities. We believe that if this alibi had any weight, it would have been submitted months ago. It's the same defense the judge questioned last year. So No witnesses were included in the filing. Koberger's team will instead rely on analysis from a cell phone data expert. Could this help him or hurt his case? I think the defense had to file this notice of alibi. I think they know that it's a tough alibi. He's not arguing that he was hundreds of miles away in another state. He's not arguing that he simply wasn't in the area. It's essentially saying my alibi is I was in the area, just not specifically there. But last January, police say cell phone data showed Koberger was attempting to conceal his location. His phone was turned off from 2.47 to 4.48 a.m. that morning during the time of the murders. Koberger's phone also pinged 12 times near the victim's house months leading up to the slayings, prosecutors say. His DNA was on a knife sheath left at the crime scene, an affidavit noted. And records show Koberger changed his car title five days after the killings, days before his arrest. Koberger was stopped in Indiana on a road trip to Pennsylvania with his father, driving a white Hyundai Elantra, the same vehicle caught on surveillance near the crime scene. Mr. Koberger is standing silent. Uh, I'm going to enter not guilty pleas on each charge. The alleged murder weapon, a large fixed blade knife, has never been found. Dana Griffin joins us tonight from Los Angeles. Dana, this trial has already been delayed quite a bit. Do we have any idea when it's actually going to start? We don't, Tom. A trial date has not been set, much to the frustration of the victim's families. And based on dates that have been thrown around by the judge and prosecution, it could start sometime next year. Although the defense says other issues have to be dealt with before they even set a date. Now, in June, the judge will hear arguments on moving the case to a different county. And Tom, this is adding to the growing bill Idaho taxpayers are footing over this case. According to the Idaho statesman, this is already costing taxpayers a whopping $3.6 million. And the University of Idaho confirmed months ago this steep private security bill for the home turned crime scene is part of the reason they tore it down. Tom? Dana Griffin for us from Los Angeles. Dana, we thank you for that. Over here on this side of the country in Pennsylvania, a terrifying moment for one mom at a Taco Bell drive through With a baby's life on the line, an employee there springing into action just in the nick of time. NBC's George Solis spoke to that mother and the woman she's now calling her baby's guardian angel. A mother's worst nightmare caught on video. These are the heart-pounding moments Natasha Long realized her 11-week-old son was struggling to breathe while at a Taco Bell drive through just outside Philadelphia in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. I saw that he was turning blue, so I pulled him out of his car seat, and that's when I blacked out. I, I didn't know what to do. Here you see Long cradling baby Miles as she begins that desperate search for help. The tension building with each passing second. Baby Miles, who was born with a rare syndrome involving his breathing and airway, was unresponsive to his mother's touch. But the pair isn't alone for long. 
She was there right when I needed her. It was the wrong time, but the right place. Watch as seemingly out of nowhere, this good Samaritan rushes to her rescue. Like a guardian angel. Yes, absolutely. She, it was literally out of nowhere. I heard someone scream and then someone yelled and drive through, call 911, baby not breathing. So I threw my headset off and ran outside. The mystery woman taking charge. That's Taco Bell manager Becky Arba, who began performing life-saving CPR on the infant. What were you mm -hmm. telling Natasha to calm her down? I just kept saying, it's okay, he's fine, he's going to breathe, he's fine, he will breathe, he's totally fine. And she's like, I, I can't lose him. She didn't, thanks to Arba, who was able to get baby Miles breathing before paramedics arrived. <laughs> a mom of four herself, Arba said a similar experience with one of her own years ago had prepared her for a moment just like this. You don't want to be called a hero. No, Why? I'm just a mom helping a mom. I didn't do anything different from what anyone else should be doing. I knew how that was and I heard it and I felt it instantly and I had to go and help her because I knew it's painful. It's you're just so helpless as a mom when that happens. The two moms now friends and feeling forever bonded. I think I'm going to look back and be like, you know, oh my gosh, thank God Becky was there because <laughs> And I'm going to let Miles know exactly why Becky is Aunt Becky. Safe okay. to say that he has a friend for life? Absolutely. Baby Miles is doing a lot better, but we'll need at least one surgery to help improve his quality of life and hopefully prevent another scare like this one. Taco Bell also issuing a statement about their employees' heroic actions. The company saying they're incredibly proud. Back to you. All right, George Solis, great story there. When we come back, talk about a horrible boss. An employee at a Bay Area school district showed up to work to find this. His desk had been put on the roof. While he claims his supervisor did it to get back at him, and it's not the only allegation why his employees say he'll never get fired. We'll explain what's going on there. That's next. for the generation of now is NBC News Now. We are in a sea of strangers right now who are united by this moment. What does it make you feel inside to see this? It's like happy, like my heart beating is fast. I am so happy you guys got to experience this. All right, back now with Top Stories News Feed. Los Angeles police confirming to NBC News that Kanye West is the suspect in a battery investigation. West is accused of punching a man in the face multiple times. TMZ reporting West accused the victim of assaulting his wife, Bianca. This is not yet, this is not Ye's first run in with a battery investigation. He was cleared on charges last year after grabbing a photographer's phone and throwing it in the street. Okay, the FBI on high alert for threats to the Jewish community ahead of the Passover holiday. 
Director Christopher Wray speaking at an event hosted by Jewish community security officials. Wray saying the FBI is especially concerned of lone actors' attacks and that increased caution should be used at large gatherings and houses of worship. Wray also warning of state-sponsored threats from Iran. And how much do you think your city spends on its public toilets? Well, a newly opened public toilet in San Francisco's No Valley was originally going to cost the city 1.7 million bucks. You heard that right. The 150 square foot structure only holds a single stall and the price sparked major backlash among taxpayers. Two companies ended up donating materials and labor, so it ended up costing the city only around $300,000. Still a lot of money. Okay, we want to turn now to the bully boss. Have you ever felt pushed around by a supervisor? Well, this Bay Area employee says his boss put his desk on the roof after a disagreement, and he's just one of 10 people who have now filed complaints. But they say this bully boss isn't getting proper discipline because of friends in high places. NBC Bay Area investigative reporter Candace Wynn pushed for answers. This picture isn't the start of the story or the end, but it might be the last chapter in Jim Kesser's 30-year career as a maintenance worker at Antioch Unified School District. He says his new boss, Ken Turnage, waited until he was not at work to trash his desk and then direct multiple district employees to use this forklift to put his desk on a roof in the district's maintenance yard, where he works. Besides it, a sign that read Kessler's access and a ladder. I literally was in the emergency room the next weekend. Um, my wife said, you're having panic attacks, and I thought I was having a heart attack. Why do you think he put your desk on the roof? I asked that question a hundred times. At first, I thought, you know, he's bullying me for speaking out for a conversation we had a few months earlier where he asked me to do a job assignment. And I said, I'm open to doing, you know, whatever you ask me to do, but I just want to let you know because you're new. I'm not a mechanic and I'm not an electrician. And he literally blew up at me. When you say he blew up at you, wh he what happened? He blew up from zero to 60 in five seconds. It wasn't a joke. It was predatorial. It was bullying. Kim Atkinson is the school district's purchasing technician. She handles district dollars and says this was not an appropriate way to use public resources. We're a school district. Our money is for students. And we're spending money and employees' time and overtime to put a desk on a roof as a cruel bullying prank. Kesser and Atkinson are two of about 10 Antioch Unified employees who've reported turnage to the district. Ken Turnage is the school district's director of maintenance, operations, and facilities. He oversees everyone in the department, including these four who provided the investigative unit copies of their complaints against him. They say his behavior put three of them on medical leave for stress and convinced Bruce Cordemanche to retire early. I said, I honestly feel like you're disrespecting me. And he did his little shoulder thing and he says, oh, I respect you. And I said, okay, thank you, I appreciate that. He stomped behind his desk, clenched his fist, did his thing and he says, I don't respect you. I don't respect you at all. Oh, he's charged up on me, thought I was gonna be physically assaulted. I asked him where I could put my printer um, and I was told I could put it on the roof. We reached out to Turnage multiple times, but he didn't respond. I believe in ecological balance. He did speak with us back in 2020 during the height of COVID, right before he was removed as Antioch's planning commissioner for writing a lengthy social media post advocating for ending the shutdown and allowing the virus to kill off the weak and the elderly. Is it something I'm advocating to happen? No, but it's nature's course. Also on Facebook, photos that these employees say reveal a bigger problem. Why they believe 15 months after this roof incident, Turnage still hasn't been held accountable. He is best friends with Stephanie Anello's husband. Stephanie Anello is Antioch Unified Superintendent. She's shown here near Ken Turnage, along with her husband, Alan Cantando, Antioch's former police chief. Cantando and Turnage are pictured together outside of work over and over again in different locations. They go golfing together every weekend. They're golf buddies, barbecue buddies. I've seen them on the golf course. I golf. 
I literally saw him playing with Cantando and Stephanie Anello. We took the allegations that Anello is failing to discipline Turnage because of his friendship with her and her husband straight to her and her husband. After multiple emails and calls, we never heard back. But we did get this email from the district's HR director saying AUSD takes all matters concerning our employees seriously. As this is a personnel matter, there will be no further comment. We still wanted to hear from the district's top official. So we went to last week's school board meeting. I'm here to speak to Superintendent Anello. You have not directly responded to any of my calls or my emails. You have received numerous complaints about Kenneth Turnage. And I want to ask you, has he been disciplined? We can't talk about personnel. He is accused of putting one of his employees' desk on a roof using district resources. What was your reaction to that? Several employees feel he has not been properly disciplined because he has a close relationship to you as well as to your husband, a former Antioch police chief. How do you respond to that? These employees say the silence makes them more uneasy. Oh, I'm ready for complete retaliation. I'm scared what he's going to do to me. NBC Bay Area's Candace Wynn joins Top Story tonight. So, Candace, we're hearing that there's now a disciplinary meeting that was scheduled after your report aired. That's right. Just hours ago, the board president of the school board, he called me. He told me that he is now calling for a special meeting tomorrow. Board members will get together to talk about possible disciplinary and even possible removal action of a public employee. Now, right now, school officials can't specify who that employee is, but they told me it is a result of our report. Tom. All right, Candace Wynn tonight here on Top Story. Candace, we appreciate all your reporting. Coming up next, we're going to take you right into the future. The latest generation of the humanoid robot Atlas, looking like something out of a sci-fi movie, but its creators say it's going to be used to do some very real manual labor. The major automaker that's already hired that bot. That's next. for the generation of now is NBC News Now. We are in a sea of strangers right now who are united by this moment. What does it make you feel inside to see this? It's like happy, like my heart beating is fast. I am so happy you guys got to experience this. The NBC News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. All right, we're back now with Top Stories Global Watch and a tsunami alert in Indonesia as a volcano erupts on a remote island. Officials say the volcano has erupted several times, raising fears it could collapse into the sea, triggering that tsunami. Authorities closing a nearby airport and ordering more than 11,000 people to evacuate. So far, no injuries or deaths have been reported.
Police in southeast Germany have arrested two suspected Russian spies in the state of Bavaria. Authorities say the dual German-Russian citizens are accused of plotting bombing and arson attacks on U.S. military facilities in Germany in hopes of sabotaging aid for Ukraine. Prosecutors say they were in contact with a person linked to the Russian intelligence group. The Kremlin has not yet responded to those allegations. And bone fragments discovered by a child on a U.K. beach turning out to be an ancient fossil that's more than 200 million years old. Researchers now say the jawbone found by a girl and her father on a beach in Somerset in 2016 was from a, gi a gigantic marine reptile. They estimate it measured between 72 and 85 feet, which could have put in the ranks of one of the largest creatures on the planet. Okay, from ancient fossils to the cutting edge of technology, robotics company Boston Dynamic unveiling a new model of the Atlas robot, an electric upgrade of a robot we've seen dance and stumble throughout the years, this one even landing a job with a major car manufacturer. Stephen Romo has the nuts and bolts of this story. When the Atlas robot first arrived on scene in 2013, its futuristic humanoid look wowed tech enthusiasts all over the world. Over the years, Boston Dynamic releasing clip after clip showing the hydraulically powered bipedal robot running, dancing, and doing so much more, including parkour. But now, as that generation of Atlas goes offline, a brand new, fully electric version is rising to take its place. Every roboticist that I've spoken to about this thus far, they've all been incredibly impressed by just that really short video. This Atlas has a sleeker design, a new round head, and is stronger with a broader range of motion, according to the company. The movement and look immediately drawing comparisons online to the killer cyborgs from the Terminator movie franchise. But unlike Arnold Schwarzenegger's iconic character or this talking robot from UK company Engineered Arts. I'm good. Today I am doing drawing. The Atlas models aren't designed to simulate human interactions using AI, but are instead intended for manual labor. In fact, Atlas was originally created for a military research competition to be used in natural disasters. This latest evolution of Atlas will be tested in a real-world factory setting, partnering with Hyundai to continue improving its applications. Historically, what's happened here is new technologies come into different industries. They either replace or augment those jobs, and then new jobs are created around them. And this isn't the first Boston Dynamic robot to get a job. Their dog-like robot, Spot, is used by some police departments. This one used by Massachusetts State Police getting shot last month, which officers say may have saved a real dog or a human from getting a bullet. Robotics have been used in factories for decades, but humanoid robots are a new frontier. Agility Robotics, which already has a pilot program with Amazon, has its digit robot even doing hands-on tasks. Any package that you get delivered to you, to you at this point especially those from Amazon, has been touched by a robot at some point. Boston Dynamic has not yet said when Atlas will be available to buy. And for an average consumer, experts expect the cost to be out of reach. If I had to ballpark these kinds of robots, I would say we're talking, you know, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, probably a rental fee, but again, still out of most people's price ranges. All right, Stephen Robo joins us down in studio. Stephen, those robots, they're, they're just so incredible. Do we, I want to hone in on this a little more. Do we know what types of jobs we're going to do? I know you mentioned manual labor there. Yeah, something a lot of people are asking, it looks like this is geared toward the auto industry in particular. Uh, it's not clear exactly what these robots can do. We just have this 30, 40 second clip right now, but they are stronger and more agile than their predecessors. So it seems like they'll be able to do a lot. The company's saying they can tackle dirty, dangerous, and dull jobs, but Humans have those jobs right now. Another consideration in this new technology. Yeah, can they report or anchor the news? Do we know? No, we'll not find yet. out about that one. Yeah. All right, because we like you, Stephen. We, yeah. don't, want, we don't want to like see Atlas well. here. All right. <laughs> when we come back, Caitlin Clark fever. Since she was picked first in the WNBA draft, her jersey has sold out. Tickets for her first game with the Indiana Fever selling for three thousand bucks. The new rumors she could soon sign an eight-figure deal and get her own shoe. Can you guess the company? That's next.
Thanks for tuning in. I'm Gotti Schwartz. Here are the stories we're following tonight. Storms keep coming here in California. The U.S. government just declassified this video. A lot more stories trending like crazy on social media. A controversy pitting lawmakers against young voters. What's the state of crypto today? Is it safe for investors? We've got another mind-bending story on artificial intelligence. This is what my voice sounds like when I clone it. That wasn't me. You gotta see this. Stay tuned now. Weeknights at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on NBC News Now. All right, finally tonight, the Caitlin Clark fever is on. From ticket sales to jerseys, the WNBA's number one draft pick is turning up the heat in basketball, obsessed Indiana and across the country, really. As NBC's Guad Venegas reports, the rookie is already on a path to superstardom and could be one step closer to the deal of a lifetime. Check it out. The Indiana fever select... Caitlin Clark. After going to Indiana as the number one draft pick, Caitlin Clark's popularity is now reaching a fever pitch. She's just a great shooter overall, great player. She's a team player. I love that about her. The Athletic reporting the 22-year-old basketball star is nearing a lucrative eight-figure endorsement deal with giant Nike that would include a signature shoe, which would see her joining the ranks of sports legends like Michael Jordan, LeBron James, and Serena Williams. Please welcome Caitlin Clark. In Indiana, excited fans lining up to get their hands on number 22 merch. So I got the Clark Effect t-shirt, and then we got the hat from my dad because he wanted it. She's also shattering sales online. Sportswear retailer Fanatics says her Indiana Fever jersey is their top-selling jersey for a first-round draft pick ever and that they're already sold out. At times, like, it doesn't feel real. I don't know. I think the biggest thing, like, I try to remember is, like, how grateful I am to have this opportunity. Fans might also have to shell out some big bucks to see the star play. Some courtside tickets to the Fever home opener now listed for a whopping $3,000 on Ticketmaster resale. I expect, you know, big numbers this, this summer. And, um, you know, I think just people couldn't be more excited about where this organization is going. The Clark expected to dominate on the court and on the air. The WNBA announcing 36 of the Fever's 40 games will be streamed or broadcast nationally, the most of any team in the league. Here to comment is Caitlin Clark. Clark already crossing over into mainstream celebrity status with a surprise appearance on SNL. I am a fan, Caitlin, by the way. Really, Michael? Because I heard that little apron joke you did. <laughs> and magazines writing splashy articles about her life and boyfriend. But through it all, the Iowa native Clark says she's staying true to her roots. People might think I'm crazy for wanting to stay in the Midwest, but like that's just who I am. That's where my roots are. Um, I love the people here. All while giving confidence to a new generation of Indiana basketball stars. Kaylin Clark's like always been like a mentor to me because she's been really good at basketball and I want to be like her when I'm older. I will be looking for those Caitlin Clark sneakers. I can promise you that. Thanks so much for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Imagine you are at home at your uh, house with your kids and all of a sudden they can't breathe or somebody is trying to break in the backyard. You grab your phone, you dial 911, and you hear this. You may have difficulty reaching us internally. We're having difficulty receiving 911 calls as well. Well, that was a reality for people in not just one or two, but five states today. I'm Gotti Schwartz, and this is Stay Tuned Now. And tonight, we still don't know exactly how many 911 calls were unable to go through, but right now we are being told the outages which disrupted 911 calls in Nevada, in Texas, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Hawaii are now restored. All of it sending law enforcement officials scrambling for answers earlier today. As the FCC chairman says, a full investigation will be launched. Meanwhile, a spokesperson for a company called Lumen Technologies, which handles cloud services for 911 systems, says the outages in a few of those states was caused by, get this, a single light pole being installed and a line cut by a different company. Now let's bring in NBC News correspondent Priscilla Thompson to give us a, an update on all these outages. Priscilla, 
these four states and then Hawaii are very far away from each other. Are they all using the same systems here? Like, how, how does this happen? Yeah, Gotti, so some of them are. We know that three of those states, Nevada, South Dakota, and Nebraska, were all using Lumen Technologies, and that is the company that confirmed that there were outages to customers in those states because a third-party company, they say, had cut a fiber, and so that's what caused that. And as for the outage here in Texas, officials in Del Rio say that it may have been caused by a T-Mobile outage, that it wasn't an issue on any systems on their end and Lumen Technology saying that they don't provide those services here in Texas. Got it? Uh, so if you do get into a situation like this where you're calling 911 and I don't know, you're going to this, it's not voicemail, but some sort of uh, recording like this and you're terrified, what do you do? Yeah, so a lot of people were still able to get through by texting and officials say calling on an open line. Officials also sent out alerts and were able to send out alerts to a lot of t uh, people's cell phones um, warning them, but certainly scary stuff. But to give you a bit of perspective, officials in Sioux Falls, police there say that they were able to receive about 112 calls for service during that two and a half hour outage and that on a typical day when all of their systems are running at full capacity, Capacity, they would have received around 114 calls. So it's unclear how much of an impact it had in places like that, but certainly for people who were dealing with an emergency and having trouble getting through to 911, definitely some very scary stuff. Gotti? And what does this say about the infrastructure? I mean, does it seem like this, I mean, could it have been a cyber attack? I know that they're blaming a light bulb, blaming possibly a T-Mobile outage, but I, as this was going on, there were a lot of people talking online that this looked like a cyber attack or, or some sort of a hack. Have we completely ruled that out? Yeah, and to be clear, we have seen some cyber attacks on 911 centers in recent months and years, but law enforcement officials say that that was not the case here. They don't believe it was a cyber attack or any sort of malicious act here. And in fact, they said that in, that these things happen more often than people realize and that almost 100% of the time it is tied to some sort of technical glitch or technology glitch. But at the same time, you have a lot of folks who are speaking up today saying that this could be a a national security issue and it's certainly uh, something that we need to look at in terms of updating our systems because it's a huge problem that something like this was able to happen even if it is just a technical glitch and not perhaps something more malicious. Gotti? Yeah, it see, seems like technical glitches should not be an issue when you're talking about uh, seconds being the matter of life and death. Priscilla, yeah. thanks so much for joining us. Yeah. And as the world waits to see how Israel will counterattack Iran, the U.S. has slapped new sanctions on the Iranian regime targeting its missile and drone program. Now, these sanctions come as the Middle East has been on edge about Israel's response to Iran strikes earlier this week. Meanwhile, the Israeli-Iran tensions have refocused attention to Israel's border with Lebanon, where Iran's ally Hezbollah and Israel are also engaging in cross-border fighting. NBC's Matt Bradley sat down with one Hezbollah leader who says that he thinks that Israel is scared and confused. Matt? So this interview with Naim Qasim, the second in command of Hezbollah, it was both rare and extremely timely because right now the entire Middle East is waiting to see what Israel does in response to that volley of missiles and drones, about 300 of them, that were fired by the Iranians at Israel uh, on Saturday night. And so this entire region is on tenterhooks. Hezbollah, which this man, Naim Qasim, leads and second in command, could become very much in the crosshairs of what Ezra, whatever Israel does when or if it decides to respond militarily. We asked him exactly what he might expect from an Israeli response and whether or not he and his massive army of foot soldiers was frightened. Here's what he said. What are you expecting Israel's attack to be? Do you think Israel doesn't have a plan right now? Do you think they're scared? 
لم يتوقعوا أن ترد إيران وردت So you can chalk those comments up to bluster or bravado, but at the same time, he was very clear throughout his interview that Hezbollah and their main patrons, Iran, were willing to set aside their escalation, that they were going to try to hew to some kind of subdued engagement as long as Israel didn't escalate first. And now, again, we're waiting to hear what Israel does, and that could put Hezbollah and Iran and really the entire Middle East region in the crosshairs. It could really kill quite a few people because we're talking about several different countries, several different groups supported by the Iranians that would be fighting all against each other. This would be a humanitarian disaster. Bradley, appreciate your reporting there. A big story to tell you that's happening right now, right here in Southern California, and it is uh, causing this huge uproar after USC canceled a graduation speech by a pro-Palestinian bound Victorian. Take a look. We are joined together to let her speak. And hundreds of people there took to the streets, took to campus to demand that Muslim American Asna Tabassum be allowed to speak at commencement and honor she was given just a few weeks back. Since then, claims started coming out saying that Asna was connected to anti-Semitic posts on social media. The university quickly canceled the speech altogether, citing security concerns. But a lot of people, including Asna, are not buying it. NBC News correspondent Steve Patterson joins us now. Steve, so much emotion on the ground there today. What happened and, and what are students saying? Here's the brilliant thing about the demonstrations that we saw today. Besides what you just played, which is obviously people saying, let her speak. Well, the actual motion of the demonstrations were happening, about 200 to 300 people marching out, you know, beyond Tommy Trojan and sort of the iconic campus. They said nothing. They were silent. And that, that is so powerful because they're obviously responding to what they feel happened happened to Asna, that she was silenced. And so they do this loop, you know, it's about an hour or so with absolutely no talking. You can see some of the video, a lot of them wearing hoodies. That's what they were instructed to do. They were instructed not to talk to the media, not to say anything to anybody in protest. Uh, and I think that was a pretty powerful display of how they feel on campus. Got it. It feels like the decision to cancel this speech yeah. has just caused this uproar, made almost like a mountain out of something uh, that may or may not have resulted in uh, the similar uh, issue that we're seeing right now. What's the blowback? You have to wonder, Gotti, like, you know, the, the university's reasoning has been from the very beginning safety about, you know, concerns over being at the speech and making sure that their student body is safe. You have to wonder, to your point, whether or not this has caused more harm than good. This will lead to maybe even more demonstrations during the day. And the question is maybe, you know, do they feel some remorse about it? Are they willing to maybe take this back because of all the blowback that they're getting? Not just here, but really across the country. The answer appears to be no. Just a few moments ago, we got another statement from the university. They said, while the decision was difficult, it was necessary to maintain and prioritize the security of the USC community during the coming weeks and to allow these those attending commencement to focus on the celebration our graduates deserve. Nothing can take precedence over the safety of our community. So it sounds like here that they are doubling down, not reversing course. What do we know about the posts that are like allegedly at yes. the center of all this? So, okay, there's a couple of things, right? There's first of all, focusing on Asna herself. Mm -hmm. Apparently she had, most of her social media is private. Her Instagram was public. On her Instagram, she had a link to a pro-Palestinian website. The, the website doesn't appear to be super inflammatory, but apparently some of these groups that were on campus found some things that they didn't like. That is it. She hasn't really led any demonstrations as far as we know. She hasn't really been a part of sort of the, the pro-Palestinian movement on campus. The second thing, though, is what the university is citing, that there are social media conversations around her being the commencement speaker, and in that, they're worried that the tenor of those conversations is getting violent. The problem though, or maybe not even violent, just sort of uproarious, right? Like the, the verbiage around it is a little too much for the university when they're concerned about safety. The problem is they haven't cited any specific instances. Like we've asked, the local, our local affiliate has asked, number of reporting outlets have asked like, okay, you're saying that people are in danger. Can you point to a specific instance? Can you point to a post? Can you tell us where to find this? 
To our knowledge, that hasn't been done yet. And I think that's where the anger is coming from. You can say, OK, we're worried about safety. Then tell us what to worry about. What is the specific threat? If there is one, we don't know. Meanwhile, her face and name is out there that's everywhere. It. Steve Patterson, thanks so much. And Ukraine is still losing ground against Russia almost every day. Today, Ukrainian rescue crews finished searching for bodies after that missile attack in Cherniv that killed 18 people and hurt 78 others yesterday. Ukraine's prime minister saying they are running out of bullets and artillery and the U.S.'s support. These difficulties which we have, have on the front line are connected only with lack of ammunition. So number one priority is artillery ammunition. We need support for yesterday, not for today or tomorrow, for yesterday. And we hope that it will bring us immediate a sub support from the United States. And then we will have a chance to win this war. OK, and then that brings us to a fight on Capitol Hill, which is kind of like deja vu. House Republicans are arguing with each other once again about aid to Ukraine while threatening to give their latest speaker the boot also again. Speaker Johnson says he has decided to move forward with a vote on a $95 billion foreign aid package that would go towards helping Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan, a move that is making some far-right Republicans very mad, including Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. Take a listen. The Republican speaker is hinging his entire um, uh, ability to stay speaker on sending 60 more billion dollars to Ukraine. I can't think of a, a worse betrayal ever to happen in, in United States history. All right, so NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ryan Nobles joins us now. Uh, Ryan, what does all this infighting between Republicans boil down to? I just heard her talking about 60 billion. And, and also, didn't we just see Johnson implying that the former president, president or former President Trump has his back? Like, what's going on? Yeah, you know, Gotti, I think it's important to keep this in context. Uh, when we talk about Republican infighting when it comes to the issue of Ukraine, there is a very small but very loud minority of the most far-right Republicans who are insistent that Ukraine aid never even come up for a vote. And that's the important part of this, right? Never even come up for a vote. Why are they trying to block it from even coming up for a vote? Because it will pass overwhelmingly. So they need to raise the stink at this stage of the debate because they know that if it gets to a vote, it will pass. And it will pass with a majority of both Republicans and Democrats. And the most prominent Republicans all believe that this is a necessary step. Listen to what the Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell had to say about it on the Senate floor. If you think the fall of Afghanistan was bad, the fall of a European capital like Kyiv to Russian troops will be unimaginably worse. And if stalled American assistance makes that outcome possible, there's no question when the blame, where the blame will end on us. And so, Gotti, it's important to keep in mind that this will likely become a reality, especially now that Speaker Johnson uh, believes that this is a necessity, something that he's willing to stake his job on. And, and any other normal Congress uh, where there is a Republican majority, uh, there is a Democrat minority, the ability of just one or two members to try and threaten the Speaker of the House just wouldn't exist because there would be enough of a cushion for that Republican leader to exert his power when it comes to the conference. Mike Johnson just doesn't have that. That's why he has to listen to even just a small group that are upset with one piece of legislation. This time around, he's decided to just go for it, whether or not they come for his job or not. And Ukraine has made it clear that they need the U.S.'s help yesterday. So, so what happens with this aid package? What are we going to see on day one? So this is the timeline, Gotti. Uh, we're still waiting on the House to take its first procedural step, which will likely require Democratic help right out of the gate. But the Speaker has said that he's going to give his members 72 hours to review this legislation before they vote on it. 
We're looking at a vote perhaps on Saturday. Once it passes through the House, it will then go to the Senate. And there will be a process in the Senate as well. It could take several days in the Senate for a number of reasons. First, even one senator can slow down the process there. And there is likely going to be some Republican senators that do that. But we're also going to run into the Passover holiday, the Jewish holiday, uh, of which there are many members who are observant. So it could be a scenario where we're looking perhaps the middle of next week uh, when this legislation passes. If it it uh, goes along uh, the route that we expect it to and then signed into law. As you ri rightly point out, that's probably later than Ukraine would like to have seen that aid, but it will allow them the opportunity to get these desperately needed resources as soon as possible, perhaps as soon as next weekend. Sounds like it's going to be a very busy weekend this weekend. Ryan Nobles, thanks so much. And don't go anywhere. We are just getting started. Up next, a jury has been seated in the trial against Donald Trump, but it was a roller coaster of a process. Angela Sinandella will be here in a moment to help us break it down. Plus, a Maryland teenager is under arrest tonight for allegedly planning a school shooting. We've got the details, including a very alarming manifesto. And later this hour, we're going to introduce you to a guy who is connecting people through nature and using the outdoors to create community in Los Angeles. That's all ahead. So stay tuned. I was able to take a step back and really understand that, you know, what really is going to fulfill me moving forward in my life is like helping people find this attachment and, and relationship with nature. from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Tonight, top story reporting from Baltimore at the Key Bridge disaster. When you look over your shoulder and you see the Key Bridge, what goes through your head? That bridge has been here longer than I've been alive. It still doesn't feel real. Hundreds of Israelis have gathered to demonstrate. What do the people in Gaza, do you think, what do they need most? A place where Palestinians and Israelis have found common ground. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hey, welcome back. Jury selection in Donald Trump's trial is moving right along, and we've got the latest developments for you in just a bit. But first, here's some other headlines we're watching tonight. More than a dozen members of the Kennedy family met up in Philadelphia today to formally endorse their pick for president, and it's not one of their own. Nearly every single grandchild of Joe and Rose Kennedy supports Joe Biden. That's right, that's right, the Kennedy family endorses Joe Biden for president. In a post on X, independent candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. said he was pleased to see that his siblings and family are politically active, even though they may be divided in their opinions. And a DA's office in Memphis is deciding not to proceed with a murder charge for a 17-year-old in the fatal shooting of a Memphis police officer. Officials say they have obtained information that shows the officer was killed by friendly fire. The 17-year-old is charged with attempted first-degree murder still and assault against a first responder. And a black inmate in Georgia has filed a federal lawsuit accusing a guard of choking him with a chain and making a racist comment. 
This follows the release of new surveillance video, and the suit says that three other officers, quote, had a duty to intervene and stop the 2022 assault, but instead did nothing. A lawyer for the guard who no longer works for the department said he had no comment beyond that lawsuit. Trader Joe's is recalling the brand Infinite Herbs Packaged Basil because of a salmonella outbreak. There's been at least a dozen reports of people getting sick, and one person had to be hospitalized. The head of the company is urging people to check out their freezers and throw it out if they find it. And Dickie Betts, a guitarist and member of the Allman Brothers Band, has died. His manager telling Rolling Stone magazine he died from cancer and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Betts helped define the Southern rock genre of the 60s and 70s. He was 80 years old. And it is day three of Donald Trump's criminal trial in New York. And so far, it seems to have two speeds, either lightning fast or super slow-mo. And today we saw both. The entire 12-person jury has been seated, but this election was not without its twists and turns by this afternoon. The court had actually lost two of the jurors that were seated on Tuesday, bringing the total down to five. But then after four o'clock in the afternoon, several, uh, seven jurors, in fact, and one alternate were all selected. And next up is picking the five remaining alternates that comes tomorrow. Joining us now is NBC News legal analyst Angela Sinandella. Angie, thanks so much for being with us. Uh, so we know the jury is seven men, five women. Uh, what else do we know about them? So we know their professions. We know that we have attorneys, a banker, a wealth manager, a speech therapist. I mean, like a cosmopolitan view of Manhattan, I mean, there are a lot of professionals here. But beyond that, what I think is most interesting is that we also know there are members of this jury panel who actively dislike Trump and don't think he's necessarily a good person. So here the judge decided that mm. that didn't matter. He was still going to allow these people to be a part of the jury, even if they didn't like his persona. And I think here that shows the judge's commitment to really move this trial along. There was so much concern here that this jury selection process could take weeks and could just stretch on. But he said that that was not enough of a reason to dismiss a juror. So at that point, we have people on this jury who have explicitly said that they don't like Trump, Gotti. Uh, so when it comes to those that were dismissed, uh, the two jurors that were dismissed that were seated, uh, what happened there? So both for different reasons, one per that juror's request herself and the other per the prosecutor's request. So the one first one went to the judge and said that she didn't necessarily feel safe. There was a security risk because she felt that parts of her, her identity were already leaked. And at that point, the judge admonished the media. But look, at the point at which any juror comes to the judge and says, I feel there is a security concern with me being on the jury, that is automatically a good reason to allow that juror to be excused if she wishes. Now, the second juror, it turned out that after some research, what she said was different from reality and that she had previously been arrested before when in this questionnaire through the process, she said she had never been arrested. So based on that discrepancy, the judge dismissed her as well. So those two are gone. And look, it's likely that more will be gone. That's why the judge here is looking for a deep pool of six alternates. And one alternate has been chosen. So five alternates remain, Gotti. And Angela, Trump quoted a Fox News host on Truth Social a little while ago uh, saying, quote, they are catching undercover liberal activists lying to the judge in order to get on the Trump jury. Uh, OK, so we, we saw the judge come down pretty hard on the former president for muttering, uh, saying something like uh, he wouldn't have his jury intimidated. Then, then we see this post today. What do you think the judge is going to do here? So I think the judge is wondering what he is going to do, because this is such a hard call. First of all, I am sure that Trump had his lawyers vet this before he put it out, because this is a type of tweet here where he is not necessarily even using his own words. He is just quoting someone who many mm. people in this country respect. So it's not clear there that it's an absolute violation, that it automatically would just go against this gag order. But I also think Trump intentionally is towing the line now before any sort of real admonishment or punishment comes. Because let's say on Tuesday, after this hearing of whether or not he has violated the gag order, the judge decides, well, look, we're going to fine you X amount of dollars. And next time you do it, we're going to throw you in jail. So right now, there's not the real threat of what will happen next. So he and his lawyers are towing that line where nobody knows, Gotti, does this really violate, does it not? Only the judge will decide.
A Angela, you had me until you suggested that the former president went to lawyers, said, is this post okay? And then posted it, but we shall see. <laughs> we shall see. <laughs> Angela, thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> And turning now to a Florida man going up against letting the satanic temple send volunteer chaplains into public schools. And that Florida man is Governor Ron DeSantis saying the satanic temple isn't a real religion. Let's all think about this. We're not playing those games in Florida. Uh, that is not a religion. That is not qualifying to be able to participate uh, in this. So we're going to be using common sense uh, when it comes to this. So you don't have to worry about that. Okay, but here's the thing. Technically, the Satanic Temple is classified as a church by the IRS, established 11 years ago to, quote, uh, fight a perceived intrusion of Christian values on American politics, and they are looking to take advantage of the law that was just signed by DeSantis that lets religious chaplains come in and help volunteer at public schools. So what's going to happen now? Probably a bunch of legal stuff in court. So let's bring in NBC News correspondent Marissa Parra. Marissa, uh, is this going to be a satanic legal rock and a Florida hard place or, or what? Potentially, Gotti. I have to first point out this is the most Florida story. That, this is as Florida as it gets. You have a showdown, potentially, between the state's governor and the Satanic Temple. So if you ask Governor Ron DeSantis, as you just heard, he feels pretty confident that there will not be a showdown because he says the Satanic Temple isn't a religion to begin with. But if you look at the words from uh, the bill's sponsor to begin with, this is a Republican senator. She lives in Fort Pierce, and she herself expressed concerns about the possibility of what the the Satanic Temple could do inside of schools, saying that this is something that could potentially be an issue because of First Amendment religious freedom rights. So it really depends on, on who you talk to, of course, here. Uh, but that would potentially be the next chapter here, Gotti. This being taken to the courts, we already know the Satanic Temple says that they will take this to the court for uh, discrimination, religious discrimination specifically. And they say that they're confident the Constitution is on their side, calling DeSantis's words, quote, empty grandstanding. They put out this whole statement earlier today saying that basically him signing this bill into law is an invitation for satanic chaplains in public schools and quote for him to claim otherwise is either an unintentional lie or an intentional lie or evidence of his total and complete ignorance regarding the limits to his authority end quote mm. so they say oh. they're going to move forward with training their satanic chaplains and uh, preparing them to place them into public schools but it's important to note here Gotti, at the end of the day uh the schools would have the final say on who gets to do so. But I, I will also point out that, you know, as you mentioned, part of the Satanic Temple's mission, part of this might also be a point to the Christian governor that if you're going to open the doors for religious figures, for religious chaplains to go into schools, well, it's not going to just be Christians who can take advantage of that. So we'll see what happens here, Gotti. Uh, Marissa, you were just talking about how they are pointing uh, to the Constitution. DeSantis, earlier today, he was pointing to the Founding Fathers, saying they didn't intend discrimination against religion. I guess the bottom line is, like, who decides what is a religion in the United States of America? Is it, is it the IRS? Is that, like, the, <laughs> is that the, the, the final say? And, and what kind of legal problems are we going to see down the road here? It's a great question. My college philosophy class did not prepare me for this. Uh, we didn't cover this in my college philosophy classes. Do tax exempt, does a tax exempt status uh, hold up in the court of law when it comes to church? I'm not sure. I think we're all going to find out, Gotti. But I will point out that in terms of critics of this bill being signed into law, we know that there have been a lot of open letters signed by chaplains, signed by um, not just religious groups, but civil rights groups. The ACLU has been very active and outspoken against this for a while now. Part of what they said in March is they had a lot of concerns saying that they feel like this violates students' religious freedom rights. They say this opens the door to evangelizing students and forcing religion on them. And they also raised concerns about the fact that they feel like there's not enough credentials and training required for these volunteer chaplains. And Gotti, I will point this out as well. Texas passed a law, this was last year, allowing chaplains to go into public schools. This was last year. And since then now, we have had 14 states, including the state of Florida, who have opened legislation. Florida becoming the very latest to sign this bill. 
bill into law, potentially not the last that we'll see this year. And of course, a whole lot of questions that come with that. Gotti? Yeah, very interesting story from our favorite Florida woman, Marissa Parra. Thank you so much. <laughs> And coming up, the LAPD are looking into whether Kanye West was involved in an alleged battery incident. We've got those details, but first, you gotta see this. A parent's worst fear is not being able to help their kid in a medical emergency, but luckily for this Pennsylvania mom, Taco Bell manager Becky Arbaugh was able to jump into action. In this drive through video, you can see the mom panic when her baby stops breathing. Becky runs out and is able to successfully perform CPR on the baby, and after doing compressions, baby Miles he finally started breathing again. Becky actually had a similar experience with her own daughter, so she knew exactly what to do. And while a lot of locals are calling her a hero, Becky claims she just happened to be at the right place at the right time. That's what heroes always say. Talk about being saved by the bell. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. Angelinos know there is a major shortage of cops on the streets these days, and Lester Holt has more on that in just a second. But first, here are some of the other stories happening out west that we're following right now. Police in Los Angeles say they are looking for Ye, the rapper formerly known as Kanye West. They say he might have been involved in an alleged battery and was gone by the time cops arrived. Now, police, uh, the victim, an unidentified man, told police Ye punched him in the face a bunch of times. Ye's team says the incident happened after his wife, Bianca Sensori, was allegedly physically assaulted. And for the first time in months, the city of Denver did not offer housing after sweeping up a homeless camp this week, but now a new camp has popped up just we are just blocks away. It is a big blow for the major mayor's homeless strategy, which has promised shelter to those affected. And Idaho's largest school district, they are switching to a four-day school schedule. Trustees of the Nampa School District voted in favor of the change earlier this week. The new school schedule will start this fall, and teachers will be able to use the fifth day, a non-student contact day, to plan and prep for classes. And a Maryland teen has been arrested for allegedly plotting a mass shooting at their high school. The plans carefully detailed out in a 129-page manifesto, saying things like, quote, it would bring me a lot of joy and satisfaction to kill, and I have also considered shooting up my former elementary school because little kids make easier targets. NBC News correspondent Yamish Alcinder has more. 
Well, it's a striking situation here tonight where 18-year-old Alex Yee is charged with making a threat of mass violence. Now, this all really centers around a 129-page document. Yee says it's a work of fiction, but a number of people said that this is really a memoir, even a manifesto. That's how police describe it in the charging documents here. And there are a number of really disturbing writings here. Um, he writes about, again, this is supposed to be a work of fiction, but he writes about the fact that he wants to shoot up high school, says at one point that he wants to target an elementary school because it might be easier to target elementary school students. He also writes about committing suicide by cop and, uh, and shooting students as well as shooting others. Um, now, we should note that Yi was actually in a psychiatric facility um, and was being housed there because he had suicidal and homicidal thoughts. Um, so it's a really striking situation here. Now, police have been investigating this for more than a month. They executed a search warrant, also searched his Gmail where they found this document. At this point, we're looking at Yi being held in custody. He's awaiting a bond hearing. Now, his father told police that he was not concerned about his son's mental health status. In fact, he said he was aware that his son had been writing what he called a novel, but he said that he actually had never read the document. So that's what the family is saying here. He is, again, adamant that this is a work of fiction, while police, of course, are taking this very, very seriously. The Montgomery County Public Schools have also said that this is an extremely, this is an extremely serious charge. So everyone here in this situation are really taking this seriously as this continues to unfold. Amish, thank you. Back here in LA, all of us are feeling the strain from what is being called a chronic shortage of officers. And NBC Nightly News anchor Lester Holt spoke with the LAPD's interim chief about how he's addressing that problem. The LAPD has long been considered one of the most understaffed major city police departments in America, making the current staffing crisis all the more troubling for the top brass. Chief, is it fair to say you are severely understaffed absolutely recruitment now a critical issue for interim police chief dominic Choi. among the three largest cities chicago and new york have about twice as many cops per capita while los angeles is far more vast i think if we had about twelve thousand, we would be um, well staffed and as of last monday we are at eight thousand eight hundred and thirty two that's the lowest staffing level at the lapd in more than two decades and it's having a direct impact on the department's ability to police has the shortage of police officers simply made it harder to respond to, to certain types of calls i think it's made it more difficult to respond to all types of calls where we're seeing some slippage is our non-emergency calls We've seen that number go from an average response time of about 20 minutes upwards to uh, 40 minutes up to an hour. Calls like this one, where a group of mass suspects use power tools to cut through the security door and safe at the Siete Mares restaurant in Boyle Heights, with the suspects taking off. Everybody was on edge. With no arrests made, Tanya Diaz and her family, who've owned this restaurant for decades, say the neighborhood feels less safe. There's not as many cops out in the streets anymore, so we got hit, and then a couple weeks later, another restaurant got hit. While violent crime trended down in 2023, property crimes were up, a revolving door of repeat offenders taking a toll on morale. I understand the frustration uh, that an officer works so hard to put somebody in jail because of criminal behavior, and then that person is walking out the door before they can finish their reports. That is frustra frustrating, it's demoralizing. Law enforcement agencies nationwide are feeling the crunch with unprecedented declines in police staffing since 2019. In a recent report, the Department of Justice calling it a historic crisis, saying departments are losing officers faster than they can hire new ones, citing labor market competition, officer safety and well-being, and increased tensions between police and the communities they serve. It affects the ability of the agency to even respond to relatively low-level um, concerns, but that are high quality of life concerns for the communities. To entice new recruits, the LAPD recently negotiated pay increases. New full-time officers can now make nearly six figures, about the same starting salary for a computer engineer graduating from the University of California system. Not everybody thinks a lot, a lot of police officers are a good thing. There, there are those voices out there um, that say this money could be used 
in a more efficient way. What's your response to that? I'm an absolute supporter of alternative response. So there are certain calls that I believe that police don't need to respond to. To the people that think less cops are okay, um, I, I have to disagree. At the end of the day, you have to have a safe community. Lester Holt, NBC News. Lester, with such important reporting. Thank you so much, Lester. Still to come, we are keeping a close eye on that massive volcanic eruption in Indonesia and the concerns over a possible tsunami. We've got those details and some other stories trending around the world, so stay tuned. lives in the now. The front lines are still very active. This is like quicksand. And officials say an entire town is cut off. This close to actually understand why people had to jump in the ocean. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. The NBC News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. Hey there, welcome back. Let's take a quick look around the world. An airport in Indonesia near a volcano that erupted five times has shut down for 24 hours. Officials say it's because of the dangers of spreading ash, falling rocks, and the possibility of a tsunami. Mount Rung's dramatic eruption started yesterday. More than 800 people have been evacuated from that area. And people in Colombia are facing some pretty extreme conditions right now. Reservoirs there are drying up and people are having to ration water. In the capital city, Bogota, mandatory rations were put into place last week. The El Nino weather cycle is apparently behind this as drought has led to forest fires, pushing reservoirs to their lowest levels in decades. And Dubai, they are still recovering from those heavy floods and record rainfall from this week. People there have lost their homes and they're still wading through water. Emergency crews are working to clear out some of the flooded roads using fire trucks to pump the water out. This has been the heaviest rainfall the Gulf state has experienced in the last 75 years. Meanwhile, over in Brazil, there is growing resistance for a plan to drill in the Amazon rainforest. Indigenous groups and some government agencies have been fighting against this for, a pa for the past few years. And there's an energy firm there that is planning a so-called exploration project that would open Brazil's northern coastline to drilling. The company was denied a license, but is now appealing, creating even more backlash. And women in Idaho are struggling to find medication for things like miscarriages or inducing labor. And that's because these meds can also be used in medical abortions. The Supreme Court allowed Idaho's criminal abortion back, uh, ban to take effect back in January, but agreed to hear an appeal later this month. And NBC News medical reporter Erica Edwards has more. Can you give me a high five? Children were part of Kristen and Lauren Colson's plan from the beginning. We always knew that we would have a family. But it hasn't been easy. In January, the Boise, Idaho couple miscarried for a fifth time. We were hoping to see a heartbeat, and on ultrasound, we saw that um, I had a non-viable pregnancy. Kristen's doctor wrote her a prescription for misoprostol, a drug that causes the uterus to contract 
helpful during a miscarriage, which is the spontaneous loss of a pregnancy and can take weeks for the body to complete on its own. Everybody processes grief differently, but for me, I, um, I like to have a plan. Choosing to use the medication, I can time when this happens. Misoprostol can also be used during a medication abortion, a deliberate termination of a pregnancy. That's why Kristen believes her Walgreens pharmacist refused to give her the drug. I was in shock, confused, um, dealing with this miscarriage. They told me that they didn't feel comfortable filling the misoprostol prescription at that dosage. Idaho's Defense of Life Act went into effect in 2022 after the U.S. Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade. The state's law says that every person who performs or attempts to perform an abortion could be committing a felony punishable by a sentence of imprisonment up to five years. The law isn't clear whether a pharmacist is committing a felony for dispensing the medication. The threat of jail time is a real worry for pharmacists like Matt Murray. Once you see a prescription for misoprostol, you now a little alert goes off in the back of your head that says, well, maybe we need to make sure what this is used for. Is this frustrating to you? It's frustrating and it, it takes time away from other things that, that we need to do. But ultimately the fear is that people aren't getting the medical care that they're needing. Pharmacists are understandably scared by these incredibly strict abortion laws that have been enacted, and they are afraid that they might be charged with a felony simply for doing their job. Allison Tanner, senior legal counsel at the National Women's Law Center, says since the Supreme Court decision, they've heard from a number of women who say they were denied access to legally prescribed medications, including misoprostol. Pharmacists were afraid about the new lay of the land under the law. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has investigated complaints against some pharmacies, including Walgreens, which HHS says have been resolved. In a statement, Walgreens says it'll accommodate team members whose beliefs conflict with selling certain products and make sure another pharmacist can fill the prescription. Kristen's doctor was able to transfer her prescription to another Walgreens that filled it. In Boise, I have other options and access to other pharmacies, and that may not be the case for, for a lot of people that went through what we went through across the state. Now, before we go, a look at some wild adventures helping us get a little closer to nature. And even in a big city like Los Angeles, oh my gosh, you don't want to miss doing a cold plunge. And if you are like, no, no, thank you, I don't, don't worry. We'll do it for you. Stay tuned. Oh, Elsa, you, you ice queen. Okay.
Hey, welcome back. Tonight, in the future of everything, we are looking at robots who can do a lot more than just dance. But first, let's turn to Google real quick, where the company uh, today fired 28 employees for protesting the company's billion-dollar contract with the Israeli government. Now, this comes after the arrests of nine workers Tuesday after a sit-in at the company's offices, including one at the Google Cloud CEO's office, where banners read, no more genocide for profit. And you've heard of ChatGPT, but what about Meta AI? Meta's artificial intelligence assistant is now rolling out across WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, and Messenger. And like OpenAI's tool, Meta AI can answer questions and generate images. And we can also expect to see some funky AI-generated GIFs soon, apparently. And remember those humanoid robots we talked so much about? The ones that were cool looking and also creepy looking at the same time. They were dancing, they were doing parkour, they were doing flips, all kinds of stuff. They were the Atlas robots. Well, this is not an Atlas robot. This is like the next generation that Boston Dynamics has put out, getting up in the creepiest way possible. And they are teaming up with a major car manufacturer, Hyundai, and NBC correspondent Steve Robo has, well, the nuts and bolts. Yeah, Gotti, we've seen clips of that original Atlas for years now, running, dancing, even doing parkour. Well, now that version is set to retire, and it's time for the new generation to rise. When the Atlas robot first arrived on scene in 2013, its futuristic humanoid look wowed tech enthusiasts all over the world. Over the years, Boston Dynamic releasing clip after clip showing the hydraulically powered bipedal robot running, dancing, and doing so much more, including parkour. But now, as that generation of Atlas goes offline, a brand new, fully electric version is rising to take its place. Every roboticist that I've spoken to about this thus far, they've all been incredibly impressed by just that really short video. This Atlas has a sleeker design, a new round head, and is stronger with a broader range of motion, according to the company. The movement and look immediately drawing comparisons online to the killer cyborgs from the Terminator movie franchise. But unlike Arnold Schwarzenegger's iconic character or this talking robot from UK company Engineered Arts. I'm good. Today I am doing drawing. The Atlas models aren't designed to simulate human interactions using AI, but are instead intended for manual labor. In fact, Atlas was originally created for a military research competition to be used in natural disasters. This latest evolution of Atlas will be tested in a real-world factory setting, partnering with Hyundai to continue improving its applications. Historically, what's happened here is new technologies come into different industries. They either replace or augment those jobs, and then new jobs are created around them. And this isn't the first Boston Dynamic robot to get a job. Their dog-like robot, Spot, is used by some police departments. This one used by Massachusetts State Police getting shot last month, which officers say may have saved a real dog or a human from getting a bullet. Robotics have been used in factories for decades, but humanoid robots are a new frontier. Agility Robotics, which already has a pilot program with Amazon, has its digit robot even doing hands-on tasks. Any package that you get delivered to you, to you at this point, especially those from Amazon, has been touched by a robot at some point. Boston Dynamic has not yet said when Atlas will be available to buy. And for an average consumer, experts expect the cost to be out of reach. If I had to ballpark these kinds of robots, I would say we're talking, you know, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, probably a rental fee, but again, still out of most people's price ranges. Now, as for that manual labor, it's not clear exactly what this robot will be capable of. We only have that short little clip of it right now. But the company is saying that it is stronger and more agile than its predecessor. So it seems like it'll be capable of quite a lot. Of course, this seems to be geared toward the auto industry right now. The company is saying it will be able to tackle dull, dangerous, and dirty jobs. But those jobs right now are being held by humans. Another thing to take into consideration when we celebrate this new technology. Gotti? Uh, Steven, thank you.
You know what we need some of right now? We need some nature, so let's talk about it. But it's not easy to connect with nature when you're in a big city like Los Angeles here. That's where this guy, Michael Washington, comes in. We want to introduce you to him. Here is the story of one man who is helping his community find that oh-so-important nature connection. For Michael Washington, the outdoors have always been a way of life, a lifestyle he thought he'd have to abandon when he left Colorado for Los Angeles to pursue a career in music. I didn't understand that you can't have a connection to the outdoors while living in a major city. For 10 years, music was the focus of his life. I loved studying music. I loved the idea of how music and artists brought people together that didn't know each other and they could all relate to a song. But something was missing. So when the pandemic hit, shows stopped, he took inventory of his life. I was able to take a step back and really understand that, you know, what really is going to fulfill me moving forward in my life is like helping people find this attachment and, and relationship with nature. So he started USAW, a community built on connection to the outdoors and wellness. Each month, Michael partners with various practitioners across a spectrum of fields in nature and wellness to create community. Give us a tail. Yes. I mean, this is incredible. And provide wholesome, healing, connected experiences. This is extreme sport. <laughs> so we, at this point, do around 20 to 30 events each month. Be it a guided run, an experience with falconry, or vegan Cuban cooking. Hi everyone, today I'm making tacos de palmito. Each adventure, in essence, a love letter to Los Angeles. This is a really great way to bring people together and get people connected with nature. We do these types of trips to really help create that connective glue. I caught up with him in the heart of LA for a breath and body workshop and a cold plunge, but we started with our feet. This is called toga. Toga is just yoga for your feet learning how to ground and center ourselves through our toes. Our feet are basically what connects us to the ground. Then it was a breath workshop in preparation for an ice bath. Sympathetic nervous system is gonna create a gasp reflect. You're gonna gasp for air and you're gonna take a few big breaths. And then it was time to start slowing everything down. We're gonna breathe to the beat of the music. Out, three, two, one. After getting our breath together, it was go time, but other people first. So, you guys have any pointers? You seem to have handled it perfectly. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Initial thought, you just have to really suppress it. Like, once you get that, you know, feeling, you just have to put it down. Put it and, down. And you leave it down. And yep. leave it down leave in it down. the ice. Finally, reluctantly, it was my turn. Let me go see if those people cross the street. <laughs> OK, let's, let's get this done. And on a chilly 52 degree LA morning, I got in 51 degree water. Step in, no. All the way down, shoulders under. Kiss it all the way down. Oh, Elsa, you, you <laughs> ice queen. OK. My Arctic dip only lasted two minutes, but it was invigorating. Yeah, I didn't even have coffee this morning. I don't even need coffee this morning. Not. It seems like your background, you bring marketing. Yeah. You bring a little bit of that music community, that sense of people vibing together yeah. for yeah. a shared purpose. And I just kind of changed it from, from music to outdoors. You know, still building community around people that I find extremely inspiring. Yeah, like your whole oh, body tingles. You're, like, I mean, you I feel just great. Have an I feel warm. You saw a flowering nature and wellness collective in the heart of LA. A story that gives you the chills. That does it for us tonight. I'm Gotti Schwartz. We'll see you tomorrow, but until then, stay tuned now. Breaking tonight, the U.S. vetoing a U.N. resolution that would have paved the way for Palestinian statehood. The move coming under sharp condemnation as the U.S. faces mounting pressure over the humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Plus, officers in riot gear arresting dozens of pro-Palestinian protesters at Columbia University. The breaking details just coming in. Also tonight, an NBC News exclusive, Hezbollah's second in command. What he says will happen if Israel fires back at Iran. The leader blaming President Biden and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for dragging out the war in Gaza. Also breaking right now, 12 jurors plus an alternate selected in President Trump's historic
historic criminal hush money trial. The announcement capping off a day of jury shuffling and drama in the courtroom where the selection process stands. And I sit down with one of the reporters who first broke the story on the hush money payment, how his work led to the first ever criminal trial of a former president. Family turns on RFK Jr. More than a dozen members of the Kennedy family throwing their support behind President Biden. RFK Jr.'s response to his family, giving him the cold shoulder. How the Democratic Party is working to fend off the independent, concerned over his appeal to younger voters. Koberger's new alibi, the suspect at the center of the brutal murders of four Idaho college students, disputing his location on the night of the killings. New court documents claiming he was out driving, something he did often to see the moon and the stars. Plus, office bully? Imagine coming to work and finding your desk put on the roof of your office. But does it go much further than just a practical joke? The employees questioning that boss's relationship with a top official, saying he will never face the consequences of his actions. And fully electronic humanoid, Boston Dynamics revealing its most human-like robot yet, the brand new state-of-the-art machine moving like nothing we've ever seen. Top story starts right now. And good evening. Coming on the air with breaking news tonight, the U.S. vetoed a Palestinian bid for full U.N. membership, ultimately blocking Palestinian statehood. This was the moment United States Ambassador Robert Wood struck down the widely backed measure. The U.S. was the only one of the 15 U.N. member states there, the Security Council, to veto the measure. Two countries abstained and 12 others voted in favor. The move coming under sharp criticism from several countries, including Russia and Egypt. The U.S. arguing the two-state solution should be a result of negotiations between Israel and Palestinians, not the United Nations. And it comes as tensions mount across the country, right? Over the Israel-Hamas war at Columbia University, police in riot gear are arresting more than 100 demonstrators during a pro-Palestinian protest. And concerns over a wider war in the Middle East, cross-border fighting between Israel and Hezbollah in southern Lebanon intensifying over recent days. In just a moment, you'll hear from Hezbollah's second-in-command in an exclusive NBC sit-down. The Iranian-backed militant group vowing to strike Israel if they provoke an attack. We'll get to all of that in a moment. But first, I want to get to that breaking news on the U.N. Security Council's vote. NBC's Ellison Barber joins us now. Ellison, take us into the U.N. and what happened today. Yeah, I mean, look, this wasn't a surprise. The U.S. had been very clear from the State Department briefings earlier today saying we intend to veto this. We saw the U.S. try to delay this resolution, having a vote, uh, presumably hoping that they wouldn't have to take this very public position against it. But the way that this works with the U.N. Security Council is that you have... Uh, all of these members that are on the Security Council, and in order for a resolution to pass the UN Security Council, you need nine votes in favor, and you cannot have any no votes or vetoes from any of the five permanent members. The United States, one of those five permanent members. So when we're looking at this 15-member council, the U.S. voting no, that minute was going to be dead on arrival. It won't go to the full UN, 193 members, to vote on this. For Palestinians, that means their hope of statehood, of an independent state, is even further from reach. This would not have meant that they were going to have a statehood and be an independent state, but it would have given a lot of validity to that push that they've been trying to get to for decades. For Israel, this is a moment where despite public disagreements between Netanyahu and Biden, Israel can look at this and say, we still have our top ally in our corner. So many countries voted to approve the statehood. We obviously voted not to. Has the White House reacted to this yet? Yeah, they have. So we heard on Air Force One from the National Security Council spokesperson John Kirby. He told reporters this, quote, we believe in a two state solution and a state for the Palestinian people, we believe the best and the most sustainable way to do that is through direct negotiations between the parties. That's echoing what we heard from the spokesperson of the State Department earlier today, where he said that direct negotiations need to happen between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. But the question moving forward is, when and how does that happen? Yeah. Because the Palestinian Authority, they control the West Bank, but they don't have full support of the Palestinian people. Hamas controls Gaza, and Netanyahu has been very clear that he 
he does not support a two-state solution, saying after the terror attacks on October 7th that that is just essentially a non-starter for them. Right. They believe that it would be a win for Hamas and that it would further threaten Israel's security. And this may be a little bit of a problem or maybe a big problem for President Biden as he heads into the election because he's already felt the pressure from progressives in his party yeah. and from Arab Americans as well in places like Michigan and Pennsylvania. Yeah, I mean, when you look at that graphic that you had up, up earlier of who voted in favor of it, the countries that said yes, and then the countries that abstained, you have key U.S. allies like France, Japan, voting in favor of this resolution. Then you have another key ally like the U.K. abstaining from voting. Domestically, you have to look at that and you think President Biden is really on a global island of yeah. sorts in some ways. And the most pressure he's faced in terms of his position on the Israel-Gaza war is from within his own party. That is something that will probably be an issue for him politically moving forward because you have other key Western allies who made a very different decision than the United States did here. Ellison Barber on that breaking news from the UN. Ellison, we appreciate that. And as we mentioned, a stunning scene at Columbia University in New York City today as this vote came down. Police in riot gear at the request of the university president moving to clear an encampment of student demonstrators protesting the war in Gaza. Antonia Hilton is there as demonstrations continue tonight. Confrontation at Columbia today. Police removing protesters from campus. Citing extraordinary circumstances, Columbia University President Manu Shafiq called in the NYPD to clear an encampment of pro-Palestinian student demonstrators. The encampment set up Wednesday morning, the same day Shafiq testified on Capitol Hill about anti-Semitism on campus. We must uphold freedom of speech because it's essential to our academic mission, but we cannot and shouldn't tolerate abuse of this privilege to harass and, disc and, and discriminate. In a letter to the university community, Shafiq noted, protests have a storied history at Columbia, where anti-Vietnam demonstrators took over buildings on campus in 1968. But in asking for help from the police, she said, the encampment and related disruptions pose a clear and present danger to the substantial functioning of the university. We are risking like our academic standing just to like show the administrators that we are not okay with their decisions. Several demonstrators today stomping on an Israeli flag. Some students saying they feel unsafe on campus. I feel as though um, people are kind of weaponizing um, anti-Semitism. Demonstrators telling us they plan to keep their protests going despite the police presence. Do you feel like this administration has clamped down on students and faculty members' free speech? 100% yes, I do believe that. New York City's mayor tonight saying police made more than 100 arrests on a campus severely divided. Antonia Hilton, NBC News, New York. And fears continue to mount that the war between Israel and Hamas will explode into a wider regional conflict. The world waiting to see how Israel will respond to that large-scale aerial assault by Iran over the weekend. Tonight, in an exclusive interview with NBC News, a top leader of the Iran-backed militia, Hezbollah, says it is not seeking to get involved in the war, but if Israel strikes, it will strike back. Here's Matt Bradley with that interview. Tonight, as the world waits for Israel's response to Iran's massive aerial assault, the entire Middle East teeters on the brink of a region-wide war. The Iranian-backed militia Hezbollah vowing to match any escalation from Israel. The Israelis have indicated that their response, which we're still waiting for, will likely not be against Iran itself. It could very well come against Iranian-backed groups like Hezbollah. In that case, are you prepared to respond? Are you prepared to escalate? If Israel attacks us and aggresses us, then we will definitely respond. If they escalate, we will escalate. In a rare and exclusive interview, Hezbollah's second in command, Naim Qasim, said the group is determined not to ramp up fighting unless Israel does first, faulting Israel and the U.S. for escalating the war. Israel's two-front war against Hamas and Hezbollah, both backed by Iran, is now in its seventh month. The war began with Hamas's attack on Israel on October 7th. Hezbollah stepped in the next day, attacking a disputed border region between Israel and Lebanon in what it described as solidarity with Hamas. We didn't expect that the war would last that long because we didn't think that Netanyahu was that foolish. Same for Biden and the other countries. Hezbollah claimed responsibility Wednesday for an attack that injured 14 soldiers in northern Israel. A response, they say, to Israeli strikes that killed two of the group's top commanders. 
Hundreds have been killed on both sides of the Lebanese border since the start of the Israel-Hamas war. Qasem defending Iran's decision to attack on Saturday night, which Iran says was in retaliation for an Israeli strike on Iranian military leaders at the country's consulate in Syria. Tehran speaks publicly and clearly. They do not want war and they have responded to the attack on their embassy and that's it for them. I think Iran is honest. This is what they told us and this is what they keep reiterating to the media. Like their patron state Iran, Qasem said that Hezbollah is determined to avoid a broader war and will only ratchet up their attacks on Israel if the Jewish state escalates first. But American officials believe Israel may respond to Iran's aerial attack by striking militant groups like Hezbollah. What are you expecting Israel's attack to be? The Israelis are confused. They do not know whether to respond or not. And you want me to know what Israel will do? Do you think Israel doesn't have a plan right now? They do not have a plan, nor the courage, nor do they know what they will do. If they commit a mistake, then they're going to pay a high price for that. Do you think they're scared? They are 100 percent scared. They did not expect Iran to respond, and it did. But there are good reasons for fear. A single spark from this conflict could ignite the entire Middle East. In such a blaze, it would be hard for the United States to avoid getting burnt. All right, Matt Bradley joins us fresh off his interview from Beirut tonight. So, Matt, you asked what Hezbollah would do if Israel strikes. How concerned are they that they could be the target of Israel's retaliation against Iran? Yeah, well, Qasem told me that, you know, he doesn't think the Israelis actually know whether or not they're going to be attacking Hezbollah or whether they're going to be attacking anyone. He said that the Israelis are confused and scared. And Tom, I don't know if concerned is the right word. He said that, you know, when it comes to the path of jihad, when it comes to fighting against Israel, martyrdom is one of the only options and that there is no way to surrender. Tom? Matt Bradley for us tonight here on Top Story. Matt, we thank you. We want to turn now to the latest in the Trump hush money trial. Twelve jurors now seated to hear the case, plus one alternate. The accelerated selection came after the process appeared to suffer a serious setback when two previously selected jurors were dismissed from the case today. NBC's Laura Jarrett has the latest. Tonight, a full jury of 12 now sworn in in former President Donald Trump's hush money criminal trial after the day began with drama surrounding two jurors dismissed. The full jury now including an investment banker, security engineer, retired private wealth manager, speech therapist, physical therapist, someone in e-commerce, and a product development manager. I'm supposed to be in a lot of different places campaigning, but I've been here all day on a trial that really is a very unfair trial. The whole world is watching this New York scam. Mr. Trump arriving this morning with seven jurors sworn in, only to see that number quickly go down to five after an oncology nurse who had said during questioning that no one was above the law. I'm here to just hear the facts. Tell the judge today she had concerns she could not be impartial about Mr. Trump and worries about her identity becoming public after loved ones figured out she'd been impaneled. The other juror, an older IT consultant who had called the presumptive GOP nominee fascinating and mysterious in court Tuesday, excused today after prosecutors said he was arrested for tearing down conservative political ads decades ago and did not reveal it on his juror questionnaire. But late today, those additional jurors selected to serve, among them an investment banker who said he follows Mr. Trump's Truth Social posts and has seen quotes from his book, The Art of the Deal, but has not read it. The retired private wealth manager who said he does yoga every morning and that speech therapist saying of Mr. Trump, I tend not to agree with a lot of his politics and his decisions as a president, but said she can be impartial. At one point, a prospective juror even apologizing to the former president for her past criticisms of him on social media. She was dismissed. Today's events underscoring the challenges of seating a jury in deep blue Manhattan, where 85 percent of people voted for President Biden. When the pool of 96 prospective jurors was asked this morning if they could be impartial in judging the likely Republican nominee, nearly 50 hands went up saying they could not and were dismissed. Kat was among them. I couldn't be impartial. It's a historical case and, you know, this is going to define so many things. Um, but at the same time, 
our job as a juror, right, is to be impartial. Mr. Trump sounding off about the jury selection process, writing he was given the second worst venue in the country. He's accused of doctoring his internal business records to hide a reimbursement payment to Michael Cohen, who allegedly paid off Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 election so she couldn't go public about an affair. Mr. Trump denies any sexual relationship with Daniels and has pled not guilty. And with that, Laura joins us tonight from Lower Manhattan. So, Laura, I know you have some new reporting about the witness list. Yeah, Tom, at the very end of the day, Todd Blanche, Mr. Trump's lead lawyer, asked the prosecution to provide the names of the first three witnesses that are expected to start to testify after opening statements. It's a typical courtesy you see in court a lot of times, but the prosecution here, Tom, said no. They said they're not going to do it because they're so worried about Mr. Trump posting about these people on social media. And Tom, get this, the judge agreed. He said, I can't blame them and I'm not going to order the people to turn those over. So they're going to go into court on the first day with the first witnesses not knowing who they are, Tom. Yeah, it speaks to the sensitivity of this case, but also how a lot of the people all around the country and the world are watching this. Um, Laura, walk our viewers through the sort of the timeline. What can we expect? The calendar, if you will. We know they're still looking for alternate jurors. They still have to do that. Do we know when uh, opening statements could start? That's right. So we have one alternate now sworn in and ready to go, but we still need about five more. The judge has said he wants six in total. You can understand why, given that two of the people who had been impaneled had to get dismissed today. So we will take up with more questioning of potential alternates in court tomorrow morning. And then opening statements in this case could begin as soon as Monday, Tom. Laura Jarrett reporting from Lower Manhattan tonight for us. Laura, we thank you for that. Next tonight in Top Stories Spotlight, before there was an indictment or a trial, there was a breaking news story. The investigation that led to the first criminal trial of a former president was prompted by a Wall Street Journal exclusive. The article, you see it right here, Trump lawyer arranged $130,000 payment for adult film star silence, broke in 2018 and detailed the arrangement of a $130,000 payment between Michael Cohen and Stormy Daniels in exchange for her silence about an alleged affair with Donald Trump. And we are joined tonight by one of the reporters of that byline who won a Pulitzer Prize for his work, Michael Rothfeld. Michael is now an investigative reporter with the New York Times. And Michael, welcome to Top Story. Thanks. So I, I want to get your first thoughts, right? It's been six years since you broke the story, nearly a decade since the alleged affair happened. And now we're about to start the criminal trial. What are your thoughts? I mean, it's pretty mind-blowing. Uh, as a reporter, you always sort of uh, are amazed when your stories have some consequences in the world. And, and this one, you know, uh, the consequences having been the first indictment of a former president, the first criminal trial of Donald Trump, maybe the only criminal trial before, you know, the election in uh, November. And, you know, you don't hope for any particular outcome. Right. But um, just to see that reporting play out over so many years since we first reported the hush money payment in 2018 is, is really amazing. And I think that's the operative phrase there, right? Over so many years. And I want to ask you, you know, the Justice Department had looked into this case, right? And we're going to get into that in a bit. The Manhattan DA's office before uh, Alvin Bragg had also looked into this, but they never pursued it, right? Yeah. And now we're about to start the criminal trial. Right. I mean, did you ever think that was going to happen? Uh, no, actually. I mean, I knew that Cy Vance, who preceded Alvin Bragg, was looking into this. And, and of course, we knew that the federal prosecutors were also looking into it, but they couldn't charge Trump uh, when he was president because of a Justice Department policy. And then afterwards, they really didn't want to use Michael Cohen as a witness because he had been convicted of crimes. He had lied. They had criticized him themselves in court papers, so they weren't going to do it. And then Cy Vance thought this case was either not serious enough or, you know, that was one of the right. main things. So you brought up Michael Cohen, and you bring up a question I have a lot for when we interview lawyers here and former district attorneys. How do you think a jury is going to perceive Michael Cohen with his history, sort of the, the, the way he carries himself, and what he told reporters, what he told authorities that turned out to be lies? Yeah, I think that is largely going to depend on how he performs on the witness stand. And he's very practiced. He's been on television a lot. He testified before Congress. And he's a, he's a smart guy. So he will be prepared to be attacked. Um, how he does will make the difference. But there, there's witnesses, uh, cooperating witnesses all the time in criminal trials yeah. who have criminal convictions, drug dealers, really bad people. And, you know, mob, mob hitmen, you know, yeah. become, uh, and, you know, so this is not unprecedented. Right. I want to, I 
want to go back in time if we can. And, and I was reading again your initial report. I'm going to put a piece of it up on the screen since we're talking about Michael Cohen here. In it, you guys write, this is a statement from uh, Michael Cohen. Um, he told you guys, this is now the second time that you are raising outlandish allegations against my client. You have attempted to perpetuate this false narrative for over a year, a narrative that has been consistently denied by all parties since at least 2011. Talk to me about the process in nailing down this story because that was a tough cast of characters you had to deal with and you guys spent over a year working this? Right, well we first broke the story at the Wall Street Journal of Karen McDougal's hush money payment or it was a non-disclosure agreement with the uh, National Enquirer. Actually they bought the rights to her life story and then it was a catch and kill. And then we knew Stormy Daniels at the time had been represented by the same lawyer as represented Karen McDougal, but we did not know uh, you know, who had paid her off, if anyone had paid her off. So throughout 2017, we kept asking this cast of characters around Donald Trump, you know, Playboy models, porn stars, paparazzi, and towards the end of 2017, uh, we had a source meeting and that, that source said, you know, think taxis and you know Michael Cohen owned a lot of taxis so we knew uh, that you know that meant that he had paid her off and that he had used uh, uh, an LLC a shell company to right. do it and so then we had to search for the shell company and we poured through corporate records until we found one that had his name on it and incredible uh, yeah Incredible reporting. You know, after your reporting, after this all came out, Michael Cohen's office was raided. Um, this was part of the, the Mueller investigation. Federal agents raided his office. And, and I ask you this because do you think there's evidence that lawyers have, that, that the prosecutors have, that maybe the public doesn't know about yet, that, that we may be surprised in this case? I, I would like to know that. I mean, we, uh, you know, uh, Joe and I, who broke the Stormy story, wrote a book about this. We have extensively interviewed everyone. Yeah. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm really curious what, what more could come out. I bet there will be some new details. I doubt there will be many new details, but I'm sure we're going to hear from David Pecker. He was the publisher of the National Enquirer yeah. and associate of Trump's. He's never spoken publicly, so I'd love to hear what comes out of his mouth. Michael, having covered this case for so long, what's the one thing you're looking for in this trial? Um, I, well, I really want to see if Donald Trump testifies and how he's going to talk about these events, on how he's going to perform on the witness stand. And I really want to see how prosecutors are going to lay all this out. And just to see this all play out in a courtroom, um, this whole story that I've been covering all this time and whether it will result in the first conviction of a, of a former president or whether Trump can take this um, back to the campaign trail and say, hey, look, it's in, in, I was being persecuted here. All right, Michael, we thank you for your time and for all your reporting. Time now for Power of Politics and the family feud playing out in the 2024 campaign trail. More than a dozen members of the Kennedy family endorsing President Biden at a Philadelphia rally, even though their own relative, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., is running against him as an independent. Gabe Gutierrez is at the White House tonight with the latest. Today, with his opponents stuck in court, President Biden on the attack in Battleground, Pennsylvania. The 2024 election is about two fundamentally different visions of, for America. Donald Trump's vision is one of anger, hate, revenge, and retribution. The campaign touting the endorsement of 15 Kennedy family members, even though one of their own, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., is running against him as an independent. The best way forward for America is to reelect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to four more years. Responding to his family's endorsement of his opponent today, RFK Jr. posted on social media, we are divided in our opinions, but united in our love for each other. The environmental lawyer and anti-vaccine activist first ran as a Democrat. Now, Kennedy's independent campaign is polling above 10 percent in a few key swing states, where Biden is also trailing Trump. Democrats are aggressively attacking third-party candidates like Kennedy, whom they view as a threat to President Biden's re-election, people involved tell NBC News. Though it's not clear which candidate, President Biden or former President Trump, would lose more votes to RFK Jr. Kennedy told NBC's Von Hillier this in February. Now, I hope to draw equal numbers from both of them. I think at this point I'm probably drawing more from President Trump. All right, Gabe Gutierrez joins us tonight from the White House. And Gabe, I understand you have some new reporting on how this endorsement came about. Uh, yeah, Tom, a source familiar with the Biden campaign's planning says that the Kennedy family endorsement was months in the making and that it was the Kennedy family that came up with the idea and brought it to the campaign. 
And Tom. Gabe, I know NBC News has a bit of other reporting on the Kennedy Shanahan ticket with a bit of other news out there. Uh, not a great day for their campaign, but they received a financial boost in a very unique way. Yeah, that's right, Tom. And we're just learning about it through an FEC filing. But it turns out the day after she was announced as vice uh, as a vice presidential candidate, Shanahan donated two million dollars uh, to that campaign. And she had donated previously. But now that she is a candidate on the ticket, she can spend unlimited amounts of her own money. Tom. OK, Gabe Gutierrez at the White House tonight. We want to switch gears now to a close call at Washington, D.C.'s Reagan National Airport. The FAA now investigating how two jetliners nearly collided on the tarmac this morning. Air traffic controllers scrambling to halt JetBlue and Southwest planes cleared onto the same runway. NBC's Emily Aketa has the story. A hair-raising moment today on one of America's busiest runways. Stop, stop, we're 2937, stop. An air traffic controller frantically telling a Southwest plane to stop. We stopped. We were cleared to cross runway four. After it was cleared to taxi across a runway at Reagan National in Washington, D.C. We in calm, runway four, clear for takeoff. A JetBlue plane was about to take off, according to the FAA, but then also suddenly told to abort. And we're stopping JetBlue 1554. A source says the planes came less than 1,000 feet of each other. Something went amiss causing uh, one controller to clear the airplane to take off and another ground controller clearing the Southwest Airlines to cross that same active runway. So to me, it looks like it's what the FAA calls an operational error uh, involving an air traffic control issue. After a string of near misses, an independent safety review found last year over time is at a historically high level for air traffic controllers and challenges, including staffing shortages, have caused an erosion of safety margins that must be urgently addressed. Tonight, the FAA reports serious runway incursions are trending down. Stop, stop, we're 2937, stop. Regarding the latest scare, both airlines say they're working closely with federal investigators to determine what went wrong. And Tom, you know, I mentioned how the FAA is ramping up its hiring process, but it says to improve safety, it is also taking a number of other measures, including introducing modernized simulators to help make the training process for all of those new hires more efficient. They're also exploring more advanced technology for the runway to help improve controllers' situational awareness, all in an effort to bring the number of serious close calls down to zero. Tom? Yeah, we hope so. Okay, Emily, thank you for that. Still ahead tonight, Brian Koberger's new alibi. The man accused of killing four University of Idaho students, claiming he could not have committed the murders in November of 2022. What his lawyers say he went on to a drive to do at the time of the slayings. Plus, the LAPD confirming Kanye West is a suspect in a criminal investigation, the charges he could be facing. And terrifying moments at a Taco Bell drive through an 11-week-old in the back of his mother's car, suddenly unable to breathe. You're going to hear from the employee who jumped into action and saved that baby's life. Stay with us. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. What do we know that voters care about? The economy, yeah. right? You are seeing That's that right. firsthand yourself on the ground there today. This is two things. It is pretty big medical news. It is also a pretty big mystery. And oh, by the way, it's driven by one of the most controversial people in the United States. What's happening? They have tweaked my monitor, and I can see now you are, in fact, soaking wet. I am <laughs> deeply sorry. My I commitment apologize to Allie for Jackson the many now questions. Will never be questioned. Democracy is happening now. Welcome to a big night that could help shape Republican politics for years to come. Now never stops. It comes down to turnout. Who shows up? Is it going to be that big block of independence? Now is where it counts. What are the issues that matter most to you guys? What did this debate change for you? Their number one issue is the economy. 2024, who's your candidate? The race is on now. The countdown has begun. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Developing right now on Morning News Now. Growing frustrations over the migrant crisis. Reports of new drone attacks by Houthi militants. And the storm is creating dangerous conditions all across the region. Now let's get to some financial headlines. New rules are coming to cap credit card late fees. Talking tuition as a new class of freshmen gets ready to go to college. This is a big decision for families. Do you think this could impact how people vote? 100%. Morning News Now. Streaming weekdays at 7. We are in 
a sea of strangers right now who are united by this moment. What does it make you feel inside to see this? It's like happy, like my heart beating is fast. I am so happy you guys got to experience this. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. What do we know that voters care about? The economy, yeah. right? You are seeing That's that right. firsthand yourself on the ground there today. This is two things. It is pretty big medical news. It is also a pretty big mystery. And oh, by the way, it's driven by one of the most controversial people in the United States. What's happening? They have tweaked my monitor, and I can see now you are, in fact, soaking wet. I am <laughs> deeply sorry. My I apologize for Jackson the many questions. Will never be I questioned. <laughs> All right, we're back now with the latest on the Idaho College murders. Defense attorneys for suspect Brian Koberger filing an updated alibi in August. His lawyer said he had been out for a drive at the time of the murders, but couldn't give a specific time or place. Prosecutors arguing that was too vague, and a judge agreed. Dana Griffin has the latest claims from his legal team and the reaction from the family of one of his alleged victims. An alleged alibi revealed in the deadly stabbing of four University of Idaho students, Madison Mogan, Kaylee Gonzalez, Zana Carnodal, and Ethan Chapin. Brian Koberger's defense writing, Mr. Koberger was out driving in the early morning hours of November 13th, 2022, as he often did to hike and run and or see the moon and stars. The Gonzalez family telling NBC News in a statement in part, we are not sure why it has taken over a year for this to come out as these don't seem to be complicated activities. We believe that if this alibi had any weight, it would have been submitted months ago. It's the same defense the judge questioned last year. So-called alibi, not really an alibi, was suggested by No witnesses were included in the filing. Koberger's team will instead rely on analysis from a cell phone data expert. Could this help him or hurt his case? I think the defense had to file this notice of alibi. I think they know that it's a tough alibi. He's not arguing that he was hundreds of miles away in another state. He's not arguing that he simply wasn't in the area. He's essentially saying my alibi is I was in the area, just not specifically there. But last January, police say cell phone data showed Koberger was attempting to conceal his location. His phone was turned off from 2.47 to 4.48 a.m. that morning during the time of the murders. Koberger's phone also pinged 12 times near the victim's house months leading up to the slayings, prosecutors say. His DNA was on a knife sheath left at the crime scene, an affidavit noted. And records show Koberger changed his car title five days after the killings, days before his arrest. Koberger was stopped in Indiana on a road trip to Pennsylvania with his father, driving a white Hyundai Elantra, the same vehicle caught on surveillance near the crime scene. Mr. Koberger is standing silent. Uh, I'm going to enter not guilty pleas on each charge. The alleged murder weapon, a large fixed blade knife, has never been found. Dana Griffin joins us tonight from Los Angeles. Dana, this trial has already been delayed quite a bit. Do we have any idea when it's actually going to start? We don't, Tom. A trial date has not been set, much to the frustration of the victims' families. And based on dates that have been thrown around by the judge and prosecution, it could start sometime next year. Although the defense says other issues have to be dealt with before they even set a date. Now, in June, the judge will hear arguments on moving the case to a different county. And, Tom, this is adding to the growing bill Idaho taxpayers are footing over this case. According to the Idaho statesman, this is already costing taxpayers a whopping $3.6 million. And the University of Idaho confirmed months ago this steep private security bill for the home turned crime scene is part of the reason they tore it down. Tom? Dana Griffin for us from Los Angeles. Dana, we thank you for that. Over here on this side of the country in Pennsylvania, a terrifying moment for one mom at a Taco Bell drive through With a baby's life on the line, an employee there springing into action just in the nick of time. NBC's George Solis spoke to that mother and the woman she's now calling her baby's guardian angel. A mother's worst nightmare caught on video. These are the heart-pounding moments Natasha Long realized her 11-week-old son was struggling to breathe while at a Taco Bell drive through just outside Philadelphia in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. I saw that he was turning blue, so I 
pulled him out of his car seat, and that's when I blacked out. I, I didn't know what to do. Here you see Long cradling baby Miles as she begins that desperate search for help. The tension building with each passing second. Baby Miles, who was born with a rare syndrome involving his breathing and airway, was unresponsive to his mother's touch. But the pair isn't alone for long. She was there right when I needed her. It was the wrong time, but the right place. Watch as seemingly out of nowhere, this good Samaritan rushes to her rescue. Like a guardian angel. Yes, absolutely. She, it was literally out of nowhere. I heard someone scream and then someone yelled and drive through, call 911, baby not breathing. So I threw my headset off and ran outside. The mystery woman taking charge. That's Taco Bell manager Becky Arba, who began performing life-saving CPR on the infant. What were you mm -hmm. telling Natasha to calm her down? I just kept saying, it's okay, he's fine, he's gonna breathe, he's fine, he will breathe, he's totally fine. And she's like, I, I can't lose him. She didn't, thanks to Arba, who was able to get baby Miles breathing before paramedics arrived. A mama for herself, Arba said a similar experience with one of her own years ago had prepared her for a moment just like this. You don't want to be called a hero. No, Why? I'm just a mom helping a mom. I didn't do anything different from what anyone else should be doing. I knew how that was and I heard it and I felt it instantly and I had to go and help her because I knew it's painful. It's you're just so helpless as a mom when that happens. The two moms now friends and feeling forever bonded. I think I'm going to look back and be like, you know, oh my gosh, thank God Becky was there because <laughs> And I'm going to let Miles know exactly why Becky is Aunt Becky. Safe to say that he has a friend for life? Absolutely. Baby Miles is doing a lot better, but we'll need at least one surgery to help improve his quality of life and hopefully prevent another scare like this one. Taco Bell also issuing a statement about their employees' heroic actions. The company saying they're incredibly proud. Back to you. All right, George Solis, great story there. When we come back, talk about a horrible boss. An employee at a Bay Area school district showed up to work to find this. His desk had been put on the roof. While he claims his supervisor did it to get back at him, and it's not the only allegation why his employees say he'll never get fired. We'll explain what's going on there. That's next. Democracy is happening. Now. Welcome to a big night that could help shape Republican politics for years to come. Now never stops. It comes down to turnout. Who shows up? Is it going to be that big block of independence? Now is where it counts. What are the issues that matter most to you guys? What did this debate change for you? Their number one issue is the economy. 2024, who's your candidate? The race is on now. The countdown has begun. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. We're talking possibly a trillion galaxies. Yes. That is a number that is just so hard to compute. Whether it's the moon, whether it's Mars, it feels like we're on the cusp of something big. Are you comfortable with the role the Supreme Court is playing in the 2024 election? Do you bear responsibility for what is happening at the border? Is it clear who's going to govern Gaza once this war is over? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. News lives in the now. The front lines are still very active. This is like quicksand. And officials say an entire town is cut off. This close to actually understand why people had to jump in the ocean. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Developing right now on Morning News Now. Growing frustrations over the migrant crisis. Reports of new drone attacks by Houthi militants. And the storm is creating dangerous conditions all across the region. Now let's get to some financial headlines. New rules are coming to cap credit card late fees. Talking tuition as a new class of freshmen gets ready to go to college. This is a big decision for families. Do you think this could impact how people vote? 100%. Morning News Now. Streaming weekdays at 7. Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. All right, back now with Top Stories News Feed. Los Angeles police confirming to NBC News that Kanye West is the suspect in a battery investigation. West is accused of punching a man in the face multiple times. TMZ reporting West accused the victim of assaulting his wife, Bianca. This is not yet, this is not Ye's first run in with a battery investigation. He was cleared on charges last year after grabbing a photographer's phone and throwing it in the street. 
Okay, the FBI on high alert for threats to the Jewish community ahead of the Passover holiday. Director Christopher Wray speaking at an event hosted by Jewish community security officials. Wray saying the FBI is especially concerned of lone actors attacks and that increased caution should be used at large gatherings and houses of worship. Ray also warning of state-sponsored threats from Iran. And how much do you think your city spends on its public toilets? Well, a newly opened public toilet in San Francisco's No Valley was originally going to cost the city 1.7 million bucks. You heard that right. The 150 square foot structure only holds a single stall and the price sparked major backlash among taxpayers. Two companies ended up donating materials and labor, so it ended up costing the city only around $300,000. Still a lot of money. Okay, we want to turn out to the bully boss. Have you ever felt pushed around by a supervisor? Well, this Bay Area employee says his boss put his desk on the roof after a disagreement, and he's just one of 10 people who have now filed complaints. But they say this bully boss isn't getting proper discipline because of friends in high places. NBC Bay Area investigative reporter Candace Wynn pushed for answers. This picture isn't the start of the story or the end, but it might be the last chapter in Jim Kesser's 30-year career as a maintenance worker at Antioch Unified School District. He says his new boss, Ken Turnage, waited until he was not at work to trash his desk and then direct multiple district employees to use this forklift to put his desk on a roof in the district's maintenance yard, where he works. Besides it, a sign that read Kessler's access and a ladder. I literally was in the emergency room the next weekend. Um, my wife said, you're having panic attacks, and I thought I was having a heart attack. Why do you think he put your desk on the roof? I asked that question a hundred times. At first, I thought, you know, he's bullying me for speaking out for a conversation we had a few months earlier where he asked me to do a job assignment. And I said, I'm open to doing, you know, whatever you ask me to do, but I just want to let you know because you're new. I'm not a mechanic and I'm not an electrician. And he literally blew up at me. When you say he blew up at you, wh he what happened? He could go from zero to 60 in five seconds. It wasn't a joke. It was predatorial. It was bullying. Kim Atkinson is the school district's purchasing technician. She handles district dollars and says this was not an appropriate way to use public resources. We're a school district. Our money is for students. And we're spending money and employees' time and overtime to put a desk on a roof as a cruel bullying prank. Kesser and Atkinson are two of about 10 Antioch Unified employees who've reported turnage to the district. Ken Turnage is the school district's director of maintenance, operations, and facilities. He oversees everyone in the department, including these four who provided the investigative unit copies of their complaints against him. They say his behavior put three of them on medical leave for stress and convinced Bruce Cordemanche to retire early. I said, I honestly feel like you're disrespecting me. And he did his little shoulder thing and he says, oh, I respect you. And I said, okay, thank you, I appreciate that. He stomped behind his desk, clenched his fist, did his thing and he says, I don't respect you. I don't respect you at all. Oh, he's charged up on me, thought I was gonna be physically assaulted. I asked him where I could put my printer um, and I was told I could put it on the roof. We reached out to Turnage multiple times, but he didn't respond. I believe in ecological balance. He did speak with us back in 2020 during the height of COVID, right before he was removed as Antioch's planning commissioner for writing a lengthy social media post advocating for ending the shutdown and allowing the virus to kill off the weak and the elderly. Is it something I'm advocating to happen? No, but it's nature's course. Also on Facebook, photos that these employees say reveal a bigger problem. Why they believe 15 months after this roof incident, Turnage still hasn't been held accountable. He is best friends with Stephanie Anello's husband. Stephanie Anello is Antioch Unified Superintendent. She's shown here near Ken Turnage, along with her husband, Alan Cantando, Antioch's former police chief. Cantando and Turnage are pictured together outside of work over and over again in different locations. They go golfing together every weekend. They're golf buddies, barbecue buddies. I've seen them on the golf course. I golf. 
I literally saw him playing with Ken Tando and Stephanie Anello. We took the allegations that Anello is failing to discipline Turnage because of his friendship with her and her husband straight to her and her husband. After multiple emails and calls, we never heard back. But we did get this email from the district's HR director saying AUSD takes all matters concerning our employees seriously. As this is a personnel matter, there will be no further comment. We still wanted to hear from the district's top official. So we went to last week's school board meeting. I'm here to speak to Superintendent Anello. You have not directly responded to any of my calls or my emails. You have received numerous complaints about Kenneth Turnage. And I want to ask you, has he been disciplined? We can't talk about personnel. He is accused of putting one of his employees' desks on a roof using district resources. What was your reaction to that? Several employees feel he has not been properly disciplined because he has a close relationship to you as well as to your husband, a former Antioch police chief. How do you respond to that? These employees say the silence makes them more uneasy. Oh, I'm ready for complete retaliation. I'm scared what he's going to do to me. NBC Bay Area's Candace Wynn joins Top Story tonight. So, Candace, we're hearing that there's now a disciplinary meeting that was scheduled after your report aired. That's right. Just hours ago, the board president of the school board, he called me. He told me that he is now calling for a special meeting tomorrow. Board members will get together to talk about possible disciplinary and even possible removal action of a public employee. Now, right now, school officials can't specify who that employee is, but they told me it is a result of our report. Tom. All right, Candace Wynn tonight here on Top Story. Candace, we appreciate all your reporting. Coming up next, we're going to take you right into the future. The latest generation of the humanoid robot Atlas, looking like something out of a sci-fi movie, but its creators say it's going to be used to do some very real manual labor. The major automaker that's already hired that bot. That's next. Still to come on the Channel 2 News. Well, the waters are certainly receding now. Still too close to call. Lester Holt reporting from the ground zero as it's uh, being referred to. It is, in fact, the taste of freedom. The Haitian people know a little something about resiliency. What's the biggest risk right now? Some of the troops who have been proud. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. In fact, we've been told we can't go any farther. You are some resilient folks. Let me get in. Mornings are full of possibility and energy. And how you get set for the day ahead matters. This is where it all begins. Take charge of those first hours. It's about getting caught up. And really, it's about getting ahead. And that's what drives us every morning. Because every day deserves the best start. This is where it all begins. We're talking possibly a trillion galaxies. Yes. That is a number that is just so hard to compute. Whether it's the moon, whether it's Mars, it feels like we're on the cusp of something big. NBC News Daily is number one for afternoon news across all of television. I'm Morgan Radford. I'm Vicki Wynn. I'm Kate Snow. And I'm Zinc Samwat. What's happening around the world? Israel's military is building up there along the border. And what matters here at home? New numbers are out today showing more encouraging signs for our economy. Let's zero in on exercise. We know we're supposed to be doing it. What does it do for our health? What needs to change for social media to be a safer place? NBC News Daily, weekdays from 12 to 4 on NBC News Now. News lives in the now. Look at this. You can't even see anything anymore. Let's break down what we know. You gotta see this. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. All right, we're back now with Top Stories Global Watch and a tsunami alert in Indonesia as a volcano erupts on a remote island. Officials say the volcano has erupted several times, raising fears it could collapse into the sea, triggering that tsunami. Authorities closing a nearby airport and ordering more than 11,000 people to evacuate. So far, no injuries or deaths have been reported.
Police in southeast Germany have arrested two suspected Russian spies in the state of Bavaria. Authorities say the dual German-Russian citizens are accused of plotting bombing and arson attacks on U.S. military facilities in Germany in hopes of sabotaging aid for Ukraine. Prosecutors say they were in contact with a person linked to the Russian intelligence group. The Kremlin has not yet responded to those allegations. And bone fragments discovered by a child on a U.K. beach turning out to be an ancient fossil that's more than 200 million years old. Researchers now say the jawbone found by a girl and her father on a beach in Somerset in 2016 was from a, gi a gigantic marine reptile. They estimate it measured between 72 and 85 feet, which could have put in the ranks of one of the largest creatures on the planet. Okay, from ancient fossils to the cutting edge of technology, robotics company Boston Dynamic unveiling a new model of the Atlas robot, an electric upgrade of a robot we've seen dance and stumble throughout the years, this one even landing a job with a major car manufacturer. Stephen Romo has the nuts and bolts of this story. When the Atlas robot first arrived on scene in 2013, its futuristic humanoid look wowed tech enthusiasts all over the world. Over the years, Boston Dynamic releasing clip after clip showing the hydraulically powered bipedal robot running, dancing, and doing so much more, including parkour. But now, as that generation of Atlas goes offline, a brand new, fully electric version is rising to take its place. Every roboticist that I've spoken to about this thus far, they've all been incredibly impressed by just that really short video. This Atlas has a sleeker design, a new round head, and is stronger with a broader range of motion, according to the company. The movement and look immediately drawing comparisons online to the killer cyborgs from the Terminator movie franchise. But unlike Arnold Schwarzenegger's iconic character or this talking robot from UK company Engineered Arts. I'm good. Today I am doing drawing. The Atlas models aren't designed to simulate human interactions using AI, but are instead intended for manual labor. In fact, Atlas was originally created for a military research competition to be used in natural disasters. This latest evolution of Atlas will be tested in a real-world factory setting, partnering with Hyundai to continue improving its applications. Historically, what's happened here is new technologies come into different industries. They either replace or augment those jobs, and then new jobs are created around them. And this isn't the first Boston Dynamic robot to get a job. Their dog-like robot, Spot, is used by some police departments. This one used by Massachusetts State Police getting shot last month, which officers say may have saved a real dog or a human from getting a bullet. Robotics have been used in factories for decades, but humanoid robots are a new frontier. Agility Robotics, which already has a pilot program with Amazon, has its digit robot even doing hands-on tasks. Any package that you get delivered to you, to you at this point, especially those from Amazon, has been touched by a robot at some points. Boston Dynamic has not yet said when Atlas will be available to buy. And for an average consumer, experts expect the cost to be out of reach. If I had to ballpark these kinds of robots, I would say we're talking, you know, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, probably a rental fee, but again, still out of most people's price ranges. All right, Stephen Robo joins us down in the studio. Stephen, those robots, they're, they're just so incredible. Do we, I want to hone in on this a little more. Do we know what types of jobs are going to do? I know you mentioned manual labor there. Yeah, something a lot of people are asking. It looks like this is geared toward the auto industry in particular. Uh, it's not clear exactly what these robots can do. We just have this 30, 40 second clip right now, but they are stronger and more agile than their predecessors. So it seems like they'll be able to do a lot. The company's saying they can tackle dirty, dangerous, and dull jobs, but humans have those jobs right now another consideration in this new technology yeah can they report or anchor the news do we know no, not, we not find yet? Out about that one yeah. all right because we like you Stephen. we yeah. don't want we don't want to like see atlas well. here all right <laughs> when we come back caitlin clark fever since she was picked first in the wnba draft her jersey has sold out tickets for her first game with the indiana fever selling for three thousand bucks the new rumors she could soon sign an eight-figure deal and get her own shoe can you guess the company that's next
people really don't know what's going to happen. Only a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. <laughs> There is some late breaking news for hours in the Iowa caucuses by the man with everything. All right, it just did too. The NBC News mobile app. Get connected to your favorite news shows. For the top stories, breaking news, and live video, download the NBC News mobile app now. Democracy is happening now. Welcome to a big night that could help shape Republican politics for years to come. Now never stops. It comes down to turnout. Who shows up? Is it going to be that big block of independence? Now is where it counts. What are the issues that matter most to you guys? What did this debate change for you? Their number one issue is the economy. 2024, who's your candidate? The race is on now. The countdown has begun. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. What do we know that voters care about? The economy, right? You are seeing that firsthand yourself on the ground there today. This is two things. It is pretty big medical news. It is also a pretty big mystery. And oh, by the way, it's driven by one of the most controversial people in the United States. What's happening? They have tweaked my monitor, and I can see now you are, in fact, Soaking wet. I am deeply sorry. <laughs> my I apologize to for Jackson the many now questions. Will never be I, questioned. <laughs> Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. All right, finally tonight, the Caitlin Clark fever is on. From ticket sales to jerseys, the WNBA's number one draft pick is turning up the heat in basketball, obsessed Indiana and across the country, really. As NBC's Guad Venegas reports, the rookie is already on a path to superstardom and could be one step closer to the deal of a lifetime. Check it out. The Indiana Fever select Caitlin Clark. After going to Indiana as the number one draft pick, Caitlin Clark's popularity is now reaching a fever pitch. She's just a great shooter overall, great player. She's a team player. I love that about her. The Athletic reporting the 22-year-old basketball star is nearing a lucrative eight-figure endorsement deal with giant Nike that would include a signature shoe, which would see her joining the ranks of sports legends like Michael Jordan, LeBron James, and Serena Williams. Please welcome Caitlin Clark. In Indiana, excited fans lining up to get their hands on number 22 merch. So I got the Clark Effect t-shirt, and then we got the hat for my dad because he wanted it. She's also shattering sales online. Sportswear retailer Fanatics says her Indiana Fever jersey is their top-selling jersey for a first-round draft pick ever and that they're already sold out. At times, like, it doesn't feel real. I don't know. I think the biggest thing, like, I try to remember is, like, how grateful I am to have this opportunity. Fans might also have to shell out some big bucks to see the star play. Some courtside tickets to the Fever home opener now listed for a whopping $3,000 on Ticketmaster resale. I expect, you know, big numbers this, this summer. And, um, you know, I think just people couldn't be more excited about where this organization is going. The Clark expected to dominate on the court and on the air. The WNBA announcing 36 of the Fever's 40 games will be streamed or broadcast nationally, the most of any team in the league. Here to comment is Caitlin Clark. Clark already crossing over into mainstream celebrity status with a surprise appearance on SNL. I am a fan, Caitlin, by the way. Really, Michael? Because I heard that little apron joke you did. <laughs> and magazines writing splashy articles about her life and boyfriend. But through it all, the Iowa native Clark says she's staying true to her roots. People might think I'm crazy for wanting to stay in the Midwest, but like that's just who I am. That's where my roots are. Um, I love the people here. All while giving confidence to a new generation of Indiana basketball stars. Kaylin Clark's like always been like a mentor to me because she's been really good at basketball and I want to be like her when I'm older. I will be looking for those Caitlin Clark sneakers. I can promise you that. Thanks so much for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way.
Tonight, the full 12-person jury now selected in Donald Trump's hush money trial after two jurors were dismissed. The judge declaring we have our jury after seating the 12 people who will decide the former president's fate, including an investment banker, a retired private wealth manager, and a speech therapist. And the two jurors who were dismissed, a nurse and an IT worker, why they were excused, our team at the courthouse. Also tonight, Columbia University's president calling in the NY NYPD to arrest more than 100 pro-Palestinian protesters a day after she testified before Congress about anti-Semitism on campus. The widespread 911 outage in four states, millions unable to call for emergency help. The cause now being traced to a single light pole. The 18-year-old arrested in Maryland accused of threatening to shoot up schools. The chilling 129-page document and more that led a friend to call police. The close call at Reagan National Airport, two planes nearly colliding on the runway. You'll hear the frantic call from the tower. Fifteen members of RFK Jr.'s family sending him a sharp rebuke, blasting his presidential bid and endorsing President Biden. And the Southern rock legend and co-founder of the Allman Brothers Band, remembering the iconic Dickie Betts. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening and welcome. The Trump hush money trial appears to be speeding toward opening statements tonight more quickly than many imagine, with 12 jurors now selected to hear the case and one of six alternate jurors also chosen late today. The rapid assembly of a jury panel came after the process appeared to suffer a serious setback earlier when two previously selected jurors were dismissed from the case. One who had second thoughts about her ability to be impartial, the other over an apparent failure to disclose interactions with law enforcement. The Manhattan jury will sit in judgment of whether Mr. Trump illegally falsified business records as part of a scheme to conceal hush money payments to a porn star with whom he's alleged to have had an affair, allegations he denies. Laura Jarrett has late developments. Tonight, a full jury of 12 now sworn in in former President Donald Trump's hush money criminal trial after the day began with drama surrounding two jurors dismissed. The full jury now including an investment banker, security engineer, retired private wealth manager, speech therapist, physical therapist, someone in e-commerce, and a product development manager. I'm supposed to be in a lot of different places campaigning, but I've been here all day uh, on a trial that really is a very unfair trial. The whole world is watching this New York scam. Mr. Trump arriving this morning with seven jurors sworn in, only to see that number quickly go down to five after an oncology nurse who had said during questioning that no one was above the law. I'm here to just hear the facts. Tell the judge today she had concerns she could not be impartial about Mr. Trump and worries about her identity becoming public after loved ones figured out she'd been impaneled. The other juror, an older IT consultant who had called the presumptive GOP nominee fascinating and mysterious in court Tuesday, excused today after prosecutors said he was arrested for tearing down conservative political ads decades ago and did not reveal it on his juror questionnaire. But late today, those additional jurors selected to serve, among them an investment banker who said he follows Mr. Trump's Truth Social posts and has seen quotes from his book, The Art of the Deal, but has not read it. The retired private wealth manager who said he does yoga every morning and that speech therapist saying of Mr. Trump, I tend not to agree with a lot of his politics and his decisions as a president, but said she can be impartial. At one point, a prospective juror even apologizing to the former president for her past criticisms of him on social media. She was dismissed. Today's events underscoring the challenges of seating a jury in deep blue Manhattan, where 85% of people voted for President Biden. When the pool of 96 prospective jurors was asked this morning if they could be impartial in judging the likely Republican nominee, nearly 50 hands went up saying they could not and were dismissed. Kat was among them. I couldn't be impartial. It's a historical case and, you know, this is going to define so many things. Um, but at the same time, our job as a juror, right, is to be impartial.
Mr. Trump sounding off about the jury selection process, writing he was given the second worst venue in the country. He's accused of doctoring his internal business records to hide a reimbursement payment to Michael Cohen, who allegedly paid off Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 election so she couldn't go public about an affair. Mr. Trump denies any sexual relationship with Daniels and has pled not guilty. And Laura, the jury is seven men and five women, and there was one alternate selected today. That's right, Lester. One alternate selected, five more to go, but one of the most remarkable moments, Lester, happening at the very end of the day when the prosecution said it would not turn over the names of the first three witnesses that it plans to call at this trial. That's something that's routinely done so that the defense can prepare. But the prosecution here, Lester, saying they're so worried that Mr. Trump will say something about them on social media, and ju the judge in this case agreed, Lester. All right, Laura, thank you. We turn now to a stunning scene at Columbia University in New York today. Police in riot gear moving in to clear an encampment of students protesting the war in Gaza. Dozens arrested. Antonia Hilton is there. Antonia, describe the scene for us. Lester, right now press isn't being allowed on campus. So what you're seeing here are protests that have spilled over to the public streets. Protests that, as you can see, appear to be far from over. Confrontation at Columbia today. Police removing protesters from campus. Citing extraordinary circumstances, Columbia University President Manu Shafiq called in the NYPD to clear an encampment of pro-Palestinian student demonstrators. The encampment set up Wednesday morning, the same day Shafiq testified on Capitol Hill about anti-Semitism on campus. We must uphold freedom of speech because it's essential to our academic mission, but we cannot and shouldn't tolerate abuse of this privilege to harass and, disc and, and discriminate. In a letter to the university community, Shafiq noted, protests have a storied history at Columbia, where anti-Vietnam demonstrators took over buildings on campus in 1968. But in asking for help from the police, she said, the encampment and related disruptions was a clear and present danger to the substantial functioning of the university. We are risking like our academic standing just to like show the administrators that we are not okay with their decisions. Several demonstrators today stomping on an Israeli flag. Some students saying they feel unsafe on campus. I feel as though um, people are kind of weaponizing um, anti-Semitism. <laughs> Demonstrators telling us they plan to keep their protests going despite the police presence. Do you feel like this administration has clamped down on students and faculty members' free speech? 100% yes, I do believe that. New York City's mayor tonight saying police made more than 100 arrests on a campus severely divided. Antonia Hilton, NBC News, New York. The government is investigating why critical 911 centers in multiple states were knocked offline. Experts say it exposes a critical national security vulnerability. Here's Tom Costello. Breaking this afternoon, Honolulu police reporting a brief 911 outage in the city, coming after more outages Wednesday night on the mainland. You may have difficulty reaching us. Internally, we're having difficulty receiving 911 calls as well. 6 p.m. Central Time, multiple 911 centers suddenly cut off in parts of four states, South Dakota, Nebraska, Nevada, and Texas. Several call centers pushed out emergency alerts telling locals to use their cell phones or text for help. To our knowledge, we have never experienced an outage of this magnitude or duration. Today, phone service provider Lumen Technologies blamed three state outages on a cut fiber line due to a third-party company installing a light pole, writing, we restored all services in approximately two and a half hours. We are dealing with 911 in last century technology. We're in the 21st century. We need to ensure that our 911 systems are current technology. While an isolated event, experts say the outage underscores an urgent concern. 911, what is the address of the emergency? U.S. cybersecurity has warned that hackers want to exploit vulnerabilities to disrupt or degrade 911 service. At risk, sensitive data that could affect emergency response abilities. And was anybody injured? Already, ransomware attacks on 911 centers, including Bucks County, Pennsylvania, have forced dispatchers to revert to manual systems. In 2017, 911 centers in more than a dozen states were paralyzed. 
Now, amid heightened global tensions and a divisive election looming here at home, concern that critical emergency communications can easily be undermined. Chris Krebs is the federal government's former cybersecurity chief. The homeland, as we say, is no longer a sanctuary. So we really have to bake in cybersecurity resilience measures into every business plan, into every operational plan. Tom Costello, NBC News, Washington. A Maryland teenager is under arrest, charged with threatening mass violence. Yamiche Alcindor reports on how a friend raised red flags. Tonight, 18-year-old Alex Yee is in custody after Maryland police say he threatened to shoot up his high school, all detailed in a 129-page memoir that discussed killing students. Yee shared the document with a friend, but said it was a work of fiction. According to charging documents, that friend called the Baltimore County Police because they believed a school shooting was imminent. I'm worried because now I don't know what to think. I don't know who in this school is going through something that I might not see. Ye had been attending the high school virtually since 2022 and recently spent time in a psychiatric facility due to suicidal and homicidal thoughts, according to police. In the memoir, he detailed how he'd do it and who his ideal victims would be. The document opens by saying it is a work of fiction, but Yee's friend told police the book's main character mirrored Yee in many ways. They were both Asian and felt bullied by other students. Authorities detailed other red flags that led to the misdemeanor charge, including medical officials previously reporting that Yee was preoccupied with self-harming, school shootings, and explosives. Authorities say Yee's Instagram chat logs also reference wanting to be a famous serial killer. While Yee's only firearm was a BB gun, police said his internet searches included gun ranges near me and searches about school shootings, including Sandy Hook and Parkland. Yee's father told police he was not concerned about his son's mental health status and had been aware that he was writing what he called a novel. Yee is currently being held in custody where he awaits a bond hearing. Lester. All right, Yamish, thank you. Let's turn to the 2024 presidential campaign. Today, prominent members of the Kennedy family endorse President Biden, even though Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is running against him. Gabe Gutierrez reports. Today, with his opponents stuck in court, President Biden on the attack in battleground Pennsylvania. The 2024 election about two fundamentally different visions for America. Donald Trump's vision is one of anger, hate, revenge, and retribution. The campaign touting the endorsement of 15 Kennedy family members, even though one of their own, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., is running against him as an independent. The best way forward for America is to reelect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to four more years. Responding to his family's endorsement of his opponent, today RFK Jr. posted on social media, we are divided in our opinions, but united in our love for each other. The environmental lawyer and anti-vaccine activist first ran as a Democrat. Now, Kennedy's independent campaign is polling above 10 percent in a few key swing states, where Biden is also trailing Trump. Democrats are aggressively attacking third-party candidates like Kennedy, whom they view as a threat to President Biden's re-election, people involved tell NBC News. Though it's not clear which candidate, President Biden or former President Trump, would lose more votes to RFK Jr. Kennedy told NBC's Von Hillier this in February. I hope to draw equal numbers from both of them. I think at this point I'm probably drawing more from President Trump. A source familiar with the Biden campaign's planning says the Kennedy family endorsement was months in the making. Notably, they didn't mention RFK Jr.'s name once at today's event. Lester? Gabe Gutierrez, thank you. Now to Washington and Speaker Mike Johnson pushing ahead with a plan to pass new aid for Israel and Ukraine despite backlash from some fellow Republicans. Ryan Nobles is at the Capitol for us tonight. Ryan, is the Speaker's job still in jeopardy? It may be, Lester. The Speaker was confronted today by members of the House Freedom Caucus on the House floor. They are not backing away from their threat to attempt to remove him from office if he moves ahead with a vote on these foreign aid bills that include funding for Ukraine. But the Speaker is not backing down, and the House is aiming for votes on these measures as soon as this weekend. Ukrainian leaders have said that their soldiers on the front lines are running out of ammunition. But Speaker Johnson says that he supports funding for Ukraine, even if it costs him his job. Lester? Ryan Nobles, thank you. In 60 seconds, urgent calls from the control tower. We're 2937, stop. As two planes on a collision course avoid hitting each other with little time to spare. 
Back now with the scary close call at Reagan National Airport near Washington, D.C. Two planes nearly colliding on the runway. Emily Akena now on what went wrong. A hair-raising moment today on one of America's busiest runways. Stop, Southwest 2937, stop. An air traffic controller frantically telling a Southwest plane to stop. We stopped. We were cleared to cross runway four. After it was cleared to taxi across a runway at Reagan National in Washington, D.C. When calm, runway four, clear for takeoff. A JetBlue plane was about to take off, according to the FAA, but then also suddenly told to abort. And we're stopping JetBlue 1654. A source says the planes came less than 1,000 feet of each other. Something went amiss, causing uh, one controller to clear the airplane to take off and another ground controller clearing the Southwest Airlines to cross that same active runway. So to me, it looks like it's what the FAA calls an operational error uh, involving an air traffic control issue. After a string of near misses, an independent safety review found last year overtime is at a historically high level for air traffic controllers. And challenges, including staffing shortages, have caused an erosion of safety margins that must be urgently addressed. Tonight, the FAA reports serious runway incursions are trending down. Stop, stop, we're 2937, stop. Regarding the latest scare, both airlines say they're working closely with federal investigators to determine what went wrong. Emily Ikeda, NBC News. And next, pollen season. What's causing such an eye-watering spring for so many? Allergy sufferers, it is not your imagination. For many, allergy season really is getting worse. Ann Thompson explains why and what you can do about it. This is where David Gitler loves to be. Outdoors, playing sports. But his worsening allergies make fun, even school, difficult for the eight-year-old. His eyes are like really bloodshot. He's just so uncomfortable that we've kept him home. Hi, David. Trend Hi. allergist Alyssa Hirsch sees in her Long Island, New York clinic. He told me that your eyes are itchy and watery. Yeah. We have more patients coming in now with severe allergy symptoms. They're coming in sneezing, congested. At University of Michigan, Allison Steiner is putting up a pollen counter to track the trend driven by climate change. Climate change is making pollen increase. It's both increasing the magnitude of pollen as well as the length and duration of the pollen season. This is an example of a birch pollen grain. Steiner says the pollen season is already 20 days longer and concentrations are up 21 percent. And the severe thunderstorms in a changing climate break up the pollen into smaller pieces that go deep into the body. While the large pollen grains are stopped by your upper respiratory system, the tinier particles can get into your lungs and they can trigger more respiratory distress. This is common ragweed. On the pollen grains, Columbia's Louis Ziska sees more proteins, another trouble sign for allergy sufferers. If there's more of that foreign substance, then you're going to show a stronger response. Proteins making the pollen more potent, multiplied by the carbon dioxide fueling climate change. The carbon dioxide is changing the chemistry of the pollen? Yes, exactly. To keep the pollen outside, doctors recommend taking off your shoes before going in, washing your hands and face, and wiping down your phone, glasses, and sunglasses. David Gitler uses a tray of medicines to cope as his mom worries his allergies will get worse. It scares me because I see how much she suffers from it every year. With no eyes. relief in sight. Good job. Ann Thompson, NBC News, New York. Good, and coming up for us tonight, he gave us Ramblin' Man and so much more. We'll remember guitar gunslinger Dickie Betts of the Allman Brothers. Next. Finally, tributes are pouring in for a rock icon, Dickie Betts of the Allman Brothers Band, who passed away today. Sam Brock now on the sound and the songwriting he's being celebrated for tonight. You might say Dickie Betts was born to play the guitar and his music, the stuff of Southern rock legends. An early guitar virtuoso and bedrock of the famed Allman Brothers Band, Betts died at the age of 80 following a period of declining health. His 
His Hall of Fame guitar skills and songwriting spawn timeless tunes. From Midnight Rider to Ramblin' Man. He found a kindred spirit in Dwayne Allman, who along with brother Greg, created a group that would reshape the genre of Southern rock, blending blues, country, and jazz. They were also touched by tragedy, Dwayne Allman dying in a motorcycle accident in 1971. Tonight, Bet's loved one sang Dickie was larger than life, and his loss will be felt worldwide. And even the Carter Center weighing in, posting on X, President Carter loved their music, and the band campaigned on his behalf. You are truly a magnificent and great crowd. Inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, his imprint on music will be remembered as fiery, hell-raising, and forever a rambling man. Sam Brock, NBC News. And that's Nightly News. Join us tomorrow for our interview of Iran's foreign minister. Thank you for watching, everyone. I'm Lester Holt. Please take care of yourself and each other. Good night. Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. What's the message that you're trying to get out to young people? No, what is in the drug supply? We've got important news this hour about your money. Mental health, big picture, why is it so tough right now? News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. We're talking possibly a trillion galaxies. Yes. That is a number that is just so hard to compute. Whether it's the moon, whether it's Mars, it feels like we're on the cusp of something big. What is going to happen now? We're back and forth, because Go ahead, let's see you. A good morning begins with hope and optimism, a chance to start fresh. We want to welcome you in to share a moment that brightens your day, because every day deserves the best start. This is where it all begins. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. What is going to happen now? We're back and forth, Go ahead, let me see you. What's the message that you're trying to get out to young people? No, what is in the drug supply? We've got important news this hour about your money. Mental health, big picture, why is it so tough right now? News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. Tonight, the full 12-person jury now selected in Donald Trump's hush money trial after two jurors were dismissed. The judge declaring we have our jury after seating the 12 people who will decide the former president's fate, including an investment banker, a retired private wealth manager, and a speech therapist. And the two jurors who were dismissed, a nurse and an IT worker, why they were excused, our team at the courthouse. Also tonight, Columbia University's president calling in the N. NYPD to arrest more than 100 pro-Palestinian protesters a day after she testified before Congress about anti-Semitism on campus. The widespread 911 outage in four states, millions unable to call for emergency help. The cause now being traced to a single light pole. The 18-year-old arrested in Maryland accused of threatening to shoot up schools. The chilling 129-page document and more that led a friend to call police. The close call at Reagan National Airport, two planes nearly colliding on the runway. You'll hear the frantic call from the tower. Fifteen members of RFK Jr.'s family sending him a sharp rebuke, blasting his presidential bid and endorsing President Biden. And the Southern rock legend and co-founder of the Allman Brothers Band, remembering the iconic Dickie Betts. This is NBC Nightly News with Lester Holt. Good evening and welcome. The Trump hush money trial appears to be speeding toward opening statements tonight more quickly than many imagine, with 12 jurors now selected to hear the case and one of six alternate jurors also chosen late today. The rapid assembly of a jury panel came after the process appeared to suffer a serious setback earlier when two previously selected jurors were dismissed from the case. One who had second thoughts about her ability to be impartial, the other over 
an apparent failure to disclose interactions with law enforcement. The Manhattan jury will sit in judgment of whether Mr. Trump illegally falsified business records as part of a scheme to conceal hush money payments to a porn star with whom he's alleged to have had an affair, allegations he denies. Laura Jarrett has late developments. Tonight, a full jury of 12 now sworn in in former President Donald Trump's hush money criminal trial after the day began with drama surrounding two jurors dismissed. The full jury now including an investment banker, security engineer, retired private wealth manager, speech therapist, physical therapist, someone in e-commerce, and a product development manager. I'm supposed to be in a lot of different places campaigning, but I've been here all day on a trial that really is a very unfair trial. The whole world is watching this New York scam. Mr. Trump arriving this morning with seven jurors sworn in, only to see that number quickly go down to five after an oncology nurse who had said during questioning that no one was above the law. I'm here to just hear the facts. Tell the judge today she had concerns she could not be impartial about Mr. Trump and worries about her identity becoming public after loved ones figured out she'd been impaneled. The other juror, an older IT consultant who had called the presumptive GOP nominee fascinating and mysterious in court Tuesday, excused today after prosecutors said he was arrested for tearing down conservative political ads decades ago and did not reveal it on his juror questionnaire. But late today, those additional jurors selected to serve. Among them, an investment banker who said he follows Mr. Trump's Truth Social posts and has seen quotes from his book, The Art of the Deal, but has not read it. The retired private wealth manager who said he does yoga every morning and that speech therapist saying of Mr. Trump, I tend not to agree with a lot of his politics and his decisions as a president, but said she can be impartial. At one point, a prospective juror even apologizing to the former president for her past criticisms of him on social media. She was dismissed. Today's events underscoring the challenges of seating a jury in deep blue Manhattan, where 85% of people voted for President Biden. When the pool of 96 prospective jurors was asked this morning if they could be impartial in judging the likely Republican nominee, nearly 50 hands went up saying they could not and were dismissed. Kat was among them. I couldn't be impartial. It's a historical case and, you know, this is going to define so many things. Um, but at the same time, our job as a juror, right, is to be impartial. Mr. Trump sounding off about the jury selection process, writing he was given the second worst venue in the country. He's accused of doctoring his internal business records to hide a reimbursement payment to Michael Cohen, who allegedly paid off Stormy Daniels ahead of the 2016 election so she couldn't go public about an affair. Mr. Trump denies any sexual relationship with Daniels and has pled not guilty. And Laura, the jury is seven men and five women, and there was one alternate selected today. That's right, Lester. One alternate selected, five more to go, but one of the most remarkable moments, Lester, happening at the very end of the day when the prosecution said it would not turn over the names of the first three witnesses that it plans to call at this trial. That's something that's routinely done so that the defense can prepare. But the prosecution here, Lester, saying they're so worried that Mr. Trump will say something about them on social media, and ju the judge in this case agreed, Lester. All right, Laura, thank you. We turn now to a stunning scene at Columbia University in New York today. Police in riot gear moving in to clear an encampment of students protesting the war in Gaza. Dozens arrested. Antonia Hilton is there. Antonia, describe the scene for us. Lester, right now press isn't being allowed on campus. So what you're seeing here are protests that have spilled over to the public streets. Protests that, as you can see, appear to be far from over. Confrontation at Columbia today. Police removing protesters from campus. Citing extraordinary circumstances, Columbia University President Manu Shafiq called in the NYPD to clear an encampment of pro-Palestinian student demonstrators. The encampment set up Wednesday morning, the same day Shafiq testified on Capitol Hill about anti-Semitism on campus. We must uphold freedom of speech because it's essential to our academic mission, but we cannot and shouldn't tolerate abuse of this privilege to harass and, disc and, and discriminate. In a letter to the university community, Shafiq noted, 
Protests have a storied history at Columbia, where anti-Vietnam demonstrators took over buildings on campus in 1968. But in asking for help from the police, she said, the encampment and related disruptions pose a clear and present danger to the substantial functioning of the university. We are risking like our academic standing just to like show the administrators that we are not okay with their decisions. Several demonstrators today stomping on an Israeli flag. Some students saying they feel unsafe on campus. I feel as though um, people are kind of weaponizing um, anti-Semitism. Demonstrators telling us they plan to keep their protests going despite the police presence. Do you feel like this administration has clamped down on students and faculty members' free speech? 100% yes, I do believe that. New York City's mayor tonight saying police made more than 100 arrests on a campus severely divided. Antonia Hilton, NBC News, New York. The government is investigating why critical 911 centers in multiple states were knocked offline. Experts say it exposes a critical national security vulnerability. Here's Tom Costello. Breaking this afternoon, Honolulu police reporting a brief 911 outage in the city, coming after more outages Wednesday night on the mainland. You may have difficulty reaching us. Internally, and we're having difficulty receiving 911 calls as well. 6 p.m. Central Time, multiple 911 centers suddenly cut off in parts of four states, South Dakota, Nebraska, Nevada, and Texas. Several call centers pushed out emergency alerts, telling locals to use their cell phones or text for help. To our knowledge, we have never experienced an outage of this magnitude or duration. Today, phone service provider Lumen Technologies blamed three state outages on a cut fiber line due to a third-party company installing a light pole, writing, we restored all services in approximately two and a half hours. We are dealing with 911 and last century technology. We're in the 21st century. We need to ensure that our 911 systems are current technology. While an isolated event, experts say the outage underscores an urgent concern. 911, what is the address of the emergency? U.S. cybersecurity has warned that hackers want to exploit vulnerabilities to disrupt or degrade 911 service. At risk, sensitive data that could affect emergency response abilities. Was anybody injured? Already, ransomware attacks on 911 centers, including Bucks County, Pennsylvania, have forced dispatchers to revert to manual systems. In 2017, 911 centers in more than a dozen states were paralyzed. Now, amid heightened global tensions and a divisive election looming here at home, concern that critical emergency communications can easily be undermined. Chris Krebs is the federal government's former cybersecurity chief. The homeland as we say, is no longer a sanctuary. So we really have to bake in cybersecurity resilience measures into every business plan, into every operational plan. Tom Costello, NBC News, Washington. A Maryland teenager is under arrest, charged with threatening mass violence. Yamish Alcindor reports on how a friend raised red flags. Tonight, 18-year-old Alex Yi is in custody after Maryland police say he threatened to shoot up his high school all detailed in a 129-page memoir that discussed killing students. He shared the document with a friend, but said it was a work of fiction. According to charging documents, that friend called the Baltimore County Police because they believed a school shooting was imminent. I'm worried because now I don't know what to think. I don't know who in this school is going through something that I might not see. He had been attending the high school virtually since 2022 and recently spent time in a psychiatric facility due to suicidal and homicidal thoughts, according to police. In the memoir, he detailed how he'd do it and who his ideal victims would be. The document opens by saying it is a work of fiction, but Yi's friend told police the book's main character mirrored Yi in many ways. They were both Asian and felt bullied by other students. Authorities detailed other red flags that led to the misdemeanor charge, including medical officials previously reporting that Yi was preoccupied with self-harming, school shootings, and explosives. Authorities say Yi's Instagram chat logs also reference wanting to be a famous serial killer. 
While Yi's only firearm was a BB gun, police said his internet searches included gun ranges near... Hello, welcome back. Let's just uh, update you with the breaking news which we've been bringing you in the last few minutes here on uh, Sky News. It, it all started with uh, Iran's Fars News Agency which said uh, an explosion was heard at an airport in the Iranian central city of Isfahan. Now, that cause wasn't immediately known at the time, but according to US media, that was an Israeli strike. Flights uh, showing uh, have been diverted, tracking there, have been diverted uh, from uh, the area. That's where it all started, in fact. Commercial flights began uh, diverting their routes. This incident, of course, comes uh, amid heightened uh, tension in the wider Middle East after Iran's barrage of uh, missile and drone attacks that it sent towards Israel on Saturday, Israel saying 99% of them uh, were intercepted. Um, Dubai-based carriers Emirates and Fly Dubai uh, are among those airlines uh, diverting around Western Iran around 4.30 uh, local time. We were hearing from uh, Alistair Bunker, weren't we, that uh, Isfahan is around uh, 200 miles south of Iran's capital, uh, Tehran, and it's uh, a manufacturing uh, base uh, possibly for aircraft. So it could be a limited strike if indeed uh, this is uh, Israel carrying out retaliation for what happened on Saturday. But of course, there has been heightened tension in the region, calls uh, for Israel to show restraint from uh, world leaders over the last few days following Saturday's attack. And uh, Israel had vowed to, to respond. It wasn't clear how it would uh, following the weekend attack, but uh, clear uh, tensions in the region, which has been uh, bracing itself for further escalation. Iran had said that it would uh, respond to any uh, retaliation by... Or Iran said it would uh, respond to any retaliation by Israel. Um, let's just remind you, this goes back, of course, to the 1st of April, uh, when there was uh, a strike on uh, the Iranian consulates in the Syrian capital, Damascus, widely uh, blamed on Israel. Israel's never said it did it, but uh, most people uh, convinced that that was uh, the case. So Iran taking uh, its uh, revenge some 13 days later, and now some five days after that, it looks like uh, Israel has uh, retaliated. Um, so we know that at the moment, all the reports are saying that uh, the city of Isfahan has been hit, and specifically uh, the airport there, which is uh, believed to be a manufacturing site for Iranian aircraft. And a uh, number of uh, flights have been diverted, commercial flights being uh, rerouted. And this all started uh, because it happened without explanation. Um, one semi-official news agency uh, in uh, Iran had claimed there had been explosions heard and that's uh, how it all started to, to come in uh, a few minutes ago. So we do know that uh, flights have been suspended over several cities according to Iranian state media but uh, the central city of Isfahan, some uh, 200 miles south of uh, Tehran, uh, looks like uh, it has been affected uh, the most. Uh, so this looks like uh, Israel has struck after what happened on Saturday night. The uh, attack on Israel, 99% of these uh, projectiles were brought down. The RAF uh, was involved, wasn't it, in uh, bringing uh, some of them down. Uh, but uh, some did uh, get through. Uh, world leaders, uh, the G7 uh, leaders of the uh, industrialised nations, had uh, urged Israel over recent days to show restraint uh, following what happens. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, it has to be said, hasn't uh, been seen in uh, recent days, but uh, the more hardline members of his war cabinet have uh, been urging him to act and to act swiftly. So, in fact, if this is uh, retaliation for what happened on Saturday night, this would have come uh, five days after uh, what happened. Uh, news coming in 
uh, fairly uh, quickly now being reported by various uh, news agencies. According to the Fars News Agency in Iran, air defence systems have been activated in response to uh, what it describes as an object suspected to be a drone. So something clearly uh, happening in uh, the skies above, specifically this Iranian city of uh, Isfahan, some 200 miles south of Tehran. Uh, let's return to Alistair Bunkle, who's following events from Jerusalem. And Ali, could you, you mentioned before, could you explain to us possibly then why this city specifically or this air base may have been targeted? Well, I think it's the location of part of Iran's um, aircraft manufacturing industry. And so and look, everything I say is caveated by the fact that this only happened within the last couple of hours and it is dawn is only, uh, the sun is only just rising across the Middle East. And so we, we really do need to find out more detail about what has happened. But based on early indications, it could be that Israel has hit uh, a, an air base that is used to, to manufacture possibly drones. And if that were the case, I think there's a there's an obvious connection then between what has happened tonight and what happened on Saturday night. And therefore, Israel, like the US and UK did yesterday when they announced sanctions against Iran, those sanctions were targeting the aircraft manufacturing industry and missile manufacturing industry. So they, they were deliberately... Um, uh, there were deliberate sanctions at you know, deliberate entities. And this would look at the moment as though it's a deliberate airstrike against a similar or the same um, area of Iranian manufacturing. And I think, therefore, if that turns out to be correct, and if, 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 if it turns out that if this is a single strike, limited number, of civi um, limited number of casualties, probably none of them civilian because it was on a military base, um, but limited number of casualties because it, it was the middle of the night and it's very much at the manufacturing industry, then I think what Israel will be saying is, look, we, we didn't go um, for the sort of the top option that we maybe might have wanted to do. We didn't strike uh, anything to do with Iran's nuclear program, for example. We didn't aim it at uh, anything to do with the civilian population in Iran. This was a retaliatory strike, but it was a very limited retaliatory strike. It's not the sort of the devastating strike that perhaps some of the war cabinet had promised earlier in the week here. And that, in turn, you would think would, would limit whatever fallout is, is coming. Um, we have heard, as I mentioned a moment ago, the uh, FARS news agency in Iran saying air defence systems have been activated in response to an object uh, suspected to be a, a drone. Is that the kind of method that Israel would use uh, for this attack, for this uh, retaliation, or, or do we not know? Possibly. I think, I think probably not. I think if you look at the war games that the Israelis have simulated in the past um, that have, uh, have sort of, um, uh, simulated an attack on Iran. Uh, they've tended to use their, their fighter jets. They would use F-35 fighter jets, I suspect, because they have an F-35 base here. Um, I think they've got just under 40 F-35s. Uh, they are stealth aircraft. I mean, they can, they can pretty much get into Iran and out again, virtually undetected. Um, so I suspect that's what they would have used. Um, they have the range as well, just about. I mean, Israel has air to air refueling capacity. Um, but the other thing as well, I'd just be careful with, again, at this stage, is that when Iran reports that it's uh, either shot down missiles or targeted drones, you know, we just need to be careful about the, how true or not that is, because ultimately, if Israel has you know, flown a, a pair of F-35s into Iranian airspace and carried out an airstrike and got back out again. That's that's a little bit humiliating to the Iranians, especially when you think that they fired over 300 missiles and drones, including ballistic missiles, at Israel on Saturday night, and most of them didn't even make it as far as Israeli airspace. And the uh, the one percent that got through and landed did, you know, pretty minor damage, to be honest, to uh, to an airbase in southern Israel. What do you make of the timing of this coming five days after what Iran did? 
I think there has been moments over the last five days, I think, to be honest, I think there was moments in the hours after what happened on Saturday night where Israel, the military, the war cabinet were, were tempted to pull the trigger pretty quickly. And I think had they done so, it would have been a very different response to what we're seeing at the moment. So for whatever reason, uh, they've taken their time. I think that could be because they have come under a lot of international pressure, particularly from the Americans. But Lord Cameron was here this week saying that, you know, cool heads, let's not let's not do something that is going to not just open up a new front of war for Israel, but a, a new front against Iran of all people. Benjamin Netanyahu um, tends to be cautious. I know sort of sometimes it doesn't sound like it from what he says in his words, but he does tend to be a, a much more cautious um, leader, doesn't doesn't typically in his past lead uh, Israel into, into conflicts, also tends to put off difficult decisions um, until he can't put them off any longer. So, I mean, it could be any or, or a combination of those things. And then I think we need to look ahead as well. Passover starts at the beginning of next week, um, the, the Jewish Religious Festival. And I think the Israeli government would have wanted this crisis to be spiraling over into, into that holiday. Uh, maybe it will do. I mean, maybe we'll, we'll have to see what Iran does. But I think they probably wanted to do this, get it out of the way, and get it out of the way, leaving Iran a few days to respond, if that's what Iran's going to do um, before Passover starts. If this is uh, an Israeli attack, in response to what happened on Saturday, what happens now? Where does this go from here? I mean, all sides at the moment, it has to be said, this is, is a limited strike, if indeed that is what it turns out to be. But what happens? I mean, everyone said, haven't they, for the past near week, expressed concerns about the wider conflict in the Middle East spiralling out of control. Well, if you believe what um, Iran's leaders have had to say over the last 24 hours, then, you know, I'm looking up in the sky as the sun rises above Jerusalem now, expecting to see some incoming missiles because they said they would hit back immediately and um, with full force. I actually don't think that's what will happen. I think that the um, Iranian leadership can often speak with high emotion, but they tend to act in a more calibrated and uh, calculated manner. And if... And again, you know, if anyone just tuning in, it is a it's a caveated if because it's still the early hours. But if this turns out to be a single strike uh, on on a facility that we expect it has has been, then that to me also suggests de escalation. And I know it sounds contradictory to to say on the one hand it's an airstrike and on the other hand it's a de escalation, but. Israel would say, look, you know, we, if we've not taken out any civilian casualties, if we've not even, if there are, in fact, no casualties whatsoever, it was a very deliberate strike on a very carefully chosen target, one strike, we didn't go off your nuclear program, we didn't go into your cities, then I think Iran's response will then, uh, at least if it's, if it's a reasonable and um, uh, a response sort of in kind, would also lower the temperature again further still. That would be the hope anyway. All right. Um, we'll talk to you uh, in a short while. Uh, for now, Alistair, many thanks indeed, Alistair Bunkle there in Jerusalem. And uh, that is the breaking news. Uh, reports of explosions heard uh, near an airport in uh, Isfahan in Iran. Um, the US is uh, reporting it is uh, an Israeli strike. That has yet to be uh, confirmed. But uh, if that is the case, that will come five days after Iran's barrage uh, that it sent uh, towards Israel. More in a moment. Big stories don't always come from big cities. I'm Lisa Dowd and I'm Sky's Midlands correspondent and this is where I grew up. We can reveal that the driver who hit Harry Dunn is 42-year-old Anne Sekoulas. Just met the president and we never thought we'd get this far. This is what they're up against, that the wind is the really big problem. It is back-breaking work and the smoke is thick. It's been working well. Water levels are dropping, but no one knows what impact further rain will have. What would you do if this place wasn't open? So. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. It's really scary. We're terrified. 
in this community, I'm told that everybody knows someone affected by COVID. Hopefully this will be the last wave. I never knew they would make it. It's amazing. Change seems tantalisingly close in this corner of the UK. Wales was the first to introduce the plastic bag charge. This is my patch, my specialism. It's also my home. Lazarus and I'm Sky's reporter based in Delhi. Hello, welcome back. Let's uh, bring you our breaking news. You can see it on your screen there. An explosion has been heard near uh, an airport in uh, Iran and it looks like uh, these Israelis have struck back for what happened on Saturday night. This is Isfahan Airport, which is home to a major airbase uh, for the Iranian military as well. Uh, we understand as sites associated with its uh, nuclear programme, if indeed this is uh, Israel's uh, turn or retaliation for what happened. Uh, this does seem to be a, a limited strike on uh, a military base following uh, what happened Saturday night. Uh, more than 300 drones and missiles sent towards uh, Israel, 99% of which, it has to be said, were uh, intercepted. And uh, I can just tell you too, according to Reuters, um, the Israeli military uh, says that sirens have been sounded in uh, northern Israel. Now, uh, let's... Uh, talk to uh, Alistair Bunkle. This is uh, what he had to say to me. Uh, he's our Middle East correspondent, uh, Alistair Bunkle, in Jerusalem a few minutes ago. Um, aircraft, manufacturing industry. And so and look, everything I say is caveated by the fact that this only happened within the last couple of hours and it is dawn is only, uh, the sun is only just rising across the Middle East. And so we, we really do need to find out more detail about what has happened. But based on early indications, it could be that Israel has hit uh, a, an airbase that is used to, to manufacture possibly drones. And if that were the case, I think there's, a, there's an obvious connection then between what has happened tonight and what happened on Saturday night. And therefore, Israel, like the US and the UK did yesterday when they announced sanctions against Iran, those sanctions were targeting the aircraft manufacturing industry and missile manufacturing industry. So they, they were deliberately, um, uh, there were deliberate sanctions at you know, deliberate entities. And this would look at the moment as though it's a deliberate airstrike against a similar or the same um, area of I Iranian manufacturing. And I think, therefore, if that turns out to be correct, and if, 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 if it turns out that if this is a single strike, Limited number of um, limited number of casualties. Probably none of them civilian because it was on a military base. Um, but limited number of casualties because it, it was the middle of the night, and it's very much at the manufacturing industry. Then I think what Israel will be saying is, look, we we didn't go um, for the sort of the top option that we maybe might have wanted to do. We didn't strike uh, anything to do with Iran's nuclear program, for example. We didn't aim it at. Uh, anything to do with the civilian population in Iran. This was a retaliatory strike, but it was a very limited retaliatory strike. It's not the sort of the devastating strike that perhaps some of the war cabinet had promised earlier in the week here. And that in turn, you would think, would, would limit whatever fallout is, is coming. 
So that's uh, Alistair Bunkle speaking to me a short time uh, ago. So let's just uh, reiterate what we know or what we uh, appear to know. Israeli missiles have hit a site in Iran, according to uh, US media, while Iranian state media has reported an explosion in the centre of the country. This would be uh, five days after Iran launched a retaliatory drone strike, drone and missile strike on Israel. That follows um, an explosion at the Iranian consulates in Damascus, the Syrian capital, on the 1st of April there. So no confirmation, indeed, of uh, what is uh, going on. Um, I was reporting as well that, according to Reuters, the Israeli military says sirens have sounded in northern Israel. But uh, this site uh, that appears to have been targeted, it is uh, an airport some or an air base, uh, specifically some 200 miles uh, south of uh, Tehran. It's home to a major air base. It's a manufacturing site uh, for aircraft, uh, for military aircraft uh, specifically. And a number of sanctions, haven't they, been uh, imposed by uh, various countries on uh, Iran, specifically uh, targeting the defence uh, industry. Well, this uh, airport is uh, home to the uh, major air base and sites, uh, we're told, associated with its uh, nuclear program. So, as uh, Alistair Bunkle was telling us there, it appears to be a, a limited strike. We haven't heard of uh, any uh, civilian casualties there, but clearly a, a volatile uh, situation uh, right now. Um, this all started because uh, Iran's state-run news agency said uh, air defence batteries had been fired in a, a number of provinces. That was a report that has uh, come from Iran. That is uh, state media. Uh, state TV is saying that Iran's nuclear facilities uh, remain unharmed and that the situation in Isfahan, which is where this uh, airport, this air base, is around 215 miles south of uh, Tehran, is, in its words, uh, normal and that uh, no explosion has taken place on the ground. So whatever has happened uh, looks like it could be uh, a limited strike on this uh, specific base coming just uh, five days after Iran sent a barrage of drones and missiles towards Israel, over 300 of them. Uh, but as you'll know, 99% uh, of these uh, projectiles were intercepted by air defences in tandem with the US, Britain, France and Jordan. More to come on our breaking news on Sky News at the top of the hour.
Hello, uh, welcome back. This is Sky News. It is uh, four o'clock here and uh, you're waking up to our breaking news uh, this morning in that uh, according to US uh, officials or reports certainly coming out of the United States, Israeli missiles have hit a site in uh, Iran while uh, Iranian state media has reported an explosion in the centre of the country. This is days after Iran uh, launched a drone and missile uh, strike on Israel. No immediate uh, confirmation of the reports. One thing, though, is clear. Uh, the area affected in Iran is some 200 miles south of the capital, uh, Tehran. Uh, this is Isfahan Airport, which uh, has uh, an air base there, home to a major air base for the Iranian military, as well as sites... Uh, associated with uh, its uh, nuclear programme. We will, of course, uh, try to get uh, to the bottom of this, but if indeed this is uh, an Israeli uh, strike, it will come five days after uh, what happened uh, from the uh, Iranians. Uh, let us bring in our US correspondent, uh, James Matthews. And, uh, James, the Americans seem to think this is uh, an Israeli strike. What more are you being told? Well, the Americans are indicating that they were given notice from Israel that there would be a strike uh, in due course. Uh, that contrasts with the earlier Israeli strike on the Iranian consulate in Damascus. At that point, uh, there was a very short notice for the Americans, which had the value for the Americans in that they were able to say, we had virtually zero notice, therefore we have plausible deniability. Therefore, the United States wasn't drawn into that particular strike in the way, perhaps, that may be different this time. The question possibly for the Iranians will be, well, how much notice did the United States have of this and to what extent are they implicated because of that prior knowledge? The Israelis will have wanted to tell America prior to this action for a number of reasons. First of all, clearly uh, there was a diplomatic priority, but also a practical priority. The United States, it has bases, it has forces in that general vicinity. And for the sake of U.S. safety, uh, the Israelis will have want to have tipped off the United States to a degree about its plans. The difficulty and the complication now for the United States is how it handles the fact that it was told by Israel not just in terms of the case it would present to the Iranians in other words, but also in terms of its relations with Israel. You will remember that Joe Biden had a phone call with Benjamin Netanyahu in the wake of the Iranian drones attack. And he said to him, you got the win, take the win. He made it clear to Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli prime minister, that America would not support an Israeli counter-strike. So there will be tough discussions, one imagines, between the United States and Israel about Israel's course of action in, the, in recent hours. And the challenge, clearly, deep broader than that, is what does Biden do in terms of reining in potential escalation? Because this strike has escalation written all over it. Americans really think that... Israel might not hit back. We talk about Joe Biden saying, take the win, um, don't retaliate. But uh, only, what was it, yesterday, the day before, Benjamin Netanyahu said it was going to be up to the Israelis how they respond. Yes, I think we are at a stage where the Americans will say one thing to, one thing to the Israelis, but fully understand that Benjamin Netanyahu will act according to his wishes, his interests, and his vision of how to ex execute conflict in the Middle East. Over the past six months, it has happened often enough for Joe Biden to recognize that, yes, Israel is its biggest ally in the region. Yes, 
the United States will continue to support Israel for a number of fundamental reasons. But yes, equally, there is a limit to American control on what Israel does. There are several occasions on which Joe Biden has found himself sidelined by Israel, sidelined by Netanyahu, humiliated by Netanyahu, because Israel has acted in a way that it confounds American interests and America's vision of the best course to pursue in terms of Israel's interests, but also in terms of the bigger big picture. And that bigger picture has been all about keeping a lid on escalation for Joe Biden. Uh, uh, and uh, that how, how do you regard relations then between uh, America or certainly Joe Biden and uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu now, given the fact that obviously there was this clear rift, wasn't there, just a few weeks ago over what was happening in Gaza? It won't help uh, uh, relations. You're right to make that point, Nick. Uh, it, in, in terms of the personal relationship, uh, to be honest, it is frayed to the extent that uh, there are realistic questions about how uh, about the strength of that relationship, which is the, at the very heart of of what happens next, and that is a key difficulty. Uh, Biden is dealing with an individual that he can't trust, whose behaviour he cannot predict, and certainly cannot control. He has come to learn that through hard experience. And that's Biden's difficulty. He's in a position where he wants to call the shots, where he has an idea of where this conflict goes and how best to take it there. And Netanyahu too often turns a deaf ear to American wishes and American instructions. Netanyahu has once too often humiliated Biden, and Biden is seen by many of his critics to be weak, too weak, in terms of his relationship with Netanyahu and his influence over Netanyahu. That is causing him all sorts of problems on the international stage, but clearly on the domestic stage as well. We see it every day. We saw it today in Columbia University, uh, New York, intense protests wired into the Israel-Hamas conflict, intense protests, protests against Joe Biden and his policy, and what his critics would see as a lack of control and a lack of an ability to steer the course of conflict, which, you know, as an American president, leader of the free world, head of a superpower, who would present himself as an individual who can uh, have an influential say over what happens in the world in general, certainly a say over the behavior of one of its biggest allies and American-funded allies, then... It's a messy picture for Biden that has got messier over the course of the past six months. Right now, right now, tonight, uh, it could scarcely be more messy. America, Joe Biden will be extremely concerned about what happens next, about the response of Iran, because we have the Iranian foreign minister in America tonight. He is, has been attending the United Nations in a television interview. He Prior to this attack, he said if Israel does strike, then Iranian reaction will be immediate and it will be at a maximum. He didn't say quite that what that would entail, but these are clearly alarming terms. I spoke to the Iranian ambassador to the United Nations on Sunday. He echoed that sentiment, spoke in similar terms about what Iran would do to counter an Iranian strike. And the word he used, was decisive and resolute. I asked him what that meant. He wouldn't expand. But the words decisive and resolute um, clearly uh, raise concern. And the question would be, well, to what extent is it decisive and resolute beyond what we saw from Iran in recent days? More than 300 projectiles heading towards Israel. Is it more decisive than that? More resolute than that? Because if it is, then it's a cause for extreme worry, certainly worry around escalation. James, for now, uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, James Matthews. And I, I should uh, just tell uh, our viewers, uh, this has just uh, come in a, a 
person uh, familiar with what's going on has told our colleagues at, LB at NBC News that Israel carried out uh, an operation in Iran uh, tonight. And as James was mentioning there, uh, Israeli officials did notify uh, American officials that a response was coming. So uh, it seems clear what has happened, doesn't it? Let's uh, go to Trisha Parsi, founder of the National Iranian American Council, again in uh, Washington, uh, D.C. Very uh, good to see you. So I suppose no one's in any doubt uh, what has happened according to uh, this drip feeding of information we're getting. Hello there. Can you, sorry, Mr. Pass, can you hear me? I can hear you now, yes. yes Please sorry, repeat no, the question sorry, if you could. Thank you, thank you for, for bearing with us. Um, I was just saying, given the fact that these reports are coming out, um, somebody's told our colleagues at uh, NBC News, Israel carried out an operation in Iran, and um, my colleague James Matthews was mentioning there that Israeli officials had notified US officials that a response uh, to what happened on Saturday was coming. Um, it seems, well, this is it, and we know what has happened now. Certainly, there is no doubt that the Israelis were behind this, but we don't know quite yet exactly the extent of it. Are these uh, some limited strikes? Uh, were they specifically geared towards damage or just responding in order to make sure that the Iranian response to Israel bombing its embassy would not be the last uh, slap in this fight, but that the Israelis would get the last say in it? None of that is clear at this point. What is clear, however, is that Joe Biden's uh, efforts, if one can even call it that, frankly, to rein in Netanyahu, to prevent him from escalating matters, has been utterly unsuccessful and not surprisingly so, mindful of the fact that in his efforts to do so, he has not used any pressure. There's been absolutely no withholding of aid, no withholding of military sales, no making the military sales uh, contingent upon certain demands by the US, Everything Netanyahu has asked for, he has gotten. In fact, the original plan to aid him with $14 billion has now been increased to $26 billion. So he has every incentive to defy Biden because Biden has so far done nothing to impose on him any consequences when he does defy him. And We're as a talking result, talking about now, Mr. Netanyahu, he's got every right to, to respond, has he not, to what happened on Saturday night? And this here it, it, it has come, and, and many might argue that it is five days afterwards. So he has thought about the response. Well, thinking about the response and actually uh, adhering to what Biden was saying to him is, of course, two different things. Netanyahu, as the prime minister of Israel, of course, can choose as he wishes. But Biden, if he truly wants to avoid an escalation can, that, that can drag not only the entire region into war, but the United States into this war as well, has to make decisions based on U.S. interests. And the, the, according to him, avoiding a regional escalation has been paramount on his mind. That raises the question then why he actually hasn't put any real pressure on all of the different parties, including Israel, to make sure that we avoid this scenario. What do you think might happen now if this is a single response, a target, this, this air base in southern Iran, which seems to have perhaps limited casualties given that it was carried out uh, overnight and a specific target? Will that perhaps diffuse things now? Very much depends on exactly what uh, uh, the extent of the strikes are. Uh, the Iranians have put themselves in a corner with the rhetoric that they have used. They have said that they will respond swiftly uh, and ferociously to any attack, regardless of size and scope on their territory. At the same time, when if you look at what the Iranians are saying in their media right now, they are playing down the impact of this. Uh, and if that is one of the outcomes here, that the Iranians choose to say that this was not a particularly uh, uh, impactful strike, in fact, they're even saying that there wasn't missiles, there may have been drones, the explosions took place in the air, not on the ground, whether that's true or not. But if that is the line they choose to take, then perhaps this will not lead to a full escalation. But I'm very, very doubtful because the message from Tehran early on was a very defiant and, and very clear one. So it would be difficult for them to uh, get out of the corner that they put themselves in. So is it up to other countries to uh, try and step in to, to stop this escalating? 
Well, certainly other countries should do everything they can because they have an interest in preventing an escalation. But what Western countries have done so far has been to put pressure on the other countries and zero pressure on Israel. That formula has brought us to this moment. It's not a formula that has worked, nor is it likely to work in the future either. And that includes what uh, uh, the British government has done in this regard. Will these sanctions that have uh, been imposed on certain sections of the uh, Iranian defence forces have any effect, given the fact that it, it looks like this is what Israel has targeted, this uh, military uh, base, which is, uh, well, home to manufacturing, isn't it? Iran has been under various forms of sanctions for more than 40 years. None of these sanctions have had any strategic impact on the direction of Iran in the desired direction, I should say, that the West has wanted. And in the contrary, we have seen that the more Iran has been sanctioned, the less it has had to lose when it comes to um, uh, its foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the West. For instance, if Donald Trump had not walked out of the Iran nuclear deal, and if Biden actually had gone back into it, as he had promised that he would do, I very much doubt that Iran would be supporting Russia in the manner that it has been in Ukraine. But because almost all trade has been cut, and we are at the cost of seeing diplomatic relations also being cut, the Iranians have had very little to lose and very few other options but to gravitate towards Russia and China. So overall, in the long picture, these sanctions have been profoundly counterproductive. Um, we just got this uh, in from Iranian State TV, which is claiming around 12.30 uh, a.m. Uh, local time. Three drones were observed in the sky over Isfahan. This is this uh, airbase we were, were mentioning now, th this specific uh, target or, or location. The air defence system, it says, became active and destroyed these drones in the sky. That's uh, what Iranian state TV has to say. Will the Iranians be trying to, to play this down? That is certainly an option that they may uh, engage in because the alternative is going to be a major escalation uh, uh, and a war that clearly the Iranians have not wanted, uh, nor does Hezbollah want it. And this is where the incentive structure of Biden, Iran, and Netanyahu are quite different. Biden doesn't want to have a regional escalation and for good reasons. Neither have the Iranians shown any clear interest to go in this direction. That's why the retaliation against the uh, attack on their embassy was so surprising in the sense that, A, there wasn't retaliation in the scope of it. Uh, but Netanyahu's incentive structure is quite different. He wants to prolong and enlarge the war that he is engaged in because he knows very well the minute the war in Gaza ends, his political career ends and his prison sentence likely begins. So he has a very different incentive structure uh, than the others have in the region. The one entity that truly is uh, um, uh, benefiting from the enlargement and the prolongment of the war, which is again why it is so uh, perplexing that the approach that Biden has chosen to have with Netanyahu is to essentially treat him with kids' gloves rather than actually draw a clear red line in front of him. Nevertheless, Iran has used ballistic missiles, hasn't it, in Saturday's uh, strike. That, that surprised many. So does that show that uh, Iran is perhaps... Um, a force to be to be bargained with now, given the fact that that took many by by surprise. Drone attacks are, are one thing, but uh, these ballistic missiles that it sent, uh, albeit ninety nine percent of these projectiles destroyed. Actually, with eighty seven, according to the uh, updated news on that, uh, it was certainly surprising. Not just that they used missiles, but they actually attacked Israel from Iranian soil rather than using some of the entities in the region that they have armed and propped up. Uh, their intent clearly seemed to have been to do uh, what they call restoring their deterrence and creating a new equation in the region in which Israel cannot strike against Iranian targets, including Iranian embassies, without being struck back. And that's the equation the Israelis are trying to destroy with their attack now because they want to show that what the Iranians did did not deter Israel. At some point, other countries are going to have to sit both of these countries down and make them stop because the entire region can be engulfed in this war if this continues.
OK, uh, we'll leave it there. I do appreciate your time uh, this morning. I do appreciate you uh, waiting around as well. There's a lot of uh, breaking news no uh, to get through. But, Trita Parsi, thank you very much indeed for your time today. Thank you. And uh, do stay with us on uh, Sky News. There uh, has been a suspected uh, Israeli strike. Uh, that is what uh, NBC News is being told on a, a specific target, it looks like, uh, there in Iran, Isfahan International Airport, some 200 miles south of uh, Tehran. Uh, this is uh, perhaps highly relevant because it's uh, a major airbase for the uh, Iranian military and uh, something that's uh, said to be associated with its uh, nuclear programme. Uh, more on this breaking news for you in a couple of minutes. I think some of the articles are a little bit misleading. So let's remember what vegan food is, first of all. It's food that's free from meat, dairy, eggs and fish. And a message for all vegans and the entire nation is that what we need to be focusing on is fruit, vegetables, beans, legumes, whole grains. Those are the foods that are going to help prevent disease, feed your good gut bacteria, our good gut bacteria eat fibre, help us maintain a healthy weight really, really easily without dieting. Those are the foods we really, really need to be focusing on. But sometimes when people hear the word vegan food, they think all of the processed foods, and they can play a part. This is all vegan food in front of you, is this, it? This is all vegan food, absolutely. Would you eat it? I eat mostly whole foods, mostly plant-based whole foods, and that's what maintains my health, my gut, great energy, um, and hopefully is going to help prevent disease in my later life. Processed red meat and red meat are classified as type 1 and type 2 carcinogens, so we do need to worry about things like potential disease later in life. There's many other ways of making this sort of food. You can make it with other... Sub they're called substitutes, but really they're just foods in themselves, like tofu and tempeh, which are made from soybeans. You can make your curries without any of this sort of stuff, for example, using chickpeas instead of chicken. That would be the absolute healthier way of doing things. Um, there's a huge, huge range when it comes to plant-based meats. There are some that are made with less ingredients than others. There are some that are cheaper than others. There are some that taste really fantastic. There are some that are just very much soya-based, for example, or and a lot healthier. So it really, really depends. But personally, for me, there's other ones other than these that I might eat. But people love these, and like I said, they're great for transition, they're great for the environment, much better than meat. And we still know that these foods don't have the cholesterol in that meat have, or the trans fat, they often have less saturated fat. And we know that red meat, even two portions a week, can increase our risk of type 2 diabetes. Hello, welcome back. Let's just update you with the breaking news that we've been uh, talking about, and you can see on your screen there. Um, state media uh, saying that in uh, Iran, saying uh, there has been an incident uh, at an airport. The Fars News Agency uh, first reported this, an explosion at an airport in the uh, Iranian central city of uh, Isfahan. Uh, the cause isn't uh, immediately known, but that's uh, key uh, to a uh, manufacturing base uh, for the uh, military there. Iranian state TV has said around 12.30 uh, a.m. local time, three drones were observed in the sky over Isfahan. In their words, the air defence system became active and d destroyed these drones in the sky. That is what is being uh, reported by uh, state TV in Tehran. Uh, a few minutes ago, a person familiar with the situation has uh, told our colleagues at NBC News that Israel did carry out an operation in Iran and we heard from James Matthews too that Israeli officials had notified uh, American officials that a response was coming, that response of course uh, to what happened in the skies over Israel on Saturday when Iran sent some 300 drones and uh, ballistic missiles from its territory uh, towards Israel. Israel had said that 99% of these projectiles were intercepted. So we were hearing from an analyst uh, there that that perhaps uh, wasn't uh, as high as uh, that figure. Nevertheless, most uh, were uh, brought down in involving in two uh, RAF jets. Uh, James Matthews is uh, our US correspondent uh, joining me live again. Uh, so, James, the Americans had been notified something was about to happen. I think that's right, isn't it? Yeah, Israel had been uh, in contact to say this was coming. It's not entirely clear just how much 
notice the United States had, but certainly more, more notice than it appeared to have had uh, during that raid, that Israeli attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus. There were discussions earlier today between Americans and Israelis actually discussing, discussing the proposed assault or incursion into Rafa. That was the uh, subject that it was at the top of the agenda. But one imagines that officials took the opportunity to discuss what uh, was in the pipeline. Uh, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Director, certainly uh, had discussions with his opposite number in Israel. And they are two individuals of a particular level who would be, who would be kept informed or tuned in to Israel's intentions. Um, we're getting very little information so far in the past are uh, about from the Americans about uh, their thoughts uh, on what has gone on, Nick. I think we're in a situation where they are waiting to see what damage has been inflicted, waiting themselves to see what the full details of this attack are, because it's one thing to be told an attack is coming, it's one thing to be told where that attack will take place, it's quite another to see what the effect is on the ground. Even the Israelis won't know the full effect until their military de debrief, their analysis of their own attack. And it may be that we need you know, to get into uh, the daylight hours for some period before it all becomes clear. There are key questions. What has been hit? To what extent does it damage Iranian infrastructure, inflict civilian casualties. To what extent does Iran feel attacked to such a degree that it is duty bound to respond in kind? That has certainly been the warning of the Iranians over the past few days. And it was articulated not a few hours ago uh, by the foreign minister who's been here at the United Nations, flew in from Tehran, special arrangements made to get him a visa. He conducted an interview in which he said uh, there would be a response should, Israelis, should the Israelis strike, a response that would be immediate and maximum. I spoke to the Iranian ambassador to the UN on Sunday. The words he used were decisive and resolute. Well, we'll see what that constitutes, decisive and resolute in due course, should Iran decide that it has no option but to respond. And Americans, Israelis, the world at large is waiting to see what shape any such response will take. Will Iran launch a strike similar to what we saw uh, recently, the 300 and more projectiles from Iran to Israel, from state to state? Or will it be a response that invokes the aid of its proxies and any no scenario is a good scenario uh, but the use of proxies the use of the likes of um, hezbollah for example on israel's northern border that will be a particular concern the extent to which they become involved in an assault over the border into israel an assault in which america would feel compelled to intervene should it see Israel being seriously threatened. As things stand, America has told Israel, you respond to Iran, we will not support you. That was what Biden told Netanyahu in a phone call when Israel was attacked a few days ago. Take the win, he said, and he made it clear that should Israel retaliate, then that would not have the support of the United States. Biden keen to distance himself from acts of war the like of which we have seen in the past hour or two. The question will be, can Biden realistically stay out of the game or will he feel compelled to get sucked in? Will it be a matter for him? Is it a decision down to him alone? The answer to that is no, because the Iranians may see this as effectively a joint operation. Uh, Israel having informed the United States of its actions. So we'll see what view the Iranians take, and that is key in terms of where this goes next. Do they retaliate? Against whom do they retaliate? And with what force do they retaliate? And does that take us down a path 
the path on which Israel has trodden, and indeed Iran trod when it fired 300 and odd projectiles towards Israel. You know, does it take us to further down that path towards escalation? James, interestingly, an Iranian official, um, according to Reuters, has said there was no missile attack on Iran. Is this perhaps the, Iran, uh, the Iranians trying to, to play this down, what, what might have happened? Clear indication something's happened, uh, isn't there? Uh, as uh, our colleagues are told uh, in America that uh, Israel has carried out an operation. Well, that's interesting, and I suppose that might be the immediate take if Iran is playing it down, uh, suggesting that uh, there was nothing of any grave nature that took place, then perhaps that is, uh, the, perhaps that is the talk of a, a nation that isn't seeking retaliation, isn't seeking conflict, and doesn't feel the need to get sucked into uh, a situation more grave than it already stands at the moment. So. I think those who don't wish escalation, and there are many on this side of the Atlantic, there's one in the White House, then that's perhaps what he wants to hear from Iran, not the language of war, but rather the language of a peaceful resolution. Uh, uh, so we'll see, we'll see, it's early. And these are the sentiments of uh, one minister. We'll see what the Iranian government in full has to say and we'll hear from the power brokers and those who wield power in that particular country in due course. But these are difficult stages. These are delicate stages, the immediate aftermath of this attack. And you have to think it's only when it becomes clear uh, about what has happened that we will have a handle on what happens next. It's only when it becomes clear that Iran itself will take a decision on what it has to do. James, what do you make of Don't the... forget there will be intelligence. There will be intelligence. There will be Israeli intelligence, US intelligence that will, will, have, uh, will have eyes on what happened during the strike and after. So it's not as if we're in a situation where Iran is giving us information only it holds. Uh, the world at large will know uh, via satellites and spy drones and so on what exactly has happened tonight, and I suppose that will be the basis on which the world moves on. Key to it is the view that Iran takes of the attack that has been perpetrated on its soil. It's worth noting that Israel hasn't publicly uh, declared that it has carried out this attack, but nobody's suggesting otherwise, particularly given that here in the United States, they're saying, well, we were told by the Israel that that this was coming, that this was in the pipeline. James, what do you make of the timing of this, what, what, what appears to be uh, a response by Israel, five days after the, this barrage from Iran? Is that perhaps something to do with Passover, as might have been mentioned just before that, or uh, perhaps that Netanyahu has been listening to Biden, that take the win, don't retaliate, because uh, we know full well, don't we, there are... Uh, hardliners in that war cabinet in Israel that, that wanted him to, to respond almost immediately. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned Passover. There's been much discussion uh, about that, uh, Nick. Passover, uh, the Jewish holiday, which starts on Monday, an eight-day holiday. And actually, the discussion has been, and it's only discussion, it had been that perhaps Israel would wait until after Passover, so knock it in uh, beyond the 28th of April. Uh, I suppose it's a theory that would match with uh, experience, the experience of the past couple of hours. Um, yeah, it may be that Israel thought it had to get its retaliation in before that holiday, but we have to hear from the Israelis, don't we? Uh, and we're in a situation where Israel isn't giving us chapter and verse or indeed claiming responsibility for what happened. So it may, we may wait a long time for the fine detail of choice of date and, you know, the various uh, infrastructure and decision making and framework for the military calls. It may be some time before we hear that full detail uh, from Israel. But whatever uh, they're choosing in terms of when to strike, um, they have struck. And that is the key thing. The, the key thing is the strike, 
the damage it has inflicted? And to what extent does Iran feel compelled to respond? Iran felt compelled to launch projectiles towards Israel a few days ago, largely uh, in an effort to save face. It is an unpopular regime uh, in Tehran. So to its own people and to its proxies in the region, it felt compelled to, to demonstrate strength. It had been wounded, weakened by the Israeli strike on the consulate in Damascus. And in these circumstances, Iran clearly felt compelled to do something and it, it took a step uh, beyond, and it, it went out with the, the boundaries of conflict thus far in that the strike was from Iran onto Israeli, towards Israeli territory, state on state conflict. And that's the worrying thing about this. Uh, it has uh, crossed a red line in terms of escalating matters, escalating military conflict. And the question is, well, where does that stop? Um, that right now is in Iran's court. We still have to, as I say, uh, we still have to have a handle and we still need to hear detail on the extent of the Israeli strike, civilian casualties, damaged infrastructure. To what extent is this um, a strike on Iran that would make Tehran feel compelled to strike back? Or is there, uh, is there a, a reason why Iran might look at it and say enough is enough? Um, it has gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Israel. It has fired more than 300 projectiles towards Israel, which in itself is a considerable act of conflict, unprecedented in its scale and nature. Uh, when I talk about scale, I talk about the number of ballistic missiles that were involved in that particular action. So uh, Iran, in terms of demonstrating its strength, you know, it, it went a considerable way down the road to that uh, a few days ago. The question is, how does it demonstrate strength without escalation? Because a less escalation for Iran, don't forget, uh, will, brings about the possibility of yet another Israeli strike. And uh, the longer that particular two-way conflict continues, then the further Iran risks pulling the United States into conflict. And we have been told that Iran has made it clear to the United States, and the message has, been, has gone two ways, that neither of those nations want escalation. Neither of those want to get dragged in to direct conflict. So that's been the clear message from Iran. It doesn't want it to pick a fight with the United States. Um, the question will be right now, does it have a choice? And to what extent to what extent does the United States have a say in what Israel does? Because what Israel does is key in terms of keeping the United States out of conflict or dragging it further in. And that is Biden's difficulty, uh, his lack of control over Benjamin Netanyahu and what he does in terms of securing Israeli security, in terms of enacting his view of what he thinks is in Israel's best interests. Well, that appears much of the time, if not all of the time, to be a choice for Netanyahu alone, without necessarily paying heed to the advice of Joe Biden. His advice in this case had been, don't retaliate, take the win. The United States will not back you if you retaliate. Well, quite how that sits with actual Israeli retaliation tonight um, is a question for Joe Biden when he wakes up. Indeed, James. Uh, thank you for now. We'll be back to you uh, very shortly. Uh, I want to bring uh, our viewers uh, some latest pictures. Uh, this from Iran. Video from the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps IRGC's Telegram channel. That's what's going on. It uh, seems to show explosions there near in the sky near uh, Isfahan. That is what we are told. That is uh, the uh, air base that appears to have been targeted. However, Sky News, I should say, has not been able to independently uh, verify that video. But let's uh, just remind you of what we are being told. Sources are telling our NBC colleagues 
that this was uh, an Israeli strike, but Iran um, seeming to uh, play it down, uh, what uh, is uh, going on there. Um, according to uh, Iranian state TV being uh, quoted by Reuters, explosions heard in Isfahan were a result of the activation of Iran's air defence systems, uh, one Iranian official uh, told the news organisation, adding that no missile attack was carried out against Iran. Well, clearly something has been going on in the skies there at uh, Isfahan, which is some 200 miles south of uh, Tehran. Uh, a person familiar with what's going on telling our NBC News colleagues that Israel carried out an operation in Iran. Well, a little earlier I spoke to our Middle East correspondent, uh, Alistair Bunkel, who uh, brought us the latest. Well, I think it's the location of part of Iran's um, aircraft manufacturing industry. And so and look, everything I say is caveated by the fact that this only happened within the last couple of hours and it's, it's dawn is only, uh, the sun is only just rising across the Middle East. And so we, we really do need to find out more detail about what has happened. But based on early indications, it could be that Israel has hit uh, an air base that is used to, to manufacture possibly drones. And if that were the case, I think there's, a, there's an obvious connection then between what has happened tonight and what happened on Saturday night. And therefore, Israel, like the US and the UK did yesterday when they announced sanctions against Iran, those sanctions were targeting the aircraft manufacturing industry and missile manufacturing industry. So they, they were deliberately... Um, uh, there were deliberate sanctions at you know, deliberate entities. And this would look at the moment as though it's a deliberate airstrike against a similar or the same um, area of I Iranian manufacturing. And I think, therefore, if that turns out to be correct, and if, 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 if it turns out that if this is a single strike, limited number, of civ um, limited number of casualties, probably none of them civilian because it was on a military base, um, but limited number of casualties because it, it was the middle of the night and it's very much at the manufacturing industry, then I think what Israel will be saying is, look, we, we didn't go um, for the sort of the top option that we maybe might have wanted to do. We didn't strike uh, anything to do with Iran's nuclear program, for example. We didn't aim it at uh, anything to do with the civilian population in Iran. This was a retaliatory strike, but it was a very limited retaliatory strike. It's not the sort of the devastating strike that perhaps some of the war cabinet had promised earlier in the week here. And that in turn, you would think would, would limit whatever fallout is, is coming. I think if you look at the war games that the Israelis have simulated in the past, um, that have, uh, have sort of, um, uh, simulated an attack on Iran, uh, they tended to use their, their fighter jets. They would use F-35 fighter jets, I suspect, because they have an F-35 base here. Um, I think they've got just under 40 F-35s. Uh, they are stealth aircraft. I mean, they can, they can pretty much get into Iran and out again, virtually undetected. Um, so I suspect that's what they would have used. Um, they have the range as well, just about. I mean, Israel has air to a receiving capacity. Um, but the other thing as well, I'd just be careful with again at this stage, is that when Iran reports that it's uh, either shot down missiles or targeted drones, you know, we just need to be careful about the, how true or not that is, because ultimately, if Israel has you know, flown a, a pair of F-35s into Iranian airspace and carried out an airstrike and got back out again, that's, that's a little bit humiliating to the Iranians especially when you think that they fired over 300 missiles and drones, including ballistic missiles, at Israel on Saturday night. And most of them didn't even make it as far as Israeli airspace. And the 1% uh, the that got through and landed did you know, pretty minor damage, to be honest, to, uh, to an airbase in southern Israel. I think there has been moments over the last five days, I think, to be honest, I think there was moments in the hours after what happened on Saturday night where Israel, the military, the war cabinet were, were tempted to pull the trigger pretty quickly. And I think had they done so, it would be a very different response to what we're seeing at the moment. 
So for whatever reason, uh, they've taken their time. I think that could be because they have come under a lot of international pressure, particularly from the Americans. But Lord Cameron was here this week saying, that, you know, cool heads, let's not let's not do something that is going to not just open up a new front of war for Israel, but a, a new front against Iran of all people. Benjamin Netanyahu um, tends to be cautious. I know sort of sometimes it doesn't sound like it from what he says in his words, but he does tend to be a, a much more cautious um, leader, doesn't doesn't typically in his past lead uh, Israel into, into conflicts, also tends to put off difficult decisions um, until he can't put them off any longer. So, I mean, it could be any or, or a combination of those things. And then I think we need to look ahead as well. Passover starts at the beginning of next week, um, the, the Jewish Religious Festival. I don't think the Israeli government would have wanted this crisis to be spiraling over into, into that holiday. Uh, maybe it will do. I mean, maybe we'll, we'll have to see what Iran does, but I think they probably wanted to do this, get it out of the way, and get it out of the way, leaving Iran a few days to respond, if that's what Iran's going to do, um, before Passover starts. Well, if you believe what um, Iran's leaders have had to say over the last 24 hours, then, you know, I'm looking up at the sky as the sun rises above Jerusalem now, expecting to see some incoming missiles, because they said they would hit back immediately and um, with full force. I actually don't think that's what will happen. I think that the um, Iranian leadership can often speak with high emotion, but they tend to act in a more calibrated and calculated manner. And if... And again, you know, if anyone just tuning in, it is a it's a caveat it is because it's still the early hours. But if this turns out to be a single strike uh, on on a facility that we expect it has has been, then that to me also suggests de escalation. And I know it sounds contradictory to to say on the one hand it's an airstrike and on the other hand it's a de escalation, but. Israel would say, look, you know, we, if we've not taken out any civilian casualties, if we've not even, if there are, in fact, no casualties whatsoever, it was a very deliberate strike on a very carefully chosen target, one strike, we didn't go after your nuclear program, we didn't go into your cities, then I think Iran's response will then, uh, at least if it's, if it's a reasonable and um, uh, a response sort of in kind, would also lower the temperature again further still. That would be the hope anyway. Alistair Bunkle there in Jerusalem. So uh, this is what we know. In our breaking news this morning, Iran fired air defence batteries early this morning after reports of explosions near the city of Isfahan. That is according to the state-run IRNA news agency. Uh, it has been said... Uh, source telling our colleagues at NBC News that Israel carried out an operation in Iran overnight and uh, Israeli officials notified US officials uh, a response was coming. We've heard that uh, from James Matthews, our US uh, correspondent. There has to be said, though, uh, state uh, media in Iran seems to be uh, playing down uh, what has happened. One Iranian official telling Reuters explosions heard with the activation of Iran's air defence system, saying that no missile attack was carried out uh, against Iran. Um, we will follow this uh, story uh, very closely. Uh, we'll return to uh, our correspondents and assess what is going on and what this all means. Clearly, uh, there are uh, tensions and have been uh, for days uh, following the Iran's uh, barrage of drones and missiles sent uh, towards Israel from its uh, territory on uh, Saturday night. Much more to come in a few minutes.
Hello, welcome back. Let's uh, remind you of our breaking news uh, this morning. It all started with Iran's Fars News Agency, uh, which said an explosion or explosions were heard at an airport in the uh, Iranian city of uh, Isfahan. You can see on your map there, uh, that is south of Tehran. We're told around 200 miles uh, south of uh, the capital. The cause wasn't uh, immediately known. We are getting more details that it could be a uh, response from uh, Israel to what happened uh, on Saturday night. Now, this from Iranian state media, which is putting out that around 12.30 GMT, three drones were observed in the sky over Isfahan. Air defence systems became active and, it says, destroyed uh, the drones in the sky. Now, these pictures that you're looking at now are from Iran, specifically released from the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps telegram channel, and it does seem to show explosions in the sky uh, near uh, Isfahan. It's uh, not exactly clear from this uh, what has gone on. A uh, source has told our NBC News colleagues that Israel did carry an out an operation in Iran tonight. Israeli officials notified US officials a response uh, was coming. It seems um, this is being played down to a large extent in uh, Iran. One official telling Reuters the explosions heard in uh, Isfahan there, which you're looking at, were a result of the activation of uh, Iran's air defence systems and says that no missile attack was uh, carried out uh, against Iran. Uh, that is what uh, some uh, in uh, Iran are saying. But clearly, uh, something has happened because a number of flights are being rerouted. Uh, James Matthews is back with us in Washington. And uh, James, interesting to know, isn't it, that since what happened on Saturday night when uh, Iran said this sent this barrage of over 300 drones and missiles towards Israel, how would uh, Israel respond? Joe Biden had uh, urged Benjamin Netanyahu to take the win, not to retaliate. But here we are, five days later. It looks like something has happened. Uh, and the timing's quite interesting. A lot of that war cabinet, the, uh, the hardliners in Netanyahu's war cabinet would have demanded an immediate response. But what does this suggest to you if this is uh, a response five days later that uh, Mr Netanyahu has in, in some part listened to Joe Biden? I think he will have listened to Joe Biden. There's no doubt about that. Um, the Americans were informed of this action prior to it taking place. Lloyd Austin, the US Defence Secretary, had made it clear to his counterpart that America wanted to be told uh, in advance of any Israeli action. That was around the time, uh, the same time that Joe Biden was saying, look, America will not support you in any retaliation strike. He was telling Benjamin Netanyahu, take the win. And he was making it clear, uh, following a successful defence of that Iranian barrage a few days ago, he made it clear publicly that Israel's foes will know that it is a considerable power that can defend itself. That was sending a, a message not just to Israel, but also to its adversaries. So that's been the, the talk uh, between the United States and Israel over uh, recent days. It's interesting that the Israel told the US it was going to launch the strike and the strike went ahead. Bear in mind the background, Israel, uh, the United States warning against a retaliation strike, its concern being that that would lead to escalation. And yet the strike went ahead anyway. Is that the United States learning details of the strike, being relatively happy with it, or is it Benjamin Netanyahu, not for the first time, turning a, a deaf ear to the entreaties of the Americans and following his own path? I, I do wonder, the Americans knowing about it and it's still happening, Iran now saying, look, this wasn't terribly much and we took care of it with our air defence systems. I, I do wonder if actually there is an element of de-escalation about that and Iran is dismissing it as no cause for Iran itself to launch a counter-strike to this Israeli action. So perhaps we're in the early stages and it is very early stages. We need to see what the damage is inflicted. Has there been civilian casualties and so on? But 
What we're hearing early on from Iran indicates that they are of a mind to dismiss this attack, which is perhaps grounds for them taking a step back, a step back from escalation. James, thank you for now. We'll come back to you uh, in a few minutes. So let's just update you with our breaking news. As we know it, uh, this hour, Israeli uh, missiles are reported to have hit a site in Iran. So uh, the Americans are uh, saying uh, Iranian state media did report an explosion in the centre of the country this after days, five days after Iran launched a uh, drone strike on Israel, sending in uh, 300 drones and missiles. More in a couple of minutes. Hello, you're watching Sky News. It's five o'clock. I'm Nick Qureshi. Let's update you with our breaking news uh, this morning. It all began with uh, Iran's Fars news agency, uh, which said an explosion or more were heard at an airport in the Iranian central city of uh, Isfahan. The cause wasn't immediately known. US media is saying it is an Israeli strike. Uh, this uh, coming just uh, five days after Iran sent a barrage of drones and missiles from its territory to war. Israel. Uh, the vast majority of those uh, intercepted and that had been a response for uh, a suspected Israeli airstrike on Tehran's embassy compound in the Syrian capital Damascus on April the 1st. Uh, so as you can see there, NBC News sources saying Israel did uh, carry out this strike in Iran. The Americans had uh, been told that something was about to happen. Uh, these are pictures, let me tell you, from the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, IRGC's telegram channel, and it shows explosions in the sky near Isfahan. Sky News, I should say, hasn't been able to independently verify uh, this video. Um, let's bring in Sky's Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkle, who is live with us in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, good to see you, Ali. So, of course, these reports are still coming in of uh, what has happened, but it looks like, uh, as we have gone on air and reporting 
what we're seeing here. This is uh, Isfahan, which is some kind of air base some 200 miles south of Tehran. And this is important and significant. Why? Well, we think it's because there is a, an aircraft manufacturing plant there, so it's part of the Iranian aerospace industry. And if that does turn out to be the case, or at least if that turns out to be the, the target, I wouldn't be surprised if it is also where some of the drones that were flown at Israel on Saturday night were manufactured. Uh, and you join those dots together, and it would mean that it's a very clearly um, thought-out target for, for the Israelis. Um, it was a calibrated target. Um, it's not a civilian target, for example. It's not part of the Iranian nuclear industry, we, we don't believe. All of those would have signalled a major, major escalation. I, I think this is designed to do the opposite. Um, it is a strike because Israel said they would and felt they had no other choice. But I think given the range of options that they would have had in front of them, this is absolutely the lower end of the scale. Now, I, I stress, it is early. Um, we will have to see what else comes out over the coming hours. For example, there are reports of explosions in Syria and Iraq. Now, I've not yet seen any evidence of explosions, and, and you do tend to get pretty quickly these days. Videos posted onto social media platforms um, showing, even in the dark of night, you know, when you hear the sounds or showing plumes of smoke. We haven't seen any of those yet, which could, and this is pure speculation, be uh, so, sound of sonic booms if Israeli jets, we think F-35 jets, were breaking the, the sound barrier. And, and anyone who's ever heard a sonic boom, it, it, it sounds like an explosion. Uh, so it could be that. It could also have been that they have attacked targets, pro-Iranian targets in Syria and Iraq, uh, of which there are many targets to go at, and, and that would be pretty easy pickings for the Israelis. But what we know, or we think we know so far, is that this military base, this air base, just outside Isfahan, which is quite deep into Iran, has been targeted uh, by the looks of things, by a, a single strike. Uh, why now? This is five days after uh, Iran's aerial bombardments. Uh, any significance, the fact this has come five days later? Is it a sign that Prime Minister Netanyahu may have been listening to those calls for restraint and anything to do with Passover? Yeah, I think, I think all of those things come into it. Um, the calls from rest for restraint coming from the White House, uh, David Cameron and the German Foreign Minister were in Israel just a couple of days ago delivering the same message. There were also, there was a, a difference of opinion within the Israeli war cabinet itself over what should be done. There, you know, there were um, some hawks and doves actually within that small group of men. Uh, there were some who believed that Israel should have carried out an almost immediate strike and a heavy strike to send you know, a message once and for all. There will have certainly been people within the wider Israeli coalition arguing that this was a moment to hit Iran's nuclear facilities and to degrade that program in a significant way. As it is, or at least, and I keep just caveating this, as it looks at least, um, Netanyahu has taken his time, and that is quite characteristic of him. He doesn't tend to be a rapid decision maker. And he has ultimately decided that a response is necessary but it is going to be, as I said, at the lower end of the scan. And it looks like they forewarned the Americans this time. The Americans were pretty annoyed that they had no warning of that strike in Damascus. But this time it looks like they forewarned the Americans. And so it's taken a bit of time to get to this, this stage. But with regards to Passover, which starts early next week, I think they, they, don't, want, they don't want this crisis to be spilling over into the Passover holiday. Now, we'll see what Iran does. Iran might strike back immediately as they threaten to do so. They might take a week or so. We'll, we'll just have to wait and see. And uh, you know, whilst I say I, I think that this, this airstrike that the Israelis have carried out is, is effectively de-escalatory, what really matters is how the Iranians regard it, whether they see it as an escalation, whether they feel compelled to respond to it. We'll have to wait and see what the statements coming out from the Iranian regime and the IRGC are over the, uh, the coming hours. But I think the Israelis wanted to do this before Passover and with sufficient time for Iran to respond if they need to, so that the coming uh, Jewish holiday is not disturbed by this, this crisis. Uh, and that's your firm 
a assumption, is it, or an analysis that things won't ratchet up now? I wouldn't go as far to say that they won't. What I would say is that if, if the, the evidence that we seem to know so far, and again in the context that it's still being early in the morning, but the evidence being that it seems to be a single strike or a single target, uh, an airbase that has a connection and a logical connection to what happened here on Saturday night, and if there's nothing else, um, and if casualty figures are, are low or there were no casualties, then I think take all of that in the round, um, I, I think it is, it is, as I say, at the lower end of what Israel could and maybe was considering doing. Now, when you then factor in, we are now almost seven months into an Israeli war with Hamas, and Iran have consistently sent signals throughout that war that they don't want to be dragged into it, even really through their proxies, then it, it remains the fact that Iran does not want to see escalation here. They have a far bigger strategy, a far longer strategy that they're playing out, and that is to develop a nuclear program. So they don't want to uh, do anything that might jeopardise that or force Israel to strike that. So I think there is a logic, at least, in Iran looking at this strike, realising that it could have been a lot worse, reading the messages coming from Israel, and no doubt there'll be messages passed to them through back channels like the British Embassy in Tehran, and coming to the conclusion that this is not the moment to escalate it. Now, that does not mean to say that Iran will not respond in some form. I would look out as well, if we're looking for signs, look to see whether or not they start to implicate the US in it. It might be that they start to try and suggest that the US military was involved in some form uh, in these strikes uh, as, as an enabler. And that could be that could be sort of them laying the ground, laying the narrative to then strike back at um, U.S. bases, U.S. military bases in Iraq and Syria, which they've done uh, many times beforehand, because they might see that as their way of um, carrying out a retaliation that is not directly on Israeli soil and probably probably would would bring an end to this this crisis. All right, uh, Ali, for now, many thanks indeed. Alistair Bunkle there in Jerusalem. Let's bring in our defence analyst, Professor Michael Clark. Good to have you on the programme, uh, Michael. Um, so it looks like, uh, from what we're seeing, this is uh, a limited strike on one airbase. Uh, that's all we can confirm at the moment, Nick. Um, I was looking at some American sources about an hour ago, which have got quite a lot of sites that they think have been hit. And I'm not, that's not confirmed, and I won't go over them, but they're looking at seven possible sites. I think we, it's far too early to say that. Um, as Ali Bunker was saying there, I mean, if this is um, Isfahan, the airbase of Isfahan, that would certainly make sense. It is also interesting that Isfahan is one of the nuclear sites, but it's the least sensitive. It's a research site, about uh, oh, 3,000 or so um, scientists work there. Um, and the, um, there's no evidence that, that this was targeted on the nuclear site. But the fact that Isfahan is one of the cities which does quite a lot of nuclear work is also symbolically quite important, I think, if the Israelis are indicating that they're not frightened to go after these sites, even if we're going for the, the air base. There are some slightly more um, firm reports that there may have been uh, an attack on Tabriz in the mountains, and Tabriz is, is one of the bases of the Shahab 2 and Shahab 3 missiles, which were used against Israel last weekend. 120 of them, apparently, were, were fired initially. Um, if that turns out to be confirmed, and at this stage, Sky is not confirming it, but there's a lot of other sources that are saying that there's a strike on Tabriz. If that turns out to be good enough for Sky's um, verification, and Sky is always very careful about this, but that would also be uh, appropriate as far as Israel is concerned if it looks as if they're going after the sort of weapons that we used against them last weekend. And as Alistair was saying, um, in a way, the Israelis want to send a message to Iran that they don't want this to get out of hand, but they are going to respond. And the important thing is that the, the Israelis will make it clear to the world community that last weekend, the Iranians threw 330 missiles and drones at Israel, and only seven of them got through and did a small amount of minor damage at the Nevatim Air Base, which is quite near to Dimona, the nuclear site in southern Israel. But here, the Israelis look as if they've walked straight through Iranian defences, which we always knew they could, probably with their Jericho 3 missile, and they hit everything they aim at. 
That's the message that they will want to send. And although the Iranians will undoubtedly say, we've shot down lots of things, our air defences were busy and they'll produce all sorts of evidence, we'll see how convincing that is, because I would expect if the uh, Israelis decide to strike Iranian territory, there's nothing really in Iranian air defences that can stop them if they use their, if Israel uses its um, Jericho missiles. Yeah, and indeed, uh, that's already started. Iranian officials telling news agencies explosions heard in Isfahan were the result of the activation of Iran's air defence system, saying no uh, missile attack was carried out uh, against Iran, as you, you might expect. That is the big question now, isn't it, Michael? How does Iran respond, whether, in fact, it does? Yeah, I mean, the Iranians will... Uh, I mean, they, they make all sorts of, of dire predictions, of course. And interestingly, um, Ahmed uh, Haktalab, who is the IRGC commander in charge of nuclear security, was making statements last night. And Haktalab was saying, he said that, um, of course, we're not aiming for a nuclear bomb, but if the Israelis attack us, we might have to reconsider, which, you know, is only what we all knew. Um, but the fact that an IRGC commander, senior IRGC commander, is now, in a sense, admitting what the Iranians have denied for the last 20-odd years, that they're building a nuclear bomb, and he's now saying, well, you know, if we have to, we'll, we'll do it, because we can, um, that's the first complete admission that somebody, with somebody of his uh, standing that I have seen, and that was just said last night. So the Iranians certainly are ramping up the rhetoric. We know that, you know, just hovering below this crisis is the spectre of, as it were, nuclear destruction between the two. Not nuclear weapons used between the two, but both of them trying to go after the nuclear programs of each of them. That's not going to happen at the moment, but that's not so far off the spectrum, at the mo uh, uh, not so far off the threshold as things progress. And both sides will not want to go to that threshold, but equally both sides feel drawn towards it. So the Iranians will try some sort of response, whether it will be a military response or maybe more um, seizures in the Gulf or some other way of trying to um, attack Western uh, interests, Israeli interests, Jewish-owned interests, American, British, European interests in the Gulf. That's possible, um, and we'll see what they do. But they will, de they will definitely do something because, again, just like the Israelis, they feel that they can't let this go unanswered. Both sides here... Um, demand the last word militarily. You know, Netanyahu always has to have the last word militarily. And Ayatollah Khomeini also has to have the last word militarily, or feel that they do, at least for the sake of their own people. And that's interesting you, you touched on that. I, is it a point, Michael, that the proxies might get involved here? I, Iran might get them uh, further in, in action or in yeah. uh, offensives? Absolutely. I mean, the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, have got people all over, uh, particularly Iraq and in Syria, um, uh, helping their interests in, in those countries, which are very sort of cross-cutting. Uh, they've got people on the, on the Galan Heights, in effect. Um, and they've got lots of groups that they could instruct, as they do, to commit whatever acts to attack American bases, which they've done over 100 times uh, since uh, October the 7th. Um, they could create ass assassinations, kidnappings and so on. Um, the, the issue for the Iranians is whether, if they do all of this, they're doing more of the same because they do this normally. So do they step all that up as a way of showing their reaction and displeasure do they do something a bit more dramatic, um, such as the uh, the MSC, um, uh, what is it, the uh, MSC Ares uh, that was seized, that ship that was seized um, on last Friday, week, just a week ago uh, today, uh, seized in the Strait of Hormuz? Do they seize more ships uh, in the uh, in the Gulf? That's plausible from their point of view, and it would give them a it would give them a way of attracting the world's attention to the fact that Iran feels that they they have a response to make. OK, Michael, we'll leave it there for now. Many thanks indeed, Professor Michael Clark, uh, with uh, his analysis there. Uh, James Matthews is our US correspondent, joining us live from Washington. Uh, hi, James. So, uh, we know, don't we, that uh, US officials were told something was going to happen. Uh, they were. Uh, bear in mind that when Israel attacked the Iranian consulate in Damascus, Nick, the Americans were furious at the way that transpired because the Israelis gave them just minutes warning. The planes were in the air when the Americans were told. The Americans were furious, A, because they felt they should have been told, specifically uh, because they have 
a military presence in that general area and they didn't have time to get their defences on high alert. So there was a physical danger to the US presence as they saw it at that time. Things happened differently uh, this time round. The Israelis did tell the Americans in advance. Lloyd Austin, the US Defence Secretary, had made it clear to his counterpart in recent days they wanted to be told what was going to happen. But of course, despite the fact they were told, it must be borne in mind that Joe Biden had said, made it clear to Netanyahu in a phone call that the United States would not support an Israeli retaliation strike. The question now would be to what extent is the United States implicated in the eyes of Iran and therefore does Iran try to rope in the United States in whatever reaction it deems appropriate. As we have been reporting, uh, it would seem there would seem to be a degree of measure in what uh, has happened. Now, time will tell exactly what uh, has happened, the damage it has inflicted, and the extent to which it is an act that re Iran will feel compelled to respond to or otherwise. But if we are talking about a measured strike with limited to no civilian casualties, a middle-of-the-night strike that the Irani Iranians can dismiss as, um, as dismiss uh, as something that doesn't necessarily strike at the heart of Iran. And that is the way uh, the ministers seem to be talking in Tehran at the moment from their early statements. Then perhaps that is the road uh, back from escalation. Of course, that is the big American fear that there will be escalation, that uh, a state-on-state -state strike uh, will involve a, a continuous era of tit-for-tat where uh, there is military development that Joe Biden or nobody can control. And of course, Joe Biden is an individual much criticised for an inability to control the course of events in the Middle East as we await to see what Iran does next, then the question for Biden is, why did this happen? Why did this happen? Uh, an attack, an, a strike perpetrated by the United States ally, f an ally funded by the United States, when the, the United States told that ally, uh, or tried to steer that ally away from an act that wouldn't lead to Escalation. So questions again for Biden about his influence and control over the actions in particular. James, what do you think Joe Biden will make of this then? He You're talking has, about again. Uh, sorry, James. Just, Netanyahu just, has turned a deaf ear. Yeah, you just, Biden. yeah, James, you just broke up there, but we got your point. So what do you think Joe Biden will make of uh, what's happened now? At the start of the week, he said, take, Sunday, wasn't it? He said, take the win to uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, don't retaliate. And we know that there have been uh, deep rifts uh, between this pair in recent weeks uh, over what's going on in Gaza. Yeah, I, I, in terms of what Biden thinks, I think that will depend on the situation that we are contemplating, the situation we will contemplate in the next few hours in daylight when we have the intelligence, from US intelligence, and indeed from the Iranians on the ground, from whom we will learn the extent of this strike and the extent of the damage, the extent of the need for retaliation, because that is key. That is key for Biden. And it will have been a key question for him and the Americans when they were told by the Israelis about this strike, given prior warning earlier today. Their immediate question and assessment would, be, would have been will this lead towards escalation? So the question will be, how much did the Israelis tell the Americans about what was involved in this strike? And was a joint assessment made that it, it, it was a strike that could be carried out without leading to escalation? Or were the Israelis acting autonomously uh, and launching a military action as they saw fit without paying due heed to any entreaties from the Americans. So that will be the question. The damage, how much were the Americans told about this particular strike? And did the Americans give their blessing 
on the back of the information that they were given, because on that hinges the fresh assessment of the relationship between Biden and Netanyahu and the ability of Biden to control Netanyahu, because that's key. Because if Iran does respond to this Israeli strike, then we have the question, again, what does Netanyahu do and what influence does Biden have in terms of reining him in? Biden, who does not want to see Netanyahu launch or escalate the war uh, and develop a state-on-state -state conflict. Uh, James Matthews, thank you very much indeed. Uh, James Matthews there in Washington. Uh, we've been uh, watching pictures, in fact, uh, of uh, the IRGC as uh, during James uh, put out a video of uh, what it says, there we are, of uh, Isfahan Airport, this uh, airbase which seems to have been uh, targeted. Certainly some activity uh, in the sky. Uh, sky News can't verify exactly uh, this video, but it says, according to the IRGC, of drones being uh, shot down. Clearly uh, some activity there at this uh, base, which is some 200 miles south of Tehran. I'd like to bring in uh, Ari Aramesh, national security and policy analyst, uh, expertise in the Middle East. Uh, good to have you with us. Thanks for hanging on there. What, what do you make of what we're seeing? Well, I'd like to say that when it, says, when it comes to expertise in the Middle East, I'd like to say we all have varying levels of ignorance. That's uh, well, especially for, for tonight when we see that the uh, attacks, the retaliatory attacks launched by Israel, uh, against Iran, uh, on the one hand, came as a surprise to some, but came as a matter of fact to others. Uh, let's back up a little bit. Now, let's talk about facts. Fact number one, uh, it seems uh, that these were unmanned aerial attacks. There, there were no F-35 Lightnings or F-15 Eagles used. F-16s clearly cannot reach that far. So unmanned, either missiles or drones. But second, uh, Iran launched about 300 plus airborne objects, air, you know, uh, from 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 uh, drones to uh, rockets and ballistic missiles. Very few hit targets, very little damage caused, almost uh, very little casualties and, and no fatalities. Israel is now saying they can strike within central Iran. Isfahan is a city, is, if I'm not mistaken, Iran's a second largest city after Tehran. You got Tehran. Isfahan, Tabriz, Mashhad, these are the largest four cities in Iran. Isfahan is also a central city in Iran. It, it, it's a somewhat religious city, but also houses some of the most uh, valuable uh, uh, sources of uh, cultural heritage inside Iran. Uh, Isfahan is also a city that not that far away from it, it houses Natanz nuclear facility, perhaps the most important nuclear site to the Iranian regime. Now, the site that was targeted appears to be the eighth tactical wing of the Iranian Air Force. This is not the IRGC we're talking about. Again, we're going based on the sources and what we're hearing right now. Uh, the eighth tactical wing of the Iranian regular military houses a number of aircraft, the most famous of which would be the 1970s F-14 Tomcats. Iran bought about 77 of them. Less than 10 are operational and airworthy. A few are housed there. Key word is a tactical. Why would you want to hit a tactical air base? Probably to ground anything that's going to take off of it and take off from it to decapitate and, and disable any potential airborne targets. Question is, what's Israel going to do next? Is there going to be another wave? I am not convinced, and I hope I'm wrong, but I'm not convinced this is it. It's uh, now uh, almost 8 o'clock in Tehran. Uh, the, the sun is up, so Israel has lost the uh, element of surprise at this point, and especially the element of operating in the dark. Question is, uh, those F-35 stealth lightning bombers, uh, lightning joint strike fighters, for that matter, can they reach and can, can they deliver a blow? Is Israel going to continue this or no? That's it. A limited strike showing, A, they can reach inside Iran within, within you know, at the very heart of it, and B, uh, sending a message that no uh, attacking at Israel is going to go unanswered, but also keeping Biden, President Biden, I'm sorry, and, and, and the White House happy that they did not escalate beyond the point of no return. My questions are going to be answered in the next few hours when the Iranian leadership decides how to do it and what to do, because Iran doesn't see this as a retaliation or as a measured counterstrike. Iran 
views this as yet another renewed offense, yet another renewed attack against its soil. Iran viewed the first attack uh, that Israel launched a few days ago against its consulate in Damascus, taking out eight IRGC top brass, including Brigadier General Zahidi, the deputy commander of the IRGC Quds Force, that's their special operations external wing, carrying attacks outside Iran, and seven other top commanders. They viewed that as, as the initial attack. Therefore, their response to Israel was supposed to be their measured or so, you know, uh, the, 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 the retaliation. Israel doesn't see that as such. Israel views October 7th as a massive strike, a massive attack on its soil, and Iran as the main culprit behind Hamas, Hezbollah, Houthis, Islamic Jihad, you name it. So question is this, what's the objective? What's the end game? Every time uh, you deal with any military operational planning, you have to uh, consider three things. Who am I sending? What am I sending? And what's my objective? People and personnel, equipment, and what's my objective? What's my strategy? Is my objective just to send the message to Washington and other capitals in, in Europe and, 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 and Brussels and other capitals in the Middle East that Israel was attacked and we retaliated? Or no, is the objective something grander, something larger? Now, uh, it could be something in between, not something very limited and not something so grand. Again, as I mentioned, uh, Isfahan is very close to the Natanz nuclear facility, which means Israel is trying to send a signal they can reach that far, they can hit Isfahan, they can also hit Natanz. Therefore, they can also hit other nuclear facilities. The Bushehr nuclear facility in southwestern Iran is far closer, far closer to the Iranian border than Isfahan is. So uh, a lot of unanswered questions. But again, if I were a betting man, I wouldn't be surprised if Israel's uh, actions and the plan of action was not just done all of a sudden. I I'm not sure if this is it. Maybe today, maybe in other days, the, the next phase is going to come. But again, keep in mind, the Iranian air defenses were on high alert. This did not happen next week. This did not happen a month after the fact. This happened while the Iranian air defenses were on high alert. Israel took this risk. But again, as, as, it, as it appears to be the case, these were unmanned strikes, no F-35s or F-15s, most likely drones or missiles. So we'll have to see what the next few days or the next few hours, for that matter, have to unfold. Uh, and what, what's your inkling towards how uh, Iran might respond? Is it in anyone's interest to inflame the tension that's already high in the Middle East? So uh, Iran is already trying to downplay this from what I'm reading uh, inside Iranian sources, Farsi sources and sources in English inside Iran. They're saying that a few uh, on a few drones, a few basic drones were shot down by Iranian air defense capabilities. So they're trying, to, they're trying to minimize this downplay this to say this was not much Iranian uh, air defense capabilities and air, you know, they just just shot everything down. And Israel did not dare send missiles, did not dare send manned aircraft. They sent some uh, basic pedestrian elementary sophomoric drones and they all got shot down. That's the message from Tehran. Now, we know they're playing to the domestic audience. We know that. But are they also trying to play to a wider international audience to say nothing happened, therefore Iran is not going to retaliate? Not convinced. I think the Iran Iranian modus operandi has changed in the past two months. Two months ago, they attacked uh, uh, northern Iraq, Mosul. They also attacked Pakistan, Pakistan, their eastern neighbor, a mighty military force. They attacked them with missiles, and Pakistan retaliated within 48 hours. Right away, they hit Iranian soil. Iran's uh, the military doctrine, in my humble opinion, has changed in the past few months. They are more on the offense than on the defense. They are more aggressive than defensive, and they are more of the provocateur than they are of the uh, sort of more of a cool-headed nature that they had been. Now, with all the ills and evils and flaws and problems the Iranian government has had for the past 40, 44 years, uh, Khamenei, the supreme leader in Iran, and the IRGC, that's the main military force behind pretty much every aspect of life in, in that country, They've made sure of one thing, not to go above and beyond a certain point of no return, that the legitimacy and also the existence of the republic, the Islamic Republic for that matter, could be jeopardized and threatened. I'm not sure that's a calculation at this point, or maybe it is. Actually, 
Maybe it is, but they think to secure that objective, they have to be more offensive. They struck Pakistan. They got hit back. They struck. Uh, they they carried out strikes against Mosul in Iraq, and they also claimed that was a main Israeli Mossad hub. Uh, and uh, they very openly opened the Houthi, uh, su supported the Houthis. They very openly started carrying out strikes against U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria. They killed three of our boys and girls, three Army National Guard soldiers in Jordan after they took out, after one of their suicide drones flown by one of their proxies killed three Army National Guard uh, soldiers and Army soldiers in, 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 in Jordan. I think Iran has gone more on the offense for, for a number of reasons, whether we like it or not. And I say this as someone who is uh, not exactly on the other side of the aisle when it comes down to this White House, but I've been rather critical of this uh, administration's uh, foreign policy that sometimes your patience appears to be a sign of weakness. Uh, sometimes your uh, sense of restraint appears to be a sense of disability. Iran, the, the Iranian regime, uh, with the help of its proxies, to carried out 160 plus attacks since October 7th. What did we do exactly? Not a whole lot. Uh, so they upped the ante. Uh, and then uh, there were the, the, the consulate in, in Damascus. Yes, it's it, according to international law, of course, any consulate, any embassy, it's part of that country's soil. We all know we all host and house a whole host of intelligence and military attaches and operatives in our embassies all around the world. Uh, again, uh, but Israel took it out and, and, and hit uh, the Iranian consulate attached uh, to, in, in Damascus, taking, you know, taking out top IRGC brass. Mind you, some of this stuff is also personal. Brigadier General Zahidi, the deputy commander of the IRGC Quds Force, was also very, very close to Ayatollah Khamenei, the Iranian supreme leader. These are not just political appointees or military appointees. These guys have been in the IRGC since the days of the Iran-Iraq war in the 1980s. They came up the ranks and they took some of these top posts. He, the uh, deceased, the departed uh, Brigadier General Zahidi, was also the former commander of IRGC land forces and IRGC Air Forces. It just shows how important the Quds Force, the external operation wing, is that you bring in a former commander of two of the branches, Air Force and the Army, to put him of the of the IRGC, not the regular military, to put him as deputy commander of IRGC Q, uh, Q as in Quebec, Quds Force. So, uh, question is this: the retaliation Iran is going to going to meet out in the next hours or days. I don't think it's going to be hours. If, if it's hours, Iran is really, really jumping the gun. But I'm not sure this is it on, on, on Israel's part. Uh, and the next wave doesn't have to be necessarily another uh, airstrike. It could be, you know, cyber attacks. It could be, a, a, you know, sabotage. It could be a whole host of things. But again, as I said, three things you always keep in mind and want to sort of lay out on the table. Who is going to take this? Who's going, who, who are my operatives? Who is doing this? What am I using? What are my tools? What, am I, what is my equipment? What, what, what devices? What sort of uh, assets am I using? And three, what's my objective? What am I trying to achieve? Just to uh, tit for tat? Or am I trying to scare the adversary? Or no, am I trying to really decapitate, disable, and then go for it? OK, Mr Aramesh, thank you very much indeed uh, for your expertise uh, today in joining us on Sky News. Uh, good to see you. Uh, let me just uh, remind uh, our viewers, as you're uh, tuning in, it's, uh, what, just after uh, half past five in the UK, just after 8 a.m. Uh, Tehran time now. And this is what uh, we know, our breaking news from the past couple of hours or so. Iran's, it all started with Iran's fast news agency uh, saying explosions were heard at an airport in the Iranian central city of Isfahan. The cause wasn't immediately known. Now, US media was saying it was an Israeli strike. And in fact, uh, a source has told our colleagues at NBC News that Israel did carry out an operation in Iran uh, tonight. And we do know that uh, Israeli officials notified American officials that uh, a response was coming. That response uh, following the drone and missile attack fired from Iran towards Israel on uh, April 
the 13th, five days ago, the vast majority of those uh, shot down. Now, this is video from uh, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps-affiliated Telegram channel. It shows explosions in the sky near uh, Isfahan. Now, I should say the Iranians are saying that they've uh, shot down a number of drones and uh, trying to seemingly play down state TV uh, what has happened. I should say Sky News uh, hasn't been able to independently verify this video, but clearly uh, something going on in the skies there at Isfahan, which is uh, home to uh, a military base. It manufactures uh, aircraft for the uh, Iranians. And, uh, in fact, we've had in the past few minutes uh, this from the Iranian news agency Taznim, which is uh, reporting that Iran's civil aviation organisation says flight restrictions in several airports have been lifted. Uh, this is where uh, we heard all this, that commercial flights had started diverting their routes early on Friday uh, without explanation. Now, that explanation perhaps uh, clearer now if uh, the targets of... An Israeli strike has been Isfahan, this airbase. Uh, let's talk to our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkle, who is live in Jerusalem. Uh, good to see you again, Ali. So if uh, flights are starting, or certainly appear to be starting to resume, that might suggest that any action by Israel has been limited. But we know the target is this uh, Isfahan base. How significant is that? Yeah, we, we know that that is one of the targets. There's a possibility that there could be some more as yet unconfirmed. I think Isfahan is, is um, significant on two levels. One, because it looks like the actual target was an air base that is connected to Iran's aviation industry. And so I wouldn't be surprised if it turns out that uh, some of the drones or parts of the drones that were flown at Israel on Saturday night were were manufactured or built or perhaps designed there um, because in which case there, there would be a direct logic uh, for Israel to attack that that particular base. There is also a part of Iran's nuclear program uh, quite close by to Isfahan but I think it's more of a research and development part. There's no indications that that has been attacked um, but it might be a sign as well, a signal from the Israelis just to say to the Iranians you know, we can and we're not scared to uh, if ever we needed to. So, as with the case with all of these things, you, you have to look at the messaging. Um, I think what is clear is that this has not been some Israeli blanket bombing of, uh, of Iran. Whatever targets they have chosen, whether it's one or more, appear to be carefully considered. And the point of that, as you've been hearing from other contributors, is both for, um, for Israel's allies, either in the region or, or in the West, uh, to justify why you're carrying out these attacks, because obviously they come with the risk of escalation. Um, but also, I think actually they are designed not to escalate the situation further. Now, we would expect Iran to respond in some form, um, but I think if messages can be sent to the Iranian uh, regime, either so that sort of blunt message of an airstrike by the Israelis, uh, but also back-channel messages, uh, perhaps to the British Embassy in Tehran, uh, that, you know, this is not supposed to be the next step towards war, if anything, it's supposed to be the next step away from it, then I think maybe the Iranian response, whatever it is and whenever it comes, uh, might be in kind. Americans will make of this now. Interesting, isn't it, that uh, this response comes five days after the bombardments from Iran. Is that because perhaps Benjamin Netanyahu has been uh, listening to world leaders? We remember that uh, President Biden said on Sunday, the day after this uh, attack, take the win, didn't he? Yeah, and Netanyahu is not typically particularly decisive. Um, he, he has a reputation for putting off difficult decisions until until he can put them off no longer. So, although he would have been urged by, I think, some of the military commanders around him, certainly some of the 
the extreme right wing in his coalition to take immediate action against Iran and, and really tough action against Iran following what happened on Saturday night. He, he has taken his, he's taken his time. I mean, there are reports here that actually the Israelis were set to launch strikes on two occasions earlier this week, but called them off at the last minute for whatever reason. But he would have had a lot of voices, as any leader does in this situation, have had a lot of voices in his ear, some saying strike, strike hard, others saying calm, you know, take your time, you don't need to do anything. Biden saying take the win. Um, what it looks like he's done is sort of gone somewhere in the middle of the two of them. He hasn't taken the win, as President Biden suggested, but nor has he gone uh, for the most extreme end of the options that would have been laid in front of him. What happens now? You, you seem to suggest things might not uh, ratchet up, but of course it all depends now on Iran, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Whether or not this is an escalation is pretty much dependent on whether Iran deems it to be an escalation and therefore worthy of a major response. So it will depend on what... Well, firstly, it will depend on whether this is the end of the Israeli action. Uh, and now that the sun is up and it looks like, as you say, air traffic is resuming in, across parts of Iran, it looks like that that might be the case because the element of surprise is over and it looks like this attack is, is over with. There were some reports of F-35 circling around um, Syrian airspace. But, you know, that could be as part of a, sort of a defensive shield in case Iran were to retaliate immediately. It looks like this attack is over, and maybe that's it. Maybe that for, for Israel, you know, this is, this is they, as far as they're concerned, no more to be done. So what does Iran do next? Well, we will see um, today a response I'm almost uh, certain of. Uh, when I, sorry, when I say response, what I mean is, is we will see a response from the Israeli, um, Iranian leadership. Now, what are their words? What are they saying? Are they going to threaten retaliation against uh, Israel like they did after the consulate bombing in Damascus? Or do they try and downplay it? Uh, because there are some reports coming out that various Iranian officials are telling Iranian media, look, there's no, you know, nothing to see here, um, nothing much has happened. Is that the party line? Is that what they're going to go down? Is, are they going to try and sort of take the heat out of the situation, um, remove the pressure uh, from themselves to, to, to respond? Or will they stick with the, the fiery rhetoric that we've seen in the last 24 hours when senior um, leaders within the Iranian administration said, if Israel dare attack us, we will respond back immediately and, and hard? Which direction are they going to go down? And that'll be something that we... I, I'm pretty sure we'll see happen over, over the morning. OK, um, we'll speak to you a little later. Many thanks indeed for now. Alistair Bunkle there, our Middle East correspondent in Jerusalem. Let's get the thoughts once again of uh, Defence Analyst Professor Michael Clark. Hello, Michael. Um, it was really expected, wasn't it? No matter how much uh, Joe Biden might have said, take the win, don't retaliate. Uh, I suppose many might think that Benjamin Netanyahu's caught between a rock and a hard place, got the hardliners in his war cabinet saying, act now. But he, as Ali was saying there, he would be thinking about things and taking his time. Yes, and I mean, we hadn't heard from uh, Netanyahu at all. Um, after the initial attacks last Saturday, when everyone was wondering how Israel would respond. Because, as you say, I mean, he had um, a lot of the international community saying, be very careful, just think about this, you know, get, get the pol political benefit from it, don't re retaliate. And then he had the hardliners, as you say, people like uh, Itamar ben Gavir and Smotrich on the ultra-right wing, ultra-Zionist wing, who can bring his government down at any time in terms of the votes they've got in the Knesset. And they're saying, you must respond. And if you don't respond, again, they hold this, this sort of sword of Damocles over him. If you don't do what we like, then we can bring you down. They, between them, Smotrich and ben Gavir's parties hold uh, 13 votes in a Knesset of 120. And that's enough to bring Netanyahu down. So he's always trying to balance these two um, forces. And he hadn't said anything until about 24 hours ago when he said, well, we've, we've received lots of advice from our partners and we're grateful for their support, but we're going to do what we, we're going to do. And as always with Netanyahu, he, you know, he demands 100% cooperation from his allies and then decides that he's not going to take any notice of them when he doesn't like what they advise. So um, that's where we are with it. And interestingly, Nick, in the last uh, couple of hours, I've been, as I've been tracking this overnight, 
um, the Iranians, as, as Alistair was pointing to the fact, the Iranians are saying there's nothing to see here. They're saying, look, it's just a drone attack. A few drones were sent and the explosions you heard were our air defences bringing them down. Um, I think I can promise you this was not a drone attack because it's over a thousand miles from Israel to the site of Isfahan. And um, nobody would send drones that far. I mean, drones only carry fairly small warheads. I mean, unless this was an aircraft-based attack, which seems very unlikely at the moment um, for all sorts of technical reasons, this almost certainly is a missile attack. And it would have been a Jericho missile, a Jericho 3, almost certainly. And the Jericho 3 has got lots of range. It'll do at least 3,000 miles, so it's easily got the range. It can carry basically a 1,000-kilogram uh, warhead, which is a one-ton warhead. And if you're going to attack an air base, you need big warheads because air bases are big places, you know, lots of open ground. And to do any real damage to an air base, you need a big explosion. Sending in drones with small warheads will put a couple of little pop marks in a runway or in the ground. That's exactly what happened um, at uh, Navatim last weekend when the Iranians got seven missiles, seven ballistic missiles missile through to the Novatim air base, and they did a bit of minor damage. In this case, if it was a Jericho missile or more than one Jericho missile, and I suspect it would have been more than one, they normally send, most militaries send two missiles to every target to make sure that the, the, there will be a 98% uh, likelihood of a hit. Um, and these missiles would have been, had a big warhead in order to do some significant damage. Um, so I'm pretty sure that will, will turn out to be what it was. Whether this is the only base that's been hit, we don't know. And as people have been saying, I mean, Isfahan is an interesting target to choose. It's, it's part of an aerospace industry. It's where the Iranians manufacture some of their drones. Uh, the air base at Isfahan is important. It's a big city. It's an important city. And Isfahan itself is host to most of the research that goes on, not the manufacture, but the research of Iran's nuclear program. So about 3,000 scientists work in the various facilities there. And although there's no indication that those facilities were affected by this, as far as we know so far, the fact that this is a city that is one of the nuclear cities of Iran will not have escaped the attention of the uh, uh, government in Tehran itself. So, uh, you know, lots of elements to the fact that Isfahan has been targeted almost certainly by Jericho missiles in this particular way. Um, Michael, uh, we're just hearing the senior Iranian commander has said, according to state media, there was no damage caused. So uh, more evidence from the Iranians uh, that uh, this is very limited or, as you say, nothing to see here. Let me just uh, remind our viewers, the pictures we're seeing here, this from the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC, affiliated uh, telegram channel. It shows explosions in the sky uh, near Isfahan. Interesting, uh, some are saying that as if there's nothing to see here. Well, uh, let us see. Uh, Sky News can't uh, independently verify that video at the moment. Big question, Michael, will be, well, what happens now? Iran was saying, wasn't it, at the weekend, uh, that uh, their action, that this huge action involving ballistic missiles um, firing towards Israel was limited, but the moment that... Israel struck back, they could uh, expect a, a harsh response. Whether that actually plays out uh, is a different matter. Yeah, I mean, both sides are daring each other to see how far they will go. I mean, 330 missiles and drones last weekend, last Saturday, that the Iranians fired at Israel were clearly intended to do more damage than they did. And although the Iranians may have wanted um, to inform some of their allies beforehand. And it, it was, I could, again, it was not an attack designed to fail. It was an attack designed to do rather more than it managed to do. If they'd wanted a symbolic attack just to be, um, to be completely de-escalatory, if that's possible, they would have sent 50 missiles or something like that, that, like that. But 330 is clearly designed to penetrate defences and the way they structured it, the timing, drones, cruise missiles, ballistic missiles in various combinations from um, an arc of 180 degrees around Israel. They all, so they all came in different directions. Um, that was clearly designed to hit more than they managed to hit. And so there's a degree of humiliation to Iran in the result of that attack last weekend, even though they're making the most of it in propaganda terms. And now in this case, they're, 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 it, it, it suits them to say, well, the Israelis have responded, but the Israelis were 
ineffective. It doesn't really matter. And that, in a sense, I think, is a, is a, a way of them trying to put a lid on this whole thing. And Israel will be able to turn around to the world community and say, look, we haven't gone berserk, because that was the that was what Ben Giver was saying, the right wing Zionist. He was saying we should go berserk. That was the word he used. We should go berserk in order to make them fear us again. Well, the Israelis will be able to say if this is all the attack has been, we have not gone berserk, but we have responded, and we're proving to the Iranians that when we attack, we get through. So they're showing that if we choose to do this again next weekend, it might be worse, and you really won't be able to defend yourself against it. So. As things stand, until we hear about any more things that may have, have happened overnight, this looks like a, a limited but relatively effective attack in terms of conveying the messages that the Israelis will want to convey, both to the Iranians and to the Allies, even though their Western allies will be very annoyed with them for doing this, but perhaps a bit relieved that this has been all that they have done so far. OK, Michael, many thanks indeed uh, for now. We'll be uh, returning to you during the course of the morning, uh, no doubt. So uh, let's uh, remind you of this uh, breaking news. Well, it's uh, broke a couple of hours ago uh, now. Uh, two and a half hours ahead of us uh, is Iran. So about 20 past eight in the morning now, daylight has uh, broken. This all started with Iran's Fars News Agency saying an explosion or explosions were heard at an airport in the central city of uh, Isfahan. Uh, our affiliate NBC News reporting uh, Israel informed US officials that it would be carrying out an attack. Uh, so it certainly seems that has happened. Uh, the latest of the tit for tat exchanges between uh, these enemies. Um, the video you're seeing there is from the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps affiliated telegram channel shows explosions in the sky near uh, Isfahan. Now, Sky News can't uh, independently verify this uh, video, but it has to be said that a commander, senior commander in Iran, said there was no damage caused. Uh, let's talk to our US correspondent, uh, James Matthews. And uh, we've been told, of course, as well at Sky News, that uh, the US uh, was informed of a response, if you like, to uh, Iran's attack uh, Saturday night. And I suppose that will bring somewhat, James, comfort to the Americans, given that what happened in Damascus on April the 1st, they weren't informed about. Well, comfort would be one word, Nick. Uh, certainly they were shown due respect, a respect that was denied them when Israel attacked the Iranian consulate in Damascus. They were given just minutes warning, the Americans. They didn't like that because an ally was launching a strike in a part of the world where there are American assets and American personnel. They told the Israelis that they needed time to, to get their defences uh, in order and allow American forces on the ground to, to be in the appropriate posture for action happening in their vicinity. So the Americans weren't happy at that point. That will be why, largely, the Americans were informed this time round. The Americans have made it clear, if you're going to do anything else, tell us. And indeed, the Americans were told, were informed earlier today. I think it's fair to assume the Americans will have been told detail about what the Israel Israelis planned and to a degree gave their blessing. There would have been an understanding by, from the Americans that Israel had to respond, an understanding that it was going to happen because the Israelis had said it would and the, with justification as they would have seen it because of the Iranian 300 plus projectiles. So the Americans would have seen that, understood it and although Joe Biden had said to the Israelis, we will not support any retaliation strike, it's not as if the Israelis have defied him uh, because there was no instruction not to launch one. As I say, Biden would have understood the need for the Israelis to make their mark, to respond to what the Iranians did in the past few days. Biden's wish uh, and his guidance to Netanyahu would have been, whatever you do, don't escalate this conflict because that is the way it has been heading with state-on-state -state, uh, military action. These words coming out of Iran, which appear to indicate Iran is dismissing this as uh, nothing to see here, playing down the significance and the damage of this, this Israeli strike. That's what 
the Americans certainly will want to hear uh, because they are invested in keeping a lid on conflict. And I think the strength for Biden moving forward in terms of reining in the possibility of a widened theatre of war is that the, the key players, Iran, Israel, uh, certainly the Americans as they look on, none of them want escalation. The Iranians certainly have made that clear to the Americans and vice versa in private via back channels, but also uh, they've made that very public that neither has any interest in a conflagration of conflict that draws both into a direct confrontation, confrontation. So that's Biden's strength moving forward. He favours the diplomatic route, of course. It's only in the last 24 hours that the United States has announced sanctions, fresh sanctions on Iran, targeting drone manufacturers to disrupt and degrade its drone manufacturing capability, also uh, targeting its steel production. So that's the Biden route. He wants to stay on that road and he will hope that what we're hearing from Iran keeps him there. James, good to see you. Thank you very much indeed. We'll see you uh, in a few minutes. So more on our breaking news uh, then. Israel has seemingly launched a strike on Iranian soil uh, this morning. Uh, the latest of the tit-for-tat exchanges between uh, these enemies. Uh, Benjamin Netanyahu had vowed he would respond after Iran fired more than 300 drones and missiles at Israel five days ago. More in a couple of minutes. Good morning from Jerusalem, where people are waking up to the news that Israel has attacked Iran. Iran State News Agency reported that air defences had been fired and explosions were heard near Isfahan International Airport. Israel warned the United States that the strike was coming. The impact of the attack is not yet clear, but it does appear to have been limited. And Iranian media is reporting there, have been, there has been no damage to nuclear facilities.
Good morning from Jerusalem. I'm Yalda Hakim, and we've woken up in the early hours of this morning to learn that uh, Israel has launched an attack on Iran. Now, we are being told that this attack is limited. There is still very little information coming out, uh, but we have learned uh, from various sources that this uh, strike was limited. But the fact remains that Israel has attacked Iran almost a week after Iran attacked uh, Israel. So the situation here is escalating and it is a very tense time. Let me bring in our Middle East correspondent, Alistair Bunkel, uh, who's here with me in Jerusalem. And Alistair, all week we heard uh, that there might be a potential strike back from Israel. And in the early hours of this morning, that's exactly what's happened. It is. The Israeli government had been taking a lot of advice from their allies, President Biden, saying take the win. Lord Cameron and the German foreign minister, both in Israel this week, also trying to um, gently nudge Israel away from anything uh, that could lead us into the path of war. But ultimately, Netanyahu was clear. Israel would always do uh, what it felt was in its own best interests and in the interests of its future security. And so I don't think there was ever much doubt that Israel was going to carry out some sort of response after what Iran did here on Saturday night. And now we know, or we're starting to find out at least, what that response is. Indeed. And um, this is a, as you say, a, a tense moment. And now, uh, I mean, the ball is very much in Iran's court. Yeah, I think so. So, I th f again, you know, it is the early hours. So we must caveat all of this in that the news is unfolding and we are learning more about what has happened. But it looks as though there has been a strike on an air base in the Iranian city of Isfahan. Now, I think that is significant for two reasons. Firstly, it is quite close to an Iranian uh, nuclear facility, I think a research facility. Now, there's no suggestion that facility has been hit whatsoever, but it does send a message from Israel to Iran that, you know, we can go there if we want to, and we're not frightened to if we're pushed to do so in the future. But secondly, the base that's hit, I think, is connected to Iran's uh, military aviation industry. And so it wouldn't be a surprise to me if we learn that perhaps some of the drones that were flown here on Saturday night were manufactured or part of the drones manufactured at that airbase. So that sort of draws a link. And so it suggests that Israel's response has been carefully calibrated and thought through. Netanyahu would have had an, a menu of options on the table provided to him by the Israeli Defense Forces. Probably at the top would have been strikes on Iran's nuclear um, facilities and maybe assassination attempts on senior individuals. Um, and then it would have been down in the sort of decreasing scale. I would put this lower down the scale. If this is it, and we don't know, but if this is it, I would put it lower down the scale. So the question is, what happens next? And that is down to Iran. Does Iran see this as an escalation it needs to respond to, or does it somehow try to downplay it? Yeah, I mean, when we think about uh, the, the timeline of the past six months, I mean, we see October 7 take place, and then Israel obviously uh, enters Gaza and launches their uh, operation. The war in Gaza begins just a few weeks after. And then significant things happen, like on uh, April the 1st, where we saw that diplomatic compound being, Iranian diplomatic compound being struck in Damascus, in Syria, where a senior Revolutionary Guard commander is killed. And then the attack of last weekend. And now, as part of that timeline, what we're seeing today. I mean, we are seeing these tensions between these two states really ratcheting up. And in the last few days, the war of words really ratcheted up as well. Yeah. I I, I would always be careful to separate the war of words from, from actual action. Uh, particularly the Iranians um, will often speak with a lot of emotion, um, but actually what they do in terms of their actions can be far more careful and far more considered. Um, the Israelis will deny until they're blue in the face that what they hit in Damascus was in any way part of the Iranian diplomatic compound. I've got to be honest, I think even amongst their allies, they don't really have much support in that argument. I think most people see it as, uh, saw that as, as, as quite a moment. And they took out um, this senior general, connected Iranian general, who's connected to Hezbollah, and six other Iranian officers. So, you know, we can argue, and people will argue whether that was the start of it or not, but it was really the start of this current sort of round of crisis between Israel and Iran. 
Iran then takes its time to respond, and we saw that what it did on Saturday night. Now, I think a lot of people say what Iran did was an escalation. 300 plus drones, missiles, and ballistic missiles fired at Israel. And it was the ballistic missiles that for Israel were the red line. Now, what, four or five days later, we have Israel's response to that. And I would read this actually as lesser. I don't see them actually doing more, in, you know, escalating, 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 but slightly less. And diplomats have been speaking to this week. What they want to see is that this crisis would gradually, like a falling leaf, start to sort of drift and fizzle out with increasingly uh, lesser events going on. This could be that. It could be that depending on what the Iranians decide to do. Indeed. Um, thanks so much, Ali, uh, for all of that. And, of course, we will be going back to Ali in a moment for all of his assessment. But let's go live now to Alex Rossi, who joins us from northern Israel. And, um, Alex, we woke up uh, in the early hours of this morning and, and saw that strike, which the Americans are describing as limited. Uh, but what we did see was Israel has responded to Iran's attack last week. Yeah, that's right. I mean, certainly the indications from the Israelis were that they would hit back. It would be a military response. Bearing in mind it needs to be a military response to what happened on Saturday, there would have to be some kind of symmetry to it. Remember that what they are doing, it's not the blind use of force. It sends signals, it's messaging, it's strategic and it's tactical in nature. So it would make sense that they hit a base uh, in Iran where some of those drones were manufactured. That would have a logic to it. But the fact that it is most likely limited in nature also suggests that perhaps it's de-escalatory. There is a chance here for the Iranians uh, to deny it happened or deny that there was significant damage and they can now move past uh, this incident. Um, I think the other thing to bear in mind is whether or not this is the end of it. Remember, we'll wind back to April the 1st. That was uh, a covert strike attributed to the Israelis and denied by the Israelis, part of what is known here as the shadow war that's been fought by Iran and Israel for many years. Iran uses what's known as its axis of resistance, its proxies in the region, uh, to attack the Israelis. Now, the message that the Iranians sent was actually you can't carry on in the shadows anymore. You can't attack our nuclear scientists. You can't attack our Iranian generals uh, without there being some kind of response. So do we see this, this over attack, which sends the signal uh, to the Iranians that they can't launch missiles? We aren't fearful, Israel says, and we will strike back and we will strike deep in Iranian territory. We will strike a city where drones were perhaps manufactured, where your nuclear program is. But also, we are going to carry on with the shadow war. And we haven't seen that yet. Does Israel carry on? Will we see an attack which is denied by Israel, but actually causes some serious destruction uh, to the Iranian regime. So we, we watch that. I think underlying all of this, of course, is that this remains an extraordinarily dangerous moment. Israel is facing crises on multiple fronts. The uh, war against Hamas is far from finished. Uh, on the northern border here in Israel, there are daily exchanges. There's a low-level war going on, Yalda, between Hezbollah and the Israeli military. That itself is enough of a flashpoint to cause a more significant war which could tumble, which would have its own deadly logic into a far greater regional conflict. So this is a, a really dangerous time, but we wait, of course, to see what the Iranian reaction is now to this Israeli attack. Uh, indeed. Um, Alex, thank you so much for all of your analysis there. Let's go live now to Alex Crawford, who joins us from Beirut. And um, Alex, uh, as Alex Rossi was saying there in northern uh, Israel, I mean, this really is a, a dangerous moment. Um, everyone is now watching very closely to how uh, the Iranians will respond, although uh, Iranian state media is now trying to, to play this down. And we've heard from the Americans that this was a, a limited strike. I think everyone behind the scenes will be doing just that, trying to play it down. Because certainly all the people that we've been speaking to over the past few days, those within Hezbollah, those very close to Hezbollah, the politicians here in Lebanon, some of those connected to Hezbollah, some of those just part of the Lebanese government, all stressing that uh, they don't want war. Uh, but also, very carefully underlined, they don't fear war and that it, the ball is very much in the Israeli court. 
Uh, we were surrounded by a number of uh, Hezbollah fighters yesterday, huge crowds of Hezbollah supporters and loyalists at a funeral. There are multiple funerals uh, every week from the cross-border exchanges with those uh, down south in, uh, w against the border with Israel. And all of them very determined to uh, hit back if they saw a significant attack by the Israelis. Obviously, there's a long history of distrust between Hezbollah and the Israelis, uh, very close links with Hezbollah and Iran because uh, they even had posters of Ayatollah Khomeini at the, at the funeral, a lot of people professing loyalty to Iran as well as Hezbollah. It was a, a time of, of grief to focus on those who'd been killed in the war because they feel there are very many, but also to show us and to show everyone else that they are strong very many of them saying that they're strong, they're powerful. Uh, Hezbollah itself has a military and political wing, and its military wing is said to be far more powerful than the Lebanese army. So uh, there was a big show uh, for the families, for those who belong to Hezbollah, but as foreigners and as a, a foreign media team there, they were determined to let us know that there was no fear if there was a retaliation, if there was a big... Uh, as in their view provocative strike from Israel but certainly behind the scenes all the political maneuvers all the diplomatic maneuvers all the attempts are to try to play this down you heard the Lebanese foreign minister earlier this week Yalda talking about how the ball was in Israel's court that they had only a certain amount of influence over Hezbollah that if there was a big provocative strike it would spread out into a massive big regional war and maybe even further that it would draw in the Houthis in Yemen, the militia group in Syria, the Hezbollah linked groups in Syria as well as in Iraq and of course here in Lebanon, a country which has already suffered for many years from a, a massive economic downturn and years of, of war. Now they believe here in, in uh, the south of Lebanon particularly that they are already engaged in a low level third front. The Lebanese foreign minister again underlining that, that there is this almost forgotten third front in this, this whole Middle East war and that is the Lebanese Israeli border where they are having multiple strikes it's there's seen a massive increase since the weekend in the number of of strikes on the border with uh, a number of, of funerals if we gauge the casualties in that a number of funerals uh, per day since since we've just been here and thousands and thousands of people displaced on both sides of the border nearly 80 villages and towns on this side of the border in Lebanon in the south of Lebanon which have had to have been emptied which are now ghost towns because of the regular firing between the two sides between Israel and Hezbollah but Again, Hezbollah telling us, at least over and over again, that of course Hezbollah is not the same as Hamas. They felt they were a target of the Israelis since October the 7th because they are seen to be so close to Iran, because they've had these very fundamental links with Iran, but they very much do not see themselves in quite the same vulnerable position as Hamas. They are a big, strong army that once defeated uh, uh, and pushed out Israeli troops back in 2006. They feel now that they have grown, developed, have become much more powerful, built up their arsenal, um, built up their, their uh, fighting force. They're not the same as they were back in, in those days in 2006. They believe they're much stronger. So the, the whole time that we've been here, uh, since the Iranian drone and missile uh, attack over the weekend, there have been constant uh, t telling us constant um, attempts to tell us about you know warnings almost through us to the rest of the world do not try and attack make a wide-scale large-scale attack on Iran and from by all accounts this could be seen to be very low scale so I'm sure this everyone will be working massively behind the scenes to try and persuade the Iranians and also Hezbollah that it is just that it is too low scale in fact the first indication from the Hezbollah leadership is that that is how they're viewing it 
that uh, they don't see, in their words, that the Israelis don't seem to have a plan, that it's clear they don't have the, uh, the uh, wherewithal to, to make a big scale attack. So they are the, the first, first uh, uh, statement from Hezbollah is that they also are trying to pass it off as, as nothing. Alex, uh, thank you, uh, as always, uh, for all of your reporting and bringing us up to date on, on the views there from uh, Lebanon and the spillover that this could potentially have regionally. Well, let's just bring you up to date. Uh, we woke up in the early hours of the morning to learn that Israel had launched uh, an attack on uh, Iran. We understand and early indications suggest that it was a single strike on a carefully selected uh, target. Um, Iranian state media are reporting that Air defences were fired close to Isfahan International Airport at around 4 a.m. local time in Iran. They say that drones were intercepted and there were no explosions on the ground. Now, we haven't been able to verify those claims, but uh, that is what they tell us is that uh, Iran um, it, and, and the views that we're getting uh, from our correspondents and, and what we're hearing is that that is Iran downplaying uh, this situation. Now, that could be crucial to what happens next, but what we have learned in the early hours of this morning is that Israel did launch a strike, uh, from what we understand, on Iran. Let's bring in our U.S. correspondent, James Matthews, who joins us live from Washington. And, and James, we are hearing from uh, U.S. officials uh, that this strike was limited. Yeah, that's the, that's the word coming from U.S. officials who are not saying much, I might say, Yalda, I mean, it's the middle of the night here in the United States, but uh, they're being quiet. The Pentagon, State Department, the White House, uh, keeping, keeping their head down because whilst they had prior knowledge of this Israeli strike, they don't want to be seen to have been a participant. And that's the one thing that they are saying, that in this limited strike, the United States did not play uh, a part. They're making that very clear. Uh, clear as they are on the possibility that they might be uh, seen to have been involved and seen to be engaged in this military action. Uh, they see the danger of the, the consequences that may flow from that. Biden uh, clearly uh, was in touch with Netanyahu in the wake of Saturday's Iranian attack, Yalda. He said to him, take the win, you have the win. And he made it clear that the United States wouldn't support any retaliation strike by Israel. But what he did not do uh, was tell Netanyahu not to launch a strike. I think there is a US and American understanding that Israel felt it had to go ahead and launch some kind of action. Uh, it's interesting that as a couple of hours ago, almost as soon as this action had taken place, the Americans felt confident in calling it a limited strike. The Americans were notified uh, that it was going to happen. So it, it may be safe to assume that there were detailed conversations around the Israeli course of action, where they were going to hit, the damage it was likely to inflict, and that there was a blessing by US defence officials, a blessing and an understanding that it had to happen. And we will find out in due course, but an agreement that it was appropriate, calibrated, not to escalate in a way the Americans don't want. That is Biden's big fear, that this blows up out of all control. The strength Biden has is that none of the key players, Iran, Israel, the United States, as it watches on, have any interest in escalated conflict. Israel has quite enough on its plate. It doesn't want increased trouble, as Alex was saying, from Hezbollah in the northern border. Iran has made it clear to the United States in private and in public that it doesn't want direct conflict with the states. Uh, and clearly the United States doesn't want to be dragged in to uh, any wider theatre of war or any kind of action militarily. That would happen if it saw Israel going under, if there was increased military pressure on Israel and it felt the need to step in to bail out uh, militarily an ally. But the question is, what does Iran do next? And my mind goes back to Sunday, Yalda. I was at the United Nations listening to the Security Council. You may remember that I caught up with Saeed Erevani, the UN ambassador for Iran. Polite, softly spoken. 
we had a a chat on his way to his uh, to his vehicle at the UN, and I asked him if a, if Israel strikes Iran, what does Iran do? And his response was that Iran's reaction would be decisive, he said, and resolute. I said, well, what does that mean? And he didn't say. I suppose in due course, we might well find out what decisive and resolute meant. Yeah, I mean, James, even yesterday, uh, Iran's president, uh, Ibrahim Raisi, said that even if the tiniest uh, attack is launched by Israel, uh, the response will be far greater than what we saw last Saturday, where we saw 300 missiles and, and drones launched uh, against uh, Israel. Um, since the very beginning of um, the last six months, really, uh, the Biden administration has really tried to ensure that this doesn't escalate, that this war between Hamas and Israel doesn't spill over to the rest of the region. They have had concerns about what's happening in the north of Israel with Hezbollah. They've had concerns about the actions of the Houthis, and they've been watching very closely uh, on what Iran has done. Even that April 1st attack that uh, Israel launched on the, uh, the Iranian uh, diplomatic compound, which ended up killing a, a Quds Force commander, the Iranians, we understand, uh, the Americans behind the scenes, we understand, uh, were telling the Iranians through intermediaries that, look, we weren't aware of this, we, you know, we, ha we didn't give this our blessing. And, and, you know, after Saturday, we heard Biden say to Netanyahu, as you say, take the win. This poses a, a bigger question around the relationship between Netanyahu and President Biden and whether Biden has been able at all to control him throughout the last six months. You're absolutely right, uh, Yelda. That is the key question at the heart of this. The key question for Biden moving forward, not just in terms of the international context, but also domestically, given, uh, given domestic reaction to what's happening uh, in the Middle East and criticism of him, that he doesn't have sufficient influence to, to rein in Netanyahu and to prevent growing tragedy in Gaza. And yes, it's the relationship, it's the access at the heart of what is happening, the American superpower and Netanyahu, the man on the ground. Israel, America's big ally, funded uh, by Israel, and, and it still enjoys uh, solid support from the Americans. The question is, how long can that last? What control does Biden exert, and to what extent does Biden ignore America? He has done that in the past, humiliated Biden repeatedly, that is a question going forward, and it becomes ever more important. Yeah, very much so. And we heard uh, um, Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu say earlier in the week um, that, you know, thanks very much for your counsel and advice, uh, but we are going to do what we need to do. James, thank you very much uh, for bringing us up to date. Let's go to Defence Analyst Professor Michael Clark, who joins me now. And, um, and Michael, big questions being asked about what the strike was, how it was conducted. We're still getting that information coming through. Uh, there is still very little information about exactly what what we understand is it was uh, over uh, Isfahan, uh, the, the air over Isfahan is where we're told that this, this uh, strike was conducted. Yes, uh, we've got some confirmation of that, Yalda, that uh, there were some explosions in Isfahan around the air base there, and there is a big uh, air base at Isfahan. Isfahan's also a pretty, a, a pretty big industrial centre, very important city. It's also one of the, you might call the nuclear cities. It's not uh, the home to a nuclear reactor or enrichment plants. They're mainly at Fordo and Natanz, a bit further south. But there's a big research centre. I mean, most of the nuclear research uh, that Iran conducts is carried out at Isfahan. About 3,000 scientists work there. Now, there's no evidence that these explosions were anywhere near the nuclear facilities. Um, but the fact that it's one of the nuclear cities is symbolically uh, not lost, I think, on uh, people assessing this. And uh, attacking the airbase at Isfahan, if that's, what, if that's where the explosions were, they seem to be, uh, would make a certain amount of sense. Also, I mean, the, uh, the Tasnim agency, the Tasnim news agency, which is very close to the IRGC, was also reporting explosions in um, Tabriz. Now, we haven't confirmed that, and Sky's been very cautious about that, but other agencies are talking about that. But the reason that, that Tabriz might be important, along with Isfahan, is that 
one of the things that Isfahan produces is drones that were used to attack Israel last weekend. And one of the things that exists at Tabriz, which is in the northwest, in the mountainous area, it's there are a lot of silos there for Shahab 2 and Shahab 3 ballistic missiles, which were also used to attack Israel last weekend. So if it is the case, if it is the case, that both Isfahan and Tabriz have been attacked, it would look like the Israelis are going after certain targets that were directly related to the attack last weekend where 330 drones and missiles were launched against Israel. Now, that's not confirmed yet, certainly in terms of Tabriz, but the Isfahan attack is confirmed, and almost certainly from a military analysis, it has to be almost certainly ballistic missiles. Um, the Iranians are saying drones, they, they've intercepted some drones and none of them uh, got through. That's very, very unlikely because Isfahan is a thousand miles away from, uh, uh, from Israel and nobody in their right mind will send drones a thousand miles to deliver very small payloads, uh, which they can only really carry. So for any sort of effective attack, a couple of missiles at least usually two missiles used on each target to make sure there's a 98% chance of, of a, a proper hit. And so two missiles at least, and probably more, were sent against uh, these targets in Isfahan. Almost certainly there would have been the Jericho 3 missile. That has a, a, a range of at least 3,000 miles, so it's easily capable of reaching the area. And it carries a 1,000 um, a, a, a kiloton warhead, which is a ton, sorry, a, 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 thousand, kilo, uh, yeah, a thousand, kilo, thousand kilogram warhead, uh, which is a ton. Uh, so uh, in that respect, it would be a, a, a big enough explosion to make a difference to something as big as an air base or a facility. Michael, no surprises that uh, Iran would say uh, they were drones just to try and downplay uh, the, the, this attack and, and the impact of it. Yeah, I mean, the, the, everything we've heard from the Iranians in the last two or three hours is, uh, is indicates that they're saying, look, there's nothing here to see. Uh, it was an attack, it was trivial, it didn't matter. Um, and if more attacks do come to light, and I've seen some American reports which are reporting a lot more attacks, and I'm very sceptical about that, but we'll see in the coming hours. But the Iranians have an interest in saying this is a one-off attack, it was drones, it didn't matter, Therefore, it relieves them of the responsibility of being so outraged by it that they feel they have to do something else even more decisive. And so both sides here are trying to save face. You can see that the Israelis are trying to save face to do something, but not so much that it upsets the Allies too much, which is why, as, as James was saying, they, they've been very careful this time to uh, inform their American allies and almost not get their approval, because they won't get approval, but to get at least their acceptance of what they're doing and the Iranians are being quite careful um, not to overplay this at the moment to indicate that as they react, they may react in a way that doesn't now hit Israel directly, but maybe tries to indicate some other reaction on targets elsewhere in the region and possibly even on, on shipping in the Strait of Hormuz, as they did um, last week. Um, the, you know, the idea that the Iranians will be seen to react, but not react in a way that is escalatory, is, is growing in, in credibility as the hours go on. So things are looking a bit calmer at the moment than they did about three or four hours ago. It's still difficult to know how exactly the uh, Iranians will react, um, Michael. I've been speaking to uh, Israeli officials here who were quite surprised that following that uh, Iranian compound that was attacked by the Israelis on April the 1st, that the reaction and response would be a state-on-state -state attack, which they say crossed every red line and every understanding that they had of how uh, Iran would respond to something like that. Yeah, I mean, the assassination of Zahidi in Damascus did cross a lot of red lines, not just for the Iranians, but for other uh, countries as well, because this was a, uh, a consular building within the embassy compound. It was diplomatic premises. And whoever is in the diplomatic premises, th there is a general ac acceptance in diplomacy that you don't attack diplomatic premises, even if the Israelis claim that that made it a military target because there were military figures there. Nobody would accept that, I think, in the diplomatic world. So that attack on the 1st of April against Zahidi, which got him and 15 others, um, did cross a number of lines and surprised and, and um, disappointed, I think, quite a lot of Israel's allies. And the Iranians felt that, that by attacking an embassy, they were effectively attacking Iranian territory and the Iranians then hit back. 
And the Iranian attack, 330 missiles and drones, was clearly intended to do a lot more damage than it did. Seven missiles, ballistic missiles, got through of those 330 to the Navatim air base in the south of Israel, quite near to Dimona, incidentally, which is the nuclear site of, in Israel, one of the important nuclear sites. Um, but only seven got through and, and created very minor damage. Undoubtedly, the Iranians were briefing out that really the attack was a, a symbol, it was intended to fail, they didn't want it to be too bad. We informed our allies before we did it. I don't, I don't believe that. I, I know they did inform their allies, but if they wanted a, an attack that was intended merely as a, as a symbol, then it would have been 50 or 60 drones and missiles. 330 was clearly intended to do a lot more damage than it actually did. So I think the Iranians did respond strongly they have been somewhat humiliated by the lack of success of that attack, although they're, they're still playing it up as a propaganda victory because they attacked Israeli territory. But here the Israelis are humiliating the Iranians in the eyes of the world. And they, what the Israelis are saying is, look, if we choose to drop two Jericho missiles on you, they will get through, and they will, because the Iranians don't really have an air defense system that can um, defend themselves effectively against a Jericho 3 missile. So the Israelis are making the point that, you know, we don't need to send 330 missiles and drones. We'll send two, we'll send six, we'll send ten. And they will hit you. They will get through and they'll hit you at a place of our choosing. And that's the message, I think, which these limited attacks so far seem designed to send to Tehran. Michael, thank you so much uh, for all of your analysis there. That's Professor Michael Clark. Well, let's just bring you up to date. We woke up in the early hours of this morning to learn that uh, Israel had lo launched uh, a strike on Iran. It was about 4 a.m. local time, according to uh, Iranian state media. They're reporting that air defences were fired close to Isfahan International Airport uh, in central Iran. They say that drones were intercepted and there were no explosions uh, on the ground. Uh, now we are waiting uh, to see whether there is any response from the Iranians, but the reports that we're getting at present, we can't verify any of these claims uh, that the Iranian state media is reporting, uh, but that is uh, how the Iranians are currently reporting it. Let's bring in Ali for more analysis. And Ali, all week we've been hearing from the, the war cabinet um, about the various options that they've been looking at. Where do you think this fits on the, on the scale of that, these strikes? Well, if, the, if, if this is it, and when I say if this is it, if there's nothing more to come, um, and if the reports of other strikes elsewhere in the region turn out not to be true, then I think it falls much lower down in that menu of options. Uh, I think Israel could have gone in far bigger if it had wanted to do so and without doubt there would have been people here in the Israeli administration particularly I'm thinking of those on the right wing the likes of Itamar Ben-Gavir, Bezalel Smotrich who would have wanted Israel to have done that uh, there would have been people in Netanyahu's ear saying this is the moment come on this is our chance to to really hit them back to really degrade their 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 nuclear uh, program Netanyahu doesn't look as though he's decided on that option. He looks as though he's decided on limited, targeted and calibrated strikes on Iran. And that might not provide a step for Iran to take, but I do think it is part of a, an off-ramp if that is where Iran wants to go. And I would fully expect that in the coming hours we will hear from Iranian leaders. Is their language the sort of you know, heavy emotional language we heard, particularly yesterday, when they were saying, you know, even the tiniest strike and we will hit you back. Is it that kind of language or is it rather dismissive? Do they try and sort of downplay it? And I think that will tell us what Iran wants to do next. Well, certainly state media has been downplaying it, haven't they? They haven't quite got their messaging uh, coordinated. There's been some saying, eh, nothing to see here. There's others been saying, we shot down drones, look how successful our air defences are, and there's others been saying actually some explosions have happened. So I don't sense a coordination in the Iranian um, uh, uh, messaging as, as things stand at the moment. And ultimately, it will come from a, cute, a few key figures. Uh, the Ayatollah Khatollah Khamenei, um, I think if we hear from Raisi today as well, we heard from him earlier on in the week, uh, and possibly some of the senior IRGC generals, that will, that will tell us where we're heading on this. 
And if they start threatening uh, Israel and a response, as they did after April the 1st and the consulate attack in Damascus, then that's, I think, what we should be looking at. If, as I say, if they try and downplay it, then I think it's a signal that Iran is looking for an off-ramp. That doesn't mean to say they won't do anything, but it would suggest to me that they are looking to try and see a way out of this crisis. Ali, thank you, uh, as always, and of course we will come back to you uh, in a moment. But let's uh, bring in Nimrod Gorand, Senior Fellow for Israeli Affairs at the Middle East Institute. Uh, Nimrod, thanks so much uh, for joining us. All week since that uh, attack that Iran launched on Israel, we've been hearing uh, from global leaders, uh, President Biden, saying to the Israelis, see this as a win. This past weekend, the uh, fact that you were able to, uh, you know, really shoot down and, and uh, uh, prevent the attack from uh, Iran from being uh, anything, um, see it as a success. Israel said, we have to respond. How do you assess this current response? Thank you. We are uh, still in early hours, of course, so whatever we're discussing could unfold in a different direction, but I think Israel definitely saw it as a win, it's a success, but this didn't mean that Israel did not need to respond from its point of view. The message uh, before the Iranian attack was very clear that if Iran attacks on Israel from its territory, Israel will retaliate in Iran. Now, the way to do that, I think, was in line uh, with the principle that Israel spelled out during that week, meaning, first and foremost, coordination with the U.S., we saw the significant role that the U.S. and other countries played in defending Israel last week. It was clear that Israel should be coordinated. It doesn't mean that there was an American green light, but it definitely was clear that the attack should be in line with what the American request considerations are. It seems like that has been the case. Plus, the Israeli reluctance from doing any attack that will lead to a wider escalation. There is no Israeli interest now with a, another full-fledged war fund. Uh, we had enough of that. So I think that's kind of the way Israel acted. And according to the initial responses from all the sides, it seemed like uh, sides are interested in de-escalating the situation. Of course, that will still change. Yeah, as you say, we'll have to wait and see. It's still the early hours. And, uh, you know, from American sources, they've described it as limited. Iranian state media has tried to downplay it. But it's still difficult to know how the Iranians exactly will respond and react to this. Exactly. We need to remember also that the covert war between Israel and Iran has been taking place for four years, basically, with uh, Israeli attacks already happening on Iranian soil without taking responsibility. So the model of Israel uh, seemingly acting, not officially taking responsibility, indicated through leaks to American sources, to the media, that it was behind that. Uh, Iranian response denies that an attack from outside the country took place and downplays the impact. All of that is a tit for tat in terms of the escalation language. Uh, so I think that's where the, the direction is heading. The choice of the target that Israel uh, picked uh, it was not a civilian, it was not a nuclear, it uh, reportedly was an Air Force a target, much like the Iranian attack was targeting an Air Force base in Israel. So it seems to be in a process of containment, or at least the, the goal uh, is to contain. I think international diplomacy should now pitch in and make sure that this containment will actually take place and that the language being used by both sides will not lead to the escalation or necessitate another phase of uh, mutual attacks. Goran, what sort of message do you think Israel was trying to send to Iran? I think the message is that Israel can first has the capacity to act. Okay, one of the things that was evident in the Iranian attack that it needed, didn't make the impact within Israel that Iran wanted to do. So Israel wanted to show the capacity, the capabilities. Israel wanted to show the principle because we are basically in the first type of event between Israel and Iran, the first time there is public, direct confrontation, military confrontation. And the concern is whether we are trying to shape a new type of status quo that may not play into Israel's security and strategic interest. So whatever response Israel is doing, the, the basic principle of responding is intended to also get out of this phase of confrontation in a way that paves the way for the future rules of engagement and do not change them to the benefit of Iran against Israel. So I think those were the interests at play uh, with the Israeli leadership, plus again, not to enter another military adventure with a power that has the capacity to really cause damage to Israel. And we saw how much just the waiting for the Iranian attack made an impact on Israeli society. I don't think that's what uh, Israel is needed at the moment more.
Uh, Gorin, I, I, you know, as you say, for years there's been a, a, covert, a covert war, there's been a, a shadow war. But what makes this particular week different is that it has been overt, it's been state on state. That is where these red lines have now been crossed. Definitely. And what happened a week ago was something that Israel has never faced. You know, we had more than 300 missiles and drones targeting Israel coming from Iran. It was a totally new wartime experience for Israel. Israelis were not sure what the capacity of the state to defend itself against such an attack. So there was a lot of relief when that attack was blocked. There was a, a very positive surprise, perhaps, to see how the regional international actors joined in in basically defending Israel's territory. We saw a major role for Jordan. We saw the Saudis, we heard the Emiratis, the American leadership. So each one had their own motivations or the different framings of defending their airspace or other interests. But eventually, it was a coalition, an undeclared coalition, led by the Americans with Arab countries, defending Israel against an attack in Iran, showing just how deep the joint interests in the regions are how sustainable and resilient regional cooperation could be, even at a time of war in Gaza, when all the Arab world and the international community are criticizing Israel, that sends a very important message for Israel, not only in its ability to have the upper hand against Iran, but also the context of regional coordination within its operates, very different than the traditional Israel experience being isolated in the region. Nimrod Goren, Senior Fellow for Israeli Affairs at the Middle East Institute, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Let's go live now to our Alex Rossi, who joins me from northern Israel. And Alex, although we continue to hear that Iranian state media is trying to downplay uh, these strikes, that we're hearing from American sources that they're saying this was limited, no doubt the region is now continues to be, as they have been for the last week, frankly for the last six months, on edge. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this crisis, we do not know which way it's going. Is this the beginning of the end? Is this the beginning of the beginning? None of that at the moment is clear. Um, we're certainly now in a situation, of course, when we are waiting for uh, whether or not there will be an Iranian response to this Israeli attack. There's also questions, of course, Yalda, about whether or not this Israeli attack uh, is over. And then there is the situation of the Iranian proxies around Israel as well, where I am in the north of the country. There has been, a, you know, effectively a low-level war being fought between Hezbollah uh, militants in Lebanon. This is a paramilitary organization which is heavily sponsored by the Iranians and Israeli forces. That is going on every day, daily exchanges of rocket and missile fire. A couple of days ago, for instance, a Bedouin village up towards the coast on Israel, uh, a, new, um, a Hezbollah attack, 14 soldiers seriously injured, um, uh, sorry, 14 soldiers injured, seven of them uh, seriously injured. Now, that was in response to an Israeli strike, Hezbollah say, which uh, uh, killed a Hezbollah commander. So you can see that this really is a flashpoint. Um, we may see de-escalation now between Iran and Israel, but there's big questions here about whether or not this leads to a broader war. Alex, thank you uh, very much for that update. Let's go straight to the United States and speak with our James Matthews. And, and James, still early uh, in the morning in the United States, but uh, no doubt uh, once the officials have got their lines together, we'll be hearing more uh, about the American reaction to this. Uh, yes, I think so, uh, Yalda. Yeah, it's the middle of the night in the United States. The, the two lines coming out of here are that the attack was limited and that the United States didn't play any part in it. I think the fact that we haven't heard from uh, the Americans probably plays into the fact that they are playing it down. That's, that would be the wish or that would be the hope of President Biden, that this does not amount to the escalation that he fears and that uh, the word coming out of Iran talking, uh, you know, talking it down in terms of impact, damage and uh, implications of the strike. If that is the way the Iranians are framing this, then that will be what Biden wants to hear. He fears escalation. He fears the impact of an escalated war. And he, he will be conscious once more of Benjamin Netanyahu as an individual over whom he doesn't have the influence that he would like, doesn't have the control that he would like over Israel and what Israel does next. Biden said to Netanyahu just a few days ago, take the win after the Iranian strike, take the win, 
said the United States would not support Israel in a strike of retaliation. And yet, here we are, we have this Israeli strike tonight. So great uncertainty that Joe Biden will feel acutely. Yeah, indeed, as you say, uh, great uncertainty uh, at present. James, thanks so much. Uh, let's get more now on that uh, Israeli attack on Iran uh, that happened in the early hours of the morning. Let's bring in Deborah Haynes, our security and defense uh, editor. And uh, Deborah, all week we were hearing from the Israelis that there would be some kind of response, some kind of uh, attack. And overnight we saw that this really is a, a very tense moment, although we are hearing from Iranian state media that this was uh, just some kind of uh, drone uh, drone strike that we, and, and it was shot down. Um, so we can't verify any of that, but that is what the Iranians are saying at present. Yes, and I also think that the, the scale of what exactly has happened overnight maybe isn't completely clear yet. And so we will, I assume, learn more about whatever the targets were that Israel was seeking to hit. It became very apparent, didn't it, after uh, last weekend's attack on Israel, that despite the best efforts by the UK, the US and others to urge restraint, to take the win, as they kept on saying, that Israel really was going to to fight back. And sources that I've been speaking to this week um, in you know, Western uh, sources have said to me that the, the hope has been um, that Israel strikes back, you know, not the hope that they would do, but the understanding that they would do in a, a, a targeted, as targeted and as limited a way as possible so that Iran could with, you know, maybe withstand that attack, Iran maybe needing to fight back itself. Um, but but that, that response by Iran being not as big as the one that happened at the weekend, but a reduced one. And so you have a gradual tit for, da, tit for tat, but in a reduction kind of way until it peters out. But as one source put it to me, it really is um, a high stakes poker, because obviously whenever there is military action, even if it's deliberate and targeted, there is always the chance of misunderstanding, miscalculation, mistake, and then escalation into uncontrolled conflict, which is clearly what everyone is incredibly concerned about. And now that this strike back has happened, uh, the big question will be how Iran and Iran's proxies in the region respond. And you can imagine that American, British and other allied forces in the region will be on high alert as this situation unfolds. Uh, indeed, uh, Deborah, thank you very much. And as uh, Deborah was saying, there are a lot of uncertainty. We're still learning uh, about uh, these uh, strikes that we're hearing about. Iran state media has reported that air defences had been fired and explosions had been heard uh, near Isfahan International uh, Airport. Uh, but we did wake up in the early hours of the morning to learn that Israel had launched uh, an attack on Iran in response to the attack that Iran had launched on Israel last weekend. This is a developing story. We are still waiting to get more information. We heard there from James Matthews who said uh, US sources are saying that this strike was limited, but it is unclear what will happen next and how the Iranians will respond and react. We are following all the developments here from Jerusalem, but for now, back to you, Gareth, in the studio. Yalda, for the moment, thank you so much. We'll cross live back to Yalda in due course throughout the course of the morning, reporting there from Jerusalem for us. Uh, you join us in London. We've got Deborah Haynes here, obviously, Jacob Jarvis, podcasting news reporter, Gopreet too as well. And Deborah, it feels as though this shadow war is now out in the open. Yeah, it's not very much a shadow war, no. is it? And it's, it, everyone is very, very aware that there's been this hybrid um, sort of sub-war war that's been going on between Israel and Iran for, for years with uh, deniable attacks on each other. Um, that changed, and not just with last weekend's attack, but when Israel chose to target the, uh, the Iranian consulate in Damascus, killing those senior generals. That really was seen on the Iranian side as a red line. And interestingly, you've had even um, the British Foreign Secretary uh, saying that that kind of attack on uh, diplomatic property 
would, uh, you know, would prompt a response from the UK, for example. But then the condemnation was the scale of the Iranian response with all those hundreds of missiles, um, including ballistic missiles and drones targeted at Israel. Uh, and that, that, that too was a red line, that direct attack on Israel, a country that ha is surrounded by neighbours that want to, uh, you know, extinguish its very existence. Mm -hmm. And so there's been this debate all week as to how they would respond. And now we're seeing the beginning of it. Um, I, mean, I don't think we fully know the full scale of what's happened overnight, but it does so far seem quite limited. And Gopri mentioned there from Deborah with regards to the Foreign Secretary David mm. Cameron. He had travelled to Jerusalem yeah. and, the, and the feedback seemed to be from Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, that Israel would make its own decisions regardless of what the UK or the US said to them. Yeah, David Cameron met uh, Netanyahu on Wednesday. They had a meeting and after that meeting, as you pointed out, Netanyahu said, ultimately, we will make our decisions ourselves. I think kind of further um, point, making this point that um, although we kind of sit here and talk about um, whether, you know, how Britain is going to respond, we're still waiting for the line from the FCO, from the government, about what it makes of all of this. Ultimately, our uh, influence on what Israel is doing and on the decisions that Netanyahu will make mm -hmm. is very limited. Mm -hmm. And Jacob, this all happens as G7 foreign ministers meeting in Capri. That was from the 16th to the 19th. We should surely expect more commentary. We're waiting kind of for official lines to the United States. But we saw people like the French, for example, as well, taking part in the defence and interception of those missiles. So G7 ministers will surely be calibrating how they respond to the situation here. Absolutely. It's, it's such a complex situation throughout the Middle East. And it will be interesting to see how the United States does react to this, which I'm sure will lead the rest of Western nations. But interestingly, how... In regards to support of Israel, there is obviously a situation with Gaza and I think the, the way the international community were feeling about how they were handling that situation had obviously turned and the US were pushing for a ceasefire there and wanting to question their support of Israel in certain ways. And then this has happened, which I'm sure you'll see, obviously America will be steadfastly supporting Israel, but how that changes the relationship between Biden and Netanyahu and shapes the, the negotiations all around and the way they discuss that, it's going to be very interesting to yeah. see. That narrative sharply changing, you know, following that, that, those killings of the World Central Kitchen workers, those seven people who were killed, there was an awful lot of kind of pressure being put on Israel now of sense that, that countries are coalescing back around it again, certainly for the short term. Yes, and that was, that, that's been really sort of playing into how Israel responds because it wasn't just British, American and French support that rallied to Israel's defences uh, on Saturday night to fend off that attack. You had the Jordanians and... You know, the Israelis are understandably tight-lipped about which countries in the region were helping, um, but clearly there was a coalition that included Arab states too, and that is a, a sense of support that Israel will need as it confronts Iran in whatever way it's choosing to do. It's obviously those two are arch enemies, and neither side so far have indicated they want to have a direct war, but clearly the fact that they are, we're now in a situation where you've got both sides firing directly at each other, then clearly the path to escalation is very um, acute and everyone right now will be working behind the scenes on both sides to try to, 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 to sort of damp things down. And it's interesting, the UK has got a different kind of relationship with Iran than countries like the United States uh, and also, of course, Israel. We still yeah, we have a functioning embassy there. We do have diplomatic relations. So potentially there must be, you'd imagine, um, some sort of conversation influence. You had the foreign secretary talking to his, his Iranian counterpart during this crisis too. So it's not just that we're talking to the Israelis on this. Mm. Um, the UK has a part to play on, on speaking to both sides. And there's been pressure, haven't there, on the UK government to potentially designate the IGRC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps as, as a terrorist entity or to, to some degree. But David Cameron's saying, no, that conversation is important to still be able to have that channel, like, like Deborah says. Yeah, I think it's really interesting what's going on um, in government because there's been some talk about, you know, how aligned David Cameron and Rishi Sunak are on this issue. Um, David Cameron has, like, largely been taking the lead on it. Um, but also there's... Um, you know, a huge amount of constant shifting in the public's perception of what's going on with this conflict. And in the run-up to uh, the general election, we've also seen a lot of pressure on Labour as well to um, clarify their position and to shift their position. So 
I think one thing I'll be looking out for is to see how Labour have responded to what's been going on just now. You mentioned there UK politics. There is some breaking news with regards to politics here in, in Westminster at the moment. Yeah, so it's understood uh, that uh, Anne Lee Dodds of the Labour Party has uh, formally uh, requested, um, we haven't had this confirmed from Labour yet, but has formally requested that the police uh, investigate Mark Menzies, that's the Conservative MP, we had news about that yesterday, who it's understood may have misused campaign funds for personal reasons. We'll follow that mm. development closely. Obviously, lots of stories making the papers today. The events of this morning, not yet in the papers. That's happened after the publication of those. What should we expect to see in the coming hours? Well, I think, first of all, there'll be the, an, a full understanding of exactly... What, or as full as possible, an understanding of, of, of what has or hasn't been targeted. Uh, you'll obviously have the Iranian response. They're clearly wanting to make out as if it's business as usual. There, were, there was a lot of concern that Israel would seek to target Iran's nuclear facilities. Um, and that would have obviously been very escalatory ha had they or have they done that. Um, and then, obviously, the, the, the reactions from allies too. We'll follow all those developments closely. Do stay with us, Deborah, Jacob, Claire Preet, thank you so much. Stick with us on Sky News. We have the developments throughout the course of the morning and on the website too.
Good morning from Jerusalem, where people are waking up to the news that Israel has attacked Iran. Iran's state news agency reported that air defences had been fired and explosions were heard near Isfahan International Airport. Israel warned the United States that the strike was coming. The impact of the attack is not yet clear, but it does appear to have been limited and Iranian media is reporting there has been no damage to nuclear facilities. And we'll be getting reaction from the UK government here in our Westminster studio. Good morning, I'm Yalda Hakim, live from Jerusalem. We've, been, uh, we've woken up this morning to the news that Israel has attacked Iran. Early indications suggest a single strike on a carefully selected target. It's a significant moment. Alex Rossi is in northern Israel. Our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, is in Beirut. And our US correspondent, James Matthews, is in Washington for us. Iranian state media is reporting that air defences were fired close to Isfahan International Airport in central Iran at around 4 a.m. local time in Iran. They say that drones were intercepted and there were no explosions on the ground. We haven't been able to verify those claims, but what they suggest to us is that Iran is playing down the attack. That could be crucial for what happens next. This video is from the international, uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard Telegram channel. It reportedly shows the explosions in the sky near uh, Isfahan. Just have a look. Now, Alistair Bunkle uh, is with me now. And uh, Ali, I mean, this is a developing story, but Israel said they were going to do it. They've now done it. It's a question of what Iran does next. It, Israel took their time. Netanyahu is not a leader who typically makes quick decisions. He will have had a lot of voices in his ear. The likes of Joe Biden saying, take the win, don't exacerbate the situation further. And then he'll have had other right-wingers in his coalition saying the opposite. Let's go hard at Iran. Let's attack their nuclear facilities. Let's teach them a lesson. In the end, five days after the airstrikes here on Israel, I think he's gone for a lesser option. He would have been provided with a menu of different responses that the Israeli military could have carried out, ranging from an attack on the Iranian nuclear facility at the top, perhaps an assassination of a senior figure, and in a decreasing scale. And I think he's gone down the lower end of things, hoping that it sends a clear message of deterrence, hoping that it proves to the Iranians that Israel can strike Iran when it wants, where it wants. Don't forget that Iran sent more than 300 drones and missiles here on Saturday night. Most of them didn't even make it into Israeli airspace. It looks like Israel has fired a small number of missiles at Iran and they've all got through. And that sends a pretty powerful message to the Iranians. Ali, in some ways, April 1, where Iran's diplomatic compound was hit and a senior Revolutionary Guard commander was killed, that in itself was an escalation. It was. The Israelis will tell you until they're blue in the face that it was not a consular um, building, it was not part of a diplomatic compound, and that the people inside were the enemies of Israel. I have to be honest, I, I don't think they have much support in their assessment of whether or not, or the sort of classification of that building. I, you know, privately, American and British diplomats I've spoken to do think that it was uh, a consular building, and therefore it did cross a red line, it did breach uh, the Vienna Convention. And so it was a major escalation, and that set in motion uh, the train of events that we're seeing play out now. We then fast forward to what happened last Saturday night, and I think that was a further escalation from the Iranians. Not only did they come out of this shadow war and directly attack Israel for the first time ever, the fact that they sent so many drones and missiles, including ballistic missiles, took everyone by surprise, and it was the use of ballistic missiles that crossed the red line for Israel. And so we've then gone to the events of the last few hours, and I would see the, Iran, uh, the Israeli response and what Israel has done in the last few hours, assuming there's nothing more that we don't yet know about, and assuming that that's it, I would see that as steps towards de-escalation. Each side is going to want to have the final say, and it might be that Iran feels compelled to do something, but I think Israel is providing Iran with, with an off-ramp. 
Ali, uh, in the last uh, week when I've been speaking to Israeli officials, frankly, it appears that they've been quite shocked by Iran's response to that diplomatic compound being hit. They say that all sorts of red lines were crossed, that they didn't quite expect that 300 drones and missiles would, would end up coming their way as a result of, of that attack. No, I think, I, I think the Israelis have been pushing the envelope over the last six and a bit months. Whether or not that, whether that's um, against Hezbollah and striking increasingly deeper into into Lebanon and taking out more senior Hezbollah commanders, and the reason I reference Hezbollah is because they they are the Iranian proxy up on the northern border here, and I think they 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 were pushing it, and probably, if I'm guessing, the calculation in Israeli security circles was that they could carry out the strike on the on the concert building in Damascus and not risk a major fallout. And so I think they were very surprised by what happened on Saturday night. We all were. Uh, and that is why they were always going to respond. Israel was always going to respond in some form. This is their response. And so is this it? Is there any more to come or is this it? And now we need to look at Iran because it's in the Iranian hands what happens next. What is the language that the Iranian leaders are going to be using later today? Will it be fiery rhetoric of revenge or will it try and downplay it? And Ali, so far, what has Iranian state media been saying? It does feel sort of different outlets are saying different things. Yeah, slightly confused. There's certainly a message floating around of Nope, not much happened, nothing to see here. Um, there are other uh, reports that uh, Iranian defences shot a few drones out of the sky. I think that's unlikely that drones w were involved, to be honest. And there were some reports um, in Iranian state media of explosions around Isfahan. So not a coordinated message coming out of the Iranians at the moment. But just referring back to my previous answer, the one thing we haven't heard from the Iranians yet, and it's still early on, is this kind of, um, the, the, this message that there will be revenge, they will carry out a, a revenge attack. That is the sort of language we heard following the April the 1st attacks in Damascus. We haven't yet heard that this time, but who knows? It, as I said, the day is young, we'll wait and see what the Iranians have to say, but I think their language will tell us everything that we need to know about where this is going to go next. Ali, uh, thank you so much uh, for now. Well, let's just remind you of how this attention began and unfolded and show you this timeline. Now, on April the 1st, is Israel struck the Iranian consulate in Syria. Seven of its military advisers, including three senior commanders, were killed. And then on Saturday, Iran fired 170 drones, over 30 cruise missiles and 120 ballistic missiles at Israel. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had vowed to respond. Well, let's bring in our special correspondent, Alex Crawford. And Alex, as we've been saying, I mean, the region hasn't just been tense since Iran launched those attacks on Israel last weekend. This tension has been brewing uh, for the past six months. It's just been ratcheting up. Yeah, I've got to remember that in southern Lebanon, northern Israel, there's been a lot of activity almost every day since October the 7th. But that definitely accelerated, it definitely ratcheted up after the weekend's events with what seemed to be much more intense crossfire between the two sides. Um, there are already nearly 80 villages and towns in southern Lebanon which have had to be evacuated. Uh, tens of thousands of people who've been displaced from that area and lost their homes with in many cases, no homes to return to. Uh, a lot of fear, a lot of trepidation down that side amongst civilians. We saw, we've seen plenty of that over this week. And multiple funerals, sometimes two or three a day since the weekend, mainly of Hezbollah fighters. And certainly over the, the past week since we've been here, the rhetoric from Hezbollah up until now, up until the overnight events, has been very stoic, very determined. We went to one of the funerals of, of their fighters yesterday, it was surrounded by uh, Hezbollah fighters, Hezbollah loyalists, uh, supporters. Uh, the whole town came out, thousands of people, not just many of whom did not know the fighter, but to demonstrate their loyalty and their support for whatever Hezbollah is doing. You've got to remember that 
in Lebanon, Hezbollah is extremely strong. It's embedded in the political, uh, economic and social um, society here in Lebanon. It's got a military wing which is said to be much stronger than the Lebanese army, but works in conjunction with the Lebanese army. And all this week, uh, and certainly this morning, this, they are still underlining that they are strong, they are powerful, and uh, Israel attacks them and Iran at, their, at great cost. But the initial indications, certainly from Hezbollah, with a, a statement from the Deputy Secretary General, Sheikh Naim Qassam, seems very much to be playing it down and un drawing a line under the whole event, saying uh, the Israelis were uh, afraid that they do not have a clear plan, but, and this is the key thing, if they make a mistake in their calculations, we must assume he's talking about future attacks even more, the price will be great. And that's certainly the message that we've been getting from all sections of, of Lebanon society, including the Lebanese authorities, the, the foreign minister telling us very clearly that uh, to escalate even more uh, on the Israeli side would be to drive into a, a, a regional, a big, far more devastating regional war, which would draw in the entire axis of resistance uh, which Iran controls. It has a network of, of proxies, Hezbollah being by far the strongest, but also the Houthis in Yemen, militia in Syria, uh, and, and also Hezbollah trained uh, and Iranian funded groups in Iraq. And the, se the uh, message was very much you threaten all of those. We know though that there have been a lot of um, man manipulations behind the scene, diplomatic talks, political talks, military talks to try and calm things behind the scenes. And those very, those Hezbollah experts have been telling us this morning that it looks as though this very uh, precision strike, what appears to be a targeted low-level strike, might be enough to draw a line under it that no red lines appear to have been crossed, that this could be an acceptable level of response. And if that's the case, there will be a huge sigh of relief, not just in Lebanon, but across the region. Now, will that stop the ongoing tensions? I still don't think so. Um, we may have just put it to one side for now, but underlying all of this is what's happening in Gaza. It's not going to suddenly lead to an end of the crossfire targeting on the border, for instance, down in, in southern Lebanon. It's not going to, it doesn't appear to be likely to stop the Houthis for continuing to attack international shipping in the Gulf of Aden and the Red Sea because underlying all of this they're all saying what what is needs to be done to put an end to it all finally is a ceasefire in gaza and some sort of recognition of a palestinian state alex uh, thank you uh, for all of that analysis and from bringing, bringing us up to date there from lebanon let's go straight to the united states now and speak with our u.s correspondent james matthews and james we're yet to hear uh, an official statement from the president. As you say, it's the, the middle of the night there. We haven't heard from the Israelis either. Certainly the Iranians are trying to downplay this. And U.S. sources are, are saying this is a limited strike. Yeah, limited. That's the word we've had from U.S. officials who are saying very little tonight. And in terms of Biden reaction, Yalda, yes, it is the middle of the night. But... Uh, the Americans saying nothing would be entirely in keeping with uh, the business of playing it down, certainly in the business of putting a distance between the United States and the act itself. The US officials that we're speaking to are saying, yes, it was limited. The one other thing they are saying is that the United States played no part in this Israeli strike. So uh, it's in the American interest to put distance between themselves and the action that has gone on for fear of dragging the United States into any uh, potential Iranian reaction. What did happen was that the Israelis informed America of the strike before it took place. And to that extent, um, I do wonder if there was 
uh, and acceptance, if not encouragement from the Americans, having been told the detail of what was going to happen, and I imagine they would have been, then there would have been a tacit acknowledgement that it was Israel's business, there was a necessity that Israel felt to launch the strike, and the Americans duly turned a blind eye at least. The Americans wanted to be told, they made that clear to Israel, because they were not uh, before the attack on the Iranian consulate in Damascus. That upset the Americans because they uh, didn't have time to put their defences in order around their personnel and assets in that particular region. So, uh, in terms of the housekeeping and the framework for this attack, uh, it was rather more tidy from an American point of view. The trouble from an American point of view is Israel, Netanyahu. What does he do next? Uh, because, once again, he has demonstrated that he will act with autonomy and in Israel's interests as he see it, as he sees it, not according to the wider interests of Joe Biden. That's one challenge for Joe Biden, but clearly the main challenge right now is Iran and what Iran does next. Biden doesn't want to see an escalation. The strength moving forward in that regard for him is that neither does Iran. It's made that clear. It doesn't want escalation or direct conflict, certainly with the United States. And neither does Israel. It can't afford escalation at a time when it has quite enough on its place uh, tackling Hamas. So many questions moving forward. But the, the key question at the heart of it, of course, is what was this strike? What damage did it inflict? Were there civilian casualties? Did it have the kind of impact that would make Iran feel it necessary to launch uh, a strike in return? Yeah, indeed. As you say, uh, James, the ball is now firmly in Iran's uh, court and we're still learning about exactly what happened. Uh, it was around 4 a.m. Uh, in Iran uh, when we heard that there had been some kind of strike that was launched. Iranian state media was very quick to try and downplay and dismiss this as, as nothing. Uh, but uh, as you say, we'll have to wait and see what the uh, Iranians do and say next. Um, you pointed out there that the uh, Americans from the outset have tried to distance themselves uh, from this situation, although they uh, did uh, impose sanctions on Iran yesterday. But even after that April 1 attack on that diplomatic compound, the Iranians made clear through back channels, didn't they, to the Iranians that, look, we didn't have anything to do with the strike that uh, Israel has, has launched. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, indeed. Um, and that, uh, moving forward for the Americans, um, I, I suppose, needs to be reinforced. The Americans will want to reinforce the message, both to Israel and to Iran, that the situation as it stands doesn't merit uh, retaliation. That was a message that Biden made clear to Netanyahu. He said after the Iranian attack, take the win. Uh, and he said, you know, this demonstrates the power of Israel to defend itself against adversaries. That was a message to Israel itself, but also to Israel's adversaries in the region. And uh, yes, there have been sanctions in the past 24 hours. Uh, we've seen that uh, um, economic sanctions implemented by the United States against Iran, uh, targeting steel production in Iran and also drone production, the plan according to US officials being to disrupt and to degrade Iranian uh, drone production. That is the sphere into which Joe Biden wants to take this. Economic sanctions, diplomacy. There was a meeting of the G7 uh, after the Iranian strike at the weekend. There was a meeting of the Security Council. Joe Biden wants to steer this away from military conflict. His difficulty is that other actors, central to the Middle East and central to conflict in the Middle East, keep dragging the United States back towards conflict. 
James, uh, thank you so much uh, for all of that uh, from the United States. Now let's go straight to Alex Rossi, Sky's international correspondent who has more. And um, Alex, uh, as we wait and watch to see what Iran does next, that low-level war between Hezbollah and Israel continues. And no doubt this rivalry between Iran and Israel will continue to be fought in the shadows as it has been for, for, for many, many years. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a war, a conflict which has been going on for many, many years, decades between the Iranians and the Israeli, uh, Israelis. As you say, it's been fought in the, the shadows. Uh, Israel, of course, has carried out airstrikes. The most audacious one that we saw was on the consulate on the 1st of April, killing uh, top uh, Iranian generals. But they've also been hitting weapons, transiting through the Shia Crescent from Tehran to paramilitary groups in uh, proxies, it, like Hezbollah, for instance, uh, in Lebanon. They've also been uh, killing scientists as well, nuclear scientists trying to arrest uh, the Iranian nuclear program. But then, of course, it burst uh, into the open and we saw direct confrontation between the two. Now, the language that the Iranians are using is that the consulate was a red line in which the Israelis had overstepped and that had gone too far and you saw a direct attack, attack from Iranian soil onto the Israelis. And now, of course, we have the response from the Israelis. Now, if it is what we think it is, a, a limited strike, I think it's mainly not about uh, causing destruction and damage. It's an expression of force. That's the language that is being used. The Israelis are saying to the Iranians, and this location is central Iran, thousand miles uh, from uh, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, they are saying we can penetrate your air defences and we can hit anywhere in your country. It's a shot across the bows in that respect. The question, of course, is will the Iranians uh, retaliate directly? It may very well be that we see, as you, as, you, as you noted, that this goes back to this shadow war. Iran will use what it calls the axis of resistance. These are the proxies that it has around the region. The, the biggest, the largest, the most powerful is on the northern border up here, Hezbollah. But there's also the Houthis in Yemen. There are Hezbollah-trained groups in Iraq. There are groups in Syria as well. And it carries on uh, like that. The problem, of course, is that the tensions here remain extraordinarily high. The war against Hamas is continuing. That's a flashpoint. That itself could continue a broader conflict. But what's happening here now on a daily basis is effectively a limited low-level war. Again, this could be the flashpoint leading to a much broader war, even a regional war. Alex, thank you so much uh, for all of that analysis there from northern Israel. Well, as we've been reporting, this is a developing story. We woke up in the early hours of the morning to learn that Israel had launched an attack on Iran. Israel said from the very beginning of this week that it would be responding to Iran's attack on Israel at the weekend. The war cabinet has been meeting virtually every single day, and we've been hearing from them very strong language that they had no choice but to respond. So in many ways... The United States, Britain, Western allies knew on some levels that this uh, was coming. We've been hearing uh, also from uh, American officials and sources saying that they had been informed, they weren't surprised by this attack, something that they would uh, feel comfortable with, the fact that they had knowledge that this was uh, coming from our understanding and from what uh, American officials have continued to say for the last few hours, that this strike was limited. But the information is still coming out and we're still waiting to hear how Iranian officials will respond. We haven't heard anything uh, from the Israeli side as yet. We've just heard from uh, American officials, as you heard there from James Matthews, that this is limited. And perhaps uh, Americans will try and distance themselves from this and not give an actual official uh, response. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see how this story develops. But we are watching all the developments. We'll have all of our correspondents here in Israel and across the region watching. Uh, but uh, Anna, back to you for now in London. Yalda, thanks very much indeed. Uh, well, let's get some reaction from here in the UK. I'm joined now by the Work and Pension Secretary, Mel Stride. A very good morning to good you. Good morning, Anna. Uh, we will talk about some domestic issues in just a moment, but mm. first, of course, I want your reaction to the news of this suspected Israeli mm. strike in Iran overnight. What do you make of it? 
Well, these are unconfirmed reports. It's an emerging story, and I think that's an important point to make. But, look, the government's position is very clear, and that is that we uh, accept that Israel has an absolute right to defend uh, itself, and, indeed, we were uh, working with Israel and other allies to uh, head off that attack last weekend that uh, Iran made uh, upon uh, Israel. At the same time, though, we do think that de-escalation is absolutely key now. And uh, our message to all in the region, including Israel, is that de-escalation is really important. The Foreign Secretary currently is in Italy, uh, speaking with his G7 counterparts, and they will be very much focused on exactly that. Uh, I take it, then, the UK government was not given any prior warning by Israel of an attack, given what you've said? So, I, I wouldn't be privy to that one way or the other, so the answer is, uh, I don't know, but uh, I think it's important just to recognise that this is an emerging story and that these are unconfirmed reports as we're uh, speaking at the moment. OK, and, and you talk about the need for de-escalation. Mm. Uh, President Biden, we understand, told Benjamin Netanyahu to take the win yeah. after Israel succeeded in shooting down the vast majority of the projectiles yeah. that were aimed at its territory by Iran. Uh, the UK, as you you've referenced, has also urged restraint. So would you support Israel if it were to be confirmed by Israel in the action that it's chosen to take? So I, I don't want to get into hypotheticals because, of course, the question you've asked begs many other questions as to what form exactly that uh, um, retaliation may or may indeed may not uh, have taken. But the overarching message is very clear and uh, President Biden's remarks are very much in that vein. We're all very much... Uh, in the same place on this, and that is that de-escalation now is absolutely key, and that's why the Foreign Secretary is meeting with other G7 counterparts at the moment uh, to focus on exactly that. Do you expect further action by Israel, and would you support further action by Israel, or is there a line that you draw for I, your support? I, I, I'm not going to speculate on specific actions that Israel may or may not take. But is there a take, line that you would but, draw? Well, I, what, what, what the message is, uh, Anna, is very clear, and that is that de-escalation is really important. Well, what we need to focus on now, as indeed we are, uh, is getting humanitarian aid into Gaza. Now, we've made uh, some progress there in getting the areas... Uh, 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 border crossing opened, getting Ashdod as a port open to uh, receiving aid, getting the Israelis to uh, agree to that. But we've got to do that. We've got to focus on uh, ceasefires around getting hostages uh, released. So there's a lot of work to do. But the overarching message on the military front is that de-escalation now is really important. Well, yes, and how concerned are you that Iran will now retaliate? How concerned are you about escalation? Well, we, we, we don't want to see escalation. This is a, a, a very... Um, difficult part of the world in that sense with a lot of tensions, a lot of possible scenarios which are, which are not good going forward. Key to avoiding those kind of scenarios, as I say, is across the piece now, de-escalating. It's a message for uh, Iran, it's a message uh, for Israel. De-escalation is really what matters. You talk about a lot of tensions. Just mm. how dangerous a moment do you think this is? Well, th th there is no doubt that since the, the, the Cold War, we live in a more dangerous world. We've got the Ukrainian war, we've got uh, issues around uh, North Korea, we've got the issues in the uh, Middle East. Uh, what our country, with our soft power and our presence in the world, with our allies, I think is very good at, is to doing what we can to diffuse tensions where they are occurring. And so, as I say, in the case of the Middle East and Iran and Israel, uh, we are very firmly engaged in uh, counselling de-escalation and moderation at this particular moment. Well, clearly that is our main story of the day, but yeah. while we've got you here, let's just yeah. turn to domestic matters for a moment, because mm. I know that you want to talk today about what the Prime Minister is announcing, and this is him promising to end our sick-note culture. Yeah. What does that mean, and, and what's yeah. the government going to do about it? So what, what we know, Anna, is that we have a rising instance of mental health-related long-term sickness and people going on to those long-term benefits. We have 2.8 million people on those benefits. In many cases, there is a better outcome than that, and that is that th those people are given treatment, but equally uh, they're held within uh, the workforce or they're introduced to jobs and get work, because we know that people that are in work have better, particularly mental health outcomes, than, the, the, than those that are out of work. So where the fit note reform comes in is at the moment, if you go to the GP and you say you're feeling a little bit depressed uh, and you are signed off, 
in 94% of occasions, a box is ticked that says you're not capable of any work whatsoever. What we want to do is change the system so that that individual will be referred to currently we're setting up something called WorkWell, where they'll get both the healthcare support that they need, but also a work coach will be involved to either help them stay in work if they're in employment or to help get them into work if they're not. Because we think that work matters, and it's a personal mission that I have, is to drive up the levels of employment, particularly amongst those who have those kind of conditions, so that they can benefit, uh, the communities they live in can benefit, the economy can benefit as well. OK, I'm sure this will prompt a lot of, of discussion through mm. the day. We yeah. are very limited on time, however. I can ask you one more question, and I want to raise the issue of Mark Menzies, mm. uh, the Tory MP who has been uh, suspended from the party after claims that he misused party funds. The Labour Party has now written to Lancashire Police asking them to investigate. They say there's a p clear public interest in this matter being thoroughly investigated. Uh, do they not have a point? Are you referring... Well, the matter to the police. Well, well, this matter is being thoroughly uh, investigated. Not by the police, and, though, is it? Or well, that, 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 that remains to be seen. I mean, the fact that the Labour Party have written to the police is maybe a fact, but it doesn't mean the police are investigating. But let, let's see where that goes. But the important point that I'm making is that we are investigating that. So Conservative uh, HQ is looking now very closely into the circumstances around the various reports that have been made, uh, and uh, the whip has been removed from Mark Menzies in the meantime. OK, well, um, yeah. Mel Stride, we appreciate your time this morning. Thank Thanks you. very much indeed for coming in. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And let's now rejoin Yalda, who's in Jerusalem for us this morning. Yalda. Anna, thank you so much. And you just heard there from uh, the minister, the key there is uh, de-escalation. That's something we've been hearing all week from the US President Joe Biden, uh, from uh, Rishi Sunak and from Lord Cameron. Everybody urging de-escalation. You heard there again uh, this uh, attempt to try and just bring the tempo down, de-escalate the situation. We saw last weekend uh, Iran attack Israel. Israel said all week that it would retaliate, it would respond, and now we've seen that response. Let's just remind you of what's happened this morning. Israel, as we've been reporting, has attacked Iran. Iran State News Agency reported that air defences had been fired and explosions were heard near Isfahan International Airport in central Iran. Early indications suggest a single strike on a carefully selected target. Now, this video is from the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Telegram channel. It reportedly shows the explosions in the sky near Isfahan. Well, the impact of the attack is not yet clear, but it does appear to have been limited, and Iranian media is reporting there has been no damage to nuclear facilities. Israel warned the United States that the strike was coming. More on uh, that breaking news story that Israel has attacked Iran. Let's speak now to Deborah Haynes, our security and defense editor. And Deborah, as I've been reporting, uh, we've heard all week uh, from the various leaders that the situation needs to de-escalate. We just heard there from the minister reiterating that despite Israel now launching that attack on Iran. Yes, and you can imagine here in the UK and the capitals across the world will be holding their breath to see what happens next. The, clearly, the, 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 the hope has been that any response by Israel to what happened over the weekend from Iran would be limited and targeted to an extent that Iran, if it chooses to respond, does so in less uh, a significant way as it did at the weekend. And then both sides could perhaps see some kind of ladder that they could climb down to de-escalate the tensions, but obviously, as one source put it to me, it's, it's high-stakes poker, um, this kind of situation, and it could clearly go wrong if either side either reads the sig misreads the signals that they are being sent, feels that the attack that they have just uh, incurred is escalatory and feels that they need to escalate in response, or if there is some kind of mistake when this military action is taking place. Because clearly, whenever a side launches some kind of military uh, attack, then there is the, 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 the chance of things going wrong. And as well, you have obviously allied forces in the region, American, British, other nations, militaries, who I imagine would be on a heightened, well, will have been on a heightened state of alert ever since the weekend. Because of course, it might not be just 
Iran that decides to strike back, but also its proxies in the region too. So there really is a, a sense of, of, of wait and see. And everyone knew that this would be coming, this moment from Israel in terms of its response. And so um, how Iran retaliates, clearly it's trying to make it seem as if everything's normal and it ha didn't have much of an impact, which hopefully is a sign that maybe they won't feel the need for any es escalatory response, but it really is early days at the moment. Uh, and Deborah, we've just uh, had some uh, development uh, that's come through. We're hearing that uh, senior Iranian officials have said that they have no plans for an immediate uh, response. All morning we've heard uh, from Iranian state media downplaying this. Uh, we've heard reports that they have said, and we haven't been able to verify that these were drones, uh, that their air defences struck down. And now we're hearing from uh, uh, Iranian uh, officials saying they have no plans for an immediate response. So. As you've been saying and as we've been reporting all morning, despite the, the nature of this and, and as you say, it feels like high stakes poker, there is an attempt now uh, to, to almost uh, settle the bill, settle the score. Iran uh, attacked Israel at the weekend. Um, Israel has now responded and it's a question of just drawing a line now on this. Yeah, that's very significant because that is that an indication that maybe this um, there's obviously been a huge amount of diplomacy going on behind the scenes as well as what's been said publicly about how Israel should be restrained in its response and clearly working on the Iranian side to ensure that any, any fight back is limited. And you'll remember at the beginning, Israel, Iran said that should Israel hit Iran, it would respond in an even greater way what degree than what happened over the weekend. So it's very significant that Iran perhaps is signalling that it's withstood this limited strike by Israel and is um, not seeking an immediate retaliation. But we are in a new era now because these key red lines have been crossed. Israel did choose to target an Iranian consulate, uh, the one in Damascus, uh, a, a consular building which is um, a protected uh, building, which really was a, a new red line in terms of the actions that Israel is willing to take against Iran, which clearly poses a, a huge threat to Israel. And then Iran has crossed that red line too by striking directly at Israel. And Israel has in turn crossed another red line by striking back at, um, at Iran. And so with those kind of lines crossed, it does mean that should tensions flare again, it could very quickly escalate into direct confrontation in a, to a much greater degree than perhaps it had been in the past. And um, Deborah, we're uh, hearing reports as well that uh, Antony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, uh, is going to hold a briefing at the G7 uh, Foreign Ministers Summit. So we will have a US uh, response as well. As we've been reporting, senior Iranian officials have told uh, Reuters uh, that uh, after the reported strike by Israel that there is no plan for immediate retaliation, uh, no clarification as well on who is behind the incident. That's what the Iranian official has said. They've said that there's no clarification on who is behind this incident, but they say there is no plan for immediate retaliation. Um, so as you say, a significant development there. And uh, we are also uh, being told that the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, is holding a briefing at the G7 uh, Foreign Ministers Summit. So the United States is going to be responding shortly, I believe, in about uh, uh, a few hours time uh, from now. So as soon as that happens, we will be bringing that to you live. Deborah, for now, thanks so much uh, for all of that analysis. Let me bring in uh, Ali Bunkle now. And Ali, a few things have developed uh, while we've been on, on air. Significant. The Iranians are, are, are saying, look, we're not going to respond and, and we don't actually know who it is at this stage. As we've been reporting um, from uh, everything that we've said, uh, Israel, it appears, has launched these, uh, attack, this attack on, on Iran in response to what happened at the weekend. But this is a significant development. Yeah, unless it's Iranian sleight of hand, uh, a double bluff, it does look as though they're not compelled to uh, react immediately as they had threatened uh, yesterday, that, yesterday that they would do. Um, I was saying earlier on, watch for what Iran's going to say. Uh, the Iranian language will be key to what happens next. I still think we are yet to hear from the, the, the key figures, uh, particularly the supreme leader, who incidentally 
is 85 today. It is his birthday. Whether or not that had anything to do with uh, Israel's timing, I don't know. But it is the Ayatollah's birthday today. Let's see what we hear later on, if anything, from um, senior Iranian figures. But my sense is, is that if they try and downplay it uh, and cool the situation, uh, then that is pretty indicative of where we're going to go next. Anthony Blinken, I think, would deliver three key lines when he speaks uh, in Italy uh, in a couple of hours' time. Firstly, he will probably defend Israel's right uh, to protect itself. Secondly, I think he will distance America from any of the attacks because if the Iranians wanted to, they could try and implicate America in these attacks and therefore open up justification to attack American military bases in the region. So I think Blinken will try and say, look, we had nothing to do with this. And thirdly, he will call on all sides to chill. Indeed, uh, because as we've been reporting, I mean, while a number of red lines have been crossed, the feeling will be Israel struck that mil uh, embassy compound uh, on April the 1st. Iran responded last weekend. Israel has now responded. Iran has said, we're not quite sure who it is. We're not going to respond immediately. So there is no doubt behind the scenes diplomats frantically working to really just de-escalate this entire situation. Yeah, and I think Iran has, uh, again, three options. Um, one is to go big and to sort of hit back in a similar manner that they did on, on Saturday night. Uh, I think it, uh, that would not be, um, even in Iran's position, that would just not be the right response to what Israel's just carried out. So I don't think they're going to go down that route. The second is some sort of more limited retaliation, perhaps not even on Israeli territory at all. Um, I still think that is very much a possibility, um, if not immediately, but at some point. And that's, that, that would, that's why I sort of brought the Americans potentially into play, because that's the sort of things the Iranians can do. And then thirdly is the sort of do nothing downplay it to your domestic audience, perhaps try and claim credit for shooting down some drones, phantom drones probably, but try and sort of say, look, you know, we, we kept our skies um, uh, clear of any enemy threat, uh, try and downplay it and everybody moves on. And that could be the territory we're in. Yeah, indeed. Ali, thank you so much. And as we've been saying, uh, senior Iranian officials have told Reuters uh, that after those uh, strikes in the last few hours, uh, which are being reported um, and that we've said uh, Israel has launched, um, Iranian officials have said they have no plans uh, for an immediate retaliation. We're also expecting in the next few hours to hear from the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, who will be uh, holding a briefing at the G7 foreign ministers uh, summit uh, that's in about three hours time so we will have uh, a reaction and response from the uh, united states to the developments of the last few hours let's bring in uh, melanie garson now associate professor of international security and conflict resolution from the university college london thank you very much uh, melanie for joining us here uh, on the program it's been a tense morning uh, we've heard now from Iranian officials and they say they have no plans for immediate retaliation uh, state media in Iran has also tried to downplay this entire thing saying they're just some drones that their air defenses kicked in and, and struck those down um, so there really is an attempt now uh, to downplay this entire thing US officials have also described these strikes as limited um, absolutely um, I think um, it is indeed it's unfolding, but as you say, uh, there is um, this de-escalatory uh, talk coming from Iran. Um, it's not clear with rumors coming out of where this attack was actually launched from. There's a discuss there's rumor that this was actually launched from actually inside Iran, whether these were some sort of um, glide bombs or drones that actually coming from uh, inside Iran, which makes it slightly more difficult. But they not, which is why we're hearing this determination that it might not, you know, that they're not reacting, they don't know who it is, so to speak. So it looks like for the moment that it has that the intention to show deterrent force hitting a military installation, no uh, sort of action that could be escalatory, such as loss of life on uh, a large scale. It was discriminate and proportionate, and it would likely not lead to anything immediate from the Iranian side. Yeah, and Melanie, while there is a, a real attempt to de-escalate this situation, I mean, a number of 
red lines have been crossed in the last few weeks. This really is a, a sort of new phase in this uh, rivalry and, and conflict between Iran and, and Israel. It is a new phase, but it's certainly reflective of the wider hand that Iran is operating across the Middle East as a whole and had to be acted upon. There is no country on earth that would support having 300 missiles being launched at its country in an indiscriminate and disproportionate manner. Um, a response of some sort uh, would have to be required, particularly because of regional dynamics. It's um, the nature of the response, having done that in discussion this week, we've seen there's been widespread discussions with both the US, with the UK, with the EU. That's the difference between working with allies and operating as proxy, Israel had reserved its right to act and did so likely further to those discussions in a proportionate and limited way that could demonstrate their operational capability to try and restore some deterrent effects, certainly to the skies from that distance. Yeah, and Melanie, while, um, you know, the Israeli officials I've been speaking to here say they're still trying to wrap their head around what happened last weekend, that it was a significant shift and milestone, the fact that 300 missiles and drones were launched on, on Israel, um, and the fact that the Allies had to come together to, to deal with it and, and assist Israel. For the Iranians, a line was crossed on April the 1st when that compound, that diplomatic compound, was targeted and a senior commander was killed. Um, well, the discussion on the nature of that compound is still, you know, it's still a subject of dispute. That It's still argued that actually that part of the compound was actually a military installation. There were military conversations going on between the IRGC leadership, between the military wing, between leaders of Hezbollah and other factions that it was actually a military installation that was attacked, it was military figures that were attacked, and it was not the nature of, it wasn't consular officials, and it wasn't the actual uh, consulate itself. So, um, and this was, you know, a meeting of, you know, IRGC military inside Syria as a whole in a different country where these activities on military installations are still taking place. So uh, whilst it's being interpreted as a line cross, it would still be subjective of whether this was a military or civilian target under that kind of protection that consular protections would usually afford. Dr. Melanie Garson, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Thank you. Let's uh, bring in our special correspondent, Alex Crawford. And Alex, uh, just in the last few minutes, we've uh, been reporting that a senior Iranian uh, official has told the Reuters news agency um, that there is no plan for immediate retaliation. You and I have been speaking in the last couple of hours. And uh, really, as you say, there is a desperate attempt behind the scenes to really try and de-escalate this situation uh, as much as possible because there is jeopardy here. There's a huge amount of jeopardy because it not only involves Iran, but certainly all its, its uh, axis of resistance, of which it is the pivotal one, the, the, the maestro behind the scenes and, and in front, the front face of it. And that axis of resistance, the strongest of Iran's proxies is here in Lebanon as Hezbollah, a, a very potent, powerful, immensely strong uh, military group, uh, militia, which has a, a military wing said to be more powerful than the Lebanese army, as well as uh, being embedded in the politics in Lebanon. It is part of the government. Uh, so to take on uh, Iran would mean bringing in all of these, not just Hezbollah, but the Houthis in Yemen, the militia group in Syria, the Hezbollah-linked and Iranian-linked groups in Iran, the whole of the region, according to anyone who knows anything about this region, would be set on fire if there was a, a large-scale attack from Israel. This, from all accounts, does not appear to be that. And it may just be enough to avert an immediate all-out war. Has it gone away, though? I think not. Uh, the, the ingredients are still all there for a flare-up almost at any time. And in southern Lebanon right now, 
many parts of, of Lebanon feel very much that they are already engaged in, in war with regular daily attacks uh, crisscrossing across the border with Israel. They've come under uh, a, a huge amount of, of attacks from Israeli drones, Israeli jets, uh, bombs, artillery uh, along that border with nearly 80 towns and villages having to be evacuated and tens of thousands of people displaced and who've lost their homes who have moved up to other parts of the country in Lebanon. So the ingredients still exist. Uh, they feel that uh, Hezbollah also feels that they are in a position to strike back and will always strike alongside Iran. And the, the basic ground of this, the foundation of all of this discontent and this violence is what's happening in Gaza and their demands for a ceasefire are not likely to stop. In fact, they're likely to increase from now on. Alex, uh, thank you so much uh, for all that, of that update there from Beirut. Well, joining me now is Nigar uh, Murtavi, uh, editor and host of the Iran podcast and senior fellow at the Center for International Policy. Thank you uh, so much uh, for joining us here on the program. As we've been uh, reporting, senior Iranian officials have said that they have no plans uh, for an immediate retaliation. There is an attempt to downplay this, but as our special correspondent Alex Crawford was just saying there, that doesn't take away uh, the, the issues, the underlying issues and concerns that remain that could cause... Uh, this to, to flare up at any other point. That's correct. I agree with your correspondent. First of all, I think it's important to note that Iran and Israel have been engaged in a so-called shadow war for years. This is way before October 7th. But the attack on the Iranian consulate in Syria a few weeks ago by Israel was seen as Iran by crossing a red line in the parameters of that shadow war. And so the Iranian retaliation came from the Iranian side thinking they're going to establish deterrence and reestablish sort of the red lines in this shadow war. In the past few months, what we've seen is the moving of the red lines for both sides. And this is yet again another episode with Israel retaliating, trying to establish the terrorists, trying to reestablish its red lines, but at the same time gambling or sort of risking, again, retaliation or more escalation from the other side. So again, now the ball is in Iran's court. We have to wait and see how the Iranians will actually respond. Uh, but I, I still do see this as an escalation and a dangerous situation for this war to expand even further than it has. Yeah, I mean, Nagar, uh, all morning, Iranian state media has been uh, downplaying this. As I said, we've just heard from an uh, Iranian uh, official who's told Reuters uh, that we have no plans to immediately uh, respond, and they say they have no confirmation exactly where this came from and, and who did it. But the fact remains that I've been speaking to Israeli officials here who say that actually there was a strategic blunder. First, the security failings of October the 7th on Israel's part. And then on April the 1st, perhaps they misjudged or misunderstood um, Iran that Iran would escalate the situation further after that diplomatic compound in Damascus was, was struck. Exactly, Yada. I agree. Again, going back to my point, the red lines have been blurred, have been moving in the past few months. And I think what each side is doing is sort of testing the waters, testing the other side in, in a calculated way, but escalating in a way to see how far they can go, both the Iranian side, their allies and the so-called axis of resistance, and also on the other side, the Israeli side. I think the U.S. has been a little more careful in telling Israel they will not participate in retaliation, in trying to do back-channel talks between Iran, between Israel, getting warnings from the Iranian side when they attack, giving warnings to Iran when the Israelis were trying to attack. So there's a lot of uh, back channel uh, diplomacy and also back and forth happening to try to minimize the damage of these retaliatory attacks. But at the same time, both sides, Iranians and Israelis, are also doing this to save face for a more radical or more hardline constituency in each of their own countries. Yeah, and, and certainly um, the Americans and the Iranians through back channels have made it clear to each other that they are not interested in any kind of confrontation between the United States and Iran over this. So there's been all sorts of, um, uh, you know, diplomatic back channel activity there as well. 
Certainly. I, I believe the U.S., especially the Biden administration, has no interest in an open war and an all war with Iran. They've indi indicated that publicly. They've indicated it privately to the Iranians. Iran also is not interested in an open war with the U.S. for obvious reasons, because there's no way they can win such a war. But any escalation, even limited by both sides, this is now the Israelis and the Iranians, can get out of hand. It's a volatile region. It's a volatile situation. And what we've seen since October 7th has only been escalations, in my view. This war has only expanded, as your correspondent was also saying, now in multiple fronts and multiple theaters in various countries with different actors. And it's just pulling more and more in and with, with more destruction and casualty on the civilians across the region. Okay, Nagar Murtazavi, thank you so much for joining us here on the program. Thanks for having me. You're looking at uh, live pictures of uh, Lord David Cameron, uh, who is at the G7 Foreign Ministers Summit. In about three hours' time, we're also expecting the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, to hold a briefing. Lord Cameron was in Israel uh, earlier this week, really uh, calling on Israel to de-escalate the situation. At one point, he said, it looks like Israel will respond, uh, but if you do do it, use your head and heart when you do it and ensure that this doesn't become a regional crisis and conflict. Let's bring in uh, Ali Bunkel. And Ali, we're looking at those images of Lord Cameron, and, and you were there at that press briefing when Lord Cameron was here early in the week. You spoke to him. He urged uh, de-escalation. De he spoke to uh, the Israelis about ensuring that this doesn't become a, a regional crisis and war. Yeah, and he wasn't the only one. The German foreign minister was here on the same day, and we know very well what President Biden, uh, Secretary of State Blinken, were saying to the Israeli government as well. The same message. It was a coordinated message from all the allies. Their language did shift over the last couple of days from don't do it to a OK, we accept you're going to do something, just let's make sure that that something isn't too big. And it would look, at this stage, as though that message has been received and acted upon. Now, we might never know uh, why Benjamin Netanyahu decided on this course of action rather than anything more severe, or not doing anything at all, for that matter. It could be that he did decide to listen to the US president and others, or it could be that he's decided that Israel has got more than enough on its plate in Gaza, on the northern border with Hezbollah, and they want to send a message to Iran and leave it there. Yeah, exactly that, uh, Ali. Well, we are, of course, watching all of the developments, and you're looking at live pictures of David Cameron in Capri. He's at the G7 Foreign Ministers Summit, and in about um, just under three hours' time, we're expecting to hear from the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, who says he'll be holding a briefing at that G7 Foreign Ministers Summit to respond, uh, we believe, to the developments of the last few hours. We've also heard from senior Iranian officials who have told Reuters that there is no plan for immediate retaliation. We are following all the developments here from Israel, so do stay with us on Sky News.
Good morning from Jerusalem, where people are waking up to the news that Israel has attacked Iran. Iran's state news agency reports that air defences had been fired and explosions were heard near Isfahan International Airport. The impact of the attack is not yet clear, but it does appear to have been limited and Iran says they have no plans for immediate retaliation. The Foreign Secretary David Cameron is at the G7 summit in Italy where we expect to hear more from the US later this morning. And here in the UK, the government is calling for de-escalation. We do think that de-escalation is absolutely key now. And our message to all in the region, including Israel, is that de-escalation is really important. We'll have more reaction from Labour in the next few minutes. Good morning from Jerusalem. We are waking up to the news that Israel has attacked Iran. Early indications suggest a single strike on a carefully selected target. It's a significant moment. Alex Rossi is in northern Israel. Our special correspondent Alex Crawford is in Beirut for us. Iranian state media is reporting that air defences were fired close to Isfahan International Airport in central Iran at around 4 a.m. local time in Iran. They say the drones were intercepted and there were no explosions on the ground. We haven't been able to verify those claims, but Iran says they have no plans for immediate retaliation. Well, this video is from the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Telegram channel. It reportedly shows the explosions in the sky near Isfahan. The UN's nuclear watchdog have confirmed that there is no damage to Iran's nuclear sites. Iran has several nuclear facilities spread across the country. The main ones are the Bonab Atomic Research Center in the north, the Boucher Nuclear Reactor, the Natanz Nuclear Enrichment Plant, and the Isfahan Nuclear Fuel uh, Research and uh, Production Center. This is Iran's largest nuclear research uh, center. Now, let's uh, bring in our Ali Bankul, who's been watching developments all morning. Significant that uh, Isfahan was hit. However, um, state media is downplaying the whole thing. Iranian officials in the last hour or so have said we have no plans to do anything about this. And we've been hearing some um, officials saying, look, it's time to now de-escalate this, which is the messaging we've heard all week. Yeah, so what do we know about the attack? The, in the hours afterwards, there was lots of reports of explosions in Syria and Iraq and elsewhere in Iran. As things stand at the moment, none of that has been substantiated and we've not seen any evidence of further attacks elsewhere. So we'll see whether anything comes out of the coming hours um, to, to explain that. So at the moment, it looks like this sort of single attack on this one location in Isfahan, which is an air base that has connections to Iran's aviation production industry. And I would expect that there is a link between that and perhaps the drones that were flown towards Israel on Saturday night. So Israel is saying we know where some of these drones were manufactured and we're hitting that, uh, that base. I think the proximity of one of the nuclear facilities in Isfahan is also significant in that it's Iran, uh, sorry, Israel saying you know, we can reach it if we want to reach it. We could go there in the future if we were pushed to go there. And the fact that Israel has managed to successfully get these missiles into Iranian airspace and hit the target, again, is Israel taking one up and chip against Iran because Iran pretty much failed to do that on Saturday night when it fired 300 projectiles at Israel. Yeah, I indeed, exactly. I mean, I I'm going to just read you uh, Israeli hard right minister Ben Gavir's um, tweet in one word he wrote feeble now uh, the reason w you know we should put this into context is the kind of pressure from uh, within that that um, benjamin netanyahu has been feeling the netanyahu have been receiving all sorts of advice some of it i'm sure helpful others not ben gavir and his uh tweet there i think speaks to the more extreme end of things 
Yeah, um, Ali, we're just looking at live pictures there of the G7 foreign ministers meeting. We saw Lord Cameron there. We saw US Secretary of State Antony Blinken. Uh, we understand in the next um, couple of hours, Antony Blinken, the US Secretary of State, is going to be holding a briefing. Uh, we understand uh, to respond to the events of the last um, couple of hours and uh, Israel launching that attack <laughs> on Iran in response to what happened here at the weekend. Let's just have a little listen in to see if uh, we can hear anything. Good morning, everybody. I think we need to change our agenda this morning. First of all, it's important to talk the situation in the Middle East in the time after this debate. The idea is to get only one point in the Pacific and the connection of the one debate after the debate on the situation in Iran with the news coming from Italy. Okay, we're just uh, hearing there the Italian Foreign Minister speaking and we will be uh, hearing from the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, uh, who is at that G7 Foreign Minister's meeting. We saw there Lord Cameron as well. Ali, Lord Cameron was here early in the in the week, um, really advising, counselling Israel, calling for restraint, saying, see what happened at the weekend as a success. Rishi Sunak was also on, on message with that, as was um, Joe Biden, who said, take this as a win, see it as a success. The allies came together. I mean, we've both of us have been speaking to Israelis who have said this was the first time that the Americans, the Brits, the, the French fought alongside the Israelis to, to protect Israel as well as some Arab states. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it was extraordinary. And, and, it, and I think that's what was trying to be impressed upon Israel is um, don't take any of this support for granted. It happened in a it happened in a rather informal and, to be honest, quite organic way. That on now Israel had planned with um, the UK, the US, and France how it would respond to an Iranian attack. That is why the British forward positioned more fighter jets in Cyprus. The head of the US CENTCOM was here, for example. But the fact that then, almost sort of spontaneously, there was this support from some of the Arab countries, like Jordan across the border, uh, there was support from the uh, Gulf states, Saudi Arabia too. The message from Israel's Western allies is, you know, there is something here that you can build upon, that don't take any action against Iran that is going to jeopardise, you know, this, this, this new fledgling relationship, this, this military relationship that you might be able to have. We're not talking about something being a sort of a Middle Eastern version of NATO, but, you know, Israel does want to try and create a sort of a missile defence system, which would be a sea cooperation between them, Gulf allies, against Iran. And we saw that play out. And so I think that, again, would have fed into Benjamin Netanyahu's thinking. I was saying that, you know, Ben Gavir's tweet, feeble. Ben Gavir would have been on the extreme end of of it, saying, hit Iran hard. We've then had Biden, Cameron, Sunak, etc., on the other end saying, you know, chill. And I think Netanyahu sort of found some middle ground that I suspect the Americans and the Brits will be satisfied with as long as it doesn't go any further. I think most of the Middle East will frankly live with it. Uh, and if, if the prospect of war goes away, they'll be happy. And you know what? But um, Netanyahu will be thinking, Ben Gavir can lump it. Well, Ali, uh, we will, of course, be watching all of the developments. And if there is some kind of official response uh, from the Israelis, thank you for now. Now, as we've been reporting, what happened overnight is really framed by two recent events. Let's just talk those through with you. On April the 1st, Israel struck the Iranian consulate in Syria. Seven of its military advisers, including three senior commanders, were killed. And then, of course, what we saw last Saturday night. Iran fired 170 drones, over 30 cruise missiles and 120 ballistic missiles at Israel. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had vowed to respond. Let's bring in our special correspondent, Alex Crawford. 
And Alex, I know that I've said that what's happened in the last few hours, what happened last weekend, was really framed by what happened on April the 1st. But, but frankly, you could take this all the way back six months to October the 7th, and then, of course, the war in Gaza, and, and uh, you know, Iran's proxies operating in the region, and that low-level war we've also seen uh, between Hezbollah and, and Israel. And, of course, uh, Yalda, the, the strongest of Iran's proxies by far is Hezbollah. It is extremely potent military force. It's got... Uh, around about, they say, 100 to 150,000 fighters, maybe more. It's spent uh, nearly a decade building up its weaponry, um, and it certainly feels extremely confident that it could take on or deflect any large-scale uh, attempt to attack them. But there have been daily skirmishes, daily cross-firing between Israel and uh, Lebanon on that southern border of Lebanon, and that has increased. It's increased in intensity, it's increased in depth into, the, into the, the region, into Lebanon. It's also, as we saw just a few days ago when I was talking to you from the same spot, that four Israeli soldiers actually made their way into uh, Lebanon and were blown up by an Hezbollah-planted exploded device with, with a number of them injured. That was the first admission by both sides that the IDF, the Israeli military, were inside Lebanon and apparently on military maneuvers. So there has been a gradual escalation. And since Saturday, since the Iranian drone and missile attack, the uh, activity on the southern border of Lebanon has increased uh, to quite an extent with... Uh, almost uh, twice daily funerals indicating the number of casualties amongst the Hezbollah fighters uh, and the, the cross firing has just increased and increased. Now the indications tonight, overnight, are that Hezbollah appears to be, if they're a reflection of what the Iranian administration's uh, approach is, they appear to be drawing a line under this with the first statement from Hezbollah this morning saying, denouncing it and dismissing it almost, use, using it as almost a, dis, with disdain. The Israelis, they say, are afraid. They do not have a clear plan, but they go on to warn if they make a mistake in their calculations, if they go further, if they hit harder, the price will be great. That's from the Deputy Secretary General of Hezbollah here in Lebanon. So if we take that as an indication and talking to a number of Hezbollah analysts, uh, Hezbollah politicians, uh, all the uh, replies, all the messages from them seem to be that maybe just this time the red line has not been crossed. Will that be over? I think it's really unlikely it will be over. And to underestimate the potential for another massive flare out and the spread throughout the region. We were in Yemen just a couple of weeks ago with the Houthis absolutely denouncing what was going on and saying they were going to hit harder and faster and they wanted to see not just a ceasefire, but a, a, a Palestinian state. That's again been re-echoed here in uh, Lebanon, in Iraq, uh, a few weeks ago, earlier on. We had the Iraqi president saying there needed to be a ceasefire, there needs to be some sort of solution to all of this to stop the ongoing escalation. So even if there is an avoidance of a massive flare-out and all-out war right now, the ingredients and the foundations for that sparking up again, very quickly, still exist, with Hezbollah presenting one of the strongest advocates of Iran and the most potent military force. Who, they, they believe that they are the third, at the moment, slightly forgotten front, uh, and underlying all of this as a determination to defend not just Palestine, but also inextricably always aligned and loyalty first to Iran. OK, Alex, uh, thank you, as always, for all of your analysis there. Let's bring in my colleague Alex Rossi, Sky's international correspondent who joins us uh, live from northern Israel. And, Alex, in the last few hours, um, Iranian uh, officials have told the Reuters news agency that they have no plans to immediately respond uh, to this attack. But as Alex Crawford was saying there in Beirut, that doesn't change the dynamics, the tensions that already exist, the low-level war uh, with Hezbollah. I mean, Israel is dealing with a number of fronts here. 
Yeah, that's right. There are crises on multiple fronts. The fact that the Iranians are saying that they won't uh, retaliate to this does suggest that in terms of the direct con confrontation uh, between Israel and Iran, there may be a chance to de-escalate. Remember, the uh, attack on Saturday by the Iranians was the first time that Iran has fired directly at Israel. But all of the other pieces around the region uh, remain, and that means that things remain extraordinarily tense. I was speaking to um, uh, a former IDF commander yesterday who was saying that you know, he, he, he could not remember a situation in the Middle East like this for decades. In fact, you have to go back four decades, probably to the Yom Kippur War of 1973, to find a similarly uh, dangerous position. Now, what the Israelis have done with this strike, and remember, it's not, it's not just brute military force. Military power has its own language. And in this, uh, on this point, the strike in central Iran is basically symbolic. It's sending a message that the Israelis can penetrate Iranian air defences. They can get through. They can do so at their choosing. They chose, it seems, if this is a limited strike, not to go out for all-out destruction, but it sends a very, very clear signal. In the same way that the Iranians sent a very clear signal on Saturday, the war that had been fought between Israel and Iran previously is referred here as a shadow war. It's hidden. It's um, fought through proxies. It's fought without um, admitting that you were behind it, whether it's an Israeli uh, assassination of a nuclear scientist or whether it was the attack on the consulate. The Israelis haven't admitted that they were behind that. It happened on April the 1st. But what the Iranians were doing with the counter-attack on Saturday is sending a message that you can't do this anymore. We're with, we are redrawing the red lines. And the problem is, is that those red lines aren't really set out at the moment. October the 7th changed the dynamic of many of the red lines, whether it's proxies, whether it's the direct confrontation between Iran and Israel. And as they are being redrawn, the possibility of miscalculation or accident becomes that much bigger. And the problem is that that could lead to a broader regional war. That is why the, 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 the time that we are in at the moment is so very dangerous. Alex, thank you, uh, as always, and uh, for now, we will be going back to you a little later in the program. And as we've been saying, we're expecting the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, to hold a briefing at the G7 foreign ministers meeting. So we will be following that closely as well. For now, back to you in London, Anna. Yalda, thanks very much indeed. Well, uh Staying with Israel's attack on Iran, the Work and Pension Secretary Mel Stride told this programme this morning that both sides need to step away from any further attacks. We do think that de-escalation is absolutely key now. And our message to all in the region, including Israel, is that de-escalation is really important. The Foreign Secretary currently is in Italy, uh, speaking with his G7 counterparts. And they will be very much focused on exactly that. Well, we're going to get reaction from Labour in just a moment. But first, uh, Gurpreet is here uh, with me. And Gurpreet, the government there, very keen to push for de-escalation this morning. Yeah, de-escalation is the word that you're going to hear repeatedly. Mel Stride saying just there that de-escalation is really important, but also trying to kind of toe this line um, by kind of still showing broad support for Israel, not um, urging them one way or another too stridently. Um, David Cameron, Foreign Secretary, he's at the G7. Uh, also, Anthony Blinken, as you heard just there, who we're expecting to hear from shortly. The Prime Minister, uh, he's giving a speech at 9.30 in the morning. That's going to be on welfare. We've had an announcement um, from the government about a set of welfare reforms that they're planning, but he may be asked on this issue uh, of what's going on in uh, Iran and Israel. So we can expect to hear more from him, but very much, as I said, from the government, the language is all about de-escalation. It's something that we've heard kind of in recent days, um, starting at the weekend. Uh, Israel has come under pressure from, from the UK, but also the US and other European countries uh, to kind of show restraint. We heard the Americans saying that they should take the win, but. David Cameron, he was in Israel uh, speaking to Netanyahu on Wednesday. After that meeting, Netanyahu said uh, that Israel will take its own uh, decisions by itself. So questions about kind of how much influence Britain really has uh, when it comes to putting any pressure on Israel whatsoever. OK, Gurpreet Nawan, our political correspondent, thanks very much indeed for that analysis. So...
Let's uh, get Labour's view then on this morning's developments. As you can see, I'm now joined by the Shadow Housing Minister, Matthew Pennycook. Uh, good to see you. Thanks Morning. very much indeed for coming in. Uh, what is your reaction to the news of this apparent Israeli strike on Iran overnight? I think it's a really concerning moment for peace and security in the Middle East. This is obviously a breaking story. My understanding is the precise details of the strike that's taken place haven't been confirmed by the US, Iran or Israel. But Labour would urge all sides to show restraint and to de-escalate the situation because the real risk of a full-scale war in the region is there and all sides need to step back. Following on from Iran's attack on Israel last week, though, does Labour support Israel's right to take retaliatory action in Iran? Well, we're asking Israel to show restraint in doing so. Um, the repelling of the very significant drone and missile strike was successful. We want them to show restraint to de-escalate the situation because, as I said, the risk of a full-scale conflagration in the region is very real and the consequences will be dire. So is there a limit to Labour's support for Israel? I don't think there's a limit to its, our support in terms of their right to respond, but what we are urging, along with all of our international partners, is restraint on Israel's part because we don't want to see further escalation and the risk of a full-scale regional war, which the consequences of which would be absolutely devastating uh, to the region. So we're asking, as I said, all sides to pull back. How concerned are you about escalation? Do you expect Iran to retaliate? I think that we can't speculate on how Iran might retaliate. What the precise nature of these strikes is, as I said, uh, on the basis of my understanding, is unconfirmed. But I think it is a very worrying moment for the Middle East and the risk of escalation into a wider regional war is very real. That is why it is so important, I say, that both Israel and Iran pull back and de-escalate and show restraint. OK, uh, this is a story that obviously we'll be covering um, all morning here on Sky News. But while I've got you here, I do want to talk about a couple of domestic issues as well, because uh, the Prime Minister is going to make a big speech later on today. He's vowing to clamp down on what he calls uh, Britain's sick note culture. Uh, he's warning against over medicalising the everyday challenges and worries of life. Uh, does he have a point? Do, do you support an end to sick note culture in this country? Well, I think this announcement screams to me a government that, after 14 years, are out of ideas and out of time. This proposal, as I understand it, is a consultation on tweets to the Fitnote system. It's actually a proposal that was first mooted by the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, back when he was Health Secretary in 2017. And in the years since, we have seen the number of people uh, transition onto long-term sick at great cost to themselves, to businesses, to the economy, and to the taxpayer in terms of the spiralling benefit bill skyrocket. So economic activity is at its highest rate for decades. We're still the only G7 country that hasn't returned to economic activity rates pre-pandemic. This is costing the country. Something's got to be done. I don't think tinkering with a call for evidence on the fitnote system is anywhere near the scale of the challenge. So Labour have a solution to tackle the fundamental causes of this crisis, which are staggeringly long NHS waiting lists, a social security system that needs reform, making work pay, supporting people into good long-term jobs. Well, yes, and, and you have vowed to uh, bring the sickness benefits bill down yourself, haven't you? You've said there'd be no option of a life on benefits under Labour, but just saying you're going to get waiting lists down sounds pretty vague. Some would say you need a more targeted approach. Well, I think waiting lists, as I've just said, is only one part of our plan to tackle economic activity. We've got to bring those waiting lists down. We've got to do more on mental health support. We've also got to reform social security. We've got to make job centres work, provide people with real support, make work pay. This is a long-term problem. This is entirely of the Tories' making. It's a crisis that has developed over many years, and it needs a plan, as we have, that tackles the fundamental causes, that doesn't just tweak uh, with elements of the system, like the Fitnote system, which can provide uh, people with more support. And if I was the government, I'd be saying, how can the Fitnote system fully support people back into work? Where is the investment in the health Okay. Uh, and work professionals that need to provide but people what, with that support. what's the fundamental problem that's going on here? Because the number of fit notes has doubled in less than a decade to 11 million a year. It's a huge rise. Why is that happening? Because there has been a long-term rise for many, many years under this government in people who are on long-term sick, either because they can't get the treatment they need 
through the NHS, which is on its knees after 14 years of Conservative government, or they're not getting the proper support to get back into did, work. Did so, GPs sign people off too easily, do you think? No, I think, I think that the sort of these simplistic sweeping statements aren't just, are just not helpful. We need to look at the root causes of the problem, why we have such staggeringly high economic activity rates under this Conservative government, and look to tackle the fundamentals. This, to me, as I said, is a policy paper that's dusted off from 2017 to get a cheap headline, it won't tackle the fundamental causes of the problem as it's developed. OK, I also want to ask you about one other issue, which is um, Mark Menzies, the Tory MP, who's now been suspended from the party after claims which he denies uh, that he misused party funds. Um, I understand that Labour has now written to Lancashire Police. Can you tell us uh, what you've uh, asked them to do? We've asked them to investigate these allegations, and I think it's entirely right that we've done so. Um, the reports that came out about this case are incredibly disturbing and there are a series of questions about whether an offence has been committed in relation to fraud by false representation or misconduct in public office. They're quite serious allegations. It's right that the police investigate. I think there are also questions about what the Conservative Party knew and when, why they've sat on this information for months. Do they have any information that the police could benefit from? If they do, they obviously need to hand it over. It's in the public interest that we get to the bottom of these allegations and the police investigate. OK, well, as we say, um, Mark Menzies denies uh, all the claims against him. Matthew Pennicott, we appreciate your time this morning. Thanks very much yes. indeed. And uh, let's take you back now to Jerusalem and Yalda. Anna, thank you so much. And welcome back to Jerusalem, where we're covering that developing story. We woke up in the early hours of the morning uh, to learn that uh, Israel had attacked Iran. Now, all week, Israeli officials have been saying that they would have to respond to Iran's attack on Israel last weekend, that they had no choice but to launch some kind of attack and retaliate in some way. We saw uh, international leaders, the US president, Rishi Sunak, David Cameron, all urge restraint. And uh, they spoke to uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Uh, they told him to de-escalate the situation to see last weekend uh, as a win for uh, Israel. But nonetheless, we've seen Israel uh, respond. In the last hour or so, we heard from Iranian officials who have told Reuters news agency that they have no plans to respond. Let's bring in Deborah Haynes now, our security and defense editor. And Deborah, a lot of developments in the last uh, few hours. We're also earlier looking at live pictures of Lord Cameron and the US Secretary of State Antony Blinken at that G7 foreign ministers meeting. There really now is an attempt to de-escalate the situation. Uh, the international leaders are saying Iran attacked Israel last weekend. Israel has now responded that some kind of line now needs to be drawn to bring an end to this. Not sure if that will happen, but for now there is an attempt to, to bring down the tempo. Yes, and you, you really got that sense speaking to officials uh, behind the scenes over the last week, as I'm sure you've been doing and I've been doing, um, and obviously the public comments that people like David Cameron uh, have been saying about the need for, um, for, for being strong and tough, but also smart uh, with Israel's response. Everybody really appreciated that Israel wouldn't be able to do nothing in response to Iran's unprecedented attack on Israel over the weekend, especially the use of ballistic missiles um, in that direct strike against Israel. Uh, and even though most of those munitions were shot out the sky by a coalition of not just the usual allies like um, the US, the UK and France helping Israel's military, but also Arab nations as well in this coalition that Israel will be wanting to keep together as it tackles the increasing threat from Iran. It's been a, a, a war that's been taking place in the shadows for so many years with Iran's proxies, uh, with deniable attacks, Israel as well launching deniable attacks on Iran. But those red lines have really been crossed in the last week with Iran choosing to directly attack Israel, openly, overtly, admitting that that's what it's done. And now uh, Israel doing the same back, though, like you're saying, clearly the focus is on containment, on trying to take the heat out of this, and the hope that the scale, the limited scale as it seems, and, you know, we still are waiting for full details of exactly what has taken place in the last few hours. But if it, if it is as limited as it seems, then the hope will be that Iran won't feel the need, as it said 
through that Reuters report to retaliate, it said retaliate immediately, but maybe even um, it could be something that could be slowed down completely. But in this region, as you well know, uh, nothing can be taken for granted and it's still a very high stakes situation. Yeah, I think you described it earlier as high stakes uh, poker and, and no doubt, Deborah, um, that even though this uh, particular situation, there's an attempt to de-escalate, this rivalry between Iran and, and Israel will go back to the shadows. It will inevitably go back to exactly where it was uh, before the events of last weekend. Absolutely, that's correct. But I do think as well that now you've had this new precedent that's been set. Uh, Israel started it really with that attack that it carried out. It's, it's not admitted it publicly against the, uh, the Iranian consulate in Damascus uh, at the beginning of the month, which killed that, those senior um, IRGC generals and other Iranian officials. And that was something that Iran uh, vowed to retaliate uh, for. And so the region was put on notice at that point when that red line of, of, of targeting a consular building was crossed. And then you had Iran crossing that red line too of directly and overtly attacking Israel. And now it seems Israel has chosen to overtly, although we're yet to hear the details, strike back. So the fact that you've had those lines crossed, you can't rewind the clock now. So yes, while uh, of course the shadow war will continue, the potential for escalation into direct confrontation is much, much greater following the events of the last few weeks. Yeah, as you say, Deborah, it's a significant and still a, a, a dangerous moment. Thanks so much. Now let's just remind you of what's happened this morning. Israel has attacked Iran. Iran State News Agency reported that air defences had been fired around 4 a.m. local time and explosions were heard near Isfahan International Airport in central Iran. Early indications suggest that a single strike on a carefully selected target. The impact of the attack is not yet clear. Iranian media is reporting they intercepted three drones and they have no plans for immediate retaliation. Well, foreign ministers, including the UK's David Cameron, are meeting at the G7 summit in Capri. The UK is urging both Iran and Israel to de-escalate. And uh, you're looking at images that came in earlier uh, where Lord Cameron is at that G7 summit. And we are expecting um, the US Secretary of State, uh, uh, Antony Blinken, to also give a briefing uh, in a couple of hours' time. Now, uh, I'm going to bring in uh, Ali Bunkle. Ali, a lot of developments. Uh, we woke up to this news. Um, there was concern about how much this was going to escalate. Iranian state media started to play it down. Iranian officials have said they're not going to do anything about it. We haven't yet heard from the Israeli side. Unlikely that we will. No, we haven't heard from the Israeli side, you're right, apart from Itamar ben Gavir describing Israel's attack as feeble. Um, Itamar ben Gavir is the national security minister. So in any other um, government structure, the, the person who's effectively the interior minister um, would be listened to. And so I, I think we can pretty much you know, take that as confirmation from at least one member of the Israeli government that it was Israel behind these strikes, something that the Americans have backed up. But yes, the Israelis tend to have a policy of no comment when it comes to speaking about any strikes they've carried out or um, any action they've carried out inside Iran or in Syria. And it might be that they keep up that, that denial or that no comment. The messaging coming out from Iran at the moment, and what we were moving towards mid-morning, um, the messaging coming out so far is to be rather dismissive of this attack, to suggest that it did no real damage, that it posed no real threat to Iran. And I think what that's all leading to at the moment is an indication that Iran is not inclined to respond. You have to remember that a lot, or most of the media inside Iran, uh, is state controlled uh, and so these messages don't get sort of delivered willy-nilly um, they do tend to conform to a line and whilst we haven't heard from Ibrahim Raisi for example the Iranian president we haven't heard from the supreme leader yet uh, or even the Iranian foreign minister who I think is probably still in New York 
Um, let's see what they say, if they say anything at all. But as I say, the, the language so far has, has, has led us to sort of think that this is probably not going to escalate. And that is a message that I guess Israel, through this strike, wanted to make. Um, we can do it if we want. Uh, we can do damage if we want. They sent a very clear message and perhaps also saying, we're not going to escalate this, but we can do damage if we want to. Iran fired 300 plus drones and missiles at Israel on Saturday night. I mean, that's, that's a barrage, right? And, and most of them got intercepted before they even hit Israeli airspace. Uh, the Israelis estimate that 99% of them were shot down. Um, the ones that did get through caused pretty minimal damage, in fairness, to, to an Israeli airbase. And now Israel has fired back, and all indications are that what they did fire hit its targets and we don't yet know the extent of the damage. So that is very much one upmanship for the Israelis. You try to hit us, and it was pretty much a failure. We tried to hit you, and it was an unqualified success. So, yeah, that is a message. Where they hit is a message. Deep inside Iran, close to a nuclear facility, and it is like, we can do this. If we need to do this at any point, if we need to attack your nuclear facilities, if we need to attack central Iran, uh, Tehran, we have the capabilities of doing it, and not just we have the capabilities, you don't seem to have the capability of stopping it. Indeed. Ali, thank you, as always. Uh, well, let's bring in our next guest from the Centre for Security Policies, a senior editor for Middle Eastern Affairs, Caroline Glick, who joins me now. Uh, Caroline, thank you very much uh, for joining us on the programme. We were discussing there the messaging that has been sent from both sides. Frankly, we've been hearing that red lines have been crossed, but Israel sent a significant message uh, to Iran, and in many ways Iran has now tried to de-escalate the situation. I think that what you're seeing with the very conflicting statements that are coming out of Iran is that the Iranians are very scared. And I think that that uh, is, a, is a good thing. Um, I think that uh, on the one hand, they say nothing. On the other hand, they say it was the Mossad. And then on the third hand, they say that they don't know who did it. Um, no damage was caused. Um, we'll just have to wait and see for the after action reports to understand precisely what the targets were and, uh, and how badly they were damaged. But uh, Israel sent a number of messages to a number of different uh, addresses uh, last night or, or in the early morning hours uh, by uh, conducting this operation in Iran. Um, it uh, sent a message to the Israeli people that are jittery because we're facing a major battle uh, both in Lebanon and in Gaza in the uh, days and weeks and months ahead. Uh, we're, in a, we're in the largest war <clears throat> since our War of Independence in 1948-49 right now, and uh, the longest war Israel has fought. Uh, and uh, we don't know when it's going to be over. So in terms of stealing the people, it's very um, important for both our Air Force and for our ground forces and for the population here to understand that we are capable of operating in Iran um, and Iraq and Syria, apparently, where our targets were also hit. Uh, at the same time. So that was important. It was important to show the United States that we're capable of uh, carrying out operations uh, in Iran without uh, without causing a, a massive conflagration that uh, can suck in other other powers into the uh, into the war. That was very Caroline, important. Uh, it was important to show the Iranian people that uh, that the regime that they hate so much isn't immune uh, from attack from outside forces. I mean, the point is, though, as well, Caroline, that the Iranians are pragmatists. They aren't suicidal. They know and understand that if they go into a war with Israel, it will drag in potentially Western powers, namely the United States, which is the US is trying to avoid here as well. And they don't have the capacity to, to take that on. Well, you know, they always say that the Iranians will fight to the last Palestinian, to the last Lebanese, to the last Syrian, that they, uh, what what is most important to them is to make other people fight their wars for them. And um, so the Iranian people, meanwhile, back home in Iran are suffering. You have 90% of them who want to oust the regime from power that's been torturing them for the past 45 years. So I think, you know, all of these things are destabilizing for this hated uh, chaos, uh, chaos uh, initiating regime that's behind uh, just about all of the wars that we've seen in the Middle East uh, over the past 45 years. So I think that that was a very important thing that happened last night, regardless of what was attacked. 
even and we don't really know exactly yeah what it's even though things yeah, we don't know. We're still waiting to get that information. And we've talked about the kind of message that Israel is trying to send uh, to Iran. And there is now an attempt to de-escalate. But it will go back to, even though this has now entered a different sort of phase, red lines have crossed, the shadow wars will also continue between the two. Um, uh, look, yes, this is a multidimensional war. And the change that we saw last Saturday night was that the puppet master came for the first time out from behind the curtain and attacked Israel directly with a massive barrage of uh, missiles and drones, as your last guest said, uh, that was unsuccessful. But on the other hand, uh, it was carried out. And that's a very new thing. And Iran is now uh, operating openly with Hamas, with Hezbollah, with the Houthis in this war that it initiated against Israel on October 7th. Um, Caroline, the Iranians are indicating that this is in response to what happened on April the 1st, uh, where they say a diplomatic compound was hit and that um, one of their senior military commanders was killed as a result. And therefore, we saw that reaction uh, at the weekend. Do you think the Israelis anticipated that kind of reaction where we saw 300 drones and missiles, um, you know, coming uh, in Israel's direction? I think the scale of the Iranian response indicates that it wasn't a reaction to anything, that this was something that was long planned because it wasn't a tit for tat. Israel's engaged in a war against Iran. Iran has been directing everything. And Mohammad Reza Zahedi, the Iranian uh, terror chief who was killed in Damascus and not in a diplomatic delegation, but rather in a building that was a military target connected to the Revolutionary Guard Corps. Um, he was, uh, not only is he, uh, 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 seen as the architect of the October 7th invasion of Israel and the atrocities that Hamas carried out that day. Uh, he's also in charge of Iran's terror operations in Syria and Lebanon. So he was a military target, not only uh, substantively because of his, oper his uh, role in October 7th, but also because he was actively engaging in war with Israel. So I think that the idea that this was a tit for tat ignores the fact that we're in a major war already. You don't have a tit for tat uh, in a major war. I mean, this is just you're constantly being attacked and you're constantly attacking across a number of battlefields that are all controlled by Iran through its proxies and now also directly. So so what we're looking at, it was, you know, to say it was a tit for tat ignores the fact that we're already in a war. Caroline Glick um, from the Center for Security Policies and a senior editor for Middle Eastern Affairs. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's uh, speak now to my colleague, uh, Trevor Phillips. And, and Trevor, you know, we can see the kind of diplomacy taking place behind the scenes. Uh, we know that Lord Cameron is at the G7 foreign ministers uh, meeting. We know that um, uh, Rishi Sunak has a scheduled uh, speech, so he will um, no doubt uh, address what's happened uh, in the early hours as well. But there is a real attempt now, isn't there, Trevor, to, to de-escalate this situation, to ensure that it doesn't um, spill over and, and turn out, uh, turn into all-out confrontation and a war. Good morning, Elder. Yeah, you're standing right in the middle of possibly the biggest and the most dangerous chess game in the world right now. We are going to hear from Cameron and also from Rishi Sunak uh, this morning, and I think also from the uh, American Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. And I guess what they're all trying to do is to create uh, an environment in which it is possible for everybody to save face, but to turn down the temperature. The word, uh, as, you, as you've been saying, is uh, de-escalation. Um, but we know that there is a conversation going on here. Um, the Iranians this morning are downplaying the impact of the Israeli strike. They're basically saying, yeah, right, didn't really uh, hit us at all. Uh, and that's presumably the uh, sound of a country trying desperately not to have to retaliate. Um, we know uh, uh, that the uh, Americans knew uh, that there was going to be uh, a strike. We also know that they knew about the Iranian retaliation. So. Actually, what is going on here is a lot of, a lot of noise publicly, but there are clearly a lot of back channels being used here to try to make sure that nobody uh, overreacts. And 
We can now look back, I guess, on the Israeli action last weekend uh, and see that it was very carefully calibrated to try to make sure that the Iranians didn't have uh, an, a reason to, uh, as it were, I, I won't say go ballistic, because that's, you know, that would be tasteless, but to overreact. Um, and I think what, what we're seeing here is obviously geopolitics. But I think, interestingly, uh, Yal, there's something very significant uh, that we sometimes forget, is that there's domestic politics involved here. In Israel, of course, it has been talked about, uh, Mr Netanyahu is doing what he's doing partly because of the weakness of his... Uh, because of his political uh, uh, weakness. Um, it is also worth saying that Iran, it is an authoritarian regime, but it is an authoritarian regime with a very young population which increasingly is restless. Uh, restless about the, uh, the uh, overwhelming significance of uh, the Ayatollahs uh, and their rule. Uh, restless about its isolation from the world, restless about the constant danger of conscription if you're a young Iranian man. So the Iranian regime has to deal not just with, you know, the, its, its strategy of keep creating chaos in the region, but keeping its own people on side. And of course, for us, uh, we have Ukraine already, we have our own domestic problems, as do the Americans, and everybody wants this to wind down. Uh, indeed, or Trevor, uh, the Israeli hard right minister Ben Gavir um, said in a tweet uh, this morning that what we're seeing in the last few hours was feeble. So it just gives you a sense of how um, split and divided um, Israel is on on the reaction and, and what to do. But in the last few uh, in the last few minutes, in fact, we've heard from uh, the European uh, uh, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, who's very much reiterating what we've heard from uh, global leaders. She says it is absolutely it's an absolute necessity that the region stays stable and all sides refrain from further action. So. There is so much diplomacy, as you say, behind the scenes, trying to bring down the tempo, trying to de-escalate this situation. We're also expecting uh, to hear from the US Secretary of State, uh, who's at that G7 foreign ministers uh, summit in Italy, uh, where we uh, are expecting a briefing. And as you say, Lord Cameron, Rishi Sunak, uh, we'll probably hear from them uh, as well. Um, France has responded and also said uh, that there, needs, there is a need uh, to de-escalate. So we are watching all of these developments as the global community tries to uh, really uh, urge both sides to refrain from any further action. And as we've been reporting, uh, Iranian officials have said uh, to the Reuters news agency that they have no plans to respond at this point. And they say they don't have confirmation of exactly who this is. The Israelis, um, up until now, uh, have uh, not commented and are probably unlikely uh, to comment. But they did say throughout the week, their war cabinet, that we will uh, respond in some way. We have no choice but to respond. And they have done that at about 4 a.m. Iran time. Let's bring in our business presenter, Ian King, um, who can give us a sense of how the markets are reacting to what's happened this morning. Ian. Good morning, Aldi. Yes, uh, most of the action, as you'd expect to see, has been in uh, Brent crude. Now, bear in mind, Brent crude has been drifting lower for most of this week because we got some blowout US retail sales figures earlier in the week, and that has really uh, put the mockers on the notion that the Federal Reserve will be cutting interest rates in the US anytime soon. And wide, more widespread concerns about inflation have really been bearing on the Brent uh, price. So Brent crude, just right now, it's trading at just about $88 a barrel. It's up 1% or so. It did pop above $90.75 a barrel. Well, to put that in context, as I say, the crude price has been drifting lower this week. That really takes you back to where it was on uh, Tuesday of this week. Uh, natural gas uh, currently up around half of 1% just now. The equity markets have uh, not reacted too well to this. Uh, when uh, news of, uh, of what happened uh, uh, broke, uh, the Asia-Pacific markets uh, was, was still open. Equities uh, traded to the downside there. Uh, the main market in Sydney fell by 1%. Uh, Shanghai 
Shanghai was off by a third of 1%, Hong Kong by nearly 1%, and the big faller was actually the Nikkei in Tokyo, which came off by 2.5%. Uh, and that was partly because you got an uptick in the Japanese yen, which uh, makes uh, the uh, Nikkei slightly less attractive to overseas investors on such occasions. Uh, those are the uh, pictures uh, on the, uh, you can see on the screen right now. Those are the uh, uh, Asia Pacific markets uh, uh, moving, uh, as I've just been describing. Here in Europe, well, again, markets have traded to the downside. The uh, CAC 40 in France is off. Uh, do thirds of one percent. The DAX in Germany off by one percent. The MIB in Milan by one point one percent, and uh, the FTSE 100 just now is off by around two thirds of one percent. You've seen a bit of movement into gold. You always get a bit of safe haven buying on such occasions. And the other uh, safe haven that's attracted a bit of money this morning is the Swiss franc. That's uh, currently trading higher on the foreign exchange markets as well. Ian, uh, thank you so much uh, for giving us a sense of how the markets are reacting this morning. Well, uh, let's bring in my next guest, Dr. Mir Javandafar, who's an Iranian-Israeli lecturer at Reichman University in Tel Aviv. Thank you, sir, for joining us here on the program. I just want to get your reaction to the events of the last few hours. We understand that Israel um, has attacked Iran at 4 a.m. Iran time. Uh, State media in Iran has downplayed it, and uh, we are, the Americans say it was limited. But just your reaction to it. Well, this is a culmination of, uh, of a recent uh, reactions by both Iran and Israel to the difficulties that they are facing and the challenges. On the one hand, the Islamic Republic of Iran over the last, since 1991, has been investing billions of dollars in proxies across the region in groups such as Jihad Islami, Hezbollah, and Hamas, for various reasons. One of the major goals was to use these groups as proxies to attack Israel, so that Israel attacks them, not Iran, so that these groups uh, absorb Israeli reaction and are subject to Israeli reaction, military reaction, not Iran. However, over the last number of years, we've seen that according to foreign press reports, Israel has been attacking Iranian officials both inside and outside of Iran. So somehow the Islamic Republic of Iran felt that its proxy model was no longer serving one of its main goals, that despite uh, investing in these groups, the actual war against Israel was reaching Iranian territory, which is why the Islamic Republic, one of the reasons it attacked Israel with 330 missiles and drones on the on the morning of the 14th of April. It was to draw, the, draw a line, draw a big red line uh, around its uh, military officials and military bases. And it said if Israel were to attack against any of these, Iran would respond directly. From no longer, the, the proxy model is no longer valid. We are also going to get involved directly. That in itself put Israel in a bind because the state of Israel has been confronting the Iranian regime. The Iranian regime, uh, unfortunately, does not is not against Israeli policies. It's against Israel's existence. It's the only regime that denies the Holocaust that has been uh, paying various groups to kill Israelis. And no Israeli government, be it Mr. Netanyahu or any other, would allow such a red line. So if the reports today are true, Israel, after five days, crossed Iran's red line. Yeah, um, Dr. Javan Dalfer, do you think, though, that even though you're saying this is a culmination and, uh, you know, uh, that Iran could no longer rely just on its proxies, that it felt like uh, the attacks were coming too close to Iranian soil, do you think, though, that Israel miscalculated or it was a strategic blunder when they attacked and targeted that um, that diplomatic compound on April the 1st, which, which killed a commander of the Quds Force? Uh, I think there were, according to Iranian figures, since October 7th uh, Hamas attack, 17 IRGC officials have been killed in Syria. Uh, and this was the culmination, the attack that we saw on the diplomatic, on the, on the building which was in the diplomatic compound was a, was a, was a culmination. And this was the, the one, uh, <clears throat> if you excuse the expression, the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, there are two schools of thought in Israel. One of them is that Israel should not have attacked um, because this would have been the, uh, the uh, reaction. Another school of thought in Israel says that Israel should have attacked despite this reaction, despite a possible reaction, 
because Israel cannot allow these IRGC officials to meet in a secure building in Damascus and to and to plan and carry out operations that help Israel's enemies. Uh, Yalda, I'd like to remind you that October seventh has been a, it's been a hammer blow to 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 Israel's. Uh, sense of security, uh, and it has been extremely traumatic for Israelis. What I would have said is that if we would have known that this was the Iranian reaction, then perhaps we should have um, been more careful, but certainly not to stop uh, attacks against Iranian regime officials. Yalda, I'm, I'm from Iran. I was born in Bar Mitzvah in Terror. And, and I have to tell you, that this, this war that the Iranian regime is waging against Israel is against the interest of Iranians. But more importantly, Yalda, more importantly, it's based on ideology and emotions more than it is based on logic. And this is what makes this confrontation dangerous. And this is why we could have this, this is why it could have unintended consequences, especially for Iran. Do you think, do you think though, something has has shifted? within the regime in, in Iran? You say it's not based on, on logic, it's based on ideology. Do you think something has fundamentally shifted there when it comes to their decision-making? Um, I think Ayatollah Khamenei um, is uh, suffering from uh, simultaneously from an inferiority and a superiority complex. He's feeling he's, he has a superiority complex because for the first time in the post-revolution history of the Islamic Republic of Iran, his country and his regime finds itself in an alliance with superpowers. And those superpowers are China and Russia. This has had a major, major boost on, on, the, on, on his, self, uh, and his uh, sense of self-confidence. At the same time, and simultaneously, the Islamic Republic is feeling an inferiority complex because the October 7th attack by Hamas was supposed to be a blow against the state of Israel, was supposed to undermine Israel uh, in an unprecedented manner. But somehow it has turned into a saga that has ended up hurting and killing Iranian regime officials in Syria and elsewhere. And he is feeling that the deterrence of his regime is being undermined in an unprecedented manner abroad and at home. I'd like to remind you, Yalda, that the Iranian, re the Iranian regime is so worried about public reaction to its attack against Israel. Uh, uh, that the Dr. Mir uh, Javandafer, uh, we've actually uh, run out of time, uh, but we're grateful for all of your analysis there. That was an Iranian-Israeli lecturer at Reichman University in Tel Aviv. Well, as we've been reporting in the early hours of this morning, uh, Israel attacked Iran. Um, since then, Iranian officials have said they have no plans uh, to respond in any way. They say they're not sure exactly who it was. So we are seeing a situation where there is de-escalation. We are following all the developments here from Jerusalem.
Good morning, I'm Yalda Hakim, live from Jerusalem, where people are waking up to the news that Israel has attacked Iran. Iran's state news agency reports that air defenses were fired and explosions were heard near Isfahan International Airport. The impact of the attack is not yet clear, but it does appear to have been limited, and Iran says they have no plans for immediate retaliation. The Foreign Secretary David Cameron is at the G7 summit in Italy, where we expect to hear more from the US later this morning. And the Prime Minister is due to speak at 9.30 a.m. We'll bring you that live. Good morning and welcome back to Jerusalem. We're waking up to the news that Israel has attacked Iran. Early indications suggest a single strike on a carefully selected target. Iranian state media is reporting that air defenses were fired close to Isfahan International Airport in central Iran at around 4 a.m. local time in Iran. They say that drones were intercepted and there were no explosions on the ground. We haven't been able to verify those claims, but Iran is downplaying the attack and say they have no plans for immediate retaliation. Well, this video is from the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps a Telegram channel. It reportedly shows the explosions in the sky near Isfahan. The UN's nuclear watchdog have confirmed that there is no damage to Iran's nuclear sites. Well, let's bring in our Ali Bunkel, who's with me live. And Ali, we've been following all of these developments all week. The War Cabinet has said they have to respond. They had no choice but to respond. We saw that response um, in the early hours of uh, the morning. It seems now everyone's trying to de-escalate. Yeah, it seems that way. Um, the, the, the reaction to it is almost entirely coming out of Iran. And as you say, it's a, a mix between downplaying what happened on one hand to mocking it on the other hand. There's a lot of social media posts in Iran. There's one of a girl with a paper plane sort of throwing it feebly into a wall, which is sort of mocking uh, Israel's attempts to attack Iran. I think what all that points to and suggests is that Iran is not um, on the brink of retaliation. Um, and perhaps is looking at this as, a, a, as an off-ramp. The other area of reaction is from here in Israel. And with the exception of the right-wing National Security Minister, ben uh, Ismail Ben-Gavir, who would have wanted something far bigger, he's described it as being feeble. But we've heard nothing from the War Cabinet. Maybe we will. But maybe actually they will also choose not to we've crow and We've actually heard from Netanyahu since, well, not even about last weekend. There was a very, very brief tweet in the early hours of Sunday morning, but beyond that, and sort of, um, you know, a few words on TV as he was sort of starting a cabinet meeting. But you would expect, after the attack on Saturday night, I think, for your leader to address the nation and say, don't worry, you know, you're safe, stay calm, you know, this is what we're going to do. That, but nothing. I mean, Netanyahu has not appeared on national TV in any meaningful way. Um, to reassure his nation. But just following this attack, I wouldn't be surprised if the Israelis choose not to make a big deal out of it and maybe not rub it in Iran's faces. They, 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 they've sent their message, and their message is being sent via a few missiles. Yeah, and, and a very clear message. Although there was a lot of speculation throughout the week, there was concern that the nuclear facilities was on the table. I spoke to a Mos, ex-Mossad um, intelligence director who said everything is on the table. Um, and then we had the UN watchdog come out and say, we haven't sent our inspectors to work. And then Rafael Grossi came and spoke to us and said, we've sent them back to work, but we're monitoring the situation. Let's just... Um, talk our audiences through uh, Iran's several nuclear facilities spread across the country. Let's just show them the main ones. Now, the Bonab Atomic Research Centre in the north, which conducts research on irrigation and agriculture. There's also the Boucher nuclear reactor, which is Iran's oldest nuclear reactor. And then there's the Natanz nuclear enrichment plant. And then, of course, the Isfahan nuclear fuel research and production centre. This is Iran's largest nuclear research centre. And from what we understand, from what we know, it was close to and over the airspace of uh, Isfahan International Airport, where we understand these missiles or the Iranians say it was drones that they struck, their air defences kicked in. That's where we understand the strike was. And Israel's message is, if we can land a couple of missiles in the middle of a 
military base in Isfahan. We can also land a couple of missiles in the middle of a nuclear research facility on the edge of the city as well, if we're pushed to do so. So, yeah, clearly there's a message there. There's always messaging uh, in these things. And it's a warning. I'm sure that over the last five days, there would have been a lot of debate about whether Israel should go further, whether they should attack the nuclear facilities. I thought it was quite interesting yesterday. Iran has always said that they want nuclear capability for civilian energy purposes. That's it. They've always denied wanting a nuclear weapon. Frankly, very few people believe them. But yesterday, a senior general did come out and say, you know, if Israel attacks us, we might be forced to change our doctrine, i.e., actually, we might be forced to get a nuclear weapon after all and, uh, and, and accelerate the enrichment process. And that was a clear threat to Israel. I don't think what's happened overnight will, will change that. Um, but the, the, the use of nuclear language has been threatened by both sides. Yeah, indeed. And Ali, we will, of course, keep talking to you throughout the programme. But just to help our audiences uh, understand um, where all this has come from, where the events of, of um, what we saw overnight has uh, come from, it's been framed based on two events. One, which was on April the 1st, Israel struck the Iranian consulate in Syria. Seven of its military advisers, including three senior commanders, uh, were killed. Now, Israel has said it was a military compound, it wasn't a diplomatic compound. Um, the Iranians have said it was a diplomatic compound. And then last weekend on Saturday, we saw Iran fired 170 drones, over 30 cruise missiles and 130 ballistic missiles at Israel. Uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had vowed to respond. And it seems we've seen that response overnight here in the early hours of the morning. Let's bring in our special correspondent, Alex Crawford, who joins us live uh, from Beirut. And Alex, I mean, for years, you've, you've covered the, the proxies, Iran's proxies in this region. But for the last six months, really, you've, you've been in Yemen, you've been talking to the Iraqis, you're currently in Lebanon. There was this feeling that no one wanted, the leadership certainly in all of these countries, didn't want the situation to escalate. When you've spoken to Hezbollah, they've made it clear they're, they're ready if this needs escalation. That war of words has continued, but not just war of words. There has been low-scale war between Hezbollah and Israel for at least the last six months. Yeah, I think the message that they've been giving out ever since uh, the weekend drone and missile attacks by Iran is twofold. One, they do not want war. That was very clearly uh, replicated over and over again from a number of different um, avenues and sources, not just the Lebanese government, not just the Lebanese Hezbollah, not just the Lebanese fighters on the ground and the Lebanese politicians and those who watch it, but also across the region. You know, that no one wants war. And Hezbollah being the strongest Iranian proxy, for them to say that is a very good indication and a reflection, perhaps, of not just how they feel, but perhaps the Iranian authorities and the, the Iranian uh, militants over there, uh, military over there. But also, the second one is, if there is a retaliation, and really what they would consider a wide-scale, deep, powerful, strong retaliation from Israel, then they were ready, and they would respond in kind. We've heard very chilling, uh, powerful messages from the Iranian leadership over the last few days, if that were to happen, that their fingers were on the trigger, that they would respond and it would hurt, and they have the capability to do that. And that, again, has been replicated by Hezbollah here in Lebanon, and they believe they are very much on the front line. There are, as you point out, daily multiple crossfire exchanges between the Lebanese Hezbollah on the south of the Lebanese border with the Israeli Defense Force on the north uh, of, of their border. And it's not just uh, multiple exchanges, multiple explosions, multiple bombing drone attacks. They have increased over the last six months in intensity and in depth, the, how far they go in into Lebanon. So we are in an escalatory pattern, there is no doubt. And the weekend drone and missile attacks just ratcheted it up even more with much more intense crossfire exchanges on that border. So the potential of it to tip into a regional war, drawing in the Yemeni Houthis, drawing in the Iraqi Qatab Hezbollah and other uh, militias in, in Iraq, as well as those uh, stationed in Syria, is immense and they are all as one they all belong under this umbrella group which they call the axis 
of resistance and that we've seen all this um, activity, not just from the Houthis in Yemen, for instance, interrupting international global trade through the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden, but also attacking American bases uh, not so long ago uh, from Iraq and Syria uh, and killing American soldiers based in Jordan. So this, this really does have the potential to escalate and we're in a very dangerous situation and position right now. But Hezbollah, the indications this morning Overnight, uh, having seen what's happened overnight, there's a lot of downplaying, not just from Tehran and from those in, in Iran, but also here in Lebanon with the Hezbollah leadership making its initial statement pretty much disdainful of the, the size and the extent of whatever attack has happened inside Iran. And we've, we've yet to hear definitively exactly what that is, but certainly the Hezbollah leadership here pouring a lot of cold water on it, pretty much dismissing it as inconsequential, saying the, uh, in their initial statement that this clearly shows, according to them, that Israel is afraid that they don't really have any clear plan that they're being dictated to by America, but underlying, if they go further, if they hit harder, if they cross this invisible red line, which clearly the Iranians and Hezbollah and all their proxies ha ha are aware of, then they, they will suffer the consequences. And let's remember just how strong Hezbollah has become over the past few years, since 2006, when they managed to push the Israeli army out of large parts of, of uh, seized area in Lebanon. They have grown. They've grown in size, they've grown in power, they've accumulated uh, an unknown, but we understand a larger arsenal of weaponry. And right now they are definitely banging the drum saying that they're prepared to use it to not only defend Lebanese borders, but also to defend an, in alignment and with loyalty to whatever happens to Iran. So I think the message that we've been very clearly getting in a number of um, the foreign ministers have, have been out across all the different countries, have been also getting that same message, is that you hit one, you hit us all. And that is a very uh, worrying prospect for the international community, particularly Israel and America, and those who are seen very much in this part of the world to be aligned with Israel. That includes Britain and France and the countries who took part in the defense of that drone and cruise missile attack. Remember here, the view here very much is that Israel started it, that they crossed this red line by attacking the consulate in Damascus. They feel that that was pretty much similar and tantamount to attacking Iran on diplomatic Iranian soil, albeit in another sovereign country. So the message from the Lebanese foreign minister just a few days ago to Sky News was, you know, we believe Israel started it and we've got only so much influence over Hezbollah. We have got some influence, he was saying, but only so much. And as far as Israel's concerned, we will stand and by shoulder to shoulder with Hezbollah. So at the moment, it feels like uh, the, perhaps a line has been drawn under these overnight um, events. You know, we'll get more detail, we hope, throughout the day and over the next few days. Obviously, everyone's waiting to see if that continues, but the suggestion seems to be that this is probably an acceptable response as far as Hezbollah and perhaps the Iranians are concerned. But the potential for it still escalating obviously, obviously still exists because the whole, the reason why this has all flared up most recently again is because of what's happening in Gaza and because Lebanon and all these countries are fighting on behalf of the Palestinians and believe that the only solution is uh, an, an official Palestinian state. Alex, uh, thank you, uh, as always, for all of your reporting there. That's our Alex Crawford uh, reporting um, and uh, offering her analysis from Beirut. Well, as we've been saying, we're expecting uh, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken to speak at, from the G7 foreign ministers meeting. All week we've heard from global leaders, ministers, uh, foreign ministers urging for restraint. The UK government uh, this morning uh, urging both Israel and Iran to de-escalate the situation. Let's just have a little listen into Mel Stride. 
We do think that de-escalation is absolutely key now. And our message to all in the region, including Israel, is that de-escalation is really important. The Foreign Secretary currently is in Italy, uh, speaking with his G7 counterparts, and they will be very much focused on exactly that. Well, that was Mel Stride. Let's uh, get more now from our Deborah Haynes. And Deborah, we just heard there uh, Mel Stride, but frankly, we've been hearing all week whether it's been uh, Joe Biden saying to Israel, take the win. But then we also saw uh, Lord Cameron here uh, as well midweek, and he said, look, it seems that Israel's going to uh, respond, just ensure that this thing doesn't uh, escalate. And now we've seen that response overnight. Yes, but it's interesting, isn't it? We don't really have... We have well, there is no official confirmation, is there, from Israel in terms of exactly what has happened, what the, what the scale of the attack was on Iran. It's obviously... We know that this is, it has happened in, on, with Iranian media reporting three drones being struck down. Um, it would be really interesting and important, I think, to hear exactly what has happened in terms of this retaliatory strike and whether whether, as it seems, that this is a limited course of action by Israel. Israel had a whole range of options um, that it could have taken in response to Iran's unprecedented military um, missile and drone strike at the weekend. And, and that ranged from you know, launching F-35 jets to target nuclear sites inside Iran, um, down to um, less, uh, well, more limited action, maybe using drones. Um, so it'd be really, I think it's going to be very interesting to see exactly what um, was, what the target was, and exactly what the um, the munitions were that were used. Um, and then from that, it will be much, it will, it will be a bit more effective to be able to draw a conclusion as how as to how Iran might view the attack and view the response. And at the same time, Israel needs to show to its own people that it is restoring deterrence. That red line has now been crossed by Iran of a direct attack against Israel. And so Israel will really be wanting to show all of its enemies in the region that it is not a soft target and anyone who attacks Israel can expect a powerful response. Yeah, I mean, Deborah, when you speak to Israeli officials, they say that you can't show weakness uh, in this region. So they wanted to send a very clear message. But also, uh, I, this is a new sort of phase and a new precedence that has been set. Yes, and that makes it so much more unpredictable. And, and as well, the fact that this is happening at a time when Israel is already engaged in a, 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 a significant war in Gaza. It's also having escalatory tensions and increasing contact with Hezbollah uh, across its northern border in Lebanon. So dealing with two fronts already and then suddenly this third front of this direct confrontation, let's just say it as it is, from Iran to Israel, Israel now having to respond back. So that surely will be playing into calculations too. Um, Israel has finite resources and clearly both sides have pre previously said, haven't they, that they don't, they aren't seeking direct confrontation, a confrontation that would not just involve Iran and Israel, but of course, allies in the region too. You've got British forces in Cyprus that were involved in that um, effort to successfully defend Israel's territory from the attacks over the weekend. They would then potentially be sucked into any wider confrontation. So it really has been a balancing act of responding, but responding in a way, hopefully, that de-escalates rather than triggers another round, another significant round of missiles and drones. And one final point, the ability to defend against that kind of incoming airstrike is also finite. There are only so many air defence missiles that Israel will have. And so it, the re it really does become more and more dangerous and the increasing chance of greater casualties rises the longer this continues. Yeah, absolutely. Deborah, thank you so much for all of that. Let's go straight to Sky News' military analyst, Sean Bell, who joins us now. And Sean, uh, we're still trying to ascertain, to figure out exactly what happened overnight. Uh, Iranian state media more or less um, tried to downplay things from, from the outset, and they said these were just drones, their air defences kicked in. 
Not sure we'll really fully understand exactly what was used, but what's your, your uh, analysis on, on what happened overnight? Yes, hi, Yelda. As you quite correctly said, I think we've got to be quite careful not to speculate too much at this stage. Uh, Israel's not saying very much. Iran w sounds like it wants to downplay all this. I think after the attacks last Saturday, we've been sat on the edge of our seat wondering what Israel would do. Three options, really. Either do nothing, and that seemed to be what the international community was trying to get Israel to do, um, but that was something that couldn't play well um, domestically for Netanyahu. The other end of the spectrum was an Armageddon option, you know, 330 31 missiles match it in some way, that would definitely have escalated in the region. Uh, and there was a hope that somehow there would be a sweet spot in between. And I think there's a sense of relief almost this morning that what appears to have happened is there appears to have been very surgical strikes done. It doesn't appear so far as if there's any reports of casualties. Despite the attacks, the Iranians are already saying um, that uh, there's no plans to react. Um, I think we've got to be quite careful about some of the imagery we see because it's quite clear the Iranian air defences were very nervous last night. Almost certainly they'd have been firing at shadows overnight, so we've got to be quite careful about that. If I was to say, though, that I think the, the fallout's interesting, one of which Iran has been turning around and saying we've no plan to escalate. Israel, some of the hardliners, I think they were used the word feeble on social media. That just demonstrates it's probably not enough to appease some, but it's small enough probably not to escalate. And I think if you were to look at this objectively, um, there's probably three things Israel should be able to walk away from this. One of which is they've sort of had the last word, which was important for Netanyahu. Secondly, they've actually struck at not only um, the military sites, a storage of air, uh, missiles, but also threaten the nuclear site. And thirdly, very importantly, presentationally, Israel was able to demonstrate that it can target effectively on Iranian soil when Iran was not able to do so very effectively despite this huge barrage of missiles. So I think if we are going to see it, the dust settle, this might be an elegant end to the story. But it's also worth pointing out, it's probably the timing. It was um, um, the, uh, the birthday, 85th birthday of Ayatollah Khomeini today. So it's no surprise that this attack happened today. Sean, uh, thank you, as always, for all of that. Well, as we've been reporting here from Jerusalem and watching the developments in the early hours of the morning, Israel launched an attack on Iran. We've heard in the last couple of hours uh, Iranian officials uh, telling Reuters news agency that they have no intention of responding immediately and that they have no confirmation as to who exactly it was. We're also waiting to hear from the U.S. Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, who's at the G seven foreign ministers uh, summit and he is going to be giving a briefing all week we've heard the israeli war cabinet israeli officials and leaders say they had to respond in some way that they were planning on retaliating uh, because of iran's attack on israel that certain red lines had been crossed this now appears to be their response. Let's bring in Mohammed Morandi from the University of Tehran to get the view there from Iran. Professor Morandi, thank you very much uh, for joining us. Israel wanted to send Iran a very clear message. Has that message now been received? Well, the, they haven't done anything. There were three quadcopters near Esfahan that were down. There were no explosions. It's a hundred. It's a country of 90 million people. In no city have we had explosions. The only thing that woke me up this morning was an international reporter that called me, asking what's happening, and I haven't been able to go back to sleep. So no, we haven't uh, seen anything in particular happen. Tehran, which I'm in, the capital, it has is very quiet, and uh, I've spoken to people in Esfahan. Uh, colleagues who also say they haven't heard anything. They've only read in the international news and Iranian local news. Just one thing, though, and that is Pro that... Uh, Professor um, Morandi, just, just to respond to what you just said there, that nothing has actually happened. I mean, there de does seem to be mixed messaging from the Iranian side. Iranian state media says there were drones, that the air defences kicked in and, and targeted them. Others are saying absolutely nothing's gone on. And then we've had Iranian officials tell Reuters news agency that they don't plan on responding in any way immediately. So is Iran sending mixed messages? Are they on high alert given the attack on Israel last weekend? 
Well, two things. One is that I'm sure that no Iranian fish official has said anything to Reuters. Reuters has a history of um, inaccurate statements when it comes to Iranian officials. I know personally because I was involved during the nuclear negotiations. So that aside, uh, what happened, this whole story began with the Israelis bombing the Iranian embassy. Then the Iranians responded. And uh, as you know, most of the drones that the Iranians sent were, were inexpensive drones. They were to distract attention from air defenses, and the Iranians fired effectively a, a handful of uh, missiles that hit their targets, both in the south and the north. So it was a limited strike, what but the saw, teach... What, 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 what we saw was 300 uh, ballistic cruise missiles, drones in total, um, was Iran surprised by what uh, Western leaders and Israel have described as Iran's failure last weekend to make any impact despite uh, the barrage of, of drones and missiles it sent Israel's way? No, Iran was highly successful. Those drones that Iran fired, 200, were very, were dirt cheap drones. And the Israelis spent 1.35 It didn't penetrate billion. anything. It didn't do any any sort of damage. The only damage it did was um, at uh, a military base and actually a, an a Arab Muslim girl who's seriously injured in hospital. Now, oh, if you could allow me to explain, you'll see that uh, the Israelis are misleading you. Uh, those drones were not intended to hit anything. Those drones were a distraction. They were meant to draw fire, and that's exactly what they did, draw fire from Israeli regime defenses. They were sent three, four, five hours earlier to get the Israel, to, to Israel. They gave the Israelis a lot of time to prepare themselves to down them, but the objective was to distract them. There were no, there were, it wasn't as if Iran was firing 300 missiles. The missiles that the Iranians fire that were intended to hit the targets were between 10 and 20, and they hit their targets, both in the air base in the south well, and well, the intelligence uh, gathering. Not, not quite. I mean, what, what was the point? I, I know you say the drones were a distraction, but what were the point? What was the point? If you then saw a, a coalition coming together of Americans, uh, Britain, France, Arab countries getting involved, Jordan, namely Jordan, um, in Israel's defense. Well, in fact, that uh, increases the scope of the failure because these drones were downed by a huge number of very advanced missiles. So Iran was able to gather intelligence about what the Americans and the Israelis have, their radar systems, their missile defense capabilities, and they were also able to empty their stocks with a bunch of very old drones that Iran had in stock. And also the missiles that Iran fired were of two types. One were very old missiles that reached Israel alongside the drones. These were all for intelligence gathering, all to make sure that the Israelis and the Americans fired upon them, but and also in a distraction so that the main missiles, which were, uh, as I said, between 10 and 20 would strike their targets, and they both did in the Golan Heights. Well, and in well the Professor Mirandi, um uh, you know, it, it, the, the, from one group, uh, it, it's being described as theatrics and, and Iran just, uh, you know, giving lots of warning uh, that, they, that this was coming. Uh, on, on the other hand, uh, there are others who say this displayed Iran's uh, weakness. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're uh, trying to get to Rishi Sunak, who's speaking live, uh, so we'll have to leave it there. But, Professor uh, Mirandi, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Well, in the next uh, few minutes, we are expecting to hear from the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, who will be speaking in central London. As soon as that happens, we will be bringing that to you. But I'm just going to bring in our Ali Bunkle, uh, who was listening to that interview and has been analysing the events of uh, the last few days. I mean, we have heard I I Iranian state media, Iranian officials downplaying what happened. Professor Mirandi saying nothing happened, actually. I've called friends in Isfahan. I'm here in Tehran. Absolutely nothing has happened. So what exactly did they do? I mean, I think it's clear that something happened. I mean, the United States were given forewarning of it, and uh, they have confirmed, uh, U.S. officials confirmed to many media outlets in the United States that Israel carried out these attacks. Um, uh, you know, if, if, if nothing did happen at all, then we still await Israel's response, because 
you know, they were always determined to carry one out. But look, the Israelis carried out an attack last night or in the early hours of this morning. Um, they targeted Isfahan. We know that. Um, if nothing did happen whatsoever, why, therefore, are so many um, state-related social media channels and media personalities in Iran talking about it uh, and mocking it as being rather feeble? Um, because something happened and they want to downplay it. That's why it's not just Rishi Sunak who's due to speak imminently. Another leader, Ibrahim Raisi, is due to speak imminently as well, the Iranian president. What he has to say will, I think, determine the course of the days ahead because if he feels that uh, Iran needs to respond, I'm sure we'll hear the words from him there. If he wants to bat it away, as state media seem to be doing so far, again, I think that is the language that he will use. Uh, and if that is what he decides to do, I think people will take a breath. Yeah, I mean, just yesterday, uh, Racy was saying, the tiniest invasion, the tiniest attack, we are going to respond much harder than what Israel saw last weekend. And then we heard from... Uh, I'm just being told Rishi Sunak has, about, uh, has just arrived and is about Thank to deliver his speech. Let's everyone. have a listen in. Uh, today I'd like to talk about the growing number of people who've become economically inactive since the pandemic and the moral mission of reforming welfare to give everyone who can the best possible chance of returning to work. Now, the values of our welfare state are timeless. They're part of our national character of who we are as a country. We're proud to ensure a safety net that is generous for those who genuinely need it and fair to the taxpayers who fund it. We know that there are some with the most severe conditions who will never be able to work and some who can no longer work because of injury or illness. And they and their loved ones must always have the peace of mind that comes from knowing they will always be supported. But we also have a long-standing and proudly British view that work is a source of dignity, purpose, of hope. The role of the welfare state should never be merely to provide financial support, as important as that will always be, but to help people overcome whatever barriers they might face to living an independent, fulfilling life. Everyone with the potential should be supported, and not just to earn, but to contribute and belong. And we must never tolerate barriers that hold people back from making their contribution and from sharing in that sense of self-worth that comes from feeling part of being something bigger than ourselves. And that is why this is a moral mission and why the value of work is so central to my vision for welfare reform. And it is fitting to be setting out that vision here at the Centre for Social Justice. Over your 20-year history, you've inspired far-reaching changes to welfare. And I want to pay tribute to you and, of course, your founder, my friend, Ian Duncan Smith, who began that journey of reform in 2010, a journey carried through so ably today by Mel Stride. Because when we arrived in office in 2010, people coming off benefits and into work could lose nine pounds for every 10 they earned, by far the highest marginal tax rate. And that was morally wrong. So we created universal credit to make sure that work always pays. We introduced the national living wage and increased it every year, ending low pay in this country. We're rolling out 30 hours of free childcare for every family over nine months of age. We've halved inflation to make the money you earn worth more. And we've cut workers' national insurance by a third, a £900 tax cut for someone earning the average wage, because it is profoundly wrong that income from work is taxed twice when other forms of income are not. For me, it is a fundamental duty of government to make sure that hard work is always rewarded. I know and you know that you don't get anything in life without hard work. It's the only way to build a better life for ourselves and our family and the only way to build a more prosperous country. But in the period since the pandemic, something has gone wrong. The proportion of people who are economically inactive in Britain is still lower than our international peers and lower today than in any year under the last Labour government. But since the pandemic, 850,000 more people have joined this group due to long-term sickness. This has wiped out a decade's worth of progress in which the rate had fallen every single year. 
Now, of those who are economically inactive, fully half say they have depression or anxiety. And most worrying of all, the biggest proportional increase in economic inactivity due to long-term sickness came from young people, those in the prime of their life, just starting out on work and family, instead parked on welfare. Now, we should see it as a sign of progress, of course, that people can talk openly about mental health conditions in a way that years ago would have been unthinkable. And I will never dismiss or downplay the illnesses people have. Anyone who has suffered mental ill health or had family and friends who have knows that these conditions are real and they matter. But just as it would be wrong to dismiss this growing trend, so it would be wrong to merely sit back and accept it. Because it's too hard, too controversial, or for fear of causing offence. Doing so would let down many of the people our welfare system was designed to help. Because if you believe, as I do, that work gives you the chance not just to earn, but to contribute, to belong, to overcome feelings of loneliness and social isolation, and if you believe, as I do, the growing body of evidence that good work can actually improve mental and physical health, then it becomes clear we need to be more ambitious about helping people back to work and more honest about the risk of over medicalizing the everyday challenges and worries of life. Fail to address this, and we risk not only letting those people down, but creating a deep sense of unfairness amongst those whose taxes fund our social safety net in a way that risks undermining trust and consent in that very system. We can't stand for that. And of course, the situation as it is, is economically unsustainable. We can't lose so many people from our workforce whose contributions could help to drive growth. And there's no sustainable way to achieve our goal of bringing down migration levels, which are just too high, without giving more of our own people the skills, incentives, and support to get off welfare and back into work. And we can't afford such a spiraling increase in the welfare bill and the irresponsible burden that would place on this and future generations of taxpayers. We now spend £69 billion on benefits for people of working age with a disability or health condition. That's more than our entire school's budget, more than our transport budget, more than our policing budget. And spending on personal independence payments alone is forecast to increase by more than 50% over the next four years. Let me just repeat that. If we do not change, it will increase by more than 50% in just four years. That's not right. It's not sustainable, and it's not fair on the taxpayers who fund it. So, in the next parliament, a Conservative government will significantly reform and control welfare. Now, this is not about making our safety net less generous, or imposing a blanket freeze on all benefits, as some have suggested. I'm not prepared to balance the books on the backs of the most vulnerable. Instead, the critical questions are about eligibility, <coughs> about who should be entitled to support, and what kind of support best matches their needs. And to answer these questions, I want to set out today five conservative reforms for a new welfare settlement for Britain. First, we must be more ambitious in assessing people's potential for work. Right now, the gateway to ill health benefits is writing too many off, leaving them on the wrong type of support and with no expectation of trying to find a job with all the advantages that that brings. In 2011, 20% of those doing a work capability assessment were deemed unfit to work. But the latest figure now stands at 65%. That's wrong. People are not three times sicker than they were a decade ago. And the world of work has changed dramatically. Now, of course, those with serious debilitating conditions should never be expected to work. But if you have a low-level mobility issue, your employer could make reasonable adjustments, perhaps including adaptations to enable you to work from home. And if you're feeling anxious or depressed, then of course you should get the support and treatment you need to manage your condition. 
but that doesn't mean we should assume you can't engage in work. That's not going to help you, and it's not fair on everyone else either. So we're going to tighten up the work capability assessment such that hundreds of thousands of benefit recipients with less severe conditions will now be expected to engage in the world of work and be supported to do so. Second, just as we help move people from welfare into work, we've got to do more to stop people going from work to welfare. Now, the whole point of replacing the sick note with the fit note was to stop so many people just being signed off as sick. Instead of being told you're not fit for work, the fit note provided the option to say that you may be fit for work with advice about what you can do and what adaptions or support would enable you to stay in or return to work quickly. 11 million of these fit notes were issued last year alone. But what proportion were signed may be fit for work? Just 6%. That's right. A staggering 94% of those signed off sick were simply written off as not fit for work. Well, that's not right. And it was never the intention. We don't just need to change the sick note. We need to change the sick note culture so that the default becomes what work you can do, not what you can't. Building on the pilots that we've already started, we're going to design a new system where people have easy and rapid access to specialised work and health support to help them back to work from the very first FitNote conversation. And part of the problem is that it may not be reasonable to ask GPs, who are perfectly very busy at the moment, assess whether their own patients are fit for work. It too often puts them in an impossible situation where they know that refusal to sign somebody off will harm that precious relationship with their patient. So we're also going to test shifting the responsibility for assessment from GPs and giving it to specialist work and health professionals who have the dedicated time to provide an objective assessment of someone's ability to work and the tailored support that they need to do so. Third, for those who could work with the right support, we should have higher expectations of them in return for receiving benefits. Because when the taxpayer is supporting you to get back on your feet, you have an obligation to put in the hours. And if you do not make that effort, you can't expect the same level of benefits. It used to be that if you worked just nine hours a week, you'd get full benefits without needing to look for additional work. That's not right. Because if you can work more, you should. So we're changing the rules. Anyone working less than half a full-time week will now have to try and find extra work in return for claiming benefits. And we'll accelerate moving people from legacy benefits onto universal credit to give them more access to the world of work. Now, one of my other big concerns about the system is that the longer you stay on welfare, the harder it can be to go back to work. Around half a million people have been unemployed for six months. And well over a quarter of a million have been unemployed for 12 months. These are people with no medical conditions that prevent them from working and who will have benefited from intensive employment support and training programs. There is no reason these people should not be in work, especially when we have almost a million job vacancies. So we will now look at options to strengthen our regime. Anyone who doesn't comply with the conditions set by their work coach, such as accepting an available job, will, after 12 months, have their claim closed and their benefits removed entirely. Because unemployment support should be a safety net, never a lifestyle choice. Fourth, we need to match the support people need to the actual conditions they have and help people live independently and remove the barriers they face. But we need to look again at how we do this through personal independence payments. I worry about it being misused. Now, its purpose is to contribute to the extra cost people face as they go about their daily lives. Take, for example, those who need money for aids or assistance with things like handrails or stair lifts. Often, they're already available at low cost or free from the NHS or local authorities and they're one-off costs. So it probably isn't right that we're paying an ongoing amount every year. 
We also need to look specifically at the way personal independence payments support those with mental health conditions. Since 2019, the number of people claiming PIP, citing anxiety or depression as their main condition, has doubled, with over 5,000 new awards on average every single month. But for all the challenges they face, it's not clear they have the same degree of increased living costs as those with physical conditions. And the whole system is undermined by the way people are asked to make subjective and unverifiable claims about their capability. So in the coming days, we will publish a consultation on how we move away from that to a more objective and rigorous approach that focuses support on those with the greatest needs and extra costs. We will do that by being more precise about the type and severity of mental health conditions that should be eligible for PIP. We'll consider linking that assessment more closely to a person's actual condition and requiring greater medical evidence to substantiate a claim. All of which will make the system fairer and harder to exploit. And we'll also consider whether some people with mental health conditions should get PIP in the same way through cash transfers or whether they'd actually be better supported to lead happier, healthier and more independent lives through access to treatment like talking therapies or respite care. I want to be completely clear about what I'm saying here. This is not about making the welfare system less generous to people who face very real extra costs from mental health conditions. For those with the greatest needs, we actually want to make it easier to access with fewer requirements. And beyond the welfare system, we're delivering the largest expansion in mental health services in a generation, with almost £5 billion of extra funding over the past five years and a near doubling of mental health training places. But our overall approach is about saying that people with less severe mental health conditions should be expected to engage in the world of work. And fifth, we can't allow fraudsters to exploit the natural compassion and generosity of the British people. We've already cracked down on thousands of people wrongly claiming universal credit, including those not self-reporting earnings or hiding capital. And we'll save the taxpayer £600 million by legislating to access vital data from third parties like banks. Just this month, DWP secured guilty verdicts against a Bulgarian gang, court making around 6,000 fraudulent claims, including by hiding behind a corner shop in North London. And we're going further. We're using all the developments in modern technology, including artificial intelligence, to crack down on exploitation in the welfare system that's taking advantage of the hardworking taxpayers who fund it. We are preparing a new fraud bill for the next parliament, which will align DWP with HMRC, so that we treat benefit fraud like tax fraud, with new powers to make seizures and arrests, and will also enable penalties to be applied to a wider set of fraudsters through a new civil penalty. Because when people see others in their community gaming the system that their taxes pay, it erodes support for the very principle of the welfare state. Now, in conclusion, some people no doubt will hear this speech and accuse me of lacking compassion, of not understanding the barriers people face in their everyday lives. But the exact opposite is true. There is nothing compassionate about leaving a generation of young people to sit alone in the dark before a flickering screen, watching as their dreams slip further from reach every passing day. And there is nothing fair about expecting taxpayers to support those who could work, but choose not to. It doesn't have to be like this. We can change. We must change. The opportunities to work are there, thanks to an economic plan that has created almost a million job vacancies. The rewards for working are there, thanks to our tax cuts and increases to the national living wage. And now, if we can deliver the vision for welfare that I've set out today, then we can finally fulfill our moral mission to restore hope and give back to everyone who can the dignity, purpose and meaning that comes from work. Thank you.
thank you. So we've got lots of time for some questions from the media. I'd like to try and get through as many as we can. So if I could ask you to try and keep it to one question, that will help. Uh, and if I could start with ITV. Thank you, Prime Minister. Um, on personal independence payments, 1.9 million people with mental health issues are currently sitting on a waiting list. Surely that's not the right moment to float replacing their cash benefits with access to treatment that they'll be worried they can't get. And I'm sorry, but I do just want to ask for a response to the Israeli strikes on Iran. Yeah, um, thanks, Anishka. Uh, we take mental health incredibly seriously, which is why we're investing record amounts into mental health services and treatment. If you look at what's happened, funding for mental health services has actually exceeded the increase that was set out a few years ago in the NHS's long-term plan. So it went up 10% last year. NHS mental health services are right now treating a record number of adults. We've rolled out mental health support in communities, in schools, and our actually world-leading talking therapies um, has been given extra funding and has, I think, a very successful recovery rate, and that's being expanded to more people. And we're preparing for the long term as well. The recently announced long-term workforce plan for the NHS trains a near, well, a near doubling of the number of mental health nurse training places are created through that. So I think that should give you a sense of our commitment to supporting those with mental health conditions, as I said, record amounts going in and a plan to continually expand them. Um, but I do think it's, it's right to make sure that our welfare system is supporting those who need it the most in the way that we intended it to. And you just have to look at the numbers. You know, over half of all the people who joined that group of the economically inactive last year uh, were citing mental health or anxiety as the main reason. Now, of course, we want to get people the support and the treatment they need uh, with those conditions. Uh, but I do think it's right that the welfare system doesn't over medicalize you know, the everyday challenges and worries of life, especially because I believe very strongly in the evidence support work is good for people's mental health, right? There's increasing evidence and you cite a range of different studies that actually people being in work see huge improvements in their overall health and especially their mental health. So we're letting those people down if we persist with a system which at the moment is writing far too many of them off as just simply not able to work, when we know that work will be very good for them. And you've seen this massive increase since the pandemic, most worryingly, I think for all of us amongst young people, and that can't be right, right. That's an enormous loss of potential, and we don't want to lose all those people's potential. We want to support them so that they can have, as I described, you know, the purpose, the meaning, the hope that comes from good work. And that's why I think it is right to look again at how the work capability assessment works, and that's why we're going to tighten up the conditions there, but also how PIP supports those with mental health conditions. And it is, I think, the right thing to consider whether those people with less severe conditions do, of course, get the treatment and support they need, and the right way to do that might not be through cash transfers. And it may also not be the case that the system, as it is set up today, in the way that it treats people with this one-size-fits-all model is actually doing the right thing. There's a range of conditions and severities that people have and the impact on their daily living costs. And we need to be a bit more specific about that and actually ask ourselves, well, hang on, is everyone seeing these extra costs in their day-to-day -day living in the same way, particularly when it comes to mental health conditions? And I think, as I said, the numbers speak for themselves. If we don't do anything, the PIP bill alone is forecast to increase by 50% in just four years. I don't think anyone sitting here thinks that is right, sustainable, or fair. Um, and as I said, particularly when we think that work is good for people, it's, uh, it's the right thing to do to, tr uh, to try and tackle this in the way that I've set out. Um, that with the situation overnight, uh, as you would appreciate, it's a developing situation. It wouldn't be right for me to speculate until the facts become clear and we're working to confirm the details together with allies. You know, we have condemned Iran's reckless and dangerous barrage of missiles against Israel on Saturday, and Israel absolutely has the right to self-defense. Uh, but as I said to Prime Minister Netanyahu when I spoke to him last week, and more generally, significant escalation is not in anyone's interest. What we want to see is calm heads prevail across the region. Uh, next, we go to LBC. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. Um, I just wanted to ask, Job Centre staff have already reported across the country unsustainable workloads and huge backlogs. Under this plan, they're going to have 400,000 more people to support into work. That is a lot of people. Are you confident that they're going to be able to manage that? And I have to ask as well, should Mark Menzies quit as an MP? So, on, uh, let me just take the second one first. It's right that Mark en Menzies has resigned the Conservative whip. He's been suspended from his position as a trade envoy whilst the investigations into those allegations continue. You know, for our part, I can't comment on our ongoing investigation while it's happening, and uh, he's no longer a Conservative MP, as I said. Now, with regard to, to work coaches, they do a fantastic job, actually, and they deserve an enormous amount of our praise um, for what they do. Because um, they're doing something actually incredible. I mean, they are transforming people's lives, right? Moving someone off welfare into work is an incredibly special moment, right? And any of us who have worked with them and heard about those stories or talked to constituents, colleagues in our communities who have made that transition will know what an incredible moment it is. Ian and I were talking about that just before we came in, and Ian's spoken about it so eloquently in the past. You know, work is an enormous force for good. And you know, I believe this very strongly. It actually, when I first created the furlough scheme and people asked me about it, what drove me to do that was my belief in the fundamental importance of work to people's lives. It gives you purpose. It gives you dignity. It gives you pride. It gives you a sense of belonging. Uh, it gives you hope. And it's not just about, obviously, the financial security that it brings. It's about all those other things that strengthen your life. And, you know, we don't get anywhere in life without working, whether it's individuals, our family, or indeed the country. That's why, you know, I created the furlough scheme, because jobs are so important to me. And it's why this agenda for welfare reform is so important to me. And the people on the front line who are doing it are our work coaches. They are the people that are supporting people into work, and they deserve an enormous amount of thanks and praise for everything they do, and rightly championed by Mel. And Mel uh, has worked really well with the Chancellor to secure extra funding for all our uh, job coaches and our um, job centres and our work coaches. Ian talked about things like universal support uh, in his opening remarks. So actually, we've invested probably over the last two or three budgets and fiscal events, literally billions of pounds into new programmes that go into supporting our work coaches. You know, Mel could explain all the details afterwards. There's universal support, there's work well. All of these things essentially provide work coaches with more resources, more work coaches to support more people, to help them into work. So we've approached this from lots of different ways. It's not just about reforms of the welfare system, it's about proactive support, wraparound support. We've also invested in training as well. So actually, for all the people that we want to help, they have now access to completely free training, level two, level three qualifications, skills boot camps, all of these initiatives designed to help them get into work. So we are wrapping our arms around these people and helping them with everything that we've got. And we're also using new technology. And I talked a little bit about AI on the fraud side, but we're also using technology to act as a co-pilot, essentially, for work coaches uh, so that it can make their lives easier. And we've already started rolling that out. The results are incredible in the amount of time that it saves work coaches. We've got more to do. But that's why it's so important that you've got, in this government, a government that understands the potential of technology to transform public services. You know, we all want more out of public services and we'd all prefer to pay less taxes. You know, one way to square that circle is to make sure that we use technology to drive up productivity. And actually, the work Mel's doing across our job centres is a great example of that. And that's only going to improve over time. Uh, and that's why actually using AI and other technologies, making work coaches' life easier, saving them uh, from the bureaucracy that some of the they're going through with the forms um, is paying real dividends and, and will only make life easier going forward. Uh, next, we go to the BBC. Vicky Young, BBC. Um, could you talk a bit more about the fit notes and the changes you want to make? Who is going to do this instead of GPs? Are there professionals? What training will they get? How will you recruit them, given that there does seem to be an issue with recruitment in uh, the NHS at the moment? And if you're going to have a more tailored service, that will, of course, take up more time and be more complicated. Isn't that going to just add to the backlog? And uh, secondly, why did you wait so long before acting on the serious allegations about Mark Menzies? 
So on, on Mark Menzies, I've already addressed that and I've said there's an ongoing investigation, so I can't really comment whilst that's ongoing. On, on the fit note, the broader point here, before we get into the practicalities of what we're doing is the why, and it's just to remind everyone of what I said, right? When, this, when we went from a sick note to fit note, the whole point was we were trying to say, hang on, there, there's lots of work people may be able to do. Right? And we need flexibility in this gateway to focus on what people can do, not what they can't. Uh, but that hasn't happened. As I said, 94% of the 11 million fit notes last year were not fit for work. Right? So this idea that we would have more flexibility, focus more on what people may be able to do, hasn't happened. And that's why I think it's right that we look at this. Um, so there, we've already started pilots. And so Mel's already been rolling out some pilots across the country to trial different ways in local areas. Uh, today, we're publishing our call for evidence, because I'm not saying I'm standing here today with the precise answer of what it's going to look like, but we're going to ask people's views. We're going to trial a range of different things. But I do think that there is a argument for moving away, as I said, from GPs doing this, who obviously there's a lot of demands on GPs, um, and it may be that this is better done by other professionals. Also, as I say, GPs have a quite special relationship with their patients, and inserting this into it puts them sometimes, and you talk to them, in a difficult position because they don't want to damage that relationship with their patient, and it may be harder for them to, to be as objective. And I know, actually, I think the Royal College of uh, General Practitioners has, has kind of welcomed the call for evidence today. So, look, we want to explore different, different models. Uh, there's a range of different options you can do, but we want to figure out, well, what's a system that's efficient, um, that's got the right number, you know, the right expertise and skills of people to make these objective assessments, and do it in a way that is fair, that is also focused on figuring out what people can do, not what they can't, so that we change the culture around this whole, uh, this whole process. Um, so that, that, that's the approach on fit notes. As I said, uh, Call for Evidence is published today, um, but I think there's a very strong argument for changing our current system because it's not delivering on the aims that it originally set out to deliver. And you know, I, as I said, if you believe, like me, work is a good thing, we've got to have a system and a culture that recognises that and encourages it, and the current fit note system, unfortunately, is not delivering that for any of us. Uh, next, we go to GB News. Um, Christopher Hope from GB News. Prime Minister, um, is this sick note culture a generational thing? Are you basically saying that Britain's got to pull itself together, get back to work, to older people to get on with it, and younger people don't want to? And can I ask you a question about the Rwanda flights? You now won't say these flights will take off by the end of spring. Will you say whether they'll take off by the end of the summer? So on this question of mental health, I just want to be really clear. I'm not in any way saying that mental health isn't a serious condition. Of course it is. And that's why, as I outlined earlier, we've invested a record amount in it, record amount of people getting treated for it. And it is a very welcome thing that we all can talk and acknowledge mental health issues in a way that we wouldn't or couldn't have done a decade ago. Uh, and look, if you're feeling anxious or depressed, then of course you should get the support and the treatment that you need to manage your conditions. But that doesn't mean that we should assume you can't engage in the world of work, because that isn't going to help you when all the evidence says that work can be good for your mental health. And what we need to not do is risk over medicalizing these things when it comes to the welfare system and, and over medicalizing what are essentially the everyday challenges and anxieties of life. Right? That is distinct from a welfare system that recognises people with severe conditions needs very specific help and support. You know, for lots of other people with less severe conditions, they can and should be expected to engage in the world of work. And that's why we're going to reform um, the work capability assessments again and look at how PIP treats these conditions. Uh, but this point on young people is important. And I said it should worry all of us. You know, the biggest proportional increase in the group of people who have become economically inactive since the pandemic is young people. Right? That is a tragedy. Right? I, it's enormous waste and loss of human potential. And so as a matter of urgency, we should be wanting to tackle that. And as I said, if you believe very strongly as I do that work is good for people, particularly early in their careers and life, then we must look at reforming this system because how it's working at the moment, forget about what it's doing on the money and everything else and it's unsustainable and bad for the economy, it is fundamentally letting these people down um, if we are writing them off rather than helping them get into work because that's probably one of the most positive things we can do for them. Uh, on, on Rwanda, look, the, the very simple thing here is, is that repeatedly everyone has tried to block us from getting this bill through. 
And, uh, you know, yet again, you saw it this week. Um, you saw, you know, Labour peers blocking us again. And that's enormously frustrating. Everyone's patience with this has run uh, thin. Mine certainly has. Uh, so our intention now is to get this done on Monday. No more prevarication, no more delay. We are going to get this done on Monday and we will sit there and vote until it's done. I think everyone will be able to see that, that there's a clear choice here. You've got a Conservative government that is doing absolutely everything it can to pass this bill so that after that we soon as practically possible can get flights to leave to Rwanda and build that deterrent so that we can stop the boats and you've got a Labour Party that is doing absolutely everything it can to delay and frustrate and us in that aim. I think the British people can see that very clearly but we're not deterred. We're going to do everything we can to stop the boats. And get. As I said, look, the priority now is to get this bill passed, right? At the end of the day, that we've got to get this bill passed. And I said now very clearly, we're going to get this done on Monday. We don't want any more prevarication or delay. Enough from the Labour Party. We're going to get this bill passed and then we will work to get flights off so we can build that deterrent because that is the only way to resolve this issue. If you care about stopping the boats, you've got to have a deterrent. You've got to have somewhere that you can send people so that they know if they come here illegally, they won't get to stay. It's as simple as that. The bill is the way we're going to deliver that. Uh, next, we'll go to the Daily Mail. Oh, thanks, PM. Uh, Jason goes from the Daily Mail. Um, you, you talk in your speech about uh, removing benefits entirely from uh, long-term unemployed who won't take a job. Um, I mean, that could leave some people destitute. Some of your critics are going to say... The uh, Prime Minister continuing uh, the Q&A session after his remarks at the uh, Centre of Social Justice, where he announced uh, planned reforms uh, uh, to the welfare state, created, saying that uh, he had, quote, a moral mission to make sure hard work is rewarded. Uh, also saying on Rwanda, everyone's trying to block us, but no more delay. We will get this done on Monday. Only one... A uh, brief answer uh, given uh, so far on the latest situation in the Middle East. He said, it wouldn't be right for me to speculate on reports of uh, an Israeli attack on Iran. Uh, he said he was waiting for more information on that uh, and working with his allies. He said, quote, Israel has the right to defend itself, uh, that we want to see calm heads prevail uh, and significant escalation in the Middle East is not in anyone's interest. Well, the situation in the Middle East is the main story uh, this morning, and US officials say Israel has launched a retaliatory strike against Iran overnight. The Prime Minister not drawn on those specifics just now, though. Iranian state media say air defence systems were fired in several provinces with reports of explosions being heard. No casualties or damage have been confirmed. Well, this video, posted on Telegram by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, a branch of uh, Iranian armed forces appears to show explosions over the Iranian province of Ishafan uh, earlier this morning. Well, Iran's uh, state-run IRNA news agency has said air defence batteries have been fired in several provinces. Flights were grounded uh, in the capital city of Tehran and Iranian state TV reported three drones were destroyed shortly after midnight in the sky over the central city of Isfahan, uh, close to uh, military and nuclear facilities. Well, this video from the semi-official Iran news agents, uh, agency Taznim, uh, verified uh, by Sky News, shows uh, Isfahan's uranium conversion nuclear site. They say anti-aircrafts at the facility fired at unspecified targets early this morning. Israel has not yet commented on the attack, but has previously vowed to respond after Iran's unprecedented attack at the weekend. A senior Iranian official has told uh, the Reuters news agency that the country has no plans to immediately retaliate. There's been plenty of international reaction to developments, uh, of course, in the Middle East this week. Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, said yesterday the country will make its own decisions about how to defend itself, despite facing calls from the West for restraint. Those comments came as the US and UK imposed sanctions against Iran in response to the missile and drone strikes on Israel at the weekend. Israel notified US officials that a response was coming, but Washington was not involved in the strikes, according to a source who's spoken to our US partner NBC News. Well, G7 foreign ministers are meeting in Italy for a third day. The US Secretary of State Antony Blinken will hold a briefing later this morning. We'll have that for you live. And reaction uh, this morning to the attack from Israel's hard right security uh, minister, uh, Itamar Ben Gavir. He posted on social media uh, just one word feeble. 
Well, International Affairs Editor Dominic Waghorn is in Jerusalem for us. Uh, Dominic, great to see you. Uh, first, what do we know about the specifics uh, of uh, the retaliation, I guess, in inverted commas? It's not yet been confirmed that that's what this was. Yeah, it seems to have been a counter-strike against Iran's retaliation for what Israel did on April the 1st, attacking uh, its embassy compound, the Iranian com uh, embassy compound uh, in Damascus. It's pretty murky, Wilf, as to what we know about what, ha what happened in uh, Iran overnight. But what it looks like, and, and you have to stress these are still early days, we may not get a full picture for some time to come, but what it looks like is Israel carried out a uh, calibrated, limited strike. It's not clear what it was using. The Iranians have reported quadcopters, um, shadowy Israeli uh, units have reportedly used quadcopter drones in the past uh, to attack targets from the ground in Iran, or reportedly at least. But this, um, I think, is most likely to have been missiles fired from Israel, long-range missiles. And in terms of targets, it seems they attacked targets in Isfahan um, and possibly another place called Tabriz, according to what we're hearing from other reports, not confirmed uh, or verified yet. Isfahan is an important target and relevant and significant in a number of ways. It's a beautiful, very important Iranian city. It's where Iran's nuclear facilities, or some of them, are based. It's also where a drone factory or production uh, facility is based as well. So striking there, the Israelis, um, it's also where an air base is based as well. And reports, some of the reports are claiming that this air base was hit. So possibly this was sort of in the uh, sense of an eye for an eye, an air base for an air base retaliation. Because, of course, the only place the Iranian counter-strike on Saturday was able to get through to and to hit was an air base uh, in Israel. Limited damage done there, but successful in striking that at least. So this could be a retaliation for that very much directly and literally, but also it's sending a clear message to the Iranians. It's saying to the Iranians, we can strike you uh, in sensitive sites close to your nuclear facilities at will, and next time we can hurt you a lot more painfully. If they've struck Tabriz as well, that's also where ballistic missiles are based, and they, of course, were used in the attack on Israel on Saturday as well. So there are a number of messages being sent to the Iranians, and it it does seem as though this was a, a limited calibrated strike, which is exactly what Israel's allies have been urging because they've been worried about the danger of a, an overreaction by the Israelis that could then plunge the region into a much bigger regional war. And so far, it seems the Iranians are sticking to the script in terms of they are playing down their response. Of course, ahead of this, they were sounding very bellicose. We heard uh, one Iranian commander saying that the tiniest invasion, in his words, would lead to a massive and harsh response. Uh, warning the Israelis to do nothing. Um, it seems that, that they are not reacting to this in, in that sense. They are playing things down. They're effectively saying, you know, they, they are admitting there was some kind of activity, some kind of uh, incident around Isfahan overnight, but they're effectively saying now to their own people, move on. And the reason for that is there's still the assumption that Iran does not want to get engaged in an all-out war with Israel and its powerful Western allies for a number of reasons. It, it couldn't possibly win one, but also it is still very much weakened at home by the impact the lasting legacy of the biggest threat to the Iranian regime since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. And that was a women-led uprising against the regime where we saw huge amounts of protests and really brutal repression following that. And uh, in the last few days, we've, we've heard reports of an intensification, a renewal of that kind of repression. And there have been reports of another woman dying in the same jail where Masa Amini, the woman whose death in jail sparked that uprising. We've heard reports of another woman uh, dying there. So the situation, even though that process, the unrest has been has been crushed by the Iranian regime. It's still difficult and uncertain, I think, for the regime. For all those reasons, the assumption is it doesn't want an all-out war, and therefore it will be playing down the impact of what Israeli Israel has done overnight because it doesn't then have to react. So I think in terms of the way allies will be looking at this, they will be reassured that Israel is following a script, and the Iranians as well, and hopefully they can draw a line under this. It has to be said, though, Wilf, that the lasting impact of what's happened over the last few weeks um, still means that the region, I think, has become more dangerous because the rules of the game, the all-important rules of the game in the Middle East, have been changed by what both Israel and Iran have done. D Dom, um, so many, as you said, uh, moving pieces here, and, you, you know, as you said, uh, a lot that we don't know for sure yet, not least what Iran might do in response. I'm interested, though, in the hypothetical question, your take on it, that earlier in the week we heard Lord Cameron use the phrase that Israel should take the win here. Uh, clearly, um, on Saturday, Iran's missile and drone strike was not largely successful on, on Israel. If things 
were to die down from here, um, would the response that Israel um, reportedly uh, launched overnight uh, cross the line to disappoint Western allies, that, that they went beyond taking the win, as it were? Or, or could this settle down as, as a sort of perfect response from Israel um, and keep Western allies and support on side in a way that we have seen return to Israel over the last week or two? I think the answer to that really depends on what has been going on diplomatically behind the scenes. Um, and you're right, David Cameron has repeated what Joe Biden said originally to the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, which was to take the win and not to do anything in the uh, wake of what Iran did against Israel on Saturday. And uh, the president's advice that's been uh, echoed by any number of Western allies is to that the win is not that just none of these cruise missiles, more than 300 cruise missiles, ballistic missiles and drones were fired at Israel, uh, not just that none of them got through to do any major damage, but also that that night showed that the air defences that America and its allies have been putting in place for a number of years now that involve Arab states as well, that air defence system that has worked and that Israel's allies rallied around uh, Israel on that night, not just Western allies but also Arab allies as well. And I think, you know, that the message from Joe Biden was accept that, be bigger than this, don't overreact and don't do anything that could plunge the region into a much bigger war. But I think the Israelis have said in turn there's huge pressure, not just from within the Israeli government but also uh, the wider sort of Israeli public saying that you can't just take this lying down. And the problem is that a line was crossed uh, by Iran attacking Israel. For the first time, Israel was attacked by another sovereign state in more than 30 years. And we have seen a shadow war for 45 years being played out between Israel and Iran. But Iran's never uh, gone out into the open and attacked Israel directly. The reason it did so was it felt that its diplomatic embassy in Damascus was sovereign territory. It also, uh, in that embassy, uh, was a very large number of, or high-level number of uh, Iranian military targets that the Israelis killed. And for those, those reasons, the Iranians felt they had to uh, respond. And in doing so, they crossed one of their own red lines, which is to never to attack uh, Israel directly. And the fact they've done so means that from now on that makes it more likely. Because up until this point, when considering how to respond to any number of attacks that Israel has carried out in this shadow war, the Iranians have always said to themselves, well, we can't attack Israel directly because we never have. They have done so now, and therefore many Israelis have been saying that it makes it more likely they'll do so in the future. So, so the message from Israel was to the Americans and to Western allies was you know, whatever you say about not reacting, we have to do something because we are under huge pressure, not just uh, across the side, but also within our own governments to uh, respond. So I think there was a, then there was a shift from, particularly from Britain and, and other, other allies saying, well, we accept you've got to do something, but if you're going to do something, please don't overreact. Don't do it in such a way that's going to plunge the region into a massive, very dangerous, uh, bigger war. And it looks as though so far the Israelis have followed that advice. They've reacted in a calibrated way that sends a clear message to Iran and obviously the hope is that Iran doesn't react in turn uh, and does draw a line under this the chapter is closed and we can move on but the, the damage has done uh, has been done in some, in, to the extent that Iran has crossed this red line that precedent has now been a new precedent has been set and that effectively changes the rules of the game here Dominic great stuff thanks so much uh, for that Dominic Waghorn uh, there in Jerusalem. Well, uh, earlier this week, the International Atomic Energy Agency warned that amid rising tensions between Israel and Iran, nuclear facilities must never be targeted. The UN nations, uh, the UN's nuclear watchdog has confirmed this morning that all nuclear sites are currently safe and undamaged. And I'm joined now by the Director General of the International Atomic uh, Energy Agency, Rafael Marino Gross. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, what is your first take uh, on these attacks overnight? Well, as you were just uh, saying, uh, you, you know we have our teams, our teams of inspectors that are permanently working uh, in, uh, in, in Iran, in all the nuclear sites of the country. And of course, uh, through the night, we were following with uh, great attention, uh, very closely what was going on there. Uh, and of course, we uh, were checking also with the uh, Iranian uh, nuclear authorities as well. Uh, getting the information about uh, things as they happened. And, and, and uh, fortunately, we were able to confirm early this morning that after these uh, attacks, there has not been any damage to the nuclear sites. You know that there are many nuclear sites uh, in, in the Islamic Republic of Iran, and, and, and uh, most notably in Isfahan, who, which, which has been 
targeted as a place, uh, not the nuclear sites, as I was saying. Uh, but of course, it is of a great concern that we are having, and I've been um, urging uh, everyone to exercise maximum uh, restraint in this regard. Let's talk about Isfahan. Do you think that nuclear facilities were not damaged by luck or by design? There was no, there was no attack on the simply like I mean I I I don't know what the military targeting acquisition was. It's not my my business, um, so I cannot tell you that part of your question. What I can tell you is that there hasn't been any uh, any damage at the site or anything that would indicate that were um, hits nearby or something that could lead you to believe that there was an intention uh, to, to reach these places. Um, is it possible uh, to attack, uh, say, infrastructure that supports uh, a nuclear strike and to do so uh, in a safe way or not? Is that a, a, a possible military uh, aim that's not dangerous? Uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, targeting a nuclear facility, apart from being forbidden by international law, uh, is, uh, you know, playing with fire. Uh, because there are so many, apart from the places where you can have, first of all, I don't want to get too technical here, but there, there, are, there are so many different kind of uh, nuclear facilities. You can have an enrichment facility, you can have a, a, a uranium uh, processing and conversion facility, you can have a research reactor, you can have different different things, all right? And in these places, you will have nuclear material in different dispositions and and uh, and physical forms, again. So everything would depend on the kind of facility. But after, but even considering that, you have the, uh, the uh, ancillary uh, infrastructure that serves that facility, including external power uh, supply lines that could be, uh, um, you know, indirectly uh, triggering, if you want, a nuclear accident. This is why, um, as I always say, nuclear facilities are completely, absolutely off limits uh, in this in these cases. I and we were relieved to see that at least now uh, there has been no um, targeting or not hitting, of course, of any nuclear uh, facility. What nuclear capability does Iran have now? Well, Iran has a very ambitious uh, nuclear program, um, which includes uh, um, very, very high levels of enrichment. I would say tantamount to, to weapon grade. They are enriching uranium at 60%. Military grade is 90%. They have an array of uh, uh, ultra centrifuges of uh, late, latest generation, more than uh, 14,000 uh, centrifuges of this type. So um, they have a very, I would say, um, uh, great capability to uh, manufacture nuclear material. Uh, um, uh, in parallel, they do have um, um, facilities related to what we call the nuclear fuel cycle, from mining to conversion to processing, fabrication of the fuel um, itself. Uh, so uh, it is a vast program spread uh, through, um, I would say, 10 at least nuclear sites across the country, from Tehran to Boucher in the south, where they have uh, a nuclear power plant. What have uh, your observations in just, let's say, the last month been uh, of what they're doing in those sites and your assessment of whether it has changed at all in response to the escalating tensions there? Are they... Uh, doubling down on their efforts? Are they speeding things up? Well, it's been... There, uh, we have seen ups and downs here. One thing uh, that it's important to say is that there is, uh, there is continuity in the... Uh, let's focus on the enrichment, uh, the uranium enrichment effort, which is the one that has drawn the most, uh, and for good reason, the most attention from the international community because of the uh, ability to use this material eventually, hypothetically, to uh, manufacture nuclear nuclear weapons. And, and, and in this regard, what we have seen is a steady effort. They are producing, you know, around nine kilograms of uh, uranium enriched at, at that very, very high level. Let me remind you that no country that does not have nuclear nuclear weapons 
enriches uranium at these levels. For nuclear reactors, for example, you are talking at levels around between 2 and 4 percent. Here we are at 60 percent, close to 90 which mm -hmm. is the military level. And this, of course, raised eyebrows. And, uh, and we are trying to keep the maximum level of, of inspection uh, there. So what I would say is that we see, we see continuity in, in the effort. We, do, we don't see a particular rush, uh, but at the same time, there is, uh, there is a steady pace, yes. Are you confident uh, that they aren't further down the line? Than that, do you think your inspections uh, are effective? Absolutely, yes. But I would say what we have saying, and I intend to be continuing this conversation, perhaps even in Iran soon. What we have been saying is that the level of inspection is um, not at the level we sh we should have. Uh, Iran has a inspections agreement, what we call in the jargon a safeguards agreement. Our inspectors are there. There is a important inspection effort, but uh, given what I said in the beginning of our conversation, uh, given the, 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 uh, the depth and breadth of the, of the program, uh, we should be having additional monitoring um, capabilities uh, about which we have been discussing with Iran. One should put things in context and re be reminded that uh, the IEA used to have much more visibility at the time of the famous JCPOA. You remember this agreement that the P5 plus Germany uh, had with the Islamic Republic, which was abandoned in, in 2018 by the United States, then Iran itself abandoned it. So, the, and that agreement um, uh, foresaw uh, a, a much uh, deeper uh, and wider uh, capability, inspection, visibility capability for the agency. This has disappeared, mm -hmm. while at the same time, Iran is doubling down, to use your expression, on, or, on its um, enrichment uh, capacities. Um, I, I guess the sort of final, final question for me on this is if you could just sum up where they are um, for us, if they decided, uh, given recent events or, or just uh, uh, for other reasons, that they wanted an effective nuclear bomb or something that's 60 percent as as powerful as one how quickly could they uh, deliver that in, in your assessment in weeks in months in years i would say in months maybe but let me be clear because i think in this on these issues one one has to be very precise at least from my perspective mm -hmm. uh, they do have uh, enough nuclear material for several uh, nuclear warheads already now. Does that mean they have a nuclear weapon? No. Uh, nuclear weapon require many other things, including testing. Um, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the, the situation is a serious one. And this is why I have been saying to my Iranian counterparts that the world is looking at them, their neighbors are looking at them, there is a concern in the world, and they must accept and understand that credibility will come through work with the international inspectorate. It will not come from their own um, affirmations that they do not have an intention to have a nuclear weapon. And also, I was pretty concerned a few weeks ago when, uh, when I heard um, very high officials uh, from the Iranian government saying that, in fact, they have everything it's needed uh, to put together um, uh, a nuclear device. And uh, so at that time, my reaction was to say, well, if that is the case, maybe there is something they are not telling me, uh, because in international law, they cannot have a nuclear weapon assembled, disassembled, or in any other way. Uh, because they are party to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, unless they decide to abandon that. So I guess a very serious conversation is, is due. Uh, I must tell you that the Vice President of the Islamic Republic has called me um, uh, a few days ago, and we might be meeting soon. I think uh, this is important, and I really hope we can engage at the level and with the uh, substance that is needed.
Well, uh, Mr Grossi, thank you so much for, for joining us. And I hope you'll come back and join us again uh, if that meeting does take place. This has been enlightening. Thank you very much. It has been my pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you. Uh, the Director General there of the uh, I. A -E -A. You're watching Sky News today. Uh, lots more still to come. You can hear my interview with the former U.S. Uh, President, Vice President Mike Pence. I spoke to him yesterday afternoon, just before Israel's retaliatory strike on Iran uh, in response to Iran's attack last weekend. His views on how the U.S. should be responding. from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Top story reporting from Baltimore every weeknight. It's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas, streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Developing right now on Morning News Now. Growing frustrations over the migrant crisis. Reports of new drone attacks by Houthi militants. And the storm is creating dangerous conditions all across the region. Now let's get to some financial headlines. New rules are coming to cap credit card late fees. Talking tuition as a new class of freshmen gets ready to go to college. This is a big decision for families. Do you think this could impact how people vote? 100%. Morning News Now. Streaming weekdays at 7. Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. What do we know that voters care about? The economy, yeah. right? You are seeing That's that right. firsthand yourself on the ground there today. This is two things. It is pretty big medical news. It is also a pretty big mystery. And oh, by the way, it's driven by one of the most controversial people in the United States. What's happening? They have tweaked my monitor, and I can see now you are, in fact, Soaking wet. I am deeply sorry. <laughs> well, I, I apologize to for Jackson the many now. questions. We'll never be I questioned. <laughs> Hey, I'm Hallie. It's good to be with you tonight. What do we know that voters care about? The economy, yeah. right? You are seeing That's that right. firsthand yourself on the ground there today. This is two things. It is pretty big medical news. It is also a pretty big mystery. And oh, by the way, it's driven by one of the most controversial people in the United States. What's happening? They have tweaked my monitor, and I can see now you are, in fact, soaking wet. I am <laughs> deeply sorry. Well, I, I apologize to for Jackson the many now. questions. We'll never be I questioned. <laughs> Kristen Welker hosts Meet the Press every Sunday on NBC. Good to have you with us. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Developing right now on Morning News Now. Growing frustrations over the migrant crisis. Reports of new drone attacks by Houthi militants. And the storm is creating dangerous conditions all across the region. Now let's get to some financial headlines. New rules are coming to cap credit card late fees. Talking tuition as a new class of freshmen gets ready to go to college. This is a big decision for families. Do you think this could impact how people vote? 100%. Morning News Now. Streaming weekdays at 7. We report live from Tel Aviv, from Juarez, Mexico. Tonight, top story reporting from Baltimore at the Key Bridge disaster. When you look over your shoulder and you see the Key Bridge, what goes through your head? That bridge has been here longer than I've been alive. It still doesn't feel real. Hundreds of Israelis have gathered to demonstrate. What do the people in Gaza, do you think, what do they need most? A place where Palestinians and Israelis have found common ground. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top story with Tom Yamas. Streaming weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Uh, staying with the breaking news, U.S. officials say Israel's launched a retaliatory strike against Iran overnight. Well, Iranian state media say air defense systems were fired in several provinces with reports of explosions being heard. No casualties or damage have been confirmed. Uh, well, this video, just as a reminder, we showed it to you earlier, on Telegram uh, from the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, uh, a branch of the Iranian armed forces, appears to show explosions uh, over the Iranian province of Isfahan early this morning. Meanwhile, Iran's state-run IRNA news agencies said air defense batteries have been fired in several provinces. Flights were grounded in the capital city of Tehran, and Iranian state TV reported three drones were destroyed shortly after midnight in the sky over the central city of Isfahan, close to a major military airbase and close to nuclear facilities. Well, this video from the semi-official Iran news agency TASNIM, uh, which verified by Sky News, shows Isfahan's uranium conversion nuclear site. They say anti-aircrafts at the facility fired at unspecified targets earlier this morning. Well, uh, earlier this hour, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak gave his response to the attack, saying escalation in the Middle East is not an option. 
It's a developing situation. It wouldn't be right for me to speculate until the facts become clear and we're working to confirm the details together with allies. You know, we have condemned Iran's reckless and dangerous barrage of missiles against Israel on Saturday, and Israel absolutely has the right to self-defense. Uh, but as I said to Prime Minister Netanyahu when I spoke to him last week, and more generally, significant escalation is not in anyone's interest. What we want to see is calm heads prevail across the region. Well, our political correspondent Tamara Cohen was there in the room. Uh, Tamara, did he expand any further than that on this? He gave one other answer. This was in a question and answer session during a speech about welfare reform. He gave one other answer later on just to reiterate that he had condemned Iran's uh, major attack on Israel with ballistic missiles, which occurred, of course, last Sunday night. And in fact, this speech had intended to take place on Monday, but was moved because of that. But he wouldn't give any further detail on the actual damage caused by the attack or how that factors into Western leaders' calculations about how this escalates further. He said he was waiting to hear more details. We haven't got any diplomatic activity by Downing Street confirmed today. We may hear more about that later. Of course, Western countries while saying that they expected uh, Israel to retaliate, given uh, the rhetoric that's come out uh, from uh, Israeli politicians this week, we're hoping for that strike back to be limited. And so we wait to hear further details about whether uh, they feel that this is what it is. And, and just give us the context, uh, tomorrow. What, what was this event? What was he announcing? Was it a, was it a new big policy or was it uh, just a sort of uh, speech that, that didn't have too much content on it? So there were a few bits of new content. The Prime Minister was giving a big speech about welfare reform, saying that uh, welfare uh, should be a safety net, not a lifestyle choice. Yes, we've heard that from Conservative politicians before. There were a few solid ideas in there, although none of them to come in immediately. Uh, the one that we've heard overnight was the idea that GPs will no longer give out sick notes and that will be delegated to other professionals. He said he feels that GPs are under too much pressure to agree sick notes and then people never come off them. Half a million people uh, been out of work for more than six months. Uh, he said in a quarter of a million for more than 12 months. Rishi Sunak talked about after the election uh, looking at legislation to take benefits away from people who've been out of work for a year and don't comply with the, with the conditions in their their work assessments, uh, serious benefit sanctions, uh, in other words, and measures to force those working currently less than half of the week to look for more work. He said the context of this is the number of people claiming disability benefits, particularly for mental health conditions like depression and anxiety, has doubled since the pandemic. He says it's costing £69 billion, more than schools at the moment, and it's economically unsustainable. He said he believes mental health conditions are real. He doesn't want to denigrate those who have serious medical issues but he said we can't carry on like this and it's about uh, he said a, a preference for trying to get uh, people back into work and what they can do rather than what they can't do but I think charities and others will have concerns about who will be making these crucial decisions uh, for people who may be waiting on waiting lists for a long time for, for NHS or mental health support. Mark Owen, thanks so much. Uh, well, uh, not much content from the Prime Minister on the situation in the Middle East uh, uh, during his uh, event this morning, uh, but we're going to pivot back to that once again now. It is the top story of the day. Uh, and discuss it with our military analyst, Sean Bell, uh, who's here with me on set. Sean, good morning to you. Good morning, Wolf. What's your take on this uh, retaliation? I think we were sat on the edge of our seats, weren't we, after this current iteration, the 1st of April, those strikes on the Iranian uh, consulate. Then we were waiting for a response last weekend. There was this 331 missiles came across, and all of a sudden we were going, are we actually on the brink of a, a major escalation in the war here? And it looked like three options for Israel. Do nothing. Very unlikely Netanyahu was going to do that. The other end of the spectrum was in Armageddon, where he launched just as many missiles back, and that would have marked a massive escalation. Or I think, as some of our correspondents have talked about, this sort of Goldilocks solution of uh, something in the middle. What we do know is Isfahan was uh, targeted last night. It's an, although we say it's a nuclear site, it's a nuclear research site rather than actually some of the uh, um, major potential of lots of uranium around. Um, there are about 3,000 3, scientists work there. There's also a military airfield there. There's also reports of Tabriz, which has also been 
being um, um, hit, which is right in the northwest up there. That's apparently where a lot of the ballistic missiles are stored and uh, stuff like that. Lots of speculation as to what weapons are used by Israel. I have to say, at this stage, I'm very nervous to get back getting too much into that. We talk about quadcopters. It's very, at least they're talking about 1,000 miles. This is a long way away. So it's, it's really missile territory, maybe uh, fighter jet territory. And also, when we've seen the footage of Iranian air defences going up, do remember that the Iranians were going to be very nervous. They were expecting something to happen. The very fact that lots of those operators, probably young men, have been firing away into the air doesn't necessarily mean there was something there. I think the three takeaways, though, are no reports of major casualties. That was something that would have been a trigger. No apparent damage to the nuclear reactors at all. And it does appear, therefore, our worst fears of escalation have not been realised. Well, on that note, I mean... Why would Israel have decided to, to do this strike just, just now, then, this type of strike just now? Well, it's interesting. I mean, only last night I was doing an interview and I, and I was asked specifically, are they going to attack tonight? And he went, probably not, and just shows how wrong we can be. What looks likely is the international community, there was pressure building on Netanyahu not to react. The United Nations were meeting at Brussels trying to put sanctions on Iran, trying to reduce the need for, um, for Israel to react. The trouble is Netanyahu would have looked weak if he didn't do anything, and every day that went by, it was building pressure on to do, to do something. So a short, sharp, surgical strike seems to be what he's done, wants to draw a line, stop escalation, a definite show of strength. I also think timing is interesting because it is Ayatollah Khomeini's 85th birthday today. I don't think it's a coincidence this strike's happened on that date. And then, finally, your take on what this means for that prospect of whether more escalation is coming or not? Well, we've worried about escalation and this tit for tat. I mean, ultimately, we've got to let the dust settle. What, what was being struck? What casualties have happened? Um, Iran has already come out and said they don't see any need for an immediate reaction. I wouldn't underestimate the back channels that were going on here. America almost certainly acting as an interlocutor between the two, warning Iran trying to make sure that the casualties were smaller. There are three positives that come out from Israel, for, though, from this. I think it's worth... Um, first of all, Netanyahu gets to have the last word, which is really important in terms of the local dynamics. Secondly, it does appear as if he's struck targets that were directly linked to the Iranian attacks uh, on that uh, last weekend. And the, second, and the final one, which is really powerful, Iran, Iran launched 331 missiles, largely ineffective. It looks like Israel's done a much more measured strike but has got through. That is a powerful message to the leaders. But it is interesting, Israel's hardliners, even tweeting this morning, were describing the attack as feeble. Mm -hmm. It will not satisfy everybody uh, out there. The dust needs to settle, uh, but it does feel as if this might be the start of an, a de-escalation rather than the opposite. Sean, as always, thanks so much. Sean Bell. Now, uh, in an interview recorded before Israel's uh, strikes against uh, Iran uh, yesterday uh, afternoon, I spoke to former US Vice President Mike Pence about the tensions in the Middle East and how the US should be responding. He said his country should be ready to support Israel in its response to the attacks from Iran last weekend. Iran is engaged in an unprecedented attack directly on Israel. I think the only message uh, that I want my country and allies around the world uh, to send Israel is that we're with you. I think it's important uh, that uh, we make it clear to Iran uh, and to other uh, uh, actors in the region that they sponsor, be that Hezbollah or Hamas, that uh, we, we will support uh, Israel in doing whatever they need to do uh, to restore deterrence uh, and respond to this uh, this truly un unprecedented assault, 300 mm -hmm. uh, missiles and drones on Israel. And uh, uh, I I'm hoping that uh, what whatever the rumblings have been out of the White House, that uh, they've made it clear at the end of the day America stands with Israel. C clearly um, unprecedented in size were the missile and drones uh, sent from Iran to Israel, though largely unsuccessful. Um, one of the other messages coming from the UK to Israel has been to, to take the win, as it were, uh, and in particular enjoy broader Western support again that, that has returned um, largely to Israel. Do, do you agree with that or is that rather a sort of weak message to be sending? Well, I, I, I neither agree nor disagree with it. I, I just think in this moment it would be important uh, that the allies of Israel make it clear that uh, we will support whatever decision uh, the leaders in, in Israel make and whatever action they take that they believe is necessary to respond to this attack. I look, it's just because Iran failed 
uh, thanks to the air defenses in Israel and, frankly, uh, the support that the United States uh, and the U.K. provided with our own military personnel in the region, uh, it is no reason to give them a pass. This was uh, 300 missiles and drones fired at civilian populations uh, in Israel. And, uh, but for the professionalism of, uh, of their forces, mm -hmm. uh, and frankly, ours and yours, uh, uh, the result of that could have been devastating. So I, I just think it's important uh, that, uh, uh, that we make it clear that, uh, that uh, our nation uh, will stand with Israel in doing whatever they believe is necessary. Again, I think, Wilf, the issue here is restoring deterrence. I mean, it's important to remember that in the, in the modern era, Iran has never directly attacked Israel. Uh, the, we know they've worked through surrogates, be that Hezbollah or Hamas or uh, the Houthis, but uh, th this, was a, this was a completely unprecedented act, uh, and I think we have to respect Israel's right uh, and ability to respond to it as such. With, with that in mind, uh, the U.S. has announced this afternoon sanctions uh, on I Iran. Uh, they don't appear to target Iran's oil-making capacity. I, I wonder whether you think the West should be directly involved uh, in, in the response and whether there's perhaps even an opportunity for, for the West to strike key targets in Iran. Well, I, I think... Uh I think it's important uh, that we support whatever Israel determines that they should do. But I, I, I'm someone who believes that the Biden administration's decision to lessen sanctions against uh, Iran and to, and to not work to enforce the sanctions that have been into effect has, has been all part of a policy of appeasement of the Biden administration that has simply emboldened the mullahs in, in Tehran. I, I, I support uh, the economic measures. I think the United States... Uh, the U.K., our allies uh, across the West, ought to be doing uh, all that we can to further uh, isolate Iran economically or diplomatically. But uh, in terms of a kinetic response, I think, uh, I think we would do well to simply support Israel mm -hmm. uh, in whatever it chooses to do uh, in the wake of this unprecedented attack. The former U.S. Vice President Mike Pence there. More from that interview coming up around 12.30. Specifically, uh, his belief that uh, the aid package going through Congress for Ukraine uh, will pass this weekend. Uh, more from Mike Pence around 12.30. Uh, also coming up uh, on, during the day here on Sky News, Yada Hakim will have a special programme uh, on uh, the Middle East situation at 5 p.m. here on Sky News and uh, a further special episode of her daily show, The World, at 9 p.m. tonight. If you're watching Sky News uh, today, still to come, we'll have uh, more on Israel's retaliation strikes with the former British ambassador to Iran. That's next. Are you comfortable with the role the Supreme Court is playing in the 2024 election? Is there not more that Israel can do to help the humanitarian crisis? Should abortion be the number one issue in 2024? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Tonight, the state of emergency here in Baltimore. Should people be concerned about the safety of flying today? Closer to the Gaza border. Good morning begins with hope and optimism, a chance to start fresh. We want to welcome you in to share a moment that brightens your day because every day deserves the best start. News lives in the now. It's coming at us every second from all over the world. We have a full team. News is more now than ever. Just outside of the Israeli military headquarters, they're asking that the hostages, demanding that the hostages be released. Now is raw. This tunnel just goes on and on and on. Now is real. This is it. We get to see democracy in action for the very first time in the 2024 race. Now is constant. Good morning news now, we're breaking news. It's NBC News special report. You gotta see this. The future is now. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. People really don't know what's going to happen. Only a dozen hours after the eye roared ashore. More good people than bad people, I know, right? There 
There's some late breaking news for our listeners in the Iowa caucuses. What's the message that you're trying to get out to young people? Know what is in the drug supply. We've got important news this hour about your money. Mental health. Big picture. Why is it so tough right now? News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. News for the generation of now is NBC News Now. You want to talk business? Meet me in the Onboard Lounge. Fly Emirates, fly better. Thank you. Welcome back. Uh, more now on the Israeli attack uh, on Iran. Joining me is Rob McCare, former British ambassador to Iran 2018 to 2021, just as the US was pulling out of the JCPOA. It must have been a contentious job um, to have, Ambassador. Thanks for, for, for joining us. My first question is, uh, I guess, your assessment, but perhaps more importantly, what you think Iran's assessment will be of this Israeli uh, response and attack overnight? So I suppose there are, there are two questions, aren't there? One is what has been hit, and the other one is, is, is that it? Is there more to come? And, and those are the questions that Iran will be thinking about. Uh, I, I don't, it doesn't seem to be we've got a clear picture yet of what's been struck with the targets in Isfahan. Obviously, Isfahan is, is a really important city in, in Iran, um, culturally and historically, as well as industrially. Um, but it is a site for uh, nuclear research and development, um, which you're showing on the screen now, uh, and also for uh, defense manufacturing, including of drones and missiles. And if the uh, Israeli attack has been clearly uh, tagged to to respond to the attacks last week by by targeting drone and missile manufacturing sites, that would be that would be a very clear signal that it's that it's directly linked. Uh, it might be uh, a, a signal to be easier than to regard that as a response which draws a line. Uh, if it's an attack on nuclear facilities, which seems to me much less likely, then Iran would typically respond by ramping up its nuclear program, because each each step up in Iran's nuclear program has been uh, in response to uh, actions against that program, whether they're sanctions or, or sabotage attacks. Well, so assuming uh, it's the former and that this attack was targeted uh, without major casualties, casualties, without major hits to nuclear facilities in, in a way that could be framed as a specific response to, to the events of last Saturday. Do you think it's likely that Iran won't uh, respond more aggressively, that they are willing to, to try and draw a line under this? It, it's not sort of uh, an easy decision to make. Look, I think it's, it's important to remember that both sides have been in different ways attacking each other um, anyway, and to, even before the, the recent uh, escalatory spiral. So it would be unrealistic to expect that to stop altogether, whether that's attacks through proxies that Iran carries out against Israel and Israeli interests, uh, or whether it's um, some of the uh, uh, some of the things that Israel has done against uh, Iranian targets in, in, in Syria or um, even inside Iran before. Uh, obviously, Iran, Israel doesn't tend to um, talk about or acknowledge a lot of what it does, uh, so I think the question is not whether it goes to to uh, no confrontation, because there's already a, a, you know, an undeclared war going on. What recent events have done is they've brought that war out of the shadows into the open, uh, and they've sort of, in some ways perhaps lifted a taboo. And the main taboo, of course, is the direct strikes from Iran against Israel. Uh, Israel will be absolutely determined to deter anything like that happening again. Uh, with both sides seeking to restore deterrence, there's a temptation that both sides want the last word. Uh, um, but also, if I could just say, I think both countries are really good at dealing with ambiguity and using ambiguity. 
and it may be that it, uh, uh, the Israeli side will want to not make it clear, entirely clear, whether this is the sum total of their response or whether there's more to come. Well, on that note, do you think that, uh, that this will be uh, all that Israel does? I, I don't know. I think there are really difficult calculations going on in both capitals. They're using force of, to send messages, and they're both looking at domestic audiences and regional audiences, as well as they, the other protagonist in this. It's a very, very complicated chess game that's going on between them with very high stakes. Um, what's your uh, take on, if things did escalate, how things would, would play out? I mean, it seems on the surface that a very major missile attack from Iran was unsuccessful, whereas a fairly minor one uh, from Israel at least got through in, in part. Uh, is that indicative of, of how things would play out if there was a significant escalation? Well, yeah, you're right. There's clearly an asymmetry in terms of, of missile defences, with Israel having very capable support and also more allies. Um, but both sides undoubtedly have the ability to hurt the other, and uh, escalation could take a number of different routes, you know, it's long been talked about that one of the things Iran can do that that, uh, that it would affect the world economy is is to seek to close the Straits of Hormuz. Um, the, you know, there's there's already a maritime um, tit for tat conflict that's been going on uh, sort of in in a, in a low key way for for um, many months. So um, I think there is there is a um, there's a range of of options that both sides could take. Um, in an escalation. Um, the, the, the concern, of course, is that no one quite knows what happens in an escalation.